This is released for the sake of education. We provide free audiobooks, key insights, summaries, and brief study notes. So make sure to subscribe and become a part of our family. So, without wasting any time, let's dive into the ocean of knowledge. Preface Agatha Christie began to write this book in April 1950, she finished it some 15 years later when she was 75 years old. Any book written over so long a period must contain certain repetitions and inconsistencies and these have been tidied up. Nothing of importance has been omitted, however, substantially, this is the autobiography as she would have wished it to appear. She ended it when she was 75 because, as she put it, it seems the right moment to stop. Because, as far as life is concerned, that is all there is to say. The last 10 years of her life saw some notable triumphs, the film of Murder on the Orient Express, the continued phenomenal run of The Mousetrap, sales of her books throughout the world growing massively year by year and in the United States taking the position at the top of the bestseller charts which had for long been hers as of right in Britain and the Commonwealth, her appointment in 1971 as a dame of the British Empire. Yet these are no more than extra laurels for achievements that in her own mind were already behind her. In 1965 she could truthfully write, I am satisfied. I have done what I want to do. Though this is an autobiography, beginning, as autobiographies should, at the beginning and going on to the time she finished writing, Agatha Christie has not allowed herself to be too rigidly circumscribed by the straight jacket of chronology. Part of the delight of this book lies in the way in which she moves as her fancy takes her, breaking off here to muse on the incomprehensible habits of housemaids or the compensations of old age, jumping forward there because some trait in her childlike character reminds her vividly of her grandson. Nor does she feel any obligation to put everything in. A few episodes which to some might seem important, the celebrated disappearance, for example, are not mentioned, though in that particular case the references elsewhere to an earlier attack of amnesia give the clue to the true course of events. As to the rest, I have remembered, I suppose, what I wanted to remember, and though she describes her parting from her first husband with moving dignity, what she usually wants to remember are the joyful or the amusing parts of her existence. Few people can have extraced more intense or more varied fun from life, and this book, above all, is a hymn to the joy of living. If she had seen this book into print she would undoubtedly have wished to acknowledge many of those who had helped bring that joy into her life, above all, of course, her husband Max and her family. Perhaps it would not be out of place for us, her publishers, to acknowledge her. For fifty years she bullied, berated, and delighted us, her insistence on the highest standards in every field of publishing was a constant challenge, her good humor and zest for life brought warmth into our lives. That she drew great pleasure from her writing is obvious from these pages, what does not appear is the way in which she could communicate that pleasure to all those involved with her work, so that to publish her made business ceaselessly enjoyable. It is certain that both as an author and as a person Agatha Christie will remain unique. Forward. Nimrud, Iraq. April 2, 1950. Nimrud is the modern name of the ancient city of Kala, the military capital of the Assyrians. Our expedition house is built of mud brick. It sprawls out on the east side of the mound, and has a kitchen, a living and dining room, a small office, a workroom, a drawing office, a large store and pottery room, and a minute dark room. We all sleep in tents. But this year one more room has been added to the expedition house, a room that measures about 3 meters square. It has a plastered floor with rush mats and a couple of gay coarse rugs. There is a picture on the wall by a young Iraqi artist, of two donkeys going through the souk, all done in a maze of brightly colored cubes. There is a window looking out east towards the snow-topped mountains of Kurdistan. On the outside of the door is affixed a square card on which is printed in cuneiform by Agatha, Agatha's house. So this is my house and the idea is that in it I have complete privacy and can apply myself seriously to the business of writing. As the dig proceeds there will probably be no time for this. Objects will need to be cleaned and repaired. There will be photography, labeling, cataloging and packing. But for the first week or ten days there should be comparative leisure. It is true that there are certain hindrances to concentration. On the roof overhead, Arab workmen are jumping about, yelling happily to each other and altering the position of insecure ladders. Dogs are barking, turkeys are gobbling. The policeman's horse is clanking his chain, and the window and door refuse to stay shut, and burst open alternately. 
I sit at a fairly firm wooden table, and beside me is a gaily painted tin box with which Arabs travel. In it I propose to keep my typescript as it progresses. I ought to be writing a detective story, but with the writer's natural urge to write anything but what he should be writing, I long, quite unexpectedly, to write my autobiography. The urge to write one's autobiography, so I have been told, overtakes everyone sooner or later. It has suddenly overtaken me. On second thoughts, autobiography is much too grand a word. It suggests a purposeful study of one's whole life. It implies names, dates, and places in tidy chronological order. What I want is to plunge my hand into a lucky dip and come up with a handful of assorted memories. Life seems to me to consist of three parts, the absorbing and usually enjoyable present which rushes on from minute to minute with fatal speed, the future, dim and uncertain, for which one can make any number of interesting plans, the wilder and more improbable the better, since, as nothing will turn out as you expect it to do, you might as well have the fun of planning anyway, and thirdly, the past, the memories and realities that are the bedrock of one's present life, brought back suddenly by a scent, the shape of a hill, an old song, some triviality that makes one suddenly say, I remember, with a peculiar and quite unexplainable pleasure. This is one of the compensations that age brings, and certainly a very enjoyable one, to remember. Unfortunately you often wish not only to remember, but also to talk about what you remember. And this, you have to tell yourself repeatedly, is boring for other people. Why should they be interested in what, after all, is your life, not theirs? They do, occasionally, when young, accord to you a certain historical curiosity. I suppose, a well-educated girl says with interest that you remember all. About the Crimea. Rather hurt, I reply that I'm not quite as old as that. I also repudiate participation in the Indian mutiny. But I admit to recollections of the Boer War I should do, my brother fought in it. The first memory that springs up in my mind is a clear picture of myself walking along the streets of Dinad on market day with my mother. A boy with a great basket of stuff cannons roughly into me, grazing my arm and nearly knocking me flat. It hurts. I begin to cry. I am, I think, about seven years old. My mother, who likes stoic behavior in public places, remonstrates with me. Think, she says, of our brave soldiers in South Africa. My answer is to ball out, I don't want to be a brave soldier. I want to be a cowyard. What governs one's choice of memories? Life is like sitting in a cinema. Flick. Here am I, a child eating eclairs on my birthday. Flick. Two years have passed and I am sitting on my grandmother's lap, being solemnly trussed up as a chicken just arrived from Mr. Whiteley's, and almost hysterical with the wit of the joke. Just moments, and in between long empty spaces of months or even years. Where was one then? It brings home to one Pierre Jint's question, where was I, myself, the whole man, the true man? We never know the whole man, though sometimes, in quick flashes, we know. The true man. I think, myself that one's memories represent those moments which, insignificant as they may seem, nevertheless represent the inner self and oneself as most really oneself. I am today the same person as that solemn little girl with pale flaxen sausage curls. The house in which the spirit dwells, grows, develops instincts and tastes and emotions and intellectual capacities, but I myself, the true Agatha, am the same. I do not know the whole Agatha. The whole Agatha, so I believe, is known only to God. So there we are, all of us, little Agatha Miller, and big Agatha Miller, and Agatha Christie and Agatha Mallowan proceeding on our way where? That one doesn't know, which, of course, makes life exciting. I have always thought life exciting and I still do. Because one knows so little of it, only one's own tiny part, one is like an actor who has a few lines to say in act I. He has a typewritten script with his cues, and that is all he can know. He hasn't read the play. Why should he? his but to say, the telephone is out of order, madam, and then retire into obscurity. But when the curtain goes up on the day of performance, he will hear the play through, and he will be there to line up with the rest, and take his call. To be part of something one doesn't in the least understand is, I think, one of the most intriguing things about life. I like living. I have sometimes been wildly despairing, acutely miserable, racked with sorrow, but through it all I still know quite certainly that just to be alive is a grand thing. So what I plan to do is to enjoy the pleasures of memory, not hurrying myself writing a few pages from time to time. It is a task that will probably go on for years. 
But why do I call it a task? It is an indulgence. I once saw an old Chinese scroll that I loved. It featured an old man sitting under a tree playing cat's cradle. It was called, Old Man Enjoying the Pleasures of Idleness. I've never forgotten it. So having settled that I'm going to enjoy myself, I had better, perhaps, begin. And though I don't expect to be able to keep up chronological continuity, I can at least try to begin at the beginning. Part I. Ashfield. First. One of the luckiest things that can happen to you in life is to have a happy childhood. I had a very happy childhood. I had a home and a garden that I loved, a wise and patient nanny, as father and mother two people who loved each other dearly and made a success of their marriage and of parenthood. Looking back I feel that our house was truly a happy house. That was largely due to my father, for my father was a very agreeable man. The quality of agreeableness is not much stressed nowadays. People tend to ask if a man is clever, industrious, if he contributes to the well-being of the community, if he counts in the scheme of things. But Charles Dickens puts the matter delightfully in David Copperfield. Is your brother an agreeable man, Peggotty? I inquired cautiously. Oh what an agreeable man he is, exclaimed Peggotty. Ask yourself that question about most of your friends and acquaintances, and you will perhaps be surprised at how seldom your answer will be the same as Peggotty's. By modern standards my father would probably not be approved of. He was a lazy man. It was the days of independent incomes, and if you had an independent income you didn't work. You weren't expected to. I strongly suspect that my father would not have been particularly good at working anyway. He left our house in Torquay every morning and went to his club. He returned, in a cab, for lunch, and in the afternoon went back to the club, played whist all afternoon, and returned to the house in time to dress for dinner. During the season, he spent his days at the cricket club, of which he was president. He also occasionally got up amateur theatricals. He had an enormous number of friends and loved entertaining them. There was one big dinner party. At our home every week, and he and my mother went out to dinner usually another two or three times a week. It was only later that I realized what a much-loved man he was. After his death, letters came from all over the world. And locally tradesmen, cabmen, old employees, again and again some old man would come up to me and say, Ah! I remember Mr. Miller well. I'll never forget him. Not many like him nowadays. Yet he had no outstanding characteristics. He was not particularly intelligent. I think that he had a simple and loving heart, and he really cared for his fellow men. He had a great sense of humor and he easily made people laugh. There was no meanness in him, no jealousy, and he was almost fantastically generous. And he had a natural happiness and serenity. My mother was entirely different. She was an enigmatic and arresting personality, more forceful than my father, startlingly original in her ideas, shy and miserably diffident about herself, and at bottom, I think, with a natural melancholy. Servants and children were devoted to her, and her lightest word was always promptly obeyed. She would have made a first-class educator. Anything she told you immediately became exciting and significant. Sameness bored her and she would jump from one subject to another in a way that sometimes made her conversation bewildering. As my father used to tell her, she had no sense of humor. To that accusation she would protest in an injured voice, just because I don't think certain stories of yours are funny, Fred, and my father would roar with laughter. She was about ten years younger than my father and she had loved him devotedly ever since she was a child often. All the time that he was a gay young man, flitting about between New York and the south of France, my mother, a shy quiet girl, sat at home, thinking about him, writing an occasional poem in her album, embroidering a pocket book for him. That pocket book, incidentally, my father kept all his life. A typically Victorian romance, but with a wealth of deep feeling behind it. I am interested in my parents, not only because they were my parents, but because they achieved that very rare production, a happy marriage. Up to date I have only seen four completely successful marriages. Is there a formula for success? I can hardly think so. Of my four examples, one was of a girl of 17 to a man over 15 years her senior. He had protested she could not know her mind. She replied that she knew it perfectly and had determined to marry him some three years back. Their married life was further complicated by having first one and then the other mother-in-law living with them enough to wreck most alliances. The wife is calm with a quality of deep intensity. She reminds me a little of my mother without having her brilliance and intellectual interests. They have three children, 
all now long out in the world. Their partnership has lasted well over 30 years and they are still devoted. Another was that of a young man to a woman 15 years older than himself a widow. She refused him for many years, at last accepted him, and they lived happily until her death 35 years later. My mother Clara Burmer went through unhappiness as a child. Her father, an officer in the Argyle Highlanders, was thrown from his horse and fatally injured, and my grandmother was left, a young and lovely widow with four children, at the age of 27 with nothing but her widow's pension. It was then that her elder sister, who had recently married a rich American as his second wife, wrote to her offering to adopt one of the children and bring it up as her own. To the anxious young widow, working desperately with her needle to support and educate four children, the offer was not to be refused. Of the three boys and one girl, she selected the girl, either because it seemed to her that boys could make their way in the world while a girl needed the advantages of easy living, or because, as my mother always believed, she cared for the boys more. My mother left Jersey and came to the north of England to a strange home. I think the resentment she felt, the deep hurt at being unwanted, colored her attitude to life. It made her distrustful of herself and suspicious of people's affection. Her aunt was a kindly woman, good-humored and generous, but she was imperceptive of a child's feelings. My mother had all the so-called advantages of a comfortable home and a good education, what she lost and what nothing could replace was the carefree life with her brothers in her own home. Quite often I have seen in correspondence columns inquiries from anxious parents asking if they ought to let a child go to others because of the advantages she will have which I cannot provide, such as a first-class education. I always long to cry out, don't let the child go. Her own home, her own people, love, and the security of belonging, what does the best education in the world mean against that? My mother was deeply miserable in her new life. She cried herself to sleep every night, grew thin and pale and at last became so ill that her aunt called in a doctor. He was an elderly, experienced man, and after talking to the little girl he went to her aunt and said, the child's homesick. Her aunt was astonished and unbelieving. Oh no, she said. That couldn't possibly be so. Clara's a good quiet child, she never gives any trouble, and she's quite happy. But the old doctor went back to the child and talked to her again. She had brothers, hadn't she? How many? What were their names? And presently the child broke down in a storm of weeping, and the whole story came out. Bringing out the trouble eased the strain, but the feeling always remained of not being wanted. I think she held it against my grandmother until her dying day. She became very attached to her American uncle. He was a sick man by then, but he was fond of quiet little Clara and she used to come and read to him from her favorite book, The King of the Golden River. But the real solace in her life were the periodical visits of her aunt's stepson, Fred Miller, her so-called cousin Fred. He was then about 20 and he was always extra kind to his little cousin. One day, when she was about 11, he said to his stepmother, what lovely eyes Clara has got. Clara, who had always thought of herself as terribly plain, went upstairs and peered at herself in her aunt's large dressing table mirror. Perhaps her eyes were rather nice, she felt immeasurably cheered. From then on, her heart was given irrevocably to Fred. Over in America an old family friend said to the gay young man, Freddy, one day you will marry that little English cousin of yours. Astonished, he replied, Clara? She's only a child. But he always had a special feeling for the adoring child. He kept her childish letters and the poems she wrote him, and after a long series of flirtations with social beauties and witty girls in New York, among them Jenny Jerome, afterwards Lady Randolph Churchill, he went home to England to ask the quiet little cousin to be his wife. It is typical of my mother that she refused him firmly. Why? I once asked her. Because I was dumpy, she replied. An extraordinary but, to her, quite valid reason. My father was not to be gainsaid. He came a second time, and on this occasion my mother overcame her misgivings and rather dubiously agreed to marry him, though full of misgivings that he would be disappointed in her. So they were married, and the portrait that I have of her in her wedding dress shows a lovely serious face with dark hair and big hazel eyes. Before my sister was born they went to Torquay, then a fashionable winter resort enjoying the prestige later accorded to the Riviera, and took furnished rooms there. My father was enchanted with Torquay. He loved the sea. He had several friends living there, and others, Americans, who came for the winter. My sister Madge was born in Torquay and shortly after that my father and mother left for America, which at that time they expected to be their permanent home. 
My father's grandparents were still living, and after his own mother's death in Florida he had been brought up by them in the quiet of the New England countryside. He was very attached to them and they were keen to see his wife and baby daughter. My brother was born whilst they were in America. Some time after that my father decided to return to England. No sooner had he arrived than business troubles recalled him to New York. He suggested to my mother that she should take a furnished house in Torquay and settle there until he could return. My mother accordingly went to look at furnished houses in Torquay. She returned with the triumphant announcement, Fred, I've bought a house. My father almost fell over backwards. He still expected to live in America. But why did you do that, he asked. Because I liked it, explained my mother. She has seen, it appeared, about 35 houses, but only one did she fancy, and that house was for sale only, its owners did not want to let. S.C. My mother, who had been left £2,000 by my aunt's husband, had appealed to my aunt, who was her trustee, and they had forthwith bought the house. But we'll only be there for a year, groaned my father, at most. My mother, whom we always claimed was clairvoyant, replied that they could always sell it again. Perhaps she saw dimly her family living in that house for many years ahead. I loved the house as soon as I got into it, she insisted. It's got a wonderfully peaceful atmosphere. The house was owned by some people called Brown who were Quakers, and when my mother, hesitatingly, condoled with Mrs. Brown on having to leave the house they had lived in so many years, the old lady said gently. I am happy to think of thee and thy children living here, my dear. It was, my mother said, like a blessing. Truly I believe there was a blessing upon the house. It was an ordinary enough villa, not in the fashionable part of Torquay, the Warberries or the Lincolns but at the other end of the town the older part of Tormahan. At that time the road in which it was situated led almost at once into rich Devon country, with lanes and fields. The name of the house was Ashfield and it has been my home, off and on, nearly all my life. For my father did not, after all, make his home in America. He liked Torquay so much that he decided not to leave it. He settled down to his club and his whist and his friends. My mother hated living near the sea, disliked all social gatherings and was unable to play any game of cards. But she lived happily in Ashfield, and gave large dinner parties, attended social functions, and on quiet evenings at home would ask my father with hungry impatience for local drama and what had happened at the club today. Nothing, my father would reply happily. But surely, Fred, someone must have said something interesting. My father obligingly racks his brains, but nothing comes. He says that M is still too mean to buy a morning paper and comes down to the club, reads the news there, and then insists on retailing it to the other members. I say, you fellows, have you seen that on the northwest frontier, etc. Everyone is deeply annoyed, since M is one of the richest members. My mother, who has heard all this before, is not satisfied. My father relapses into quiet contentment. He leans back in his chair, stretches out his legs to the fire and gently scratches his head, a forbidden pastime. What are you thinking about, Fred, demands my mother. Nothing, my father replies with perfect truth. You can't be thinking about nothing? Again and again that statement baffles my mother. To her it is unthinkable. Through her own brain thoughts dart with the swiftness of swallows in flight. Far from thinking of nothing, she is usually thinking of three things at once. As I was to realize many years later, my mother's ideas were always slightly at variance with reality. She saw the universe as more brightly colored than it was, people as better or worse than they were. Perhaps because in the years of her childhood she had been quiet, restrained, with her emotions kept well below the surface, she tended to see the world in terms of drama that came near, sometimes, to melodrama. Her creative imagination was so strong that it could never see things as drab or ordinary. She had, too, curious flashes of intuition, of knowing suddenly what other people were thinking. When my brother was a young man in the army and had got into monetary difficulties which he did not mean to divulge to his parents, she startled him one evening by looking across at him as he sat frowning and worrying. Why, Monty, she said, you've been to money lenders. Have you been raising money on your grandfather's will? You shouldn't do that. It's better to go to your father and tell him about it. Her faculty for doing that sort of thing was always surprising her family. My sister said once, anything I don't want mother to know, I don't even think of, if she's in the room. Second. Difficult to know what one's first memory is. I remember distinctly my third birthday. The sense of my own importance surges up in me. 
We are having tea in the garden, in the part of the garden where, later, a hammock swings between two trees. There is a tea table and it is covered with cakes, with my birthday cake, all sugar icing and with candles in the middle of it. Three candles. And then the exciting occurrence, a tiny red spider, so small that I can hardly see it, runs across the white cloth. And my mother says, it's a lucky spider, Agatha, a lucky spider for your birthday, and then the memory fades, except for a fragmentary reminiscence of an interminable argument sustained by my brother as to how many eclairs he shall be allowed to eat. The lovely, safe, yet exciting world of childhood. Perhaps the most absorbing thing in mine is the garden. The garden was to mean more and more to me, year after year. I was to know every tree in it, and attach a special meaning to each tree. From a very early time, it was divided in my mind into three distinct parts. There was the kitchen garden, bounded by a high wall which abutted on the road. This was uninteresting to me except as a provider of raspberries and green apples, both of which I ate in large quantities. It was the kitchen garden but nothing else. It offered no possibilities of enchantment. Then came the garden proper, a stretch of lawn running downhill, and studded with certain interesting entities. The ilex, the cedar, the wellingtonia, excitingly tall. Two fir trees, associated for some reason not now clear with my brother and sister. Monty's tree you could climb, that is to say hoist yourself gingerly up three branches. Madge's tree, when you had burrowed cautiously into it, had a seat, an invitingly curved bough, where you could sit and look out unseen on the outside world. Then there was what I called the turpentine tree which exuded a sticky strong smelling gum which I collected carefully in leaves and which was, very precious balm. Finally, the crowning glory, the beech tree, the biggest tree in the garden, with a pleasant shedding of beech nuts which I ate with relish. There was a copper beech, too, but this, for some reason, never counted in my tree world. Thirdly, there was the wood. In my imagination it looked and indeed still looms as large as the new forest. Mainly composed of ash trees, it had a path winding through it. The wood had everything that is connected with woods. Mystery, terror, secret delight, inaccessibility, and distance. The path through the wood led out onto the tennis or croquet lawn at the top of a high bank in front of the dining room window. When you emerged there, enchantment ended. You were in the everyday world once more, and ladies, their skirts looped up and held in one hand, were playing croquet, or, with straw. Boater hats on their heads, were playing tennis. When I had exhausted the delights of, playing in the garden, I returned to the nursery wherein was Nurshi, a fixed point, never changing. Perhaps because she was an old woman and rheumatic, my games were played around and beside, but not wholly with, Nurshi. They were all make-believe. From as early as I can remember, I had various companions of my own choosing. The first lot, whom I cannot remember except as a name, were the kittens. I don't know now who the kittens were, and whether I was myself a kitten, but I do remember their names. Clover, Blackie, and three others. Their mother's name was Mrs. Benson. Nurshi was too wise ever to talk to me about them, or to try to join in the murmurings of conversation going on round her feet. Probably she was thankful that I could amuse myself so easily. Yet it was a horrible shock to me one day when I came up the stairs from the garden for tea to hear Susan the housemaid saying. Don't seem to care for toys much. Does she? What does she play with? And Nurshi's voice replying. Oh she plays that she's a kitten with some other kittens. Why is there such an innate demand for secrecy in a child's mind? The knowledge that anyone, even Nurshi, knew about the kittens upset me to the core. From that day on I set myself never to murmur aloud in my games. The kittens were my kittens and only mine. No one must know. I must, of course, have had toys. Indeed, since I was an indulged and much-loved child, I must have had a good variety of them, but I do not remember any, except, vaguely, a box of variegated beads, and stringing them into necklaces. I also remember a tiresome cousin, an adult, insisting teasingly that my blue beads were green and my green ones were blue. My feelings were as those of Euclid, which is absurd, but politely I did not contradict her. The joke fell flat. I remember some dolls, Phoebe, whom I did not much care for, and a doll called Rosalind or Rosie. She had long golden hair and I admired her enormously, but I did not play much with her. I preferred the kittens. Mrs. Benson was terribly poor, and it was all very sad. Captain Benson, their father, had been a sea captain and had gone down at sea, which was why they had been left in such penury. 
that more or less ended the saga of the kittens except that there existed vaguely in my mind a glorious finale to come of Captain Benson not being dead and returning one day with vast wealth just when things had become quite desperate in the kittens' home. From the kittens I passed on to Mrs. Green. Mrs. Green had a hundred children, of whom the important ones were Poodle, Squirrel, and Tree. Those three accompanied me on all my exploits in the garden. They were not quite children and not quite dogs, but indeterminate creatures between the two. Once a day, like all well brought up children, I went for a walk. This I much disliked, especially buttoning up my boots a necessary preliminary. I lagged behind and shuffled my feet, and the only thing that got me through was Nurshi's stories. She had a repertoire of six, all centered on the various children of the families with which she had lived. I remember none of them now, but I do know that one concerned a tiger in India, one was about monkeys, and one about a snake. They were very exciting, and I was allowed to choose which I would hear. Nurshi repeated them endlessly without the least sign of weariness. Sometimes, as a great treat, I was allowed to remove Nurshi's snowy ruffled cap. Without it, she somehow retreated into private life and lost her official status. Then, with elaborate care, I would tie a large blue satin ribbon round her head, with enormous difficulty in holding my breath, because tying a bow is no easy matter for a four-year-old. After which I would step back and exclaim in ecstasy, Oh Nurshi, you are beautiful. At which she would smile and say in her gentle voice, Am I, love? After tea, I would be put into starched muslin and go down to the drawing room to my mother to be played with. If the charm of Nurshi's stories were that they were always the same, so that Nurshi represented the rock of stability in my life, the charm of my mother was that her stories were always different and that we practically never played the same game twice. One story, I remember, was about a mouse called Bright Eyes. Bright Eyes had several different adventures, but suddenly, one day, to my dismay, my mother declared that there were no more stories about Bright Eyes to tell. I was on the point of weeping when my mother said, but I'll tell you a story about a curious candle. We had two installments of the curious candle, which was, I think, a kind of detective story, when unluckily some visitors came to stay in our private games and stories were in abeyance. When the visitors left and I demanded the end of the curious candle, which had paused at a most thrilling moment when the villain was slowly rubbing poison into the candle, my mother looked blank and apparently could remember nothing about the matter. That unfinished serial still haunts my mind. Another delightful game was houses, in which we collected bath towels from all over the house and draped them over chairs and tables so as to make ourselves residences, out of which we emerged on all fours. I remember little of my brother and sister, and I presume this is because they were away at school. My brother was at Harrow and my sister at Brighton at the Miss Lawrence's school which was afterwards to become Rodian. My mother was considered go-ahead to send her daughter to a boarding school, and my father broad-minded to allow it. But my mother delighted in new experiments. Her own experiments were mostly in religion. She was, I think, of a naturally mystic turn of mind. She had the gift of prayer and contemplation, but her ardent faith and devotion found it difficult to select a suitable form of worship. My long-suffering father allowed himself to be taken to first one, now another place of worship. Most of these religious flirtations took place before I was born. My mother had nearly been received into the Roman Catholic Church had then bounced off into being a Unitarian, which accounted for my brother never having been christened, and had from there become a budding theosophist, but took a dislike to Mrs. Besant when hearing her lecture. After a brief but vivid interest in Zoroastrianism, she returned, much to my father's relief, to the safe haven of the Church of England, but with a preference for high churches. There was a picture of St. Francis by her bed, and she read The Imitation of Christ Night and Morning. That same book lies always by my bed. My father was a simple-hearted, orthodox Christian. He said his prayers every night and went to church every Sunday. His religion was matter of fact and without heart searchings, but if my mother liked hers with trimmings, it was quite all right with him. He was, as I have said, an agreeable man. I think he was relieved when my mother returned to the Church of England in time for me to be christened in the parish church. I was called Mary after my grandmother, Clarissa after my mother, and Agatha as an afterthought suggested on the way to the church by a friend of my mother's who said it was a nice name. My own religious views were derived mainly from Nurshi, who was a Bible Christian. She did not go to church but read her Bible at home. Keeping the Sabbath was very important, and being worldly was a sore offense in the eyes of the Almighty. I was myself insufferably smug in my conviction of being one of the saved. 
I refused to play games on Sunday or sing or strum the piano, and I had terrible fears for the ultimate salvation of my father, who played croquet blithely on Sunday afternoons and made gay jokes about curates and even, once, about a bishop. My mother, who had been passionately enthusiastic for education for girls, had now, characteristically, swung round to the opposite view. No child ought to be allowed to read until it was eight years old, better for the eyes and also for the brain. Here, however, things did not go according to plan. When a story had been read to me and I liked it, I would ask for the book and study the pages which, at first meaningless, gradually began to make sense. When out with Nershi, I would ask her what the words written up over shops or on hoardings were. As a result, one day I found I was reading a book called The Angel of Love quite successfully to myself. I proceeded to do so out loud to Nershi. I'm afraid, ma'am, said Nershi apologetically to mother the next day, Miss Agatha can read. My mother was much distressed, but there it was. Not yet five, but the world of story books was open to me. From then on, for Christmas and birthdays I demanded books. My father said that, as I could read, I had better learn to write. This was not nearly so pleasant. Shaky copybooks full of pothocase and hangers still turn up in old drawers, or lines of shaky B's and R's, which I seem to have had great difficulty in distinguishing since I had learned to read by the look of words and not by their letters. Then my father said I might as well start arithmetic, and every morning after breakfast I would set to at the dining room window seat, enjoying myself far more with figures than with the recalcitrant letters of the alphabet. Father was proud and pleased with my progress. I was promoted to a little brown book of problems. I loved problems. Though merely sums in disguise, they had an intriguing flavor. John has five apples, George has six, if John takes away two of George's apples, how many will George have at the end of the day, and so on. Nowadays, thinking of that problem, I feel an urge to reply, depends how fond of apples George is. But then I wrote down four, with the feeling of one who has solved a naughty point, and added of my own accord, and John will have seven. That I liked arithmetic seemed strange to my mother, who had never, as she admitted freely, had any use for figures, and had so much trouble with household accounts that my father took them over. The next excitement in my life was the gift of a canary. He was named Goldie and became very tame, hopping about the nursery, sometimes sitting on Nurshi's cap, and perching on my finger when I called him. He was not only my bird, he was the start of a new secret saga. The chief personages were Dickie and Dick's mistress. They rode on chargers all over the country, the garden, and had great adventures and narrow escapes from bands of robbers. One day the supreme catastrophe occurred. Goldie disappeared. The window was open, the gate of his cage unlatched. It seemed likely he had flown away. I can still remember the horrible, dragging length of that day. It went on and on and on. I cried and cried and cried. The cage was put outside the window with a piece of sugar in the bars. My mother and I went round the garden calling, Dicky, Dicky, Dicky. The housemaid was threatened with instant dismissal by my mother for cheerfully remarking, some cats got him, likely as not, which started my tears flowing again. It was when I had been put to bed and lay there, still sniffing spasmodically and holding my mother's hand, that a cheerful little cheep was heard. Down from the top of the curtain pole came Master Dicky. He flew round the nursery once and then entered his cage. Oh that incredulous wonder of delight. All that day that unending miserable day, Dickie had been up the curtain pole. My mother improved the occasion after the fashion of the time. You see, she said, how silly you have been. What a waste all that crying was. Never cry about things until you are sure. I assured her that I never would. Something else came to me then, besides the joy of Dickie's return the strength of my mother's love and understanding when there was trouble. In the black abyss of misery, holding tight to her hand had been the one comfort. There was something magnetic and healing in her touch. In illness there was no one like her. She could give you her own strength and vitality. Third. The outstanding figure in my early life was Nershi. And round myself and Nershi was our own special world, the nursery. I can see the wallpaper now, Moviris is climbing up the walls in an endless pattern. I used to lie in bed at night looking at it in the firelight or the subdued light of Nurshi's oil lamp on the table. I thought it was beautiful. Indeed, I have had a passion for mauve all my life. Nurshi sat by the table sewing or mending. There was a screen round my bed and I was supposed to be asleep, but I was usually awake, admiring the irises, trying to see just how they intertwined, 
and thinking up new adventures for the kittens. At 9.30, Nurshi's supper tray was brought up by Susan the housemaid. Susan was a great big girl, jerky and awkward in her movements and apt to knock things over. She and Nurshi would hold a whispered conversation, then, when she had gone, Nurshi would come over and look behind the screen. I thought you wouldn't be asleep. I suppose you want a taste. Oh, yes please, Nurshi. A delicious morsel of juicy steak was placed in my mouth. I cannot really believe that Nurshi had steak every night for supper, but in my memories steak it always is. One other person of importance in the house was Jane our cook, who ruled the kitchen with the calm superiority of a queen. She came to my mother when she was a slim girl of 19, promoted from being a kitchen maid. She remained with us for 40 years and left weighing at least 15 stone. Never once during that time had she displayed any emotion, but when she finally yielded to her brother's urgings and went to keep house for him in Cornwall, the tears rolled silently down her cheeks as she left. She took with her one trunk, probably the trunk with which she had arrived. In all those years she had accumulated no possessions. She was, by today's standards, a wonderful cook, but my mother occasionally complained that she had no imagination. Oh dear, what pudding shall we have tonight? You suggest something, Jane. What about a nice stone pudding, ma'am? A stone pudding was the only suggestion Jane ever vouchsafed, but for some reason my mother was allergic to the idea and said no, we wouldn't have that, we'd have something else. To this day I have never known what a stone pudding was, my mother did not know either, she just said that it sounded dull. When I first knew Jane she was enormous, one of the fattest women I have ever seen. She had a calm face, hair parted in the middle, beautiful, naturally wavy dark hair scraped back into a bun in the nape of her neck. Her jaws moved rhythmically all the time because she was invariably eating something, a fragment of pastry, a freshly made scone, or a rock cake, it was like a large gentle cow everlastingly chewing the cud. Splendid eating went on in the kitchen. After a large breakfast, eleven o'clock brought the delights of cocoa, and a plate of freshly made rock cakes and buns, or perhaps hot jam pastry. The midday meal took place when ours was finished, and by etiquette the kitchen was taboo until three o'clock had struck. I was instructed by my mother that I was never to intrude during the kitchen lunch time, that is their own time, and it must not be interrupted by us. If by some unforeseen chance, a cancellation of dinner guests for instance a message had to be conveyed, my mother would apologize for disturbing them, and, by unwritten law, none of the servants would rise at her entrance if they were seated at table. Servants did an incredible amount of work. Jane cooked five course dinners for seven or eight people as a matter of daily routine. For grand dinner parties of 12 or more, each course contained alternatives, two soups, two fish courses, etc. The housemaid cleaned about 40 silver photograph frames and toilet silver ad lib, took in and emptied a hip bath, we had a bathroom but my mother considered it a revolting idea to use a bath others had used, brought hot water to bedrooms four times a day, lit bedroom fires in winter, and mended linen etc. every afternoon. The parlor maid cleaned incredible amounts of silver and washed glasses with loving care in a papier-mâché bowl, besides providing perfect waiting at table. In spite of these arduous duties, servants were, I think, actively happy, mainly because they knew they were appreciated, as experts, doing expert work. As such, they had that mysterious thing, prestige, they looked down with scorn on shop assistants and their like. One of the things I think I should miss most, if I were a child nowadays, would be the absence of servants. To a child they were the most colorful part of daily life. Nurses supplied platitudes, servants supplied drama, entertainment, and all kinds of unspecified but interesting knowledge. Far from being slaves they were frequently tyrants. They knew their place, as was said, but knowing their place meant not subservience but pride, the pride of the professional. Servants in the early 1900s were highly skilled. Parlor maids had to be tall, to look smart, to have been perfectly trained, to have the right voice in which to murmur, hawk or sherry. They performed intricate miracles of valeting for the gentlemen. I doubt if there is any such thing as a real servant nowadays. Possibly a few are hobbling about between the ages of 70 and 80, but otherwise there are merely the dailies, the waitresses, those who oblige, domestic helpers, working housekeepers, and charming young women who want to combine earning a little extra money with hours that will suit them and their children's needs. They are amiable amateurs, they often become friends but they seldom command the awe with which we regarded our domestic staff. Servants, of course, were not a particular luxury, 
It was not a case of only the rich having them, the only difference was that the rich had more. They had butlers and footmen and housemaids and parlor maids and between maids and kitchen maids and so on. As you descended the stages of affluence you would arrive eventually at what is so well described in those delightful books of Barry Payne, Eliza, and Eliza's husband, as the girl. Our various servants are far more real to me than my mother's friends and my distant relations. I have only to close my eyes to see Jane moving majestically in her kitchen, with vast bust, colossal hips, and a starched band that confined her waist. Her fat never seemed to trouble her, she never suffered from her feet, her knees or her ankles, and if she had blood pressure she was quite unaware of it. As far as I remember she was never ill. She was Olympian. If she had emotions, she never showed them, she was prodigal neither of endearments nor of anger, only on the days when she was engaged in the preparation of a large dinner party a slight flush would show. The intense calm of her personality would be what I should describe as faintly ruffled her face slightly redder, her lips pressed tight together, a faint frown on her forehead. Those were the days when I used to be banished from the kitchen with decision. Now, Miss Agatha, I have no time today, I've got a lot on hand. I'll give you a handful of raisins and then you must go out in the garden and not come and worry me any more. I left immediately, impressed, as always, by Jane's utterances. Jane's principal characteristics were reticence and aloofness. We knew she had a brother, otherwise we knew little of her family. She never talked about them. She came from Cornwall. She was called Mrs. Rowe, but that was a courtesy title. Like all good servants, she knew her place. It was a place of command, and she made it clear to those working in the house that she was in charge. Jane must have taken pride in the splendid dishes she cooked, but never showed it or spoke of it. She accepted compliments on her dinner on the following morning with no sign of gratification, though I think she was definitely pleased when my father came out into the kitchen and congratulated her. Then there was Barker, one of our housemaids, who opened up to me yet another vista of life. Barker's father was a particularly strict Plymouth brother, and Barker was very conscious of sin and the way she had broken away in certain matters. Damned to all eternity I shall be, no doubt of it, she would say, with a kind of cheerful relish. What my father would say, I don't know, if he knew I went to Church of England services. What's more, I enjoyed them. I enjoyed the vicar's sermon last Sunday, and I enjoyed the singing too. A child who came to stay was heard by my mother saying scornfully one day to the parlor maid, Oh, you're only a servant, and was promptly taken to task. Never let me hear you speak like that to a servant. Servants must be treated with the utmost courtesy. They are doing skilled work which you could not possibly do yourself without long training. And remember they cannot answer back. You must always be polite to people whose position forbids them to be rude to you. If you are impolite, they will despise you, and rightly, because you have not acted like a lady. To be a little lady was well rammed home in those times. It included some curious items. Starting with courtesy to dependents, it went on to such things as always leave something on your plate for lady manners. Never drink with your mouth full. Remember never to put two halfpenny stamps on a letter unless it is a bill to a tradesman. And, of course, put on clean underclothes when you are going on a railway journey in case there should be an accident. Tea time in the kitchen was often a social reunion. Jane had innumerable friends, and one or two of them dropped in nearly every day. Trays of hot rock cakes came out of the oven. Never since have I tasted rock cakes like Jane's. They were crisp and flat and full of currants, and eaten hot they were heaven. Jane in her mild bovine way was quite a martinet, if one of the others rose from the table, a voice would say, I haven't finished yet, Florence, and Florence, abashed, would sit down again murmuring, I beg your pardon, Mrs. Rowe. Cooks of any seniority were always MRS. Housemaids and parlormaids were supposed to have suitable names, e.g. Jane, Mary, Edith, etc. Such names as Violet, Muriel, Rosamund, and so on were not considered suitable and the girl was told firmly, whilst you are in my service you will be called Mary. Parlor maids, if of sufficient seniority, were often called by their surnames. Friction between the nursery and the kitchen was not uncommon, but Nurshi, though no doubt standing on her rights, was a peaceable person and respected and consulted by the young maids. Dear Nurshi, I have a portrait of her hanging in my house in Devon. It was painted by the same artist who painted the rest of my family, a painter well known at that time. And H.J. Baird. My mother was somewhat critical of Mr. Baird's pictures, he makes everybody look so dirty, she complained. 
All of you look as if you hadn't washed for weeks. There is something in what she said. The heavy blue and green shadows in the flesh tints of my brother's face do suggest a reluctance to use soap and water, and the portrait of myself at 16 has a suggestion of an incipient mustache, a blemish from which I have never suffered. My father's portrait, however, is so pink and white and shining that it might be an advertisement for soap. I suspect that it gave the artist no particular pleasure to paint, but that my mother had vanquished poor Mr. Baird by sheer force of personality. My brother's and sister's portraits were not particularly like, my father's was the living image of him, but was far less distinctive as a portrait. Nershi's portrait was, I am sure, a labor of love on Mr. Baird's part. The transparent cambric of her frilled cap and apron is lovely, and a perfect frame for the wise wrinkled face with its deep set eyes the whole reminiscent of. Some Flemish old master. I don't know how old Nershi was when she came to us, or why my mother should have chosen such an old woman but she always said. From the moment Nershi came, I never had to worry about you, I knew you were in good hands. A great many babies had passed through those hands, I was the last of them. When the census came round, my father had to register the names and ages of everyone in the house. Very awkward job, he said ruefully. The servants don't like you asking them their ages. And what about Nershi? So Nershi was summoned and stood before him her hands folded in front of her snowy apron and her mild old eyes fixed on him inquiringly. So you see, explained my father, after a brief resume of what a census was, I have to put down everyone's age. Er, what shall I put down for you? Whatever you like, sir, replied Nershi politely. Yes, but, Er, I have to know. Whatever you think best, sir. Nershi was not to be stampeded. His own estimate being that she was at least seventy-five, he hazarded nervously, er, er, 59. Something like that. An expression of pain passed across the wrinkled face. Do I really look as old as that, sir, asked Nershi wistfully. No, no, well, what shall I say? Nershi returned to her gambit. Whatever you think right, sir, she said with dignity. My father thereupon wrote down 64. Nershi's attitude has its echoes in present times. When my husband, Max, was dealing with Polish and Yugoslav pilots during the last war, he encountered the same reaction. Age. The pilot waves his hands amiably, anything you please, 20, 30, 40, it does not matter. And where were you born? Anywhere you like. Krakow, Warsaw, Belgrade, Zagreb as you please. The ridiculous unimportance of these factual details could not be more clearly stressed. Arabs are much the same. Your father as well. Oh yes, but he is very old. How old? Oh a very old man, 90, 95. The father turns out to be just short of 50. But that is how life is viewed. When you are young, you are young, when you are in vigor you are a very strong man, when your vigor begins to fail, you are old. If old, you might as well be as old as possible. On my fifth birthday, I was given a dog. It was the most shattering thing that ever happened to me, such unbelievable joy that I was unable to say a word. When I read that well-known cliché, so-and-so was struck dumb, I realized that it can be a simple statement of fact. I was struck dumb, I couldn't even say thank you. I could hardly look at my beautiful dog. Instead I turned away from him. I needed, urgently, to be alone and come to terms with this incredible happiness. I have done the same thing frequently during my later life. Why is one so idiotic? I think it was the lavatory to which I retired, a perfect place for quiet meditation, where no one could possibly pursue you. Lavatories were comfortable, almost residential apartments in those days. I closed the heavy mahogany shelf-like seat, sat on it, gazed unseeingly at the map of Torquay that hung on the wall, and gave myself up to realization. I have a dog, a dog. It's a dog of my own, my very own dog. It's a Yorkshire Terrier, my dog, my very own dog. My mother told me later that my father had been much disappointed by the reception of his gift. I thought the child would love it, he said. She doesn't seem to care about it at all. But my mother, always understanding, said that I needed a little time. She can't quite take it in yet. The four-month-old Yorkshire Terrier puppy, meantime, had wandered out disconsolately into the garden, where he attached himself to our gardener, a grumpy man called Davy. The dog had been bred by a jobbing gardener and at the sight of a spade being pressed into the earth he felt that here was a place where he could feel at home. He sat down on the garden path and watched the digging with an attentive air. 
Here in due course I found him and we made acquaintance. We were both shy, and made only tentative advances to each other. But by the end of the week Tony and I were inseparable. His official name, given him by my father, was George Washington, Tony, for short, was my contribution. Tony was an admirable dog for a child, he was good-natured, affectionate, and lent himself to all my fancies. Nershi was spared certain ordeals. Bows of ribbon and general adornments were now applied to Tony, who welcomed them as a mark of appreciation and occasionally ate bits of them in addition to his quota of slippers. He had the privilege of being introduced into my new secret saga. Dicky, Goldie the Canary, and Dick's mistress, me, were now joined by Lord Tony. I remember less of my sister in those early years than of my brother. My sister was nice to me, while my brother called me kid and was lofty, so naturally I attached myself to him whenever he permitted it. The chief fact I remember about him was that he kept white mice. I was introduced to Mr. and Mrs. Whiskers and their family. Nurshi disapproved. She said they smelled. They did, of course. We already had one dog in the house, an old dandy dinman called Scotty, which belonged to my brother. My brother, named Louis Montant after my father's greatest friend in America, was always known as Monty, and he and Scotty were inseparable. Almost automatically, my mother would murmur, don't put your face down on the dog and let him lick you, Monty. Monty, flat on the floor by Scotty's basket, with his arm wreathed lovingly round the dog's neck, would pay no attention. My father would say, that dog smells terrible. Scotty was then 15, and only a fervent dog lover could deny the accusation. Roses. Monty would murmur lovingly. Roses. That's what he smells of roses. Alas, tragedy came to Scotty. Slow and blind, he was out walking with Nershi and myself when, crossing the road, a tradesman's cart dashed round a corner, and he was run over. We brought him home in a cab and the vet was summoned, but Scotty died a few hours later. Monty was out sailing with some friends. My mother was disturbed at the thought of breaking the news to him. She had the body put in the wash house and waited anxiously for my brother's return. Unfortunately, instead of coming straight into the house as usual, he went round to the yard and into the wash house, looking for some tools he needed. There he found Scotty's body. He went straight off again and must have walked round for many hours. He got home at last just before midnight. My parents were understanding enough not to mention Scotty's death to him. He dug Scotty's grave himself in the dog's cemetery in a corner of the garden where each family dog had his name in due course on a small headstone. My brother, given, as I have said, to remorseless teasing, used to call me the scrawny chicken. I obliged him by bursting into tears every time. Why the epithet infuriated me so I do not know. Being somewhat of a crybaby I used to. Trail off to mother, sobbing out, I aren't a scrawny chicken, are my, marmy. My mother, unperturbed, would merely say, if you don't want to be teased, why do you go trailing after Monty all the time? The question was unanswerable, but such was my brother's fascination for me that I could not keep away. He was at an age when he was highly scornful of kid sisters, and found me a thorough nuisance. Sometimes he would be gracious and admit me to his workshop, where he had a lathe, and would allow me to hold pieces of wood and tools and hand them to him. But sooner or later the scrawny chicken was told to take herself off. Once he so highly favored me as to volunteer to take me out with him in his boat. He had a small dinghy which he sailed on Torbay. Rather to everyone's surprise I was allowed to go. Nershi, who was still with us then, was dead against the expedition, being of the opinion that I would get wet, dirty, tear my frock, pinch my fingers and almost certainly be drowned. Young gentlemen don't know how to look after a little girl. My mother said that she thought I had sense enough not to fall overboard, and that it would be an experience. I think also she wished to express appreciation of Monty's unusual act of unselfishness. So we walked down the town and onto the pier. Monty brought the boat to the steps and Nershi passed me down to him. At the last moment, mother had qualms. You are to be careful, Monty. Very careful. And don't be out long. You will. Look after her, won't you? My brother, who was, I imagine, already repenting of his kindly offer, said briefly, she'll be all right. To me he said, sit where you are and keep still, and for goodness sake don't touch anything. He then did various things with ropes. The boat assumed an angle that made it practically impossible for me to sit where I was and keep still as ordered, and also frightened me a good deal, but as we scud through the water my spirits revived and I was transported with happiness. 
Mother and Nershi stood on the end of the pier, gazing after us like figures in a Greek play, Nershi almost weeping as she prophesied doom, my mother seeking to allay her fears, adding finally, probably remembering what a bad sailor she herself was, I don't expect she'll ever want to go again. The sea is quite choppy. Her pronouncement was true enough. I was returned shortly afterwards, green in the face, having fed the fishes as my brother put it, three times. He landed me in high disgust, remarking that women were all the same. Fourth. It was just before I was five years old that I first met fear. Nershi and I were primrosing one spring day. We had crossed the railway line and gone up Shifei Lane, picking primroses from the hedges, where they grew thickly. We turned in through an open gate and went on picking. Our basket was growing full when a voice shouted at us, angry and rough. What do you think you're doing, Air? He seemed to me a giant of a man, angry and red-faced. Nershi said we were doing no harm, only primrosing. Trespassing, that's what you're at. Get out of it. If you're not out of that gate in one minute, I'll boil you alive, see. I tugged desperately at Nershi's hand as we went. Nershi could not go fast, and indeed did not try to do so. My fear mounted. When we were at last safely in the lane I almost collapsed with relief. I was white and sick, as Nershi suddenly noticed. Deary, she said gently, you didn't think he meant it, did you? Not to boil you or whatever it was. I nodded dumbly. I had visualized it. A great steaming cauldron on a fire, myself being thrust into it. My agonist screams. It was all deadly real to me. Nershi talked soothingly. It was a way people had of speaking. A kind of joke, as it were. Not a nice man, a very rude, unpleasant man, but he hadn't meant what he said. It was a joke. It had been no joke to me, and even now when I go into a field a slight tremor goes down my spine. From that day to this I have never known so real a terror. Yet in nightmares I never relived this particular experience. All children have nightmares, and I doubt if they are a result of nursemaids or others frightening them, or of any happening in real life. My own particular nightmare centered round someone I called the gunman. I never read a story about anyone of the kind. I called him the gunman because he carried a gun, not because I was frightened of his shooting me, or for any reason connected with the gun. The gun was part of his appearance, which seems to me now to have been that of a Frenchman in grey-blue uniform, powdered hair in a queue and a kind of three-cornered hat, and the gun was some old-fashioned kind of musket. It was his mere presence that was frightening. The dream would be quite ordinary, a tea party, or a walk with various people, usually a mild festivity of some kind. Then suddenly a feeling of uneasiness would come. There was someone, someone, who ought not to be there, a horrid feeling of fear, and then I would see him sitting at the tea table, walking along the beach, joining in the game. His pale blue eyes would meet mine, and I would wake up shrieking, the gunman, the gunman. Miss Agatha had one of her gunman dreams last night, Nershi would report in her placid voice. Why is he so frightening, darling, my mother would ask. What do you think he will do to you? I didn't know why he was frightening. Later the dream varied. The gunman was not always in costume. Sometimes, as we sat round a tea table, I would look across at a friend, or a member of the family, and I would suddenly realize that it was not Dorothy or Phyllis or Monty, or my mother or whoever it might be. The pale blue eyes in the familiar face met mine, under the familiar appearance. It was really the gunman. At the age of four I fell in love. It was a shattering and wonderful experience. The object of my passion was one of the Dartmouth cadets, a friend of my brother's. Golden-haired and blue-eyed, he appealed to all my romantic instincts. He himself could have had no idea of the emotions he aroused. Gloriously uninterested in the kid sister of his friend Monty, he would probably have said, if asked, that I disliked him. An excess of emotion caused me to go in the opposite direction if I saw him coming, and when seated at the dining table, to keep my head resolutely turned away. My mother took me gently to task. I know you're shy, dear, but you must be polite. It's so rude to turn your head away from Philip all the time, and if he speaks to you, you only mutter. Even if you dislike him, you must be polite. Dislike him. How little anyone knew. When I think of it now, how supremely satisfying early love can be. It demands nothing, not a look nor a word. It is pure adoration. Sustained by it, one walks on air, creating in one's own mind heroic occasions on which one will be of service to the beloved one. Going into a plague camp to nurse him. Saving him from fire. 
shielding him from a fatal bullet. Anything, indeed, that has caught the imagination in a story. In these imaginings there is never a happy ending. You yourself are burnt to death, shot, or succumb to the plague. The hero does not even know of the supreme sacrifice you have made. I sat on the nursery floor, and played with Tony, looking solemn and priggish, whilst inside my head a glorious exultation swirled in extravagant fancies. The months passed. Philip became a midshipman and left the Britannia. For a short while his image persisted and then dwindled. Love vanished, to return three years later, when I adored hopelessly a tall dark young army captain who was courting my sister. Ashfield was home and accepted as such, ailing, however, was an excitement. It had all the romance of a foreign country. One of its principal joys was its lavatory. It had a splendidly large mahogany lavatory seat. Sitting on it one felt exactly like a queen on her throne, and I rapidly translated Dick's mistress into Queen Marguerite, and Dickie became her son, Prince Goldie, the heir to the throne. He sat at her right hand on the small circle which enclosed the handsome Wedgwood plug handle. Here in the morning I wowed retreat, sit bowing, giving audience, and extending my hand to be kissed until summoned angrily to come out by others wishing to enter. On the wall there hung a colored map of New York City, also an object of interest to me. There were several American prints in the house. In the spare bedroom was a set of colored prints for which I had a deep affection. One, entitled Winter Sports, depicted a very cold-looking man on a sheet of ice, dragging up a fish through a small hole. It seemed rather a melancholy sport to me. On the other hand, Grey Eddie, the trotter, was fascinatingly dashing. Since my father had married the niece of his stepmother, his American father's English second wife, and since he called her mother whilst his wife continued to call her auntie, she was usually known officially as Auntie Granny. My grandfather had spent the last years of his life going to and fro between his business in New York and its English branch in Manchester. His had been one of the success stories of America. A poor boy from a family in Massachusetts, he had come to New York, been engaged more or less as an office boy, and had risen to be a partner in the firm. Shirt sleeves to swivel chair in three generations had certainly come true in our family. My grandfather made a big fortune. My father, mainly owing to trust in his fellow men, let it dwindle away, and my brother ran through what was left of it like a flash of lightning. Not long before he died my grandfather had bought a large house in Cheshire. He was a sick man by then, and his second wife was left a widow comparatively young. She lived on in Cheshire for a while, but finally bought a house in Ealing, which was then still practically in the country. As she often said, there were fields all around. However, by the time I came to visit her this seemed hard to believe. Rows of neat houses spread in every direction. Granny's house and garden had a tremendous fascination for me. I divided the nursery into several territories. The front part had been built out with a bay window and had a gay striped drugget on the floor. This part I christened the Muriel Room, possibly because I had been fascinated by the term Oriel. Window. The back part of the nursery, covered with a Brussels carpet, was the dining hall. Various mats and pieces of linoleum were allocated by me to different rooms. I moved, busy and important, from one room of my house to another, murmuring under my breath. Nurshi, peaceful as ever, sat stitching. Another fascination was Auntie Granny's bed, an immense mahogany four-poster closely hemmed in with red damask curtains. It was a feather bed, and early in the morning I would arrive before being dressed and climb in. Granny was awake from six o'clock onwards, and always welcomed me. Downstairs there was the drawing room, crowded to repletion with marquetry furniture and Dresden china, and perpetually shrouded in gloom because of the conservatory erected outside. The drawing room was only used for parties. Next to the drawing room was the morning room, where almost invariably a sewing woman was ensconced. Now that I come to think of it, sewing women were an inevitable accompaniment of a household. They all had a certain resemblance to each other in that they were usually very refined, in unfortunate circumstances, treated with careful courtesy by the mistress of the house, and the family, and with no courtesy at all by the servants, were sent in meals on trays, and, as far as I can remember, were unable to produce any article of clothing that fitted. Everything was either too tight everywhere or else hung on one in loose folds. The answer to any complaint was usually, ah yes, but Miss James has had such an unfortunate life. So, in the morning room, Miss James sat and sewed with patterns all around her, and a sewing machine in front of her. In the dining room, Granny passed her life in Victorian contentment. The furniture was of heavy mahogany with a central table and chairs all round it. 
The windows were thickly draped with Nottingham lace. Granny sat either at the table, in a huge leather-backed carver's chair, writing letters, or else in a big velvet armchair by the fireplace. The tables, sofa, and some of the chairs were taken up with books, books that were meant to be there and books escaping out of loosely tied up parcels. Granny was always buying books, for herself and for presents, and in the end the books became too much for her and she forgot to whom she had meant to send them, or else discovered that Mr. Bennett's dear little boy had, unnoticed by her, now reached the age of 18 and was no longer eligible for the boys of St. Goldred's or the adventures of Timothy Tiger. An indulgent playmate, Granny would lay aside the long scratchy looking letter she was writing, heavily crossed, to save note paper, and enter into the delightful pastime of a chicken from Mr. Whiteley's. Needless to say, I was the chicken. Selected by Granny with appeals to the shopman as to whether I was. Really young and tender, brought home, trussed up, skewered, yells of delight from my skewered self, put in the oven, done to a turn, brought on the table dished up, great show of sharpening the carving knife, when suddenly the chicken comes alive and it's me. Grand climax, to be repeated ad lib. One of the morning events was Granny's visit to the store cupboard which was situated by the side door into the garden. I would immediately appear and Granny would exclaim, now what can a little girl want here? The little girl would wait hopefully, peering into the interesting recesses. Rows of jars of jam and preserves. Boxes of dates, preserved fruits, figs, French plums, cherries, angelica, packets of raisins and currants, pounds of butter and sacks of sugar, tea, and flour. All the household eatables lived there, and were solemnly handed out every day in anticipation of the day's needs. Also a searching inquiry was held as to exactly what had been done with the previous day's allocation. Granny kept a liberal table for all, but was highly suspicious of waste. Household needs satisfied, and yesterday's PROV ender satisfactorily accounted for, Granny would unscrew a jar of French plums and I would go gladly out into the garden with my hands full. How odd it is, when remembering early days, that the weather seems constant in certain places. In my nursery at Torquay it is always an autumn or winter afternoon. There is a fire in the grate, and clothes drying on the high fire guard, and outside there are leaves swirling down, or sometimes, excitingly, snow. In the Ealing Garden it is always summer, and particularly hot summer. I can relieve easily the gasp of dry hot air and the smell of roses as I go out through the side door. That small square of green grass, surrounded with standard rose trees, does not seem small to me. Again it was a world. First the roses, very important. Any dead head snipped off every day, the other roses cut and brought in and arranged in a number of small vases. Granny was inordinately proud of her roses, attributing all their size and beauty to the bedroom slops, my dear. Liquid manure, nothing like it. No one has roses like mine. On Sundays my other grandmother and usually two of my uncles used to come to midday dinner. It was a splendid Victorian day. Granny Burmer, known as Granny B, who was my mother's mother, would arrive about 11 o'clock, panting a little because she was very stout, even stouter than Auntie Granny. After taking a succession of trains and omnibuses from London, her first action would be to rid herself of her buttoned boots. Her servant Harriet used to come with her on these occasions. Harriet would kneel before her to remove the boots and substitute a comfortable pair of woolly slippers. Then with a deep sigh Granny B would settle herself down at the dining room table, and the two sisters would start their Sunday morning business. This consisted of Lengthy and complicated accounts. Granny B did a great deal of Auntie Granny's shopping for her at the Army and Navy stores in Victoria Street. The Army and Navy stores was the hub of the universe to the two sisters. Lists, figures, accounts were gone into and thoroughly enjoyed by both. Discussions on quality of the goods purchased took place, you wouldn't have cared for it, Margaret. Not good quality material, very runny, not at all like that last plum color velvet. Then Auntie Granny would bring out her large fat purse, which I always looked upon with awe and considered as an outward and visible sign of immense wealth. It had a lot of gold sovereigns in the middle compartment, and the rest of it was bulging with half crowns and sixpences and an occasional five shilling piece. The accounts for repairs and small purchases were settled. The Army and Navy stores, of course, was on a deposit account, and I think that Auntie Granny always added a cash present for Granny B's time and trouble. The sisters were fond of each other, but there was also a good deal of petty jealousy and bickering between them. Each enjoyed teasing the other, and getting the better of her in some way. Granny B had, by her own account, been the beauty of the family. Auntie Granny used to deny this. 
Mary, or Polly, as she called her, had a pretty face, yes, she would say. But of course she hadn't got the figure I had. Gentlemen like a figure. In spite of Polly's lack of figure, for which, I may say, she amply made up later, I have never seen such a bust, at the age of 16 a captain in the Black Watch had fallen in love with her. Though the family had said that she was too young to marry, he pointed out that he was going abroad with his regiment and might not be back in England for some time, and that he would like the marriage to take place straight away. So married Polly was at 16. That, I think, was possibly the first point of jealousy. It was a love match. Polly was young and beautiful and her captain was said to be the handsomest man in the regiment. Polly soon had five children, one of whom died. Her husband left her a young widow of 27, after a fall from his horse. Auntie Granny was not married until much later in life. She had had a romance with a young naval officer, but they were too poor to marry and he turned to a rich widow. She in turn married a rich American with one son. She was in some ways frustrated, though her good sense and love of life never deserted her. She had no children. However, she was left a very rich widow. With Polly, on the other hand, it was all she could do to feed and clothe her family after her husband's death. His tiny pension was all she had. I remember her sitting all day in the window of her house, sewing, making fancy pin cushions, embroidered pictures and screens. She was wonderful with her needle, and she worked without ceasing, far more, I think, than an eight-hour day. So. Each of them envied the other for something they did not have. I think they quite enjoyed their spirited squabbles. Erupting sounds would fill the ear. Nonsense, Margaret, I never heard such nonsense in my life. Indeed, Mary, let me tell you, and so on. Polly had been courted by some of her dead husband's fellow officers and had had several offers of marriage, but she had steadfastly refused to marry again. She would put no one in her husband's place, she said, and she would be buried with him in his grave in Jersey when her time came. The Sunday accounts finished, and commissions written down for the coming week, the uncles would arrive. Uncle Ernest was in the home office and Uncle Harry secretary of the Army and Navy stores. The eldest uncle, Uncle Fred, was in India with his regiment. The table was laid and Sunday midday dinner was served. An enormous joint, usually cherry tart and cream, a vast piece of cheese, and finally dessert on the best Sunday dessert plates, very beautiful they were and are, I have them still, I think 18 out of the original 24, which is not bad for about 60 odd years. I don't know if they were Colport or French China, the edges were bright green, scalloped with gold, and in the center of each plate was a different fruit, my favorite was then and always has been the fig, a juicy looking purple fig. My daughter Rosalind's has always been the gooseberry, an unusually large and luscious gooseberry. There was also a beautiful peach, white currants, red currants, raspberries, strawberries, and many others. The climax of the meal was when these were placed on the table, with their little lace mats on them, and finger bowls, and then everyone in turn guessed what fruit their plate was. Why this afforded so much satisfaction I cannot say, but it was always a thrilling moment, and when you had guessed right you felt you had done something worthy of esteem. After a gargantuan meal there was sleep. Auntie Granny retired to her secondary chair by the fireplace, large and rather low-seated. Granny B would settle on the sofa, a claret-colored leather couch, buttoned all over its surface, and over her mountainous form was spread an Afghan rug. I don't know what happened to the uncles. They may have gone for a walk, or retired to the drawing room, but the drawing room was seldom used. It was impossible to use the morning room because that room was sacred to Miss Grant, the present holder of the post of sewing woman. My dear, such a sad case, Granny would murmur to her friends. Such a poor little creature, deformed, only one passage, like a fowl. That phrase always fascinated me, because I didn't know what it meant. Where did what I took to be a corridor come in? After everyone except me had slept soundly for at least an hour, I used to rock. Myself cautiously in the rocking chair, we would have a game of schoolmaster. Both Uncle Harry and Uncle Ernest were splendid exponents of schoolmaster. We sat in a row, and whoever was schoolmaster, armed with a newspaper truncheon, would pace up and down the line shouting out questions in a hectoring voice, what is the date of the invention of needles? Who was Henry VIII's third wife? How did William Rufus meet his death? What are the diseases of wheat? Anyone who could give a correct answer moved up, those correspondingly disgraced moved down. I suppose it was the Victorian forerunner of the quizzes we enjoy so much nowadays. The uncles, I think, disappeared after that, 
having done their duty by their mother and their aunt. Granny B remained, and partook of tea with Madeira cake, then came the terrible moment when the buttoned boots were brought forth, and Harriet started on the task of encasing her in them once more. It was agonizing to watch, and must have been anguish to endure. Poor Granny B's ankles had swollen up like puddings by the end of the day. To force the buttons into their holes with the aid of a button hook involved an enormous amount of painful pinching, which forced sharp cries from her. Oh! Those buttoned boots! Why did anyone wear them? Were they recommended by doctors? Were they the price of a slavish devotion to fashion? I know boots were said to be good for children's ankles, to strengthen them, but that could hardly apply in the case of an old lady of 70. Anyway, finally encased and pale still from the pain, Granny B started her return by train and bus to her own residence in Bayswater. Ealing at that time had the same characteristics as Cheltenham or Lemington Spa. The retired military and navy came there in large quantities for the healthy air and the advantage of being so near London. Granny led a thoroughly social life, she was a sociable woman at all times. Her house was always full of old colonels and generals for whom she would embroider waistcoats and knit bedsocks, I hope your wife won't object, she would say as she presented them. I shouldn't like to cause trouble. The old gentlemen would make gallant rejoinders, and go away feeling thoroughly doggish and pleased with their manly attractions. Their gallantry always made me rather shy. The jokes they cracked for my amusement did not seem funny, and their arch, rallying manner made me nervous. And what's the little lady going to have for her dessert? Sweets to the sweet, little lady. A peach now? Or one of these golden plums to match those golden curls? Pink with embarrassment, I murmured that I would like a peach please. And? Which peach? Now then, choose. Please, I murmured. I would like the biggest and the bestest. Roars of laughter. All unaware, I seemed to have made a joke. You shouldn't ask for the biggest, ever, said Nershi later. It's greedy. I could admit that it was greedy, but why was it funny? As a guide to social life, Nershi was in her element. You must eat up your dinner quicker than that. Suppose now, that you were to be dining at a ducal house when you grow up. Nothing seemed more unlikely, but I accepted the possibility. There will be a grand butler and several footmen, and when the moment comes, they'll clear away your plate, whether you fancy it or not. I paled at the prospect and applied myself to boiled mutton with a will. Incidents of the aristocracy were frequently on Nershi's lips. They fired me with ambition. I wanted, above everything in the world, to be the Lady Agatha one day. But Nershi's social knowledge was inexorable. That you can never be, she said. Never. I was aghast. Never, said Nershi, a firm realist. To be the Lady Agatha, you have to be born it. You have to be the daughter of a duke, a marquis, or an earl. If you marry a duke, you'll be a duchess, but that's because of your husband's title. It's not something you're born with. It was my first brush with the inevitable. There are things that cannot be achieved. It is important to realize this early in life, and very good for you. There are some things that you just cannot have, a natural curl in your hair black eyes, if yours happen to be blue, or the title of Lady Agatha. On the whole I think the snobbery of my childhood, the snobbery of birth that is, is more palatable than the other snobberies, the snobbery of wealth and intellectual snobbery. Intellectual snobbery seems today to breed a particular form of envy and venom. Parents are determined that their offspring shall shine. We've made great sacrifices for you to have a good education, they say. The child is burdened with guilt if he does not fulfill their hopes. Everyone is so sure that it is all a matter of opportunity, not of natural aptitude. I think late Victorian parents were more realistic and had more consideration for their children and for what would make a happy and successful life for them. There was much less keeping up with the Joneses. Nowadays I often feel that it is for one's own prestige that one wants one's children to succeed. The Victorians looked dispassionately at their offspring and made up their minds about their capacities. I was obviously going to be the pretty one. B was, the clever one. C was going to be plain and was definitely not intellectual. Good. Works would be C's best chance. And so on. Sometimes, of course, they were wrong, but on the whole it worked. There is an enormous relief in not being expected to produce something that you haven't got. In contrast to most of our friends, we were not really well off my father, as an American, was considered automatically to be rich. All Americans were supposed to be rich. Actually he was merely comfortably off we did not have a butler or a footman. 
We did not have a carriage and horses and a coachman. We had three servants, which was a minimum then. On a wet day, if you were going out to tea with a friend, you walked a mile and a half in the rain in your Macintosh and your Goloshis. A cab was never ordered for a child unless it was going to a real party in a perishable dress. On the other hand, the food that was served to guests in our house was quite incredibly luxurious compared to present-day standards, indeed you would have to employ a chef and his assistant to provide it. I came across the menu of one of our early dinner parties, for 10, the other day. It began with a choice of thick or clear soup, then boiled turbot, or fillets of sole. After that came a sorbet. Saddle of mutton followed. Then, rather unexpectedly, lobster mayonnaise. Pudding diplomatique and charlotte russe were the sweets and then dessert. All this was produced by Jane, single-handed. Nowadays, of course, on an equivalent income, a family would have a car, perhaps a couple of dailies, and any heavy entertaining would probably be in a restaurant or done at home by the wife. In our family it was my sister who was early recognized as, the clever one. Her headmistress at Brighton urged that she should go to Girton. My father was upset and said we can't have Madge turned into a blue stocking. We'd better send her to Paris to be finished. So my sister went to Paris, to her own complete satisfaction since she had no wish whatever to go to Girton. She certainly had the brains of the family. She was witty, very entertaining, quick of repartee and successful in everything she attempted. My brother, a year younger than her, had enormous personal charm, a liking for literature, but was otherwise intellectually backward. I think both my father and my mother realized that he was going to be the difficult one. He had a great love of practical engineering. My father had hoped that he would go into banking but realized that he did not have the capacity to succeed. So he took up engineering, but there again he could not succeed, as mathematics let him down. I myself was always recognized, though quite kindly, as the slow one of the family. The reactions of my mother and my sister were unusually quick, I could never keep up. I was, too, very inarticulate. It was always difficult for me to assemble into words what I wanted to say. Agatha's so terribly slow, was. Always the cry. It was quite true, and I knew it and accepted it. It did not worry or distress me. I was resigned to being always the slow one. It was not until I was over 20 that I realized that my home standard had been unusually high and that actually I was quite as quick or quicker than the average. Inarticulate I shall always be. It is probably one of the causes that have made me a writer. The first real sorrow of my life was parting with Nershi. For some time one of her former Nazilings who had an estate in Somerset had been urging her to retire. He offered her a comfortable little cottage on his property where she and her sister could live out their days. Finally she made her decision. The time had come for her to quit work. I missed her terribly. Every day I wrote to her, a short badly written ill-spelt note, writing and spelling were always terribly difficult for me. My letters were without originality. They were practically always the same, darling Nershi. I miss you very much. I hope you are quite well. Tony has a flea. Lots and lots of love and kisses. From Agatha. My mother provided a stamp for these letters, but after a while she was moved to gentle protest. I don't think you need write every day. Twice a week, perhaps. I was appalled. But I think of her every day. I must write. She signed, but did not object. Nevertheless she continued gentle suggestion. It was some months before I cut down correspondence to the two letters a week suggested. Nershi herself was a poor hand with a pen, and in any case was too wise, I imagine, to encourage me in my obstinate fidelity. She wrote to me twice a month, gentle nondescript epistles. I think my mother was disturbed that I found her so hard to forget. She told me afterwards that she had discussed the matter with my father, who had replied with an unexpected twinkle, well, you remembered me very faithfully as a child when I went to America. My mother said that that was quite different. Did you think that I would come back and marry you one day when you were grown up, he asked. My mother said, no, indeed, then hesitated and admitted that she had had her daydream. It was a typically sentimental Victorian one. My father was to make a brilliant but unhappy marriage. Disillusioned, after his wife's death he returned to seek out his quiet cousin Clara. Alas, Clara, a helpless invalid, lay permanently on a sofa, and finally blessed him with her dying breath. She laughed as she told him, you see, she said, I thought I shouldn't look so. Dumpy lying on a sofa, with a pretty soft wool cover thrown over me. 
Early death and invalidism were as much the tradition of romance then as toughness seems to be nowadays. No young woman then, as far as I can judge, would ever own up to having rude health. Granny always told me with great complacence how delicate she had been as a child, never expected to live to maturity, a slight knock on the hand when playing and she fainted away. Granny B, on the other hand, said of her sister, Margaret was always perfectly strong. I was the delicate one. Auntie Granny lived to 92 and Granny B to 86, and personally I doubt if they were ever delicate at all. But extreme sensibility, constant fainting fits, and early consumption, a decline, were fashionable. Indeed, so imbued with this point of view was Granny that she frequently went out of her way to impart mysteriously to my various young men how terribly delicate and frail I was and how unlikely to reach old age. Often, when I was 18, one of my swains would say anxiously to me, are you sure you won't catch a chill? Your grandmother told me how delicate you are. Indignantly I would protest the rude health I had always enjoyed, and the anxious face would clear. But why does your grandmother say you're delicate? I had to explain that Granny was doing her loyal best to make me sound interesting. When she herself was young, Granny told me, young ladies were never able to manage more than a morsel of food at the dinner table if gentlemen were present. Substantial trays were taken up to bedrooms later. Illness and early death pervaded even children's books. A book called Our White Violet was a great favorite of mine. Little Violet, a saintly invalid on page one, died an edifying death surrounded by her weeping family on the last page. Tragedy was relieved by her two naughty brothers, Punny and Firkin, who never ceased getting themselves into mischief. Little Women, a cheerful tale on the whole, had to sacrifice rosy-faced Beth. The death of Little Nell in the old curiosity shop leaves me cold and slightly nauseated, but in Dickens's time, of course, whole families wept over its pathos. That article of household furniture, the sofa, or couch, is associated nowadays mainly with the psychiatrist, but in Victorian times it was the symbol of early death, decline, and romance with a capital R. I am inclined to the belief that the Victorian wife and mother cashed in on it pretty well. It excused her from much household drudgery. She often took to it in the early 40s and spent a pleasant life, waited on hand and foot, given affectionate consideration by her devoted husband and ungrudging service by her daughters. Friends flocked to visit her, and her patience and sweetness under affliction were admired by all. Was there really anything the matter with her? Probably not. No doubt her back ached and she suffered from her feet as most of us do as life goes on. The sofa was the answer. Another of my favorite books was about a little German girl, naturally an invalid, crippled, who lay all day looking out of the window. Her attendant, a selfish and pleasure-loving young woman, rushed out one day to view a procession. The invalid leaned out too far, fell and was killed. Haunting remorse of the pleasure-loving attendant, white-faced and grief-stricken for life. All these gloomy books I read with great satisfaction. And there were, of course, the Old Testament stories, in which I had reveled from an early age. Going to church was one of the highlights of the week. The parish church of Tor Mahan was the oldest church in Torquay. Torquay itself was a modern watering place, but Tor Mahan was the original hamlet. The old church was a small one, and it was decided that a second, bigger church was needed for the parish. This was built just about the time that I was born, and my father advanced a sum of money in my infant name so that I should be a founder. He explained this to me in due course and I felt very important. When can I go to church, had been my constant demand, and at last the great day came. I sat next to my father in a pew near the front and followed the service in his big prayer book. He had told me beforehand that I could go out before the sermon if I liked, and when the time came he whispered to me, would you like to go? I shook my head vigorously and so remained. He took my hand in his and I sat contentedly, trying hard not to fidget. I enjoyed church services on Sunday very much. At home previously there had been special storybooks only allowed to be read on Sundays, which made a treat of them, and books of Bible stories with which I was familiar. There is no doubt that the stories of the Old Testament are, from a child's point of view, rattling good yarns. They have that dramatic cause and effect which a child's mind demands, Joseph and his brethren, his coat of many colors, his rise to power in Egypt, and the dramatic finale of his forgiveness of the wicked brothers. Moses and the burning bush was another favorite. David and Goliath, too, has a surefire appeal. Only a year or two ago, standing on the mound at Nimrud, I watched the local bird scarier, an old Arab with his handful of stones and his sling, defending the crops from the hordes of predatory birds. 
Seeing his accuracy of aim and the deadliness of his weapon, I suddenly realized for the first time that it was Goliath against whom the dice were loaded. David was in a superior position from the start, the man with a long-distance weapon against the man who had none. Not so much the little fellow against the big one, as brains versus brawn. A good many interesting people came to our house during my young days. And it seems a pity that I do not remember any of them. All I recall about Henry James is my mother complaining that he always wanted a lump of sugar broken in two for his tea, and that it really was affectation, as a small knob would do quite as well Rudyard Kipling came, and again my only memory is a discussion between my mother and a friend as to why he had ever married Mrs. Kipling. My mother's friend ended by saying, I know the reason. They are the perfect complement to each other. Taking the word to be compliment I though it a very obscure remark, but as Nershi explained one day that to ask you to marry him was the highest compliment a gentleman could pay a lady, I began to see the point. Though I came down to tea parties, I remember, in white muslin and a yellow satin sash, hardly anyone at the parties remains in my mind. The people I imagined were always more real to me than the flesh and blood ones I met. I do remember a close friend of my mother's, a Miss Tower, mainly because I took endless pains to avoid her. She had black eyebrows and enormous white teeth, and I thought privately that she looked exactly like a wolf. She had a habit of pouncing on me, kissing me vehemently and exclaiming, I could eat you. I was always afraid she would. All through my life I have carefully abstained from rushing at children and kissing them unasked. Poor little things, what defense have they? Dear Miss Tower, so good, and kind and so fond of children, but with so little idea of their feelings. Lady McGregor was a social leader in Torquay, and she and I were unhappy, joking terms. When I was still in the perambulator she had accosted me one day and asked if I knew who she was. I said truthfully that I didn't. Tell your mama, she said, that you met Mrs. Snooks out today. As soon as she had gone, Nurshi took me to task. That's Lady McGregor, and you know her quite well. But thereafter I always greeted her as Mrs. Snooks and it was our own private joke. A cheerful soul was my godfather, Lord Lifford, then Captain Hewitt. He came to the house one day, and hearing Mr. and Mrs. Miller were out said cheerfully, Oh, that's all right. I'll come in and wait for them, and attempted to push past the parlor maid. The conscientious parlor maid slammed the door in his face and rushed upstairs to call to him from the conveniently situated lavatory window. He finally convinced her that he was a friend of the family principally because he said, And I know the window you're speaking from, it's the W.C. This proof of topography convinced her, and she let him in but retired convulsed with shame at his knowledge that it was the lavatory from which she had been speaking. We were very delicate about lavatories in those days. It was unthinkable to be seen entering or leaving one except by an intimate member of the family, difficult in our house, since the lavatory was halfway up the stairs and in full view from the hall. The worst, of course, was to be inside and then hear voices below. Impossible to come out. One had to stay immured there until the coast was clear. Of my own childish friends I do not remember much. There were Dorothy and Dulcie, younger than I was, stolid children with adenoids, whom I found dull. We had tea in the garden and ran races round a big ilex tree, eating Devonshire cream on tough cakes, the local bun. I cannot imagine why this pleased us. Their father, Mr. B, was my father's great crony. Soon after we came to live in Torquay, Mr. B told my father that he was going to be married. A wonderful woman, so he described her, and it frightens me, Joe, my father was always called Joe by his friends, it positively frightens me how that woman loves me. Shortly afterwards a friend of my mother's arrived to stay, seriously perturbed. Acting as companion to someone at a hotel in North Devon, she had come across a large, rather handsome young woman, who in a loud voice was conversing with a friend in the hotel lounge. I've landed my bird, Dora, she boomed triumphantly. Got him to the point at last, and he's eating out of my hand. Dora congratulated her, and marriage settlements were freely discussed. Then the name of Mr. B was mentioned as the duly landed bridegroom. A great consultation was held between my mother and father. What, if anything, was to be done about this? Could they let poor B be married for his money in this shameful way? Was it too late? Would he believe them if they told him what had been overheard? My father, at last, made his decision. B was not to be told anything. Tale telling was a mean business. And B was not an ignorant boy. He had chosen with his eyes open. Whether Mrs. B had married her husband for money or not, 
she made him an excellent wife, and they appeared to be as happy together as turtle doves. They had three children, were practically inseparable, and a better home life could not be found. Poor B eventually died of cancer of the tongue, and all through his long painful ordeal his wife nursed him devotedly. It was a lesson, my mother once said, in not thinking you know what's best for other people. When one went to lunch or tea with the BS the talk was entirely of food. Percival, my love, Mrs. B would boom, some more of this excellent mutton. Deliciously tender. As you say, Edith, my dear. Just one more slice. Let me pass you the caper. Sauce. Excellently made. Dorothy, my love, some more mutton. No, thank you, Papa. Dulcy? Just a small slice from the knuckle, so tender. No, thank you, Mama. I had one other friend called Margaret. She was what might be termed a semi-official friend. We did not visit each other's homes, Margaret's mother had bright orange hair and very pink cheeks, I suspect now that she was considered fast and that my father would not allow my mother to call, but we took walks together. Our nurses, I gathered, were friends. Margaret was a great talker and she used to cause me horrible embarrassment. She had just lost her front teeth and it made her conversation so indistinct that I could not take in what she said. I felt it would be unkind to say so, so I answered at random, growing more and more desperate. Finally Margaret offered to tell me a story. It was all about Thome Poithone Thweets, but what happened to them I shall never know. It went on incomprehensibly for a long time and Margaret ended up triumphantly with, Don't you think that the loverly that hurry? I agreed fervently. Do you think they really ought to? I felt questioning on the story would be too much for me to bear. I broke in with decision. I'll tell you a story now, Margaret. Margaret looked undecided. Evidently there was some naughty point in the poison sweets story that she wanted to discuss, but I was desperate. It's about a, a, peach stone, I improvised wildly. About a fairy who lived in a peach stone. Go on, said Margaret. I went on. I spun things out till Margaret's gate was in sight. That's a very nice story, said Margaret appreciatively. What fairy book does it come out of? It did not come out of any fairy book. It came out of my head. It was not, I think, a particularly good story. But it had saved me from the awful unkindness of reproaching Margaret for her missing teeth. I said that I could not quite remember which fairy book it was in. When I was five years old, my sister came back finished from Paris. I remember the excitement of seeing her alight at Ealing from a four-wheeler cab. She wore a gay little straw hat and a white veil with black spots on it, and appeared to me an entirely new person. She was very nice to her little sister and used to tell me stories. She also endeavored to cope with my education by teaching me French from a manual called Le Petit Preceptor. She was not, I think, a good teacher and I took a fervent dislike to the book. Twice I adroitly concealed it behind other books in the bookshelf, it was a very short time, however, before it came to light again. I saw that I had to do better. In a corner of the room was an enormous glass case containing a stuffed bald-headed eagle which was my father's pride and glory. I insinuated Le Petit Preceptor behind the eagle into the unseen corner of the room. This was highly successful. Several days passed and a thorough hunt failed to find the missing book. My mother, however, defeated my efforts with ease. She proclaimed a prize of a particularly delectable chocolate for whoever should find the book. My greed was my undoing. I fell into the trap, conducted an elaborate search round the room, finally climbed up on a chair, peered behind the eagle, and exclaimed in a surprised voice, Why, there it is. Retribution followed. I was reproved and sent to bed for the rest of the day. I accepted this as fair, since I had been found out, but I considered it unjust that I was not given the chocolate. That had been promised to whoever found the book, and I had found it. My sister had a game which both fascinated and terrified me. This was, the elder sister. The thesis was that in our family was an elder sister, senior to my sister and myself. She was met and lived in a cave at Corbin's head, but sometimes she came to the house. She was indistinguishable in appearance from my sister, except for her voice, which was quite different. It was a frightening voice, a soft oily voice. You know who I am don't you, dear? I'm your sister Madge. You don't think I'm anyone else, do you? You wouldn't think that. I used to feel indescribable terror. Of course I knew really it was only Madge pretending, but was it? Wasn't it perhaps true? That voice, those crafty sideways glancing eyes. It was the elder sister. 
My mother used to get angry. I won't have you frightening the child with this silly game, Madge. Madge would reply reasonably enough, but she asks me to do it. I did. I would say to her, will the elder sister be coming soon? I don't know. Do you want her to come? Yes, yes, I do. Did I really? I suppose so. My demand was never satisfied at once. Perhaps two days later there would be a knock at the nursery door, and the voice. Can I come in, dear? It's your elder sister. Many years later, Madge had still only to use the elder sister voice and I would feel chills down my spine. Why did I like being frightened? What instinctive need is satisfied by terror? Why, indeed, do children like stories about bears, wolves, and witches? Is it because something rebels in one against the life that is too safe? Is a certain amount of danger in life a need of human beings? Is much of the juvenile delinquency nowadays attributable to the fact of too much security? Do you instinctively need something to combat, to overcome, to, as it were, prove yourself to yourself? Take away the wolf from Red Riding Hood and would any child enjoy it? However, like most things in life, you want to be frightened a little, but not too much. My sister must have had a great gift for storytelling. At an early age her brother would urge her on. Tell it me again. I don't want to. Do, do. No, I don't want to. Please. I'll do anything. Will you let me bite your finger? Yes. I shall bite it hard. Perhaps I shall bite it right off. I don't mind. Madge obligingly launches into the story once more. Then she picks up his finger and bites it. Now Monty yells. Mother arrives. Madge is punished. But it was a bargain, she says, unrepentant. I remember well my first written story. It was in the nature of a melodrama, very short, since both writing and spelling were a pain to me. It concerned the noble lady Madge, good, and the bloody lady Agatha, bad, and a plot that involved the inheritance of a castle. I showed it to my sister and suggested we could act it. My sister said immediately that she would rather be the bloody lady Madge and I could be the noble lady Agatha. But don't you want to be the good one? I demanded, shocked. My sister said no, she thought it would be much more fun to be wicked. I was pleased, as it had been solely politeness which had led me to ascribe nobility to Lady Madge. My father, I remember, laughed a good deal at my effort, but in a kindly way, and my mother said that perhaps I had better not use the word bloody as it was not a very nice word. But she was bloody, I explained. She killed a lot of people. She was like Bloody Mary, who burned people at the stake. Fairy books played a great part in life. Granny gave them to me for birthdays and Christmas. The yellow fairy book, the blue fairy book, and so on. I loved them all and read them again and again. Then there was a collection of animal stories, also by Andrew Lang, including one about Androcles and the lion. I loved that too. It must have been about then that I first embarked on a course of Mrs. Molesworth, the leading writer of stories for children. They lasted me for many years, and I think, on rereading them now, that they are very good. Of course children would find them old-fashioned nowadays, but they tell a good story and there is a lot of characterization in them. There was Carrots, just a little boy, and Hair Baby for very young children, and various fairy story tales. I can still reread The Cuckoo Clock and The Tapestry Room. My favorite of all, Four Winds Farm, I find uninteresting now and wonder why I loved it so much. Reading storybooks was considered slightly too pleasurable to be really virtuous. No storybooks until after lunch. In the mornings you were supposed to find something useful to do. Even to this day, if I sit down and read a novel after breakfast I have a feeling of guilt. The same applies to cards on a Sunday. I outgrew Nershi's condemnation of cards as, the devil's picture books, but, no cards on Sundays was a rule of the house, and in after years when playing bridge on a Sunday I never quite threw off a feeling of wickedness. At some period before Nershi left, my mother and father went to America and were away some time. Nershi and I went to Ealing. I must have been several months there, fitting in very happily. The pillar of Granny's establishment was an old, wrinkled cook, Hannah. She was as thin as Jane was fat, a bag of bones with deeply lined face and stooped shoulders. She cooked magnificently. She also made home-baked bread three times a week, and I was allowed in the kitchen to assist and make my own little cottage loaves and twists. I only fell foul of her once, when I asked her what giblets were. Apparently giblets were things nicely brought up young ladies did not ask about. 
I tried to tease her by running to and fro in the kitchen saying, Hannah, what are giblets? Hannah, for the third time, what are giblets, etc. I was removed by Nershi in the end and reproved, and Hannah would not speak to me for two days. After that I was much more careful how I transgressed her rules. Sometime during my stay at Ealing I must have been taken to the Diamond Jubilee for I came across a letter not long ago written from America by my father. It is couched in the style of the day, which was singularly unlike my father's spoken words, letter writing fell into a definite and sanctimonious pattern, whereas my father's speech was usually jolly and slightly ribald. You must be very very good to dear Auntie Granny, Agatha, because remember how very very good she has been to you, and the treats she gives you. I hear you are going to see this wonderful show which you will never forget, it is a thing to be seen only once in a lifetime. You must tell her how very grateful you are, how wonderful it is for you, I wish I could be there, and so does your mother. I know you will never forget it. My father lacked the gift of prophecy, because I have forgotten it. How maddening children are. When I look back to the past, what do I remember? Silly little things about local sewing women, the bread twists I made in the kitchen, the smell of Colonel F.S. breath, and what do I forget? A spectacle that somebody paid a great deal of money for me to see and remember. I feel very angry with myself. What a horrible, ungrateful child. That reminds me of what I think was a coincidence so amazing that one is so inclined to say it could never have happened. The occasion must have been Queen Victoria's funeral. Both Auntie Granny and Granny B were going to see it. They had procured a window in a house somewhere near Paddington, and they were to meet each other there on the great day. At five in the morning, so as not to be late, Granny rose in her house at Ealing, and in due course got to Paddington Station. That would give her, she calculated, a good three hours to get to her vantage point, and she had with her some fancy work, some food and other necessities to pass the hours of waiting once she arrived there. Alas, the time she had allowed herself was not enough. The streets were crammed. Some time after leaving Paddington Station she was quite unable to make further headway. Two ambulance men rescued her from the crowd, and assured her that she couldn't go on. I must, but I must, cried Granny, tears streaming down her face. I've got my room, I've got my seat, the two first seats in the second window on the second floor, so that I can look down and see everything. I must. It's impossible, ma'am, the streets are jammed, nobody has been able to get through for half an hour. Granny wept more. The ambulance man kindly said, You can't see anything, I am afraid, ma'am, but I'll take you down this street to where our ambulance is and you can sit there, and they will make you a nice cup of tea. Granny went with them, still weeping. By the ambulance was sitting a figure not unlike herself, also weeping, a monumental figure in black velvet and bugles. The other figure looked up, two wild cries rent the air, Mary. Margaret. Two gigantic bugle-shaking bosoms met. Fifth. Thinking over what gave me most pleasure in my childhood I should be inclined to place first and foremost, my hoop. A simple affair, in all conscience, costing how much? Sixpence. A shilling? Certainly not more. And what an inestimable boon to parents, nurses, and servants. On fine days. Agatha goes out into the garden with her hoop and is no more trouble to anyone until the hour for a meal arrives, or, more accurately, until hunger makes itself felt. My hoop was to me in turn a horse, a sea monster, and a railway train. Beating my hoop round the garden paths, I was a knight in armor on a quest, a lady of the court exercising my white palfrey, clover, of the kittens, escaping from imprisonment, or, less romantically, I was engine driver, guard, or passenger, on three railways of my own devising. There were three distinct systems, the tubular railway, with eight stations encircling three quarters of the garden, the tub railway, a short line, serving the kitchen garden only and starting from a large tub of water with a tap under a pine tree, and the terrace railway, which encircled the house. Only a short while ago I came across in an old cupboard a sheet of cardboard on which sixty odd years before I had drawn a rough plan of all these railways. I cannot conceive now why I so enjoyed beating my hoop along, stopping, calling out lily of the valley bed. Change for the tubular railway here. Tub. Terminus. All change. I did it for hours. It must have been very good exercise. I also practiced diligently the art of throwing my hoop so that it returned to me, a trick in which I had been instructed by one of our visiting naval officer friends. I could not do it at all at first, 
but by long and arduous practice I got the hang of it, and was thereafter immensely pleased with myself. On wet days there was Matilde. Matilde was a large American rocking horse which had been given to my sister and brother when they were children in America. It had been brought back to England and now, a battered wreck of its former self, sans mane, sans paint, sans tail, etc., was ensconced in a small greenhouse which adjoined the house on one side, quite distinct from the conservatory, a grandiloquent erection, containing pots of begonias, geraniums, tiered stands of every kind of fern, and several large palm trees. This small greenhouse, called, I don't know why, KK, or possibly Kai Kai, was bereft of plants and housed instead croquet mallets, hoops, balls, broken garden chairs, old painted iron tables, a decayed tennis net and Matilde. Matilde had a splendid action, much better than that of any English rocking horse I have ever known. She sprang forwards and back, upwards and down, and ridden at full pressure was liable to unseat you. Her springs, which needed oiling, made a terrific groaning, and added to the pleasure and danger. Splendid exercise again. No wonder I was a skinny child. As companion to Matilde and Kai Kai was true love, also of transatlantic origin. True love was a small painted horse and cart with pedals. Presumably from long years of disuse, the pedals were no longer workable. Large. Applications of oil might have done the trick, but there was an easier way of making true love serviceable. Like all gardens in Devon, our garden was on a slope. My method was to pull true love to the top of a long grassy slope, settle myself carefully, utter an encouraging sound, and off we went, slowly at first, gathering momentum whilst I braked with my feet so that we came to rest under the monkey puzzle at the bottom of the garden. Then I would pull true love back up to the top and start down once more. I discovered in later years that it had been a great source of amusement to my future brother-in-law to see this process enacted, for sometimes an hour at a time, always in perfect solemnity. When Nershi left I was, naturally, at a loss for a playmate. I wandered disconsolately about until the hoop solved my problem. Like all children I went round trying to induce people to play with me, first my mother, then the servants. But in those days, if there was no one whose business it was to play with children then the child had to play by itself. The servants were good-natured, but they had their work to do, plenty of it, and so it would be, now run away, Miss Agatha. I've got to get on with what I'm doing. Jane was usually good for a handful of sultanas, or a slice of cheese, but suggested firmly that these should be consumed in the garden. So it was that I made my own world and my own playmates. I really do think that it was a good thing. I have never, all through my life, suffered from the tedium of, nothing to do. An enormous number of women do. They suffer from loneliness and boredom. To have time on their hands is a nightmare and not a delight. If things are constantly being done to amuse you, naturally you expect it. And when nothing is done for you, you are at a loss. I suppose it is because nearly all children go to school nowadays, and have things arranged for them that they seem so forlornly unable to produce their own ideas in holiday time. I am always astonished when children come to me and say, please. I've nothing to do. With an air of desperation I point out. But you've got a lot of toys, haven't you? Not really. But you've got two trains. And lorries, and a painting set. And blocks. Can't you play with some of them? But I can't play by myself with them. Why not? I know. Paint a picture of a bird, then cut it out and make a cage with the blocks, and put the bird in the cage. The gloom brightens and there is peace for nearly ten minutes. Looking back over the past, I become increasingly sure of one thing. My tastes have remained fundamentally the same. What I liked playing with as a child, I have liked playing with later in life. Houses, for instance. I had, I suppose, a reasonable amount of toys, a doll's bed with real sheets and blankets and the family building bricks handed down by my elder sister and brother. Many of my playthings were extemporized. I cut pictures out of old illustrated magazines and pasted them into scrapbooks made of brown paper. Odd rolls of wallpaper were cut and pasted over boxes. It was all a long, leisurely process. But my principal source of indoor amusement was undoubtedly my doll's house. It was the usual type of painted affair, with a front that swung open, revealing kitchen, sitting room and hall downstairs, two bedrooms and bathroom upstairs. That is, it began that way. The furniture was acquired, piece by piece. There was an enormous range of dolls' furniture in the shops then, quite cheap in price. My pocket money was, for those days, rather large. 
It consisted of what Copper Coin's father happened to have in his possession every morning. I would visit him in his dressing room, say good morning, and then turn to the dressing table to see what fate had decreed for me on that particular day. Tuppence? Five pence? Once a whole eleven pence. Some days, no coppers at all. The uncertainty made it rather exciting. My purchases were always much the same. Some sweets, boiled sweets, the only kind my mother considered healthy, purchased from Mr. Wiley who had a shop in Tor. The sweets were made on the premises, and as you came in through the shop door you knew at once what was being made that day. The rich smell of boiling toffee, the sharp odor of peppermint rock, the elusive smell of pineapple, barley sugar, dull, which practically didn't smell at all, and the almost overpowering odor when pear drops were in process of manufacture. Everything cost eight pence a pound. I spent about four pence a week, one penny worth of four different kinds. Then there was a penny to be donated for the waifs and strays, money box on the hall table, from September onwards a few pence were salted away to save up for such Christmas presents as would be bought, not made. The rest went towards the furnishing and equipping of my doll's house. I can still remember the enchantment of the things there were to buy. Food, for instance. Little cardboard platters of roast chicken, eggs and bacon, a wedding cake, a leg of lamb, apples and oranges, fish, trifle, plum pudding. There were plate baskets with knives, forks, and spoons. There were tiny sets of glasses. Then there was the furniture proper. My drawing room had a suite of blue satin chairs, to which I added by degrees a sofa and a rather grand gilded armchair. There were dressing tables with mirrors, round polished dinner tables, and a hideous orange brocade dining room suite. There were lamps and aprons and bowls of flowers. Then there were all the household implements, brushes and dust pans, brooms and pails and kitchen saucepans. Soon my doll's house looked more like a furniture storehouse. Could I, could I, possibly, have another doll's house? Mother did not think that any little girl ought to have two doll's houses. But why not, she suggested, inspired, use a cupboard. So I acquired a cupboard, and it was a wild success. A big room at the top of the house, originally built on by my father to provide two extra bedrooms, was so much enjoyed in its bare state by my sister and brother as a playroom that that is what it remained. The walls were more or less lined with books and cupboards, the center conveniently free and empty. I was allotted a cupboard with four shelves, part of a built-in fitment against the wall. My mother found various nice pieces of wallpaper which could be pasted on the shelves as carpets. The original doll's house stood on top of the cupboard, so that I now had a six-storied house. My house, of course, needed a family to live in it. I acquired a father and mother, two children, and a maid, the kind of doll that has a china head and bust and malleable sawdust limbs. Mother sewed some clothes on them, from odd bits of stuff she had. She even fixed with glue a small black beard and mustache to the face of the father. Father, mother, two children, and a maid. It was perfect. I don't remember their having any particular personalities, they never became people to me, they existed only to occupy the house. But it really looked right when you sat the family round the dinner table. Plates, glasses, roast chicken, and a rather peculiar pink pudding were served at the first meal. An additional enjoyment was house moving. A stout cardboard box was the furniture van. The furniture was loaded into it, it was drawn round the room by a string several times, and then, arrived at the new house. This happened at least once a week. I can see quite plainly now that I have continued to play houses ever since. I have gone over innumerable houses, bought houses, exchanged them for other houses, furnished houses, decorated houses, made structural alterations to houses. Houses. God bless houses. But to go back to memories. What odd things really, when one collects them all together, one does remember out of one's life. One remembers happy occasions, one remembers, very vividly, I think, fear. Oddly enough pain and unhappiness are hard to recapture. I do not mean exactly that I do not remember them, I can, but without feeling them. Where they are concerned I am in the first stage. I say, there was Agatha being terribly unhappy. There was Agatha having toothache. But I don't feel the unhappiness or the toothache. On the other hand, one day the sudden smell of lime trees brings the past back, and suddenly I remember a day spent near the lime trees, the pleasure with which I threw myself down on the ground, the smell of hot grass, and the suddenly lovely feeling of summer, a cedar tree nearby and the river beyond, the feeling of being at one with life. 
it comes back in that moment. Not only a remembered thing of the mind but the feeling itself as well. I remember vividly a field of buttercups. I must have been under five, since I walked there with Nershi. It was when we were at Ealing, staying with Auntie Granny. We went up a hill, past St. Stephen's Church. It was then nothing but fields, and we came to one special field, crammed with golden buttercups. We went to it, that I do know, quite often. I don't know if my memory of it is of the first time we went there or a later occasion, but the loveliness of it I do remember and feel. It seems to me that for many years now I have never seen a field of buttercups. I have seen a few buttercups in a field, but that is all. A great field full of golden buttercups in early summer is something indeed. I had it then, I have it with me now. What has one enjoyed most in life? I dare say it varies with different people. For my own part, remembering and reflecting, it seems that it is almost always the quiet moments of everyday life. Those are the times, certainly, when I have been happiest. Adorning Nershi's old grey head with blue bows, playing with Tony, making a parting with a comb down his broad back, galloping on what I feel to be real horses across the river my fancy has set in the garden. Following my hoop through the stations of the tubular railway. Happy games with my mother. My mother, later, reading Dickens to me, gradually getting sleepy, her spectacles half falling off her nose and her head dropping forward, and myself saying in an agonist voice. Mother, you're going to sleep, to which my mother with great dignity replies, nothing of the kind, darling. I am not in the least sleepy. A few minutes later she would be asleep. I remember feeling how ridiculous she looked with her spectacles slipping off her nose and how much I loved her at that moment. It is a curious thought, but it is only when you see people looking ridiculous, that you realize just how much you love them. Anyone can admire somebody for being handsome or amusing or charming, but that bubble is soon pricked when a trace of ridicule comes in. I should give as my advice to any girl about to get married, well now, just imagine he had a terrible cold in his head, speaking through his nose all full of B's and D's, sneezing, eyes watering. What would you feel about him? It's a good test, really. What one needs to feel for a husband, I think, is the love that is tenderness, that comprises affection, that will take colds in the head and little mannerisms all in its stride. Passion one can take for granted. But marriage means more than a lover, I take an old-fashioned view that respect is necessary. Respect, which is not to be confused with admiration. To feel admiration for a man all through one's married life would, I think, be excessively tedious. You would get, as it were, a mental crick in the neck. But respect is a thing that you don't have to think about that you know thankfully is there. As the old Irish woman said of her husband, himself is a good head to me. That, I think, is what a woman needs. She wants to feel that in her mate there is integrity, that she can depend on him and respect his judgment, and that when there is a difficult decision to be made it can safely lie in his hands. It is curious to look back over life, over all the varying incidents and scenes such a multitude of odds and ends. Out of them all what has mattered? What lies behind the selection that memory has made? What makes us choose the things that we have remembered? It is as though one went to a great trunk full of junk in an attic and plunged one's hands into it and said, I will have this, and this and this. Ask three or four different people what they remember, say of a journey abroad and you will be surprised at the different answers you get. I remember a boy of fifteen, a son of friends of ours, who was taken to Paris as part of his spring holidays. When he returned, some fatuous friend of the family said, with the usual jovial accent inflicted on the young, well, my boy, and what impressed you most in Paris? What do you remember about it? He replied immediately, the chimneys. The chimneys there are quite different from chimneys on houses in England. From his point of view it was a perfectly sensible remark. Some years later he started studying as an artist. It was, therefore, a visual detail that really impressed him, that made Paris different from London. So, too, another memory. This was when my brother was invalid home from East Africa. He brought with him a native servant, Shabani. Anxious to show this simple African the glories of London, my brother hired a car and, sitting in it with Shabani, drove all round London. He displayed to him Westminster Abbey, Buckingham Palace, the Houses of Parliament, the Guildhall, Hyde Park, and so on. Finally, when they had arrived home, he said to Shabani, what did you think of London? Shabani rolled his eyes up. It is wonderful, Dwana, a wonderful place. Never did I think I would see anything like it. 
My brother nodded a satisfied head. And what impressed you most, he said. The answer came without a moment's thought. Oh, Dwana, shops full of meat. Such wonderful shops. Meat hanging in great joints all over and nobody steals them, nobody rushes and pushes their way there and snatches. No, they pass by them in an orderly fashion. How rich, how great a country must be to have all this meat hanging in shops open to the streets. Yes, indeed, England is a wonderful place. London a wonderful city. Point of view. The point of view of a child. We all knew it once but we've traveled so far away from it that it's difficult to get back there again. I remember seeing my own grandson Matthew when he must have been, I suppose, about two and a half. He did not know I was there. I was watching him from the top of the stairs. He walked very carefully down the stairs. It was a new achievement and he was proud of it, but still somewhat scared. He was muttering to himself, saying, this is Matthew going downstairs. This is Matthew. Matthew is going downstairs. This is Matthew going downstairs. I wonder if we all start life thinking of ourselves, as soon as we can think of ourselves at all, as a separate person, as it were, from the one observing. Did I say to myself once, this is Agatha and her party sash going down to the dining room. It is as though the body in which we have found our spirit lodged is at first strange to us. An entity, we know its name, we are on terms with it, but are not as yet identified fully with it. We are Agatha going for a walk, Matthew going downstairs. We see ourselves rather than feel ourselves. And then one day the next stage of life happens. Suddenly it is no longer, this is Matthew going downstairs. Suddenly it has become I am going downstairs. The achievement of I is the first step in the progress of a personal life. Part 2. Girls and boys come out to play. First. Until one looks back on one's own past one fails to realize what an extraordinary view of the world a child has. The angle of vision is entirely different to that of the adult, everything is out of proportion. Children can make a shrewd appraisal of what is going on around them, and have a quite good judgment of character and people. But the how and the why of things never seems to occur to them. It must have been when I was about five years old that my father first became worried about financial affairs. He had been a rich man's son and had taken it for granted that an assured income would always come in. My grandfather had set up a complicated series of trusts to come into effect when he died. There had been four trustees. One was very old and had, I think, retired from any active connection with the business, another shortly went into a mental asylum, and the other two, both men of his own age, died shortly afterwards. In one case the son took on. Whether it was sheer inefficiency or whether in the course of replacement somebody managed to convert things to his own use I do not know. At any rate the position seemed to get worse and worse. My father was bewildered and depressed, but not being a businesslike man he did not know what to do about it. He wrote to dear old so-and-so and dear old somebody else, and they wrote back, either reassuring him or laying the blame on the state of the market, depreciation, and other things. A legacy from an elderly aunt came in about this time and, I should imagine, tied him over a year or two, whilst the income that was due and should have been paid to him never seemed to arrive. It was at about this time, too, that his health began to give way. On several occasions he suffered what were supposed to be heart attacks, a vague term that covered almost everything. The financial worry must, I think, have affected his health. The immediate remedy seemed to be that we must economize. The recognized way at that particular time was to go and live abroad for a short while. This was not, as nowadays, because of income tax, income tax was, I should imagine, about a shilling in the pound, but the cost of living was much less abroad. So the procedure was to let the house with the servants, etc., at a good rent, and go abroad to the south of France, staying at a fairly economical hotel. Such a migration happened, as far as I remember, when I was six years old. Ashfield was duly let, I think to Americans, who paid a good price for it, and the family prepared to set off. We were going to Pau in the south of France. I was, of course, very much excited by this prospect. We were going, so my mother told me, where we should see mountains. I asked many questions about these. Were they very, very high? Higher than the steeple of St. Mary Church? I asked with great interest. It was the highest thing I knew. Yes, mountains were much, much higher than that. They went up for hundreds of feet, thousands of feet. I retired to the garden with Tony, 
and munching an enormous crust of dry bread obtained from Jane in the kitchen set to work to think this out, to try to visualize mountains. My head went back, my eyes stared up at the skies. That was how mountains would look, going up, 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 up until lost in the clouds. It was an awe-inspiring thought. Mother loved mountains. She had never cared for the sea, she told us. Mountains, I felt sure, were to be one of the greatest things in my life. One said thing about going abroad was that it meant a parting between me and Tony. Tony was not, of course, being let with the house, he was being boarded out with a former parlor maid called Frouty. Frouty, who was married to a carpenter and lived not far away, was quite prepared to have Tony. I kissed him all over and Tony responded by licking me frantically all over my face, neck, arms, and hands. Looking back now, the conditions of travel abroad then seem extraordinary. There were, of course, no passports or any forms to fill in. You bought tickets, made sleeping car reservations, and that was all that had to be done. Simplicity itself. But the packing. Only capital letters would explain what packing meant. I don't know what the luggage of the rest of the family consisted of, I do have a fair memory of what my mother took with her. There were, to begin with, three round top trunks. The largest stood about four feet high and had two trays inside. There were also hat boxes, large square leather cases, three trunks of the type called cabin trunks and trunks of American manufacture which were often to be seen at that time in the corridors of hotels. They were large, and I should imagine excessively heavy. For a week at least before departure my mother was surrounded by her trunks in her bedroom. Since we were not well off by the standards of the day, we did not have a lady's maid. My mother did the packing herself. The preliminary to it was what was called sorting. The large wardrobes and chests of drawers stood open while my mother sorted amongst such things as artificial flowers, and an array of odds and ends called, my ribbons and, my jewelry. All these apparently required hours of sorting before they were packed in the trays in the various trunks. Jewelry did not, as nowadays, consist of a few pieces of, real jewelry, and large quantities of costume jewelry. Imitation jewelry was frowned on as bad taste, except for an occasional brooch of old paste. My mother's valuable jewelry consisted of, my diamond buckle, my diamond crescent and my diamond engagement ring. The rest of her ornaments were real but comparatively inexpensive. Nevertheless they were all of intense interest to all of us. There was, my Indian necklace, my Florentine set, my Venetian necklace, my cameos and so on. And there were six brooches in which both my sister and myself took a personal and vivid interest. These were, the fishes, five small fish in diamonds, the mistletoe, a tiny diamond and pearl brooch, my parma violet, an enamel brooch representing a parma violet, my dog rosé, also a flower brooch, a pink enameled rose with clusters of diamond leaves round it, and, my donkey, prime favorite, which was a baroque pearl mounted in diamonds as a donkey's head. They were all earmarked for the future on my mother's demise. Madge was to have the parma violet, her favorite flower, the diamond crescent and the donkey. I was to have the rose, the diamond buckle and the mistletoe. This earmarking of possessions for the future was freely indulged in by my family. It conjured up no sad feelings about death, but merely a warm appreciation of the benefits to come. At Ashfield the whole house was crowded with oil paintings bought by my father. To crowd oil paintings as closely as you could on your walls was the fashion of the day. One was marked down for me, a large painting of the sea, with a simpering young woman catching a boy in a net in it. It was my highest idea of beauty as a child, and it is said to reflect how poorly I thought of it when the time came for me to sort out pictures to sell. Even for sentiment's sake I have not kept any of them. I am forced to consider that my father's taste in pictures was consistently bad. On the other hand every piece of furniture he ever bought is a gem. He had a passion for antique furniture, and the Sheraton desks and Chippendale chairs that he bought, often at a very low figure since at that time bamboo was all the rage, are a joy to live with and possess, and appreciated so much in value that my mother was able to keep the wolf from the door after my father died by selling a good many of the best pieces. He, my mother and my grandmother all had a passion for collecting china. When granny came to live with us later she brought her collection of Dresden. And Capo de Monte with her, and innumerable cupboards were filled with it at Ashfield. In fact, fresh cupboards had to be built to accommodate it. There is no doubt that we were a family of collectors and that I have inherited these attributes. The only sad thing is that if you inherit a good collection of china and furniture it leaves you no excuse for starting a collection of your own.
The collector's passion, however, has to be satisfied, and in my case I have accumulated quite a nice stock of papier-mâché furniture and small objects which had not figured in my parents' collections. When the day came I was so excited that I felt quite sick and completely silent. When really thrilled by anything, it always seems to deprive me of the powers of speech. My first clear memory of going abroad was when we stepped onto the boat at Folkestone. My mother and Madge took the channel crossing with the utmost seriousness. They were bad sailors and retired immediately to the ladies' saloon to lay themselves down, close their eyes and hope to get across the intervening water to France without the worst happening. In spite of my experience in small dinghies I was convinced that I was a good sailor. My father encouraged me in this belief, so I remained on deck with him. It was, I imagine, a perfectly smooth crossing, but I gave the credit not to the sea but to my own power of withstanding its motion. We arrived at Boulogne and I was glad to hear father announce, Agatha is a perfectly good sailor. The next excitement was going to bed in the train. I shared a compartment with my mother and was hoisted up onto the top bunk. My mother always had a passion for fresh air, and the steam heat of the wagon lit's carriages was agony to her. All that night it seemed to me I woke up to see mother with the window pushed down and her head out, breathing great gasps of night air. Early the next morning we arrived at Pau. The Hotel Beausajour bus was waiting so we piled into it, our 18 pieces of luggage coming separately, and in due course arrived at the hotel. It had a large terrace outside it facing the Pyrenees. There, said father. See? There are the Pyrenees. The snow mountains. I looked. It was one of the great disillusionments of my life, a disillusionment that I have never forgotten. Where was that soaring height going up, up, up into the sky, far above my head, something beyond contemplation or understanding? Instead, I saw, some distance away on the horizon, what looked like a row of teeth standing up, it seemed, about an inch or two from the plain below. Those? Were those mountains? I said nothing, but even now I can still feel that terrible disappointment. Second. We must have spent about six months at Pau. It was an entirely new life for me. My father and mother and Madge were soon caught up in a whirl of activity. Father had several American friends staying there, he made a lot of hotel acquaintances, and we also had brought letters of introduction to people in various hotels and pensions. To look after me, mother engaged a kind of daily nursery governess, actually an English girl, but one who had lived in Pau all her life and who spoke French as easily as English, if not, in fact, rather better. The idea was that I should learn French from her. This plan did not turn out as expected. Miss Markham called for me every morning and took me for a walk. In its course she drew my attention to various objects and repeated their names in French. Un chien. Un maison. Un gendarme. Elie Boulanger. I repeated these dutifully, but naturally when I had a question to ask I asked it in English and Miss Markham replied in English. As far as I can remember I was rather bored during my day, interminable walks in the company of Miss Markham, who was nice, kind, conscientious, and dull. My mother soon decided that I should never learn French with Miss Markham, and that I must have regular French lessons from a French woman who would come every afternoon. The new acquisition was called Mademoiselle Mahouret. She was large, buxom, and dressed in a multiplicity of little capes, brown in color. All rooms of that period were overcrowded, of course. There was too much furniture in them, too many ornaments and so on. MLLE Mahouré was a flouncer. She flounced about the room, jerking her shoulders, gesticulating with her hands and elbows, and sooner or later she invariably knocked an ornament off the table and broke it. It became quite a family joke. Father said, she reminds me of that bird you had, Agatha. Daphne. Always big and awkward and knocking her seed pans over. MLLE Mahouré was particularly full of gush, and gush made me feel shy. I found it increasingly difficult to respond to her little cooing squeals of, oh, la chère mignonne. Quel est gentil, said petit. Oh, la chère mignonne. New salons prendre de lefons trace amusants, n'est ce pas. I looked at her politely but with a cold eye. Then, receiving a firm look from my mother, I muttered unconvincingly, oui, merci, which was about the limit of my French at that time. The French lessons went on amiably. I was docile as usual, but apparently boneheaded as well. Mother, who liked quick results, was dissatisfied with my progress. She's not getting on as she should, Fred, she complained to my father. My father, always amiable, said, oh, give her time, Clara, give her time. 
the woman's only been here ten days. But my mother was not one to give anybody time. The climax came when I had a slight childish illness. It started, I suppose, with local flu and led to catarrhal trouble. I was feverish, out of sorts, and in this convalescent stage with still a slight temperature I could not stand the sight of MLLE Mahure. Please, I would beg, please don't let me have a lesson this afternoon. I don't want to. Mother was always kind enough when there was real cause. She agreed. In due course MLLE Mahure, capes, and all, arrived. My mother explained that I had a temperature, was staying indoors, and perhaps it would be better not to have a lesson that day. MLLE Mahure was off at once, fluttering over me, jerking her elbows, waving her capes, breathing down my neck. Oh, la pauvre mignon, la pauvre petite mignon. She would read to me, she said. She would tell me stories. She would amuse, la pauvre petite. I cast the most agonizing glances at mother. I couldn't bear it. I couldn't bear another moment of it. MLLE Mahure's voice went on, high-pitched, squeaky everything I most disliked in a voice. My eyes implored, take her away. Please take her away. Firmly, my mother drew MLLE Mahure towards the door. I think Agatha had better be kept quite quiet this afternoon, she said. She ushered MLLE Mahure out, then she returned and shook her head at me. It's all very well, she said, but you must not make such terrible faces. Faces? I said. Yes. All that grimacing and looking at me. MLLE Mahure could see perfectly that you wanted her to go away. I was upset. I had not meant to be impolite. But, mummy, I said, those weren't French faces that I was making. They were English faces. My mother was much amused, and explained to me that making faces was a kind of international language which was understood by people of all countries. However, she told my father that MLLE Mahure was not being much of a success and she was going to look elsewhere. My father said it would be just as well if we did not lose too many more china ornaments. He added, if I were in Agatha's place, I should find that woman insupportable, just as she does. Freed from the ministrations of Miss Markham and MLLE Mahure, I began. To enjoy myself. Staying in the hotel was Mrs. Selwyn, the widow, or perhaps the daughter-in-law of Bishop Selwyn, and her two daughters, Dorothy and Mary. Dorothy, D.A.R., was a year older than I was, Mary a year younger. Pretty soon we were inseparable. Left to myself I was a good, well-behaved, and obedient child, but in company with other children I was only too ready to engage in any mischief that was going. In particular we three plagued the life out of the unfortunate waiters in the table d'hote. One evening we changed the salt to sugar in all of the salt cellars. Another day we cut pigs out of orange peel and placed them on everyone's plate just before the table d'hote bell was rung. Those French waiters were the kindliest men I'm ever likely to know. In particular there was Victor, our own waiter. He was a short square man with a long jerking nose. He smelled to my mind, quite horribly, my first acquaintance with garlic. In spite of all the tricks that we played upon him, he seemed to bear no malice and, indeed, went out of his way to be kindly to us. In particular, he used to carve us the most glorious mice out of radishes. If we never got into serious trouble for what we did, it was because the loyal victor never complained to the management or to our parents. My friendship with D.A.R. and Mary meant far more to me than any of my former friendships. Possibly I was now of an age when cooperative enterprise was more exciting than doing things alone. We got up to plenty of mischief together and enjoyed ourselves thoroughly all through those winter months. Of course we often got into trouble through our pranks, but on only one occasion did we really feel righteous indignation at the censure that fell upon us. My mother and Mrs. Selwyn were sitting together happily talking when a message was brought by the chambermaid. With the compliments of the Belgian lady who lived in the other block of the hotel. Did Mrs. Selwyn and Mrs. Miller know that their children were walking round the fourth floor parapet? Imagine the sensation of the two mothers as they stepped out into the courtyard, looked up and caught sight of three cheerful figures balancing themselves on a parapet about a foot in width and walking along it in single file. The idea that there was any danger attached to it never entered our heads. We had gone a little far in teasing one of the chambermaids and she had managed to inveigle us into a broom cupboard and then shut the door on us from outside, triumphantly turning the key in the lock. Our indignation was great. What could we do? There was a tiny window and sticking her head out of it D.A.R. said she thought possibly that we could wriggle through and then walk along the parapet, round the corner and get in at one of the windows along there. No sooner said than done. 
D.A.R. squeezed through first, I followed, and then Mary. To our delight. We found it was quite easy to walk along the parapet. Whether we looked down the four stories below I don't know, but I don't suppose, even if we had, that we would have felt giddy or been likely to fall. I've always been appalled by the way children can stand on the edge of a cliff, looking down with their toes over the edge, with no sense of vertigo or other grown-up complaints. In this case we had not to go far. The first three windows, as I remember, were shut, but the next one, which led into one of the public bathrooms, was open, and we had gone in through this to be met to our surprise with the demand, come down at once to Mrs. Selwyn's sitting room. Both mothers were excessively angry. We could not see why. We were all banished to bed for the rest of the day. Our defense was simply not accepted. And yet it was the truth. But you never told us, we said, each in turn. You never told us that we weren't to walk round the parapet. We withdrew to bed with a strong feeling of injustice. Meanwhile, my mother was still considering the problem of my education. She and my sister were having dresses made for them by one of the dressmakers of the town, and there, one day, my mother was attracted by the assistant fitter, a young woman whose main business was to put the fitted garment on and off and hand pins to the first fitter. This latter was a sharp-tempered, middle-aged woman, and my mother, noticing the patient good humor of the young girl's manner, decided to find out a little more about her. She watched her during the second and third fitting and finally retained her in conversation. Her name was Marie Sage, she was 22 years of age. Her father was a small cafe proprietor and she had an elder sister, also in the dressmaking establishment, two brothers, and a little sister. Then my mother took the girl's breath away by asking her in a casual voice if she would care to come to England. Marie gasped her surprise and delight. I must of course talk to your mother about it, said my mother. She might not like her daughter to go so far away. An appointment was arranged, my mother visited Madame Sage, and they went into the subject thoroughly. Only then did she approach my father on the subject. But, Clara, protested my father, this girl isn't a governess or anything of that kind. My mother replied that she thought Marie was just the person they needed. She knows no English at all, not a word of it. Agatha will have to learn French. She's a really sweet-natured and good-humored girl. It's a respectable family. The girl would like to come to England and she can do a lot of sewing and dressmaking for us. But are you sure about this, Clara? My father asked doubtfully. My mother was always sure. It's the perfect answer, she said. As was so often the case with my mother's apparently unaccountable whims, this proved to be true. If I close my eyes I can see dear Marie today as I saw her then. Round rosy face, snub nose, dark hair piled up in a chignon. Terrified, as she later told me, she entered my bedroom on the first morning having primed herself by laboriously learning the English phrase with which to greet me, good morning, mees. I hope you are well. Unfortunately, owing to Marie's accent I did not understand a word. I stared at her suspiciously. We were, for the first day, like a couple of dogs just introduced to each other. We said little and eyed each other in apprehension. Marie brushed my hair, very fair hair always arranged in sausage curls, and was so frightened of hurting me that she hardly put the brush through the hair at all. I wanted to explain to her that she must brush much harder, but of course it was impossible as I did not know the right words. How it came about that in less than a week Marie and I were able to converse I do not know. The language used was French. A word here and a word there, and I could make myself understood. Moreover, at the end of the week we were fast friends. Going out with Marie was fun. Doing anything with Marie was fun. It was the beginning of a happy partnership. In the early summer it grew hot in Pau, and we left, spending a week at Argyles and another at Lourdes, then moving up to Cotterets in the Pyrenees. This was a delightful spot, right at the foot of the mountains. I had got over my disappointment about mountains now, but although the position at Cotterets was more satisfactory you could not really look a long way up. Every morning we had a walk along a mountain path which led to the spa, where we all drank glasses of nasty water. Having thus improved our health we purchased a stick of Sucre d'Orge. Mother's favorite was aniseed, which I could not bear. On the zigzag paths by the hotel I soon discovered a delightful sport. This was to toboggan down through the pine trees on the seat of my pants. Marie took a poor view of this, but I am sorry to say that from the first Marie was never able to exert any authority over me. We were friends and playmates, but the idea of doing what she told me never occurred to me. Authority is an extraordinary thing. 
My mother had it in full measure. She was seldom cross, hardly ever raised her voice, but she had only gently to pronounce an order and it was immediately fulfilled. It always was odd to her that other people had not got this gift. Later, when she was staying with me after I was first married and had a child of my own, I complained how tiresome some little boys were who lived in the next house and who were always coming in through the hedge. Though I ordered them away, they would not go. But how extraordinary, said my mother. Why don't you just tell them to go away? I said to her, well, you try it. At that moment the two small boys arrived and were preparing as usual to say, ya, yeah, boo, shanty go, and throw gravel on the grass. One started pelting a tree and shouting and puffing. My mother turned her head. Ronald, she said. Is that your name? Ronald admitted it was. Please don't play so near here. I don't like being disturbed, said my mother. Just go a little further away. Ronald looked at her, whistled to his brother, and departed immediately. You see, dear, said my mother, it's quite simple. It certainly was for her. I really believe that my mother would have been able to manage a class of juvenile delinquents without the least difficulty. There was an older girl at the hotel in Cotterets, Sybil Patterson, whose mother was a friend of the Selwyns. Sybil was the object of my adoration. I thought her beautiful, and the thing I admired about her most was her budding figure. Bosoms were much in fashion at that time. Everyone more or less had one. My grandmother and great aunt had enormous jutting shelves, and it was difficult for them to greet each other with a sisterly kiss without their chests colliding first. Though I took the bosoms of grown-up people for granted, Sybil's possession of one aroused all my most envious instincts. Sybil was fourteen. How long should I have to wait until I, too, could have that splendid development? Eight years? Eight years of skinniness? I longed for these signs of female maturity. Ah well, patience was the only thing. I must be patient. And in eight years' time, or seven perhaps, if I was lucky, two large rounds would miraculously spurt forth on my skinny frame. I only had to wait. The Selwyns were not at Cotterets as long as we were. They went away, and I then had the choice of two other friends, a little American girl, Marguerite Prestley, and another, Margaret Home, an English girl. My father and mother were great friends by now with Margaret's parents, and naturally they hoped that Margaret and I would go about and do things together. As is usual in these cases, however, I had an enormous preference for the company of Marguerite Prestley, who used what were to me extraordinary phrases and odd words that I had never heard before. We told each other stories a good deal, and there was one story of Marguerite's which entailed the dangers encountered on meeting a scarapin which thrilled me. But what is a scarapin? I kept asking. Marguerite, who had a nurse called Fanny whose Southern American drawl was such that I could seldom understand what she said, gave me a brief description of this horrifying creature. I applied to Marie but Marie had never heard of scarapins. Finally I tackled my father. He had a little difficulty, too, at first, but at last realization dawned on him and he said, I expect what you mean is a scorpion. Somehow the magic then departed. A scorpion did not seem nearly so horrifying as the imagined scarapin. Marguerite and I had quite a serious dispute on one subject, which was the way babies arrived. I assured Marguerite that babies were brought by the angels. This had been Nurshi's information. Marguerite, on the other hand, assured me that they were part of a doctor's stock and trade, and were brought along by him in a black bag. When our dispute on this subject had got really heated, the tactful Fanny settled it once and for all. Why, that's just the way it is, honey, she said. American babies come in a doctor's black bag and English babies are brought by the angels. It's as simple as that. Satisfied, we ceased hostilities. Father and Madge made a good many excursions on horseback, and in answer to my entreaties one day I was told that on the morrow I should be allowed to accompany them. I was thrilled. My mother had a few misgivings, but my father soon overruled them. We have a guide with us, he said, and he's quite used to children and will see to it that they don't fall off. The next morning the three horses arrived, and off we went. We zigzagged along up the precipitous paths, and I enjoyed myself enormously perched on top of what seemed to me an immense horse. The guide led it up, and occasionally picking little bunches of flowers, handed them to me to stick in my hatband. So far all was well, but when we arrived at the top and prepared to have lunch, the guide excelled himself. He came running back to us bringing with him a magnificent butterfly he had trapped. Pour la petite mademoiselle, he cried. 
Taking a pin from his lapel he transfixed the butterfly and stuck it in my hat. Oh the horror of that moment. The feeling of the poor butterfly fluttering, struggling against the pin. The agony I felt as the butterfly fluttered there. And of course I couldn't say anything. There were too many conflicting loyalties in my mind. This was a kindness on the part of the guide. He had brought it to me. It was a special kind of present. How could I hurt his feelings by saying I didn't like it? How I wanted him to take it off. And all the time, there was the butterfly, fluttering, dying. That horrible flapping against my hat. There is only one thing a child can do in these circumstances. I cried. The more anyone asked me questions the more I was unable to reply. What's the matter, demanded my father. Have you got a pain? My sister said, perhaps she's frightened at riding on the horse. I said no and no I wasn't frightened and I hadn't got a pain. Tired, said my father. No, I said. Well, then, what is the matter? But I couldn't say. Of course I couldn't say. The guide was standing there, watching me with an attentive and puzzled face. My father said rather crossly. She's too young a child. We shouldn't have brought her on this expedition. I redoubled my weeping. I must have ruined the day for both him and my sister, and I knew I was doing so, but I couldn't stop. All I hoped and prayed was that presently he, or even my sister, would guess what was the matter. Surely they would look at that butterfly, they would see it, they would say, perhaps she doesn't like the butterfly on her hat. If they said it, it would be all right. But I couldn't tell them. It was a terrible day. I refused to eat any lunch. I sat there and cried, and the butterfly flapped. It stopped flapping in the end. That ought to have made me feel better. But by that time I had got into such a state of misery that nothing could have made me feel better. We rode down again, my father definitely out of temper, my sister annoyed, the guide still sweet, kindly and puzzled, fortunately, he did not think of getting me a second butterfly to cheer me up. We arrived back, a most woeful party, and went into our sitting room where mother was. Oh dear, she said, what's the matter? Has Agatha hurt herself? I don't know, said my father crossly. I don't know what's the matter with the child. I suppose she's got a pain or something. She's been crying ever since lunchtime, and she wouldn't eat a thing. What is the matter, Agatha, asked my mother. I couldn't tell her. I only looked at her dumbly while tears still rolled down my cheeks. She looked at me thoughtfully for some minutes, then said, who put that butterfly in her hat? My sister explained that it had been the guide. I see, said mother. Then she said to me, you didn't like it, did you? It was alive and you thought it was being hurt. Oh, the glorious relief, the wonderful relief when somebody knows what's in your mind and tells it to you so that you are at last released from that long bondage of silence. I flung myself at her in a kind of frenzy, thrust my arms round her neck and said, Yes, yes, yes. It's been flapping. It's been flapping. But he was so kind and he meant to be kind. I couldn't say. She understood it all and patted me gently. Suddenly the whole thing seemed to recede in the distance. I quite see what you felt, she said. I know. But it's over now, and so we won't talk about it anymore. It was about this time that I became aware that my sister had an extraordinary fascination for the young men in her vicinity. She was a most attractive young woman, pretty without being strictly beautiful, and she had inherited from my father a quick wit and was extremely amusing to talk to. She had, moreover, a great deal of sexual magnetism. Young men went down before her like ninepins. It was not long before Marie and I had made what might in racing parlance be called a book on the various admirers. We discussed their chances. I think Mr. Palmer. What do you think, Marie? Say possible. Maisiel S. Trojan. I replied that he was about the same age as Madge, but Marie assured me that that was, Boku Trojan. Me, said Marie, I think the Sir Ambrose. I protested, he's years and years older than she is, Marie. She said, perhaps, but it made for stability if a husband was older than his wife. She also added that Sir Ambrose would be a very good party, one of which any family would approve. Yesterday, I said, she put a flower as a buttonhole in Bernard's coat. But Marie did not think much of the young Bernard. She said he was not a garçon serious. I learned a lot about Marie's family. I knew the habits of their cat and how it was able to walk about among the glasses in the cafe and curl down asleep in the middle of them without ever breaking one. I knew that her sister, Bert, was older than her and a very serious girl, 
that her little sister Angeli was the darling of the whole family. I knew all the tricks the two boys played and how they got into trouble. Marie also confided to me the proud secret of the family, that once their name had been Shij instead of Saj. Though unable to see whence this pride came in, and indeed I do not even now, I fully concurred with Marie and congratulated her on having this satisfactory ancestry. Marie occasionally read me French books, as did my mother. But the happy day arrived when I picked up Memoirs d'Anana myself and found, on turning the pages, that I was able to read it alone just as well as anyone could have read it to me. Great congratulations followed, not least from my mother. At last, after many tribulations, I knew French. I could read it. Occasionally I needed explanations of the more difficult passages, but on the whole I had arrived. At the end of August we left Cotterets for Paris. I remember it always as one of the happiest summers the first have ever known. For a child of my age it had everything. The excitement of novelty. Trees, a recurring factor of enjoyment all through my life. Is it possibly symbolic that one of my first imaginary companions was called Tree? A new and delightful companion, my dear snub-nosed Marie. Expeditions on mules. Exploring steep paths fun with the family. My American friend Marguerite. The exotic excitement of a foreign place. Something rare and strange, how well Shakespeare knows. But it is not the items, grouped together and added up, that linger in my memory. It is Cotterets the place, the long valley, with its little railway and its wooded slopes, and the high hills. I have never been back there. I am glad of that. A year or two ago, we contemplated taking a summer holiday there. I said, unthinkingly, I should like to go back. It was true. But then it came to me that I could not go back. One cannot, ever, go back to the place which exists in memory. You would not see it with the same eyes, even supposing that it should improbably have remained much the same. What you have had you have had. The happy highways where I went, and shall not come again. Never go back to a place where you have been happy. Until you do it remains alive for you. If you go back it will be destroyed. There are other places I have resisted going back to. One is the shrine of Sheikh Adi in northern Iraq. We went there on my first visit to Mosul. There was a certain difficulty of access then, you had to get a permit, and to stop at the police post at Ansifni under the rocks of the Jebla Maklub. From there, accompanied by a policeman, we walked up a winding path. It was spring, fresh and green, with wild flowers all the way. There was a mountain stream. We passed occasional goats and children. Then we reached the Yazidai shrine. The peacefulness of it comes back, the flagged courtyard, the black snake carved on the wall of the shrine. Then the step carefully over, not on the threshold, into the small dark sanctuary. There we sat in the courtyard under a gently rustling tree. One of the Yazidis brought us coffee, first carefully spreading a dirty tablecloth. This, proudly, as showing that European needs were understood. We sat there a long time. Nobody forced information on us. I knew, vaguely, that the Yazidis were devil worshippers, and the peacock angel, Lucifer, is the object of their worship. It always seems strange that the worshippers of Satan should be the most peaceful of all the varying religious sects in that part of the world. When the sun began to get low, we left. It had been utter peace. Now I believe, they run tours to it. The spring festival is quite a tourist attraction. But I knew it in its day of innocence. I shall not forget it. Third. From the Pyrenees we went to Paris and then to Dinard. It is irritating to find that all I remember of Paris is my bedroom in the hotel, which had richly painted chocolate-colored walls on which it was quite impossible to see mosquitoes. There were myriads of mosquitoes. They pinged and whined all night, and our faces and arms were covered with bites. Extremely humiliating to my sister Madge, who minded a good deal about her complexion at this period of her life. We were only in Paris a week, and we seemed to spend all our time attempting to kill mosquitoes, anointing ourselves with various kinds of peculiar smelling oils, lighting incense cones by the bed, scratching bites, dropping hot candle grease on them. Finally, after vehement representations to the hotel management, who persisted in saying there were not really any mosquitoes, the novelty of sleeping under a mosquito net remains an event of the first importance. It was August in boiling hot weather, and under a net it must have been hotter still. I suppose I must have been shown some of the sights of Paris, but they have left no mark on my mind. I do remember that I was taken to the Tour Eiffel as a treat, but I imagine that, like my first view of mountains, it did not come up to expectation.
In fact the only souvenir of our stay there seemed to be a new nickname for me. Mustique. No doubt justified. No, I am wrong. It was on that visit to Paris that I first became acquainted with the forerunners of the great mechanical age. The streets of Paris were full of those new vehicles called automobiles. They rushed madly along, by present day standards probably quite slowly, but then they only had to compete with the horse, smelling, hooting, driven by men with caps and goggles and full of motoring equipment. They were bewildering. My father said they would be everywhere soon. We did not believe him. I surveyed them without interest, my own allegiance firmly given to all kinds of trains. My mother exclaimed sadly, what a pity Monty is not here. He would love them. It seems odd to me looking back now at this stage of my life. My brother seems to disappear from it completely. He was there, presumably, coming home for the holidays from Harrow, but he does not exist as a figure any longer. The answer is, probably, that he took very little notice of me at this point. I learned only later that my father was worried about him. He was superannuated from Harrow, being quite unable to pass his exams. I think he went first to a shipbuilding yard on the Dart, and afterwards up north, to Lincolnshire. Reports of his progress were disappointing. My father received blunt advice. He'll never get anywhere. You see, he can't do mathematics. You show him anything practical and it's all right, he's a good practical workman. But that's all he'll ever be in the engineering line. In every family there is usually one member who is a source of trouble and worry. My brother Monty was ours. Until the day of his death he was always causing someone a headache. I have often wondered, looking back, whether there is any niche in life where Monty would have fitted in. He would certainly have been all right if he had been born Ludwig II of Bavaria. I can see him sitting in his empty theater, enjoying opera sung only for him. He was intensely musical, with a good bass voice, and played various instruments by ear, from penny whistles to piccolo and flute. He would never have had the application, though, to become a professional of any kind, nor, I think, did the idea ever enter his head. He had good manners, great charm, and throughout his life was surrounded by people anxious to save him worry or bother. There was always someone ready to lend him money and to do any chores for him. As a child of six, when he and my sister received their pocket money, the same thing invariably happened. Monty spent his on the first day. Later in the week he would suddenly push my sister into a shop, quickly order three penny worth of a favorite sweet and then look at my sister, daring her not to pay. Madge, who had a great respect for public opinion, always did. Naturally she was furious about it and quarreled with him violently afterwards. Monty would merely smile at her serenely and offer her one of the sweets. This attitude was one he adopted throughout his life. There seemed to be a natural conspiracy to slave for him. Again and again various women have said to me, you know you don't really understand your brother Monty. What he needs is sympathy. The truth was that we understood him only too well. It was impossible, mind you, not to feel affection for him. He recognized his own faults with the utmost frankness, and was always sure that everything was going to be different in future. He was, I believe, the only boy at Harrow who was allowed to keep white mice. His housemaster, in explaining this, said to my father, you know he really seems to have such a deep love of natural history that I thought he should be allowed this privilege. The family opinion was that Monty had no love of natural history at all. He just wished to keep white mice. I think, on looking back, that Monty was a very interesting person. A slightly different arrangement of genes and he might have been a great man. He just lacked something. Proportion? Balance? Integration? I don't know. The choice of a career for him settled itself. The Boer War broke out. Almost all the young men we knew volunteered, Monty, naturally, among them. He had occasionally condescended to play with some toy soldiers I had, drawing them up in line of battle and christening their commanding officer Captain Dashwood. Later, to vary the routine, he cut off Captain Dashwood's head for treason while I wept. In some ways my father must have felt relief, the army might provide a career for him, especially just at this moment when his engineering prospects were so doubtful. The Boer War, I suppose, was the last of what one might describe as the old wars, the wars that did not really affect one's own country or life. They were heroic storybook affairs, fought by brave soldiers and gallant young men. They were killed, if killed, gloriously in battle. More often they came home suitably decorated with medals for gallant feats performed on the field. They were tied up with the outposts of empire, 
the poems of Kipling, and with the bits of England that were pink on the map. It seems strange today to think that people, girls in particular, went around handing our white feathers to young men whom they considered were backward in doing their duty by dying for their country. I remember little of the outbreak of the South African War. It was not regarded as an important war, it consisted of teaching Kruger a lesson. With the usual English optimism it would be all over in a few weeks. In 1914 we heard the same phrase. All over by Christmas. In 1940, not much point in storing the carpets with mothballs. This when the Admiralty took over my house, it won't last over the winter. So what I remember is a gay atmosphere, a song with a good tune, the absent-minded beggar, and cheerful young men coming up from Plymouth for a few days leave. I can remember a scene at home a few days before the 3rd Battalion of the Royal Welsh Regiment was to sail for South Africa. Monty had brought a friend up from Plymouth, where they were stationed at the moment. This friend, Ernest McIntosh, always called by us for some reason Billy, was to remain a friend and far more of a brother than my real brother to me all my life. He was a young man of great gaiety and charm. Like most of the young men around, he was more or less in love with my sister. The two boys had just got their uniforms, and were intensely intrigued by putties which they had never seen before. They wound the putties round their necks, bandaged their heads with them and played all sorts of tricks. I have a photograph of them sitting in our conservatory with putties round their necks. I transferred my girlish hero worship to Billy McIntosh. A photograph of him stood by my bed in a frame. With forget-me-nots on it. From Paris we went to Dinant in Brittany. The principal thing that I remember about Dinant is that I learned to swim there. I can remember my incredulous pride and pleasure when I found myself striking out for six spluttering strokes on my own without submerging. The other thing I remember is the blackberries, never were there such blackberries, great big fat juicy ones. Marie and I used to go out and pick baskets of them, and eat masses of them at the same time. The reason for this profusion was that the natives of the countryside believed them to be deadly poison. I.L.S. any mangent pot of years, said Marie wonderingly. They say to me vous allez vous am poisoner. Marie and I had no such inhibitions, and we poisoned ourselves happily every afternoon. It was in Dinant that I first took to theatrical life. Father and mother had a large double bedroom with an enormous bow window, practically an alcove, across which curtains were drawn. It was a natural for stage performances. Fired by a pantomime I had seen the previous Christmas, I pressed Marie into service and we gave nightly representations of various fairy stories. I chose the character I wished to be and Marie had to be everybody else. Looking back, I am filled with gratitude at the extraordinary kindness of my father and mother. I can imagine nothing more boring than to come up every evening after dinner and sit for half an hour watching and applauding whilst Marie and I strutted and postured in our home improvised costumes. We went through the Sleeping Beauty, Cinderella, Beauty, and the Beast and so forth. I was fondest of the part of Principal Boy, and borrowing my sister's stockings in an attempt to produce tights I marched around and declaimed. The performance was, of course, always in French, as Marie could not speak English. What a good-natured girl she was. Only once did she strike, and that for a reason I simply could not fathom. She was to be Cinderella, and I insisted on her taking her hair down. One really cannot imagine Cinderella with a chignon on top of her head. But Marie, who had enacted the part of the beast without murmuring, who had been Red Riding Hood's grandmother, Marie, who had been good fairies, bad fairies, who had been wicked old women, who had enacted a street scene where she spat into the gutter in a most realistic fashion saying in Argo, et bien cratch, which incidentally convulsed my father with mirth, Marie suddenly refused with tears to enact the part of Cinderella. Maze, pourquoi, pa, Marie? I demanded. It is a very good part. It is the heroine. It is Cinderella the whole play is about. Impossible, said Marie, impossible that she should enact such a role. To take her hair down, to appear with her hair loose on her shoulders before Monsieur. That was the crux. To appear with her hair down before Monsieur was to Marie unthinkable, shocking. I yielded, puzzled. We concocted a kind of hood that went over Cinderella's chignon, and all was well. But how extraordinary taboos are. I remember one of my friend's children, a pleasant, amiable little girl of about four. A French nursery governess arrived to look after her. There was the usual hesitation as to whether the child would get on with her or not, but everything appeared to be perfect happiness. She went out with her for a walk, chatted, showed Madeline her toys. Everything seemed to be going perfectly. 
Only at bedtime did tears arise when Joan refused firmly to let Madeline give her her bath. Her mother, puzzled, gave in on the first day, since she could understand that the child was perhaps not quite at home with the strangers yet. But this refusal continued for two or three days. All was peace, all was happiness, all was friendship, until bed and bath time. It was not till the fourth day that Joan, weeping bitterly and burying her head in her mother's neck, said, You don't understand, mummy. You don't seem to understand. How can I show my body to a foreigner? So it was with Marie. She could strut about in trousers, show quite a lot of leg in many roles, but she could not take her hair down in front of Monsieur. I imagine, to begin with, our theatrical performances must have been extremely funny, and my father at least got a great deal of enjoyment out of them. But how boring they must have become. Yet my parents were far too kind to tell me frankly that they couldn't be bothered to come up every night. Occasionally they let themselves off by explaining that friends were dining and so they would not be able to come upstairs, but on the whole they stuck it nobly in how I, at least, enjoyed performing before them. During the month of September that we stayed in Dinad my father was happy to find some old friends there, Martin Peary and his wife and two sons, who were finishing off their holidays. Martin Peary and my father had been at school together at Veve, and close friends ever since. Martin's wife, Lillian Peary, I still think of as one of the most outstanding personalities I have ever known. The character that Sackville West drew so beautifully in all passion spent has always struck me as a little like Mrs. Peary. There was something faintly awe-inspiring in her, slightly aloof. She had a beautiful, clear voice, delicate features and very blue eyes. The movements of her hands were always beautiful. I think Dinad was the first time I ever saw her, but from then on I saw her at frequent intervals, and I knew her up to the age of 80-odd when she died. All that time my admiration and respect for her increased. She was one of the few people I have met whom I consider had a really interesting mind. Each of her houses was decorated in a startling and original manner. She did the most beautiful embroidered pictures, there was never a book or a play she had not read or seen, and she always had something telling to say about them. Nowadays I suppose she would have embarked upon some career, but I wonder, if she had done so, whether the impact of her personality would have been as great as it actually was. Young people always flocked to her house and were happy to talk to her. To spend an afternoon with her, even when she was well over 70, was a wonderful refreshment. I think she had, more perfectly than anyone I have ever known, the art of leisure. You found her sitting in a high-backed chair in her beautiful room, usually engaged with some needlework of her own design, some interesting book or other by her side. She had the air of having time to talk with you all day, all night, for months on end. Her criticisms were caustic and clear. Although she would talk about any abstract subject under the sun she seldom indulged in personalities. But it was her beautiful speaking voice that attracted me most. It is such a rare thing to find. I have always been sensitive to voices. An ugly voice repels me where an ugly face would not. My father was delighted to see his friend Martin again. My mother and Mrs. Peary had much in common, and immediately engaged, if I remember rightly in a frenzied discussion about Japanese art. Their two boys were there, Harold, who was at Eton, and Wilfred, who I suppose must have been at Dartmouth, as he was going into the Navy. Wilfred was later to be one of my dearest friends, but all I remember about him from Dinad was that he was said to be the boy who always laughed out loud whenever he saw a banana. This made me look at him with close attention. Naturally, neither of the boys took the least notice of me. An Eton schoolboy and a naval cadet would hardly demean themselves by paying attention to a little girl of seven. From Dinad we moved on to Guernsey, where we spent most of the winter. As a birthday present I was given a surprise of three birds of exotic plumage and coloring. These were named Kiki, T-O-U-T-O-U, -T -O -U, and Bibi. Shortly after arrival in Guernsey, Kiki, who was always a delicate bird, died. He had not been long enough in my possession for his decease to occasion violent grief, in any case, Bibi who was an enchanting small bird, was my favorite, but I certainly enjoyed myself in a lavish way over the obsequies of Kiki. He was splendidly buried in a cardboard box with a lining of satin ribbon supplied by my mother. An expedition was then made out of the town of St. Peter Port to an upland region where a spot was chosen for the funeral ceremonies, and the box was duly buried with a large knot of flowers placed upon it. All that of course was highly satisfactory, but it did not end there. Visitor La Tumda Kiki became one of my favorite walks. The great excitement in St. Peter Port was the flower market. There were lovely flowers of every kind and very cheap. 
According to Marie it was always the coldest and windiest day when, after inquiring, and where shall we go for a walk today, Mies. Mies would reply with gusto, new salon's visitor La Tung de Kiki. Terrible sighs from Marie. A two-mile walk and a great deal of cold wind. Nevertheless, I was adamant. I dragged her to the market, where we purchased exciting camellias or other flowers, and then we took the two-mile walk lashed by wind and frequently rain as well, and placed the floral bouquet with due ceremony upon Kiki's grave. It must run in one's blood to enjoy funerals and funeral observances. Where indeed would archaeology be if it had not been for this trait in human nature? If I was ever taken for a walk in my youth by anyone other than nurses, one of the servants, for instance, we invariably went to the cemetery. How happy are those scenes in Paris at Père Lachaise, with whole families attending family tombs and making them beautiful for All Souls Day. Honoring the dead is indeed a hallowed cult. Is there behind it some instinctive means of avoiding grief, of becoming so interested in the rites and ceremonies that one almost forgets the departed loved one? I do know this, that however poor a family may be the first thing they save for is their funeral. A sweet old dear who worked for me at one time said, Ah, hard times, dearie. Hard times indeed they've been. But one thing, however short I've gone and all the rest of us, I've got my money saved to bury me decent and I'll never touch that. No, not even if I go hungry for days. Fourth. I sometimes think that in my last incarnation, if the theory of reincarnation is right, I must have been a dog. I have a great many of the dog's habits. If anybody is undertaking anything or going anywhere I always want to be taken with them and do it too. In the same way, when returning home after this long absence I acted exactly like a dog. A dog always runs all round the house examining everything, sniffing here, sniffing there, finding out by its nose what has been going on, and visiting all its best spots. I did exactly the same. I went all round the house, then went out in the garden and visited my pet spots there, the tub, the seesaw tree, my little secret post overlooking the road outside in a hiding place up by the wall. I found my hoop and tested its condition, and took about an hour to satisfy myself that all was exactly as it had been before. The greatest change had taken place in my dog, Tony. Tony had been a small, neat Yorkshire terrier when we went away. He was now, owing to Froudy's loving care and endless meals, as fat as a balloon. She was completely Tony's slave, and when my mother and I went to fetch him home Froudy gave us a long dissertation on how he liked to sleep, what exactly he had to be covered with in his basket his tastes in food, and what time he liked his walk. At intervals she broke off her conversation with us to speak to Tony. Mother's lovely, she said. Mother's handsome. Tony looked very appreciative at these remarks, but nevertheless seemed to take them as no more than his due. And he won't eat a morsel, said Froudy proudly, unless you give it him by hand. Oh no, I have to feed him every single little piece myself. I noticed a look in my mother's face, and I could see that Tony was not going to receive quite that treatment at home. We took him home with us in the hired cab which we had got for the occasion, plus his bedding and the rest of his possessions. Tony, of course, was delighted to see us, and licked me all over. When his dinner was prepared and brought, Froudy's warning was proved true. Tony looked at it, looked up at my mother and at me, moved a few steps away and sat down, waiting like a grand seigneur to have each morsel fed to him. I gave him a piece and he accepted it graciously, but my mother stopped that. It's no good, she said. He will have to learn to eat his dinner properly, as he used to do. Leave his dinner down there. He'll go and eat it presently. But Tony did not go and eat it. He sat there. And never have I seen a dog more overcome with righteous indignation. His large, sorrowful, brown eyes went round the assembled family and back to his plate. He was clearly saying, I want it. Don't you see? I want my dinner. Give it to me. However, my mother was firm. Even if he doesn't eat it today, she said, he will tomorrow. You don't think he'll starve? I demanded. My mother looked thoughtfully at Tony's immensely broad back. A little starvation, she said, would do him a world of good. It was not till the following evening that Tony capitulated, and then he saved his pride by eating his dinner when nobody was in the room. After that there was no further trouble. Days of being treated like a grand duke were over, and Tony obviously accepted the fact. Still, he did not forget that for a whole year he had been the beloved darling of another house. Any word of reproof, any trouble he got into, and immediately he would sneak off and trot down to Froudy's house, where he obviously told her that he was not properly appreciated. 
The habit persisted for quite a long time. Marie was now Tony's nurse attendant, in addition to her other duties. It was amusing to see Marie arrive when we were playing downstairs in the evening, an apron tied round her waist, saying politely, Monsieur Tony pour le bain. Monsieur Tony would immediately try to get down on all fours and slide under the sofa, since he had a poor opinion of the weekly bath. Extracted, he was carried off, his tail drooping and his ears down. Marie would report proudly later on the amount of fleas that were floating on top of the Jai's fluid. I must say that now dogs do not seem to have nearly as many fleas as they did in my young days. In spite of baths, brushing, and combing, and large amounts of Jai's fluid, all our dogs always seemed to be full of fleas. Perhaps they frequented stables and played with other flea-ridden dogs more than they do now. On the other hand they were less pampered, and they did not seem to live at the vets as much as dogs do today. I don't remember Tony ever being seriously ill, his coat seemed always in good condition, he ate his meals, which were the scraps from our own dinner, and little fuss was made about his health. But much more fuss is made about children now than was then the case. Temperatures, unless they were high, were not taken much notice of. A temperature of 102, sustained for 24 hours, would probably involve a visit from the doctor, but anything under that was given little attention. Occasionally, after a surfeit of green apples one might have what was termed a bilious attack. 24 hours in bed with starvation usually cured that quite easily. Food was good and varied. I suppose there was a tendency to keep young children on milk and starch far too long, but certainly I, from a young age, had tastes of the steak that was sent up for Nurshi's supper, and underdone roast beef was one of my favorite meals. Devonshire cream, too, was eaten in quantities, so much nicer than cod liver oil, my mother used to say. Sometimes one ate it on bread and sometimes with a spoon. Alas. You never see real Devonshire cream in Devon nowadays, not as it used to be, scalded and taken off the milk in layers with its yellow top standing in a china bowl. There is no doubt about it, my favorite thing has been, is, and probably always will be, cream. Mother, who craved for variety in food as well as in everything else, used from time to time to have a new craze. One time it was, there's more nourishment in an egg. On this slogan we had eggs at practically every meal till father rebelled. There was also a fishy period, when we lived on sole and whiting and improved our brains. However, having made the round of the food diets, mother usually returned to the normal, just as, having dragged father through Theosophy, the Unitarian Church, a near miss of becoming a Roman Catholic, and a flirtation with Buddhism, she returned at last to the Church of England. It was satisfactory to come home and find everything just as usual. There was only one change, and that was for the better. I now had my devoted Marie. I suppose that until I dipped a hand into my bag of remembrances I had never actually thought about Marie, she was just Marie, part of my life. To a child the world is simply what is happening to him or her, and that includes the people in it, whom they like, whom they hate, what makes them happy, what makes them unhappy. Marie, fresh, cheerful, smiling, always agreeable, was a much appreciated member of the household. What I wonder now is what it meant to her. She had been, I think, very happy during the autumn and winter that we spent traveling in France and the Channel Islands. She was seeing places, the life in the hotels was pleasant, and, strangely enough, she liked her young charge. I would, of course, like to think that she liked me because I was me, but Marie was genuinely fond of children, and would have liked any child that she was looking after, short of one or two of those infantile monsters that one does encounter. I was certainly not particularly obedient to her, I don't think the French have the capacity for enforcing obedience. In many ways I behaved disgracefully. In particular I hated going to bed, and invented a splendid game of leaping round all the furniture, climbing up on wardrobes, down from the tops of chests of drawers, completing the circuit of the room without ever once touching the floor. Marie, standing in the doorway, would moan, oh, mise, mise. Madame Vautry mir any sirite pa contente. Madame Mamir certainly did not know what was going on. If she had made an unexpected appearance, she would have raised her eyebrows, said, Agatha. Why are you not in bed, and within three minutes I would have been in bed, scurrying there, without any further word of admonition. However, Marie never denounced me to authority, she pleaded, she sighed, but she never reported me. On the other hand, if I did not give her obedience, I did give her love. I loved her very much. On only one occasion do I really remember having upset her, 
and that was entirely inadvertent. It happened after we had come back to England, in the course of an argument on some subject or other which was proceeding quite amicably. Finally, in exasperation, and wishing to prove my point of view, I was saying, Mais, ma pauvre fille, vous ne savez d'un pas les chemins de fersant. At this point, to my utter amazement, Marie suddenly burst into tears. I stared at her. I had no idea what was the matter. Then words came amongst the sobs. Yes, she was indeed a pauvre fille. Her parents were poor, not rich like those of Mies. They kept a café, where all the sons and daughters worked. But it was not gentle, it was not bien a levy of her dear Mies to reproach her with her poverty. But, Marie, I expostulated, Marie, I didn't mean that at all, dot. It seemed impossible to explain that no idea of poverty had been in my mind, that, ma pauvre fille, was a mere expression of impatience. Poor Marie had been hurt in her feelings, and it took at least half an hour of protestations, caresses, and reiterated assurances of affection before she was soothed. After that, all was healed between us. I was terribly careful in future never to use that particular expression. I think that Marie, established at our house in Torquay, felt lonely and homesick for the first time. No doubt in the hotels where we had stayed there had been other maids, nurses, governesses, and so on, cosmopolitan ones, and she had not felt the separation from her family. But here in England she came in contact with girls of her own age, or at any rate of not much more than her own age. We had at that time, I think, a youngish housemaid and a parlour maid of perhaps thirty. But their point of view was so different from Marie's that it must have made her feel a complete alien. They criticised the plainness of her clothes, the fact that she never spent any money on finery, ribbons, gloves, all the rest of it. Marie was receiving what were to her fantastically good wages. She asked Monsieur every month if he would be so kind as to remit practically the whole of her pay to her mother in pow. She herself kept a tiny sum. This was to her natural and proper, she was saving up for her dot, that precious sum of money that all French girls at that time, and perhaps now, I do not know, industriously put by as a dowry, a necessity for the future, for lacking it they may easily not get married at all. It is the equivalent, I suppose, of what we call in England, my bottom drawer, but far more serious. It was a good and sensible idea, and I think in vogue nowadays in England, because young people want to buy a house and therefore both the man and the girl save money towards it. But in the time I am speaking of, girls did not save up for marriage, that was the man's business. He must provide a home and the wherewithal to feed, clothe, and look after his wife. Therefore the girls in good service and the lower class of shop girls considered the money they earned was their own to use for the frivolous things of life. They bought new hats and coloured blouses, an occasional necklace or brooch. One might say, I suppose, that they used their wages as courting money to attract a suitable male of the species. But here was Marie, in her neat little black coat and skirt, and her little toque in her plain blouses, never adding to her wardrobe, never buying anything unnecessary. I don't think they meant to be unkind, but they laughed at her, they despised her. It made her very unhappy. It was really my mother's insight and kindness that helped her through the first four or five months. She was homesick, she wanted to go home. My mother, however, talked to Marie, consoled her, told her that she was a wise girl and doing the right thing, that English girls were not as far-seeing and prudent as French girls. She also, I think, had a word with the servants themselves and with Jane, saying that they were making this French girl unhappy. She was far away from home, and they must think what it would be like if they were in a foreign country. So after a month or two Marie cheered up. I feel that, at this point, anyone who has had the patience to read so far will exclaim, but didn't you have any lessons to do? The answer is, no, I did not. I was, I suppose, nine years old by now, and most children of my age had governesses, though these were engaged, I fancy, largely from the point of view of child care, to exercise and supervise. What they taught you in the way of lessons depended entirely on the tastes of the individual governesses. I remember dimly a governess or two in friends' houses. One held complete faith in Dr. Brewer's Child's Guide to Knowledge, a counterpart of our modern quiz. I retain scraps of knowledge thus acquired, what are the three diseases of wheat? Rust, mildew, and soot. Those have gone with me all through life though unfortunately they have never been of practical use to me. What is the principal manufacture in the town of Redditch? Needles. What is the date of the Battle of Hastings? 1066. 
Another governess, I remember, instructed her pupils in natural history, but little else. A great deal of picking of leaves and berries and wild flowers went on, and a suitable dissection of the same. It was incredibly boring. I do hate all this pulling things to pieces, confided my small friend to me. I entirely agreed, and indeed the word botany all through my life has made me shy like a nervous horse. My mother had gone to school in her own youth, to an establishment in Cheshire. She sent my sister Madge to boarding school but was now entirely converted to the view that the best way to bring up girls was to let them run wild as much as possible, to give them good food, fresh air, and not to force their minds in any way. None of this, of course, applied to boys, boys had to have a strictly conventional education. As I have already mentioned, she had a theory that no child should be allowed to read until it was eight. This having been frustrated, I was allowed to read as much as I pleased, and I took every opportunity to do so. The schoolroom, as it was called, was a big room at the top of the house, almost completely lined with books. There were shelves of children's books, Alice in Wonderland and, through the looking glass, the earlier, sentimental Victorian tales which I have already mentioned, such as our white violet, Charlotte Yonge's books, including the Daisy Chain, a complete set, I should think, of Henty, and, besides that, any amount of school books, novels, and others. I read indiscriminately, picking up anything that interested me, reading quite a lot of things which I did not understand but which nevertheless held my attention. In the course of my reading I found a French play which father discovered me reading. How did you get hold of that, he asked, picking it up, horrified. It was one of a series of French novels and plays which he usually kept carefully locked up in the smoking room for the perusal of adults only. It was in the schoolroom, I said. It shouldn't have been there, said father. It should have been in my cupboard. I relinquished it cheerfully. Truth to tell, I had found it somewhat difficult to understand. I returned happily to reading memoirs d'Anana, sans famille, and other innocuous French literature. I suppose I must have had lessons of some kind, but I did not have a governess. I continued to do arithmetic with my father, passing proudly through fractions to decimals. I eventually arrived at the point where so many cows ate so much grass, and tanks filled with water in so many hours, I found it quite enthralling. My sister was now officially out, which entailed parties, dresses, visits to London, and so on. This kept my mother busy, and she had less time for me. Sometimes I became jealous, feeling that Madge had all the attention. My mother had had a dull girlhood herself. Though her aunt was a rich woman, and though Clara had traveled to and fro across the Atlantic with her, she had seen no reason to give her a social debut of any kind. I don't think my mother was socially minded, but she did yearn, as any young girl might, to have a great many prettier clothes and dresses than she had. Auntie Granny ordered herself very expensive and fashionable clothes at the best dressmakers in Paris, but she always considered Clara as a child, and more or less dressed her as such. The awful sewing women again. My mother was determined that her daughters should have all the pretty pretties and frivolities of life that she herself had missed. Hence her interest and delight in Madge's clothes, and later in mine. Mind you, clothes were clothes in those days. There was a great deal of them, lavish both in material and in workmanship. Frills, ruffles, flounces, lace, complicated seams and gores, not only did they sweep the ground and have to be held up in one hand elegantly as you walked along, but they had little capes or coats or feather boas. There was also hairdressing, hairdressing, too, really was hairdressing in those times, no running a comb through it and that was that. It was curled, frizzed, waved, put in curlers overnight, waved with hot tongs, if a girl was going to a dance she started doing her hair at least two hours earlier and the hairdressing would take her about an hour and a half, leaving her about half an hour to put on her dress, stockings, slippers, and so on. This was not, of course, my world. It was the grown UPS world, from which I remained aloof. Nevertheless, I was influenced by it. Marie and I discussed the toilettes of the mademoiselles in our special favorites. It so happened that in our particular road there were no next-door neighbors with children of my age. So, as I had done at a younger age, I once more arranged a set of friends and intimates of my own, in succession to poodle, squirrel, and tree, and the famous kittens. This time I invented a school. This was not because I had any desire myself to go to school. No, I think that the school constituted the only background into which I could conveniently fit seven girls of varying ages and appearances, giving them different backgrounds instead of making them a family, 
which I did not want to do. The school had no name, it was just the school. The first girls to arrive were Ethel Smith and Annie Gray. Ethel Smith was eleven and Annie was nine. Ethel was dark, with a great mane of hair. She was clever, good at games, had a deep voice, and must have been rather masculine in appearance. Annie Gray, her great friend, was a complete contrast. She had pale flaxen hair, blue eyes, and was shy and nervous and easily reduced to tears. She clung to Ethel, who protected her on every occasion. I liked them both, but my preference was for the bold and vigorous Ethel. After Ethel and Annie, I added two more, Isabella Sullivan, who was rich, golden-haired, brown-eyed, and beautiful. She was eleven years of age. Isabella I did not like, in fact I disliked her a good deal. She was worldly. Worldly was a great word in the storybooks of the time, pages of the daisy chain are devoted to the worries in the May family because of Flora's worldliness. Isabel was certainly the quintessence of worldliness. She gave herself airs, boasted about being rich, and had clothes that were far too expensive for her and too grand for a girl of her age. Elsie Green was her cousin. Elsie was rather Irish, she had dark hair, blue eyes, curls, and was gay and laughed a good deal. She got on quite well with Isabel, but sometimes ticked her off. Elsie was poor, she wore Isabel's cast-off clothes, which sometimes rankled, but not much, because Elsie was easygoing. With these four I got on well for some time. They traveled on the tubular railway, they rode horses, they did gardening, they also played a great deal of croquet. I used to arrange tournaments and special matches. My great hope was that Isabel would not win. I did everything short of cheating to see that she did not win, that is, I held her mallet for her carelessly, played quickly, hardly aimed at all, yet somehow the more carelessly I played, the more fortunate Isabel seemed to be. She got through impossible hoops, hit balls from right across the lawn, and nearly always finished as winner or runner-up. It was most annoying. After a while I thought it would be nice to have some younger girls at the school. I added two six-year-olds, Ella White and Sue DeVert. Ella was conscientious, industrious, and dull. She had bushy hair, and was good at lessons. She did well in Dr. Brewer's Guide to Knowledge, and played quite a fair game of croquet. Sue DeVert was curiously colorless, not only in appearance, she was fair, with pale blue eyes, but also in character. Somehow I couldn't see or feel Sue. She and Ella were great friends, but though I knew Ella like the back of my hand Sue remained fluid. I think this is probably because Sue was really myself when I conversed with the others, I was always Sue conversing with them, not Agatha, and therefore Sue and Agatha became two facets of the same person, and Sue was an observer, not really one of the dramatis personae. The seventh girl to be added to the collection was Sue's stepsister, Vera de Verde. Vera was an immense age, she was thirteen. She was not at the moment beautiful, but she was going to be a raving beauty in the future. There was also a mystery about her parentage. I had half-planned various futures for Vera of a highly romantic nature. She had straw-colored hair and forget-me-not blue eyes. An additional help to the girls were bound copies of Royal Academy pictures which my grandmother had in the house in Ealing. She promised that they should belong to me one day, and I used to spend hours looking at them in wet weather, not so much for artistic satisfaction as for finding suitable pictures of the girls. A book that had been given me as a Christmas present, illustrated by Walter Crane, The Feast of Flora, represented flower pictures in human form. There was a particularly lovely one in it of forget-me-nots wreathed round a figure who was definitely Vera de Verde. Chaucer's daisy was Ella, and the handsome crown imperial striding along was Ethel. The girls, I may say, stayed with me for many years, naturally changing their characters as I myself matured. They participated in music, acted in opera, were given parts in plays and musical comedies. Even when I was grown up I spared them a thought now and then, and allocated them the various dresses in my wardrobe. I also designed model gowns for them in my mind. Ethel, I remember, looked very handsome in a dress of dark blue tulle with white arum lilies on one shoulder. Poor Annie was never given much to wear. I was fair to Isabel, though, and gave her some extremely handsome gowns, embroidered brocades, and satins usually. Even now, sometimes, as I put away a dress in a cupboard, I say to myself, yes, that would do well for Elsie, green was always her color. Ella would look very nice indeed in that three-piece jersey suit. It makes me laugh when I do it, but there the girls are still, though, unlike me, they have not grown old. Twenty-three is the oldest I have ever imagined them.
In the course of time I added four more characters, Adelaide, who was the oldest of all, tall, fair and rather superior, Beatrice, who was a merry, dancing, little fairy, the youngest of them all, and two sisters, Rose and Iris Reed. I became rather romantic about those two. Iris had a young man who wrote poetry to her and called her Iris of the Marshes, and Rose was very mischievous, played tricks on everybody, and flirted madly with all the young men. They were, of course, in due time married off, or remained unmarried. Ethel never married but lived in a small cottage with the gentle Annie, very appropriate, I think now, it's exactly what they would have done in real life. Soon after our return from abroad the delights of the world of music were opened to me by Fraulein Uter. Fraulein Uter was a short, wiry, formidable, little German woman. I don't know why she was teaching music in Torquay, I never heard anything of her private life. My mother appeared one day in the schoolroom with Fraulein Uter in tow, explaining she wanted Agatha to start learning the piano. ACH, said Fraulein Uter with a rich German sound, though she spoke English perfectly. Then we will at once to the piano go. To the piano we went the schoolroom piano, of course, not the grand piano in the drawing room. Stand there, commanded Fraulein Uter. I stood as placed to the left of the piano. That, she said, thumping the note so hard that I really thought something might happen to it, is C major. You understand. That is the note C. This is the scale of C major. She played it. Now we go back and play the chord of C, like that now again, the scale. The notes are C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. You understand. I said yes. As a matter of fact I knew that much already. Now, said Fraulein Uter, you will stand there where you cannot see the notes and I play first C, then another note, and you shall tell me what the second is. She hit C, and then hit another note with equal force. What is that? Answer me. E, I said. Quite right. Good. Now we will try again. Once more she thumped C, and then another note. And that. A, I hazarded. A C H, that at first class. Good. This child is musical. You have the ear, yes. A C H, we shall get on famously. I certainly got off to a good start. I don't think, to be honest, I had the least idea what the other notes were she was playing. I think it must have been an inspired guess. But anyway, having started on those lines we went ahead with plenty of goodwill on either side. Before long the houses resounded with scales, arpeggios, and in due course the strains of the merry peasant. I enjoyed my music lessons enormously. Both father and mother played the piano. Mother played Mendelssohn's songs without words and various other pieces that she had learned in her youth. She played well, but was not, I think, a passionate music lover. My father was naturally musical. He could play anything by ear, and he played delightful American songs and Negro spirituals and other things. To the merry peasant Fraulein Uter and I added Terdumere, and other of Schumann's delicate little tunes. I practiced with zeal for an hour or two a day. From Schumann I proceeded to Grieg, which I loved passionately, Erotiki and the first rustle of spring were my favorites. When I finally progressed to being able to play the Piergent Morgan I was transported with delight. Fraulein Uter, like most Germans, was an excellent teacher. It was not all playing of pleasant tunes, there were masses of Czerny's exercises, about which I was not quite so zealous, but Fraulein Uter was having no nonsense. You must the good grounding have, she said. These exercises, they are the reality, the necessity. The tunes, yes, they are pretty little embroideries, they are like flowers, they bloom and drop off, but you must have the roots, the strong roots and the leaves. So I had a good deal of the strong roots and the leaves and an occasional flower or two, and I was probably much more pleased with the result than the others in the house, who found so much practicing somewhat oppressive. Then there was also dancing class, which took place once a week, at something grandiosely called the Athenaeum Rooms, situated over a confectioner's shop. I must have started going to dancing class quite early, five or six, I think, because I remember that Nershi was still there and took me once a week. The young ones were started off with the polka. Their approach to it was to stamp three times, right, left, right, left, right, left, thump, 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 thump. Very unpleasant it must have been for those having tea at the confectioners underneath. When I got home I was slightly upset by Madge, who said that that was not how the polka was danced. You slide one foot, bring the next up to it, 
and then the first, she said, like this. I was rather puzzled, but apparently it was Miss Hickey's, the dancing mistress's idea of getting the rhythm of the polka before you did the steps. Miss Hickey, I remember, was a wonderful if alarming personality. She was tall, stately, had a pompadour of gray hair beautifully arranged, long flowing skirts, and to waltz with her, which happened, of course, much later, was a terrifying experience. She had one pupil teacher of about 18 or 19, and one of about 13 called Aileen. Aileen was a sweet girl, who worked hard, and whom we all liked very much. The older one, Helen, was slightly terrifying, and only took notice of the really good dancers. The procedure of dancing class was as follows. It started with what were called expanders, which exercised your chest and arms. They were a sort of blue ribbon elastic with handles. You stretched these vigorously for about half an hour. There was then the polka, which was danced by all once they had graduated from thump, 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 the older girls in the class dancing with the younger ones. Have you seen me dance the polka? Have you seen my coattails fly? The polka was merry and unattractive. Then you had the grand march, in which, in pairs, you went up the middle of the room, round the sides, and into various figures of eight, the seniors leading, the juniors following up. You had partners for the march whom you engaged yourself, and a good deal of heartburning took place over this. Naturally, everybody wished to have as partner either Helen or Aileen, but Miss Hickey saw to it that there were no particular monopolies. After the march the smaller ones were removed to the junior room, where they learned the steps of either the polka or, later, the waltz, or steps in their fancy dances at which they were particularly maladroit. The seniors did their fancy dance under the eye of Miss Hickey in the big room. This consisted of either a tambourine dance, a Spanish castanet dance, or a fan dance. Talking of the fan dance, I once mentioned to my daughter, Rosalind, and her friend Susan, when they were girls of 18 or 19, that I used to do a fan dance in my youth. Their ribald laughter puzzled me. You didn't really, mother, did you? A fan dance. Susan, she did a fan dance. Oh, said Susan, I always thought that Victorians were so particular. It dawned on us soon, however, that by a fan dance we did not mean exactly the same thing. After that the seniors sat out and the juniors did their dance, which was the sailor's hornpipe or some gay little folk dance, not too difficult. Finally we entered into the complications of the lancers. We were also taught the Swedish country dance, and Sir Roger de Coverley. These last were especially useful because when you went to parties you were not shamed by ignorance of such social activities. At Torquay we were almost entirely girls. When I went to dancing class in Ealing there was quite a number of boys. This I think was when I was about nine, very shy, and not as yet adept in dancing. A boy of considerable charm, probably a year or two older than I was, came up and asked me to be his partner in the Lancers. Upset and downcast, I said that I couldn't dance the Lancers. It seemed to me hard, I had never seen so attractive a boy. He had dark hair, merry eyes, and I felt at once that we were going to be soulmates. I sat down sadly when the Lancers began, and almost immediately Mrs. Wordsworth's representative came up to me. Now, Agatha, we can't have anyone sitting out. I don't know how to dance the Lancers, Mrs. Wordsworth. No, dear, but you can soon learn. We must find you a partner. She seized a freckled boy with a snub nose and sandy hair, he also had adenoids. Here you are. Here is William. During the Lancers, when we were engaged in visiting, I came up against my first love and his partner. He whispered to me, in dudgeon, you wouldn't dance with me, and here you are. It is very unkind of you. I tried to tell him that I couldn't help it, that I had thought I couldn't dance the Lancers but I was told I had to, but there is not time when you are visiting in the Lancers to enter into explanations. He continued to look reproachfully at me until the end of the dancing class. I hoped I might meet him the following week, but alas I never saw him again, one of life's said love stories. The waltz was the only dance I learned that was going to be useful to me through life, and I have never really liked waltzing. I do not like the rhythm, and I always used to get exceedingly giddy, especially when honored by Miss Hickey. She had a wonderful sweep round in the waltz, which practically took you off your feet, and which left you at the end of the performance with your head reeling, hardly able to stand up. But I must admit that it was a beautiful sight to watch her. Fraulein Uder disappeared from my life, I don't know where or when. Perhaps she went back to Germany. 
she was replaced a little later by a young man called, as far as I remember, Mr. Trotter. He was the organist of one of the churches, was rather a depressing teacher, and I had to adopt an entirely different style. I had to sit practically on the floor, with my hands reaching upward to get to the keys of the piano, and everything had to be played from the wrist. Fraulein Uder's method, I think, must have been to sit high and play from the elbows. One was more or less poised above the piano so as to be able to come down on the keys with maximum power. Very satisfactory. Fifth. It must have been shortly after our return from the Channel Isles that the shadow of my father's illness began to be felt. He had not been well abroad, and had twice consulted a doctor. The second doctor had propounded a somewhat alarmist view, namely that my father suffered from a kidney disease. After our return to England he consulted our own doctor, who did not agree with that diagnosis and who sent him to a specialist. After that, the shadow was there, faint, felt only by a child as one of those atmospheric disturbances which are to the psychic world as an approaching thunderstorm is to the physical one. Medical science seemed to be of little use. Father went to two or three specialists. The first one said it was definitely a heart condition. I don't remember the details of it now, I only remember listening to my mother and sister talking, and the words, an inflammation of the nerves surrounding the heart, which sounded to me very frightening. Another doctor who was consulted put it down entirely to gastric trouble. At increasingly short intervals my father had attacks of pain and breathlessness during the night, and my mother sat up with him, altering his position and giving him such medicaments as had been ordered by the last doctor. As always there was a pathetic belief in the last doctor whom we had consulted, and the latest regime or treatment that we adopted. Faith does a lot faith, novelty, a dynamic personality in a doctor, but it cannot in the end deal with the real organic complaint that is at the bottom of it. Most of the time my father was his usual cheerful self, but the atmosphere of our home altered. He still went to the club, spent his summer days at the cricket ground, came back with amusing stories, was the same kindly personality. He was never cross or irritable, but the shadow of apprehension was there, also felt, of course, by my mother, who made valiant attempts to reassure my father and to tell him that he looked better, felt better, was better. At the same time the shadow of financial worry darkened. The money from my grandfather's will had been invested in house property in New York, but the buildings were leasehold, not freehold. By now, apparently, they were in a part of the city where the land would have been valuable but the buildings were worth practically nothing. The owner of the land was, I gather, uncooperative an elderly woman of seventy-odd, who appeared to have a stranglehold, preventing any development or improvement. The income that should have come over seemed always to be swallowed up in repairs or taxation. Catching scraps of conversation which seemed to me of dramatic import, I hurried upstairs and announced to Marie in the best manner of Victorian stories that we were ruined. Marie did not seem to me as distressed as I thought she. Ought to have been, however, she must have attempted some condolence with my mother, who came to me with some annoyance. Really, Agatha, you must not repeat things in an exaggerated way. We are. Not ruined. We are just badly off for the time being and will have to economize. Not ruined. I said, deeply chagrined. Not ruined, said my mother firmly. I must admit that I was disappointed. In the many books I had read ruin happened frequently, and was treated as it should be treated, seriously. There would be threats of blowing out one's brains, a heroine leaving a rich mansion in rags, and so on. I forgot you were even in the room, said my mother. But you understand, no repeating of things that you overhear. I said I would not, but I felt injured because only a short time before I had been criticized for not telling what I had overheard of another incident. Tony and I had been seated under the dining room table one night just before dinner. It was a favorite place of ours, suitable for the playing of adventures in crypts, dungeons, and the like. We were hardly daring to breathe, so that the robbers who had imprisoned us should not hear us, this was not true of Tony who was fat and panted, when Barter, the housemaid who assisted the parlor maid at dinner, came in with the tureen of soup which she placed on the sideboard hot plate. She lifted the lid and inserted the big soup ladle. Ladling out a spoonful, she took some swigs from it. Louis, the parlor maid, came in and said, I am just going to ring the gong, then broke off and exclaimed, Why, Louis, whatever are you doing? Just refreshing myself, said Barter, with a hearty laugh. Mm, not bad soup, and she took another swig. Now, you put that back and the lid on, said Louis, shocked. Really? Barter laughed her fat good-natured chuckle, 
put back the ladle, replaced the lid, and departed to the kitchen for the soup plates as Tony and I emerged. Is it good soup? I inquired with interest, as I prepared to take myself off. Oh, I never. Miss Agatha, you give me such a fright, you did. I was mildly surprised, but never mentioned it until one day a couple of years later. My mother, talking to Madge, mentioned our former housemaid, Barter. I suddenly broke into the conversation, saying, I remember Barter. She used to drink soup out of the tureen in the dining room before you all came into dinner. This caused lively interest on the part of both my mother and Madge. But why didn't you ever tell me, asked mother. I stared at her. I couldn't see the point. Well, I said, it seemed, I hesitated, mustering all my dignity, and proclaimed, I don't care for parting with information. After that it was always a joke brought up against me. Agatha doesn't like parting with information. It was true enough. I didn't. Unless they struck me as apposite or interesting, I tucked away any scraps of information that came to me, locked them up, as it were, in a file inside my head. This was incomprehensible to the rest of my family, who were all extrovert talkers. If asked to keep a secret they never by any chance remembered to do so. It made them all much more entertaining than I was. If Madge went to a dance or to a garden party, when she came back she had quantities of amusing things to tell. Indeed my sister was an entertaining person in every way, wherever she went things happened to her. Even later in life, going down the village to do a little marketing, she would come back with something extraordinary that had occurred or something somebody had said. These things were not untruths, either, there was always a good foundation of fact, but worked up by Madge to make a better story. I, on the contrary, presumably taking after my father in this respect, when asked if anything amusing had happened, would immediately say, nothing. What was Mrs. So and so wearing at the party? I don't remember. Mrs. S has done up her drawing room again I hear, what color is it now? I didn't look. Oh, Agatha, you really are hopeless, you never notice anything. I continued on the whole to keep my own counsel. I don't think I meant to be secretive. It just seemed to me that most things didn't matter, so why keep talking about them? Or else I was so busy conducting the conversations and quarrels of the girls and inventing adventures for Tony and myself that I could not pay attention to the small affairs going on round me. It took something like a rumor of ruin to get me really aroused. Undoubtedly I was a dull child, with every prospect of growing up to be the kind of person who is most difficult to integrate properly in a party. I have never been good at parties, and never much enjoyed them. I suppose there were children's parties, but I don't think there were nearly as many then as there are nowadays. I do remember going to tea with friends and friends coming to tea with me. That I did enjoy, and do nowadays. Set parties, I think, in my youth only happened round Christmas time. I seem to remember one fancy dress party and another at which there was a conjurer. I fancy my mother was anti-party, being of the opinion that children got too hot, overexcited, and overeaten, and frequently came home and were sick from all three causes. She was probably right. At any children's parties of any size that I have gone to, I have come to the conclusion that at least a third of the children are not really enjoying themselves. A party is controllable up to 20 in number, beyond that, I should say, it is dominated by a lavatory complex. Children who want to go to the lavatory, who don't like to say they want to go to the lavatory, leave going to the lavatory till the last minute, and so on. If the lavatories are inadequate to deal with large quantities of children who all want to use them at once, chaos and some regrettable incidents ensue. I remember one little girl of only two whose mother had been persuaded, against the advice of her experienced nanny, to bring her child to one party. Annette is so sweet, she must come. I'm sure she will enjoy it, and we'll all take great care of her. As soon as they got to the party her mother, to be on the safe side, marched her to a potty. Annette, worked up to a fever of excitement, was quite unable to do her little performance. Oh, well, perhaps she doesn't really want to go, said the mother hopefully. They came downstairs and when a conjurer was producing things of every kind from his ears and his nose, and making the children laugh, and they were all standing round shouting and clapping their hands, the worst happened. My dear, said an elderly aunt, recounting this to my mother. You really have never seen anything like it, poor child. Right in the middle of the floor. Just like a horse, it was. Marie must have left some time before my father's death, possibly a year or two. She had contracted to come for two years to England, but she stayed on at least a year after. 
she was homesick for her family and, also, I think, being sensible and practical, realized it was time for her to think in a serious French way about marriage. She had saved up a very nice little dot from her wages, and so, with tears, fond embraces to her dear mies, Marie went, and left me very lonely. We had, however, before she departed, come to an agreement on the subject of my sister's future husband. That, as I have said, had been one of our continual sources of speculation. Marie's selection had been firmly, L.E. Monsieur Blonde. My mother, as a girl living with her aunt in Cheshire, had had a school friend to whom she was much devoted. When Annie Brown married James Watts and my mother married her step-cousin Frederick Miller the two girls agreed that they would never forget each other and that they would always exchange letters and news. Although my grandmother left Cheshire for London, the two girls still kept in touch with each other. Annie Watts had five children, four boys and a girl, mother, of course, had three. They exchanged photographs of their children at various ages, and sent presents to them at Christmas. So when my sister was going on a visit to Ireland, to make up her mind, whether she was going to get engaged to a certain young man who was anxious to marry her, my mother mentioned Madge's journey to Annie Watts, and Annie begged Madge to come and stay at Abney Hall in Cheshire, on her way back from Holyhead. She would so much like to see one of mother's children. Madge, therefore, having had a good time in Ireland and having decided that she did not want to marry Charlie P. after all, broke her journey back and stayed with the Watts family. The eldest son, James, who was then 21 or 22, and was still at Oxford, was a quiet fair-haired young man. He had a soft low voice and did not speak much, and he paid much less attention to my sister than most young men did. She found this so extraordinary that it excited her interest. She took a good deal of trouble over James, but was not sure what effect she had made. Anyway, after she came home, desultory correspondence took place between them. Actually James had been bowled over by her from the first moment she appeared, but it was not in his nature to display such emotion. He was shy and reserved. He came to stay with us the following summer. I took a great fancy to him at once. He was kind to me, always treating me seriously, and not making silly jokes or talking to me as though I was a little girl. He treated me as an individual, and I became devoted to him. Marie also thought well of him. So, L.E. Monsieur Blonde was constantly discussed between us in the sewing room. I don't think they really seem to care for each other very much, Marie. Ah, Maze we, he thinks of her a great deal, and he watches her when she is not looking. Oh yes, I.L.S. bien Epris. And it would be a good marriage, very sensible. He has the good prospects, I hear, and is tout a fate un garçon serious. He will make a very good husband. And Mademoiselle, she is gay, witty, full of fun and laughter. It will suit her well to have a quiet and steady husband, and he will appreciate her because she is so different. The person who didn't like him, I think, was my father, but I believe that is almost inevitable with the fathers of charming and gay daughters, they want somebody much better than could ever have been born at all. Mothers are supposed to feel the same about their sons' wives. As my brother never married, my mother was not affected that way. I must say, she never considered that her daughter's husbands were good enough for them, but she admitted herself that that was a failing on her part rather than a failing on theirs. Of course, she said, I can't think any man would be good enough for either of my two daughters. One of the great joys in life was the local theater. We were all lovers of the theater in my family. Madge and Monty went practically every week and usually I was allowed to accompany them. As I grew older it became more and more frequent. We went to the pit stalls always, the pit itself was supposed to be rough. The pit cost a shilling and the pit stalls, which were two rows of seats in front, behind about ten rows of stalls, were where the Miller family sat, enjoying every kind of theatrical entertainment. I don't know whether it was the first play I saw, but certainly among the first was Hearts Are Trumps, a roaring melodrama of the worst type. There was a villain in it, the wicked woman was called Lady Winifred, and there was a beautiful girl who had been done out of a fortune. Revolvers were fired, and I clearly remember the last scene, when a young man hanging by a rope from the Alps cut the rope and died heroically to save either the girl he loved or the man whom the girl he loved loved. I remember going through this story point by point. I suppose, I said, that the really bad ones were spades, father being a great whist player, I was always hearing talk of cards, and the ones who weren't quite so bad were clubs. I think perhaps Lady Winifred was a club, because she repented, and so did the man who cut the rope on the mountain. And the diamonds, I reflected. 
Just worldly, I said, in my Victorian tone of disapproval. One of the great yearly events was the Torquay Regatta, which took place on the last Monday and Tuesday in August. I started saving up for it at the beginning of May. When I say I remember the regatta I do not so much mean the yacht racing as the fair which accompanied it. Madge, of course, used to go with father to Halden Pier to watch the sailing, and we usually had a house party staying for the regatta ball in the evening. Father, mother, and Madge used to go to the regatta yacht club tea in the afternoon, and all the various functions connected with sailing. Madge never did more sailing than she could help, because she was, throughout her life, an incurably bad sailor. However, a passionate interest was taken in our friend's yacht. There were picnics and parties, but this was the social side of the regatta in which I was too young to participate. My looked forward to joy in life was the fair. The merry-go-rounds, where you rode on horses with manies, round and round and round, and a kind of switchback where you tore up and down slopes. Two machines blared music, and as you came round on the horses and the switchback cars, the tunes combined to make a horrible cacophony. Then there were all the shows, the fat woman, Madame Arensky, who told the future, the human spider, horrible to look at, the shooting gallery, where Madge and Monty spent always a great deal of time and money. And there were coconut shies, from which Monty used to obtain large quantities of coconuts and bring them home to me. I was passionately fond of coconut. I was given a few shies at the coconuts myself, gallantly allowed so far forward by the man in charge that I sometimes actually managed to knock a coconut off. Coconut shies were proper coconut shies then. Nowadays there are still shies, but the coconuts are so arranged in a kind of saucer that nothing but the most stupendous mixture of luck and strength would topple one. Then one had a sporting chance. Out of six shots you usually got one, and Monty once got five. The hoop loss, the cupie dolls, the pointers, and all those things had not arrived yet. There were various stalls that sold things. My particular passion was what were known as penny monkeys. They cost a penny, and they were fluffy little representations of monkeys on a long pin which you stuck into your coat. Every year I purchased six to eight of these, and added them to my collection pink, green, brown, red, yellow. As the years went by it became more difficult to find a different color or a different pattern. There was also the famous nougat, which only appeared at the fair. A man stood behind a table chopping nougat from an enormous pink and white block in front of him. He yelled, shouted, and offered bits for auction. Now, friends, sixpence for a stupendous piece. All right, love, cut it in half. Now then, what about that for four pence, and so on and so on. There were some ready-made packets which you could buy for tuppence, but the fun was entering the auction. There, to the little lady there. Yes, tuppence halfpenny to you. Goldfish did not arrive as a novelty in the regatta until I was about twelve. It was a great excitement when they did. The whole stall was covered with goldfish bowls, one fish in each, and you threw ping-pong balls for them. If a ball lodged in the mouth of one of the bowls, the goldfish was yours. That, like the coconuts, was fairly easy to begin with. The first regatta they appeared we got eleven between us, and bore them home in triumph to live in the tub. But the price had soon advanced from a penny a ball to sixpence a ball. In the evening there were fireworks. Since we could not see them from our house, or only the very high rockets, we usually spent the evening with some friends who lived just over the harbor. It was a nine o'clock party, with lemonade, ices and biscuits handed round. That was another delight of those days that I miss very much, not being of an alcoholic persuasion, the garden parties. The garden parties of pre-1914 were something to be remembered. Everyone was dressed up to the nines, high-heeled shoes, muslin frocks with blue sashes, large leghorn hats with drooping roses. There were lovely ices, strawberry, vanilla, pistachio, orange water and raspberry water was the usual selection. With every kind of cream cake, of sandwich, of eclair, and peaches, musket grapes, and nectarines. From this I deduce that garden parties were practically always held in August. I don't remember any strawberries and cream. There was a certain pain in getting there, of course. Those who hadn't got carriages took a hired cab if they were aged or infirm, but all the young people walked a mile and a half to two miles from different parts of Torquay, some might be lucky and live near, but others were always bound to be a good way away, because Torquay is built on seven hills. There is no doubt that walking up hills in high-heeled shoes, holding up one's long skirt in one's left hand and one's parasol in the right, was something of an ordeal. It was worth it, however 
to get to the garden party. My father died when I was eleven. His health had got slowly worse, but his illness seems never to have been precisely diagnosed. There is no doubt that constant financial worry weakened his resistance to illness of any kind. He had been at Ealing, staying with his stepmother for about a week, and seeing various friends in London who might be able to help him find some kind of job. Finding jobs was not an easy thing to do at that particular date. Either you were a lawyer or a doctor or managed an estate, were in one of the services, or were a barrister, but the great world of business did not provide the livelihood that we expect of it nowadays. There were big financial banking houses, such as Pierpont Morgans, and others in which my father had some acquaintances, but everyone was of course a professional, either you belonged to one of the banking houses and had been in it ever since you were a boy, or you did not. My father, like most of his contemporaries, was not trained for anything. He did a great deal of charitable work, and other things that would nowadays provide a paid position, but it was very different then. His financial position was perplexing to him, and indeed perplexed his executors after his death. It was a question of where the money left by my grandfather had disappeared to. My father had lived well within his supposed income. It was there on paper, but it was never there in fact, and there always seemed to be plausible excuses to explain this and to show that this default would only be temporary, just a matter of special repairs. The estate was no doubt mismanaged by the trustees and by their successors, but it was too late to remedy that. He worried, the weather was cold, he caught a bad chill, and double pneumonia developed. My mother was sent for to Ealing, and presently Madge and I followed her there. He was by then very ill. My mother never left him. Night or day. We had two hospital nurses in the house. I wandered about, unhappy and frightened, praying earnestly that father might get well again. One picture remains etched in my mind. It was afternoon. I was standing on the half landing. Suddenly the door of father and mother's bedroom opened. My mother came out in a kind of rush, her hands held to her head over her eyes. She rushed from there into the adjoining room and shut the door behind her. A hospital nurse came out and spoke to Granny, who was coming up the stairs. It's all over, she said. I knew then that my father was dead. They did not take a child to the funeral of course. I wandered about the house in a queer state of turmoil. Something awful had happened, something that I had never envisaged could happen. The blinds of the house were pulled down, the lamps were lit. In the dining room, in her big chair, Granny sat writing endless letters, in her own peculiar style. From time to time she shook her head sadly. Except when she got up to go to the funeral, my mother lay in her room. She did not eat anything for two days, because I heard Hannah commenting on the fact. I remember Hannah with gratitude. Dear old Hannah, with her worn, lined face. She beckoned me to the kitchen and told me she needed someone to help her mix pastry. They were very devoted, said Hannah, again and again. It was a good marriage. Yes, it was indeed a good marriage. I found among various old things, a letter written by my father to my mother, possibly only three or four days before his death. He wrote of how he longed to return to her at Torquay, nothing satisfactory had been arranged in London, but he felt, he said, he would forget it all when he was back with his dearest Clara again. He went on to say that he had told her often before but he wanted to tell her again how much she meant to him. You have made all the difference in my life, he said. No man ever had a wife like you. Every year I have been married to you I love you more. I thank you for your affection and love and sympathy. God bless you, my dearest, we shall soon be together again. I found this letter in an embroidered pocket book. It was the pocket book my mother had worked for him as a young girl and sent to him in America. He had always kept it, and in it he kept two poems she had written him. My mother added this letter to it. The house at Ealing had a somewhat ghoulish character these days. It was full of whispering relatives, Granny B, uncles, the wives of uncles, courtesy aunts, Granny's old lady cronies, they all half whispered, sighed, shook their heads. And everyone wore heavy black, I too had black clothes. I must say my morning clothes were about the only consolation to me at that time. I felt important, worthwhile and part of things when I put on my black clothes. Then there were more whispers of, really, Clara must be made to rouse herself. At intervals Granny would say, wouldn't you like to read this letter I've had from Mr. B or Mrs. C. Such a beautiful letter of condolence, really I think you would feel most touched by it. My mother would say fiercely, I don't want to see it. She opened her own letters but threw them aside almost immediately. Only one she treated differently. 
Is that from Cassie? Granny asked. Yes, Auntie, it's from Cassie. She folded it up and put it in her bag. She understands, she said, and she went out of the room. Cassie was my American godmother, Mrs. Sullivan. I had probably seen her as a small child, but I only remember her when she came to London about a year later. She was a wonderful person, a little woman with white hair and the gayest, sweetest face imaginable, bursting with vitality, with a strange joyousness about her, yet she had had one of the saddest lives possible. Her husband, to whom she was devoted, had died quite young. She had had two lovely boys, and they too had died, paralyzed. Some nursemaid, said my grandmother, must have let them sit on the damp grass. Really, I suppose, it must have been a case of polio, not recognized at that time, which was always called rheumatic fever, the result of damp, and which resulted in crippling paralysis. Anyway, her two children had died. One of her grown-up nephews, who was staying in the same house, also had suffered from paralysis and remained crippled for life. Yet, in spite of her losses, in spite of everything, Aunt Cassie was gay, bright, and full of more human sympathy than anyone I have ever known. She was the one person mother longed to see at that time. She understands, it is no good making consoling phrases at people. I remember that I was used as an emissary by the family, that somebody perhaps granny, or perhaps one of my aunts, took me aside and murmured that I must be my mama's little comforter, that I must go into the room where my mother was lying and point out to her that father was happy now, that he was in heaven, that he was at peace. I was willing, it was what I believed myself, what surely everyone believed. I went in, a little timid, with the vague feeling which children have when they are doing what they have been told is right, and what they know is right, but which they feel may, somehow or other, for a reason that they don't know, be wrong. I went timidly up to mother and touched her. Mummy, father is at peace now. He is happy. You wouldn't want him back, would you? Suddenly my mother reared up in bed, with a violent gesture that startled me into jumping back. Yes, I would, she cried in a low voice. Yes, I would. I would do anything in the world to have him back, anything, anything at all. I'd force him to come back, if I could. I want him, I want him back here, now, in this world with me. I shrank away, rather frightened. My mother said quickly, it's all right, darling. It's all right. It's just that I am not, not very well at present. Thank you for coming. And she kissed me and I went away consoled. Part 3. Growing up. First. Life took on a completely different complexion after my father's death. I stepped out of my child's world, a world of security and thoughtlessness, to enter the fringes of the world of reality. I think there is no doubt that from the man of the family comes the stability of the home. We all laugh when the phrase comes, your father knows best, but that phrase does represent what was so marked a feature of later Victorian life. Father, the rock upon which the home is set. Father likes meals punctually, father mustn't be worried after dinner, father would like you to play duets with him. You accept it all unquestioningly. Father provides meals, father sees that the house works to rule, father provides music lessons. Father took great pride and pleasure in Madge's company as she grew up. He enjoyed her wit and her attractiveness, they were excellent companions to each other. He found in her, I think, some of the gaiety and humor my mother probably lacked but he had a soft spot in his heart for his little girl, the afterthought, little Agatha. We had our favorite rhyme. Agatha Pagatha my black hen, she lays eggs for gentlemen, she laid six and she laid seven, and one day she laid eleven. Father and I were very fond of that particular joke. But Monty, I think, was really his favorite. His love for his son was more than he would feel for any daughter. Monty was an affectionate boy, and he had great affection for his father. He was, alas, unsatisfactory from the point of view of making a success of life, and father was unceasingly worried about this. In a way, I think, his happiest time, where Monty was concerned, was after the South African War. Monty obtained a commission in a regular regiment, the East Surreys, and went straight from South Africa, with his regiment, to India. He appeared to be doing well and to have settled down in his army life. In spite of father's financial worries, Monty at least was one problem removed for the time. Being. Madge married James Watts about nine months after my father's death, though a little reluctant to leave mother. Mother herself was urgent that the marriage should take place, and that they should not have to wait longer. She said, and truly I think, 
that it would be even more difficult for her to part with Madge as time went on and their companionship drew them closer. James's father was anxious for him to marry young. He was just leaving Oxford, and would go straight into the business, and he said it would be happier for him if he could marry Madge and settle down in their own home. Mr. Watts was going to build a house for his son on part of his land, and the young couple could settle down there. So things were arranged. My father's American executor, Augusta Montant, came from New York and stayed with us a week. He was a large stout man, genial, very charming, and nobody could have been kinder to my mother. He told her frankly that father's affairs were in a bad mess, and that he had been extremely ill-advised by lawyers and others who had pretended to act for him. A lot of good money had been thrown after bad by trying to improve the New York property by half-hearted measures. It was better, he said, that a good deal of the property should be abandoned altogether to save taxes. The income that was left would be very small. The big estate my grandfather had left had disappeared into thin air. H.B. Claflin Co., the firm in which my grandfather had been partner, would still provide Granny's income, as the widow of a partner, and also a certain income for mother, though not a large one. We three children, under my grandfather's will, would get, in English currency, £100 a year each. The rest of the vast amount of dollars had been also in property, which had gone downhill and fallen derelict, or had been sold off in the past for far too little. The question arose now whether my mother could afford to live on at Ashfield. Here, I think, mother's own judgment was better than anyone else's. She thought definitely that it would be a bad thing to stay on. The house would need repairs in the future, and it would be difficult to manage on a small income, possible but difficult. It would be better to sell the house and to buy another smaller house somewhere in Devonshire, perhaps near Exeter, which would cost less to run and would leave a certain amount of money from the exchange to add to income. Although my mother had no business training or knowledge, she had really quite a lot of common sense. Here, however, she came up against her children. Both Madge and I, and my brother, writing from India, protested violently against selling Ashfield, and begged her to keep it. We said it was our home and we couldn't bear to part with it. My sister's husband said he could always spare mother a small addition to her. Income. If Madge and he came down in the summers they could help with the running expenses. Finally, touched I think by my violent love for Ashfield, mother gave in. She said at any rate we would try how we got on. I now suspect that mother herself had never really cared for Torquay as a place to live. She had a great passion for cathedral towns, and she had always been fond of Exeter. She and my father sometimes went for a holiday touring various cathedral towns, to please her, I think, not my father, and I believe she rather enjoyed the idea of living in a much smaller house near Exeter. However, she was an unselfish person, and fond of the house itself, so Ashfield continued to be our home, and I continued to adore it. To have kept it on was not a wise thing, I know that now. We could have sold it and bought a much more manageable house. But though my mother recognized that at the time, and must indeed have recognized it very much better later, yet I think she was content to have had it so. Because Ashfield has meant something to me for so many years. It has been there, my background, my shelter, the place where I truly belong. I have never suffered from the absence of roots. Though to hold on to it may have been foolish, it gave me something that I value, a treasure of remembrance. It has also given me a lot of trouble, worry, expense, and difficulties, but surely for everything you love you have to pay some price. My father died in November, my sister's marriage took place the following September. It was quiet, with no reception afterwards, owing to the mourning still observed for my father's death. It was a pretty wedding and took place in Old Tor Church. With the importance of being first bridesmaid I enjoyed it all immensely. The bridesmaids all wore white, with white wreaths of flowers on their heads. The wedding took place at 11 in the morning, and we had the wedding breakfast at Ashfield. The happy couple were blessed not only with lots of lovely wedding presents but with every variety of torture that could have been thought up by my boy cousin Gerald and myself. All through their honeymoon rice fell out of every garment they removed from suitcases. Satin shoes were tied onto the carriage in which they drove away, and chalked on the back, after it had first been carefully examined to make sure that nothing of the kind had occurred, were the words, Mrs. Jimmy Watts is a first class name. So off they drove to a honeymoon in Italy. My mother retired to her bed exhausted and weeping, and Mr. and Mrs. Watts to their hotel, Mrs. Watts no doubt also to weep. Such appears to be the effect of weddings on mothers. 
The young Wattses, my cousin Gerald and I were left to view each other with the suspicion of strange dogs, and try to decide whether or not we were going to like each other. There was a great deal of natural antagonism at first between Nan Watts and me. Unfortunately, but in the fashion of the day, we had each been given harangues about the other by our respective families. Nan, who was a gay boisterous tomboy, had been told now nicely Agatha always behaved, so quiet and polite. And while Nan had my decorum and general solemnity praised to her I had been admonished on the subject of Nan, who was said to be, never shy, always answered when she was spoken to never flushed, or muttered, or sat silent. We both therefore looked at each other with a great deal of ill will. A sticky half hour ensued, and then things livened up. In the end we organized a kind of steeplechase round the schoolroom, doing wild leaps from piled up chairs and landing always on the large and somewhat elderly Chesterfield. We were all laughing, shouting, screaming, and having a glorious time. Nan revised her opinion of me, here was somebody anything but quiet, shouting at the top of her voice. I revised my opinion of Nan as being stuck up, talking too much, and in with the grown UPS. We had a splendid time, we all liked each other, and the springs of the sofa were permanently broken. Afterwards there was a snack meal and we went to the theater, to the Pirates of Penzance. From that time the friendship never looked back and continued intermittently all throughout lives. We dropped it, picked it up, and things seemed just the same when we came together again. Nan is one of the friends I miss most now. With her, as with few others, I could talk together of Abney and Ashfield and the old days, the dogs, and the pranks we played, and our young men, and the theatricals we got up and acted in. After Madge's departure the second stage of my life began. I was a child still, but the first phase of childhood had ended. The brilliance of joy, despair of sorrow, the momentous importance of every day of one's life, those things are the hallmark of childhood. With them go security and the complete lack of thought for the morrow. We were no longer the Millers, a family. We were now just two people living together, a middle-aged woman and an untried, naive girl. Things seemed the same, but the atmosphere was different. My mother had bad heart attacks since my father's death. They came on her with no warning, and nothing that the doctors gave her helped. I knew for the first time what it was to feel anxiety for other people, whilst at the same time being a child still, so that my anxiety was naturally exaggerated. I used to wake up at night, my heart beating, sure that mother was dead. Twelve or thirteen may be a natural time of anxiety. I knew, I think, that I was being foolish and giving. Way too exaggerated feelings, but there it was. I would get up, creep along the corridor, kneel down by my mother's door with my head to the hinge, trying to hear her breathing. Very often I was quickly reassured, a welcome snore rewarded me. Mother had a special style of snoring, beginning daintly and pianissimo and working up to a terrific explosion, after which she would usually turn over and there would be no repetition of the snoring for at least another three quarters of an hour. If I heard a snore then, delighted, I went back to bed and to sleep, but if there happened to be none, I remained there, crouching in miserable apprehension. It would have been far more sensible if I had opened the door and walked in to reassure myself, but somehow that does not seem to have occurred to me, or possibly mother always locked her door at night. I did not tell mother about these terrible fits of anxiety, and I don't think she ever guessed at them. I used also to have fears, when she had gone out into the town, that she might have been run over. It all seems silly now, so unnecessary. It wore off gradually, I think, and probably lasted only for a year or two. Later I slept in father's dressing room, off her bedroom, with the door slightly ajar, so that if she did have an attack in the night I could go in, raise her head, and fetch her brandy and sal volatile. Once I felt that I was on the spot, I no longer suffered from the awful pangs of anxiety. I was, I suppose, always overburdened with imagination. That has served me well in my profession, it must, indeed, be the basis of the novelist's craft, but it can give you some bad sessions in other respects. The conditions of our life changed after my father's death. Social occasions practically ceased. My mother saw a few old friends but nobody else. We were very badly off and had to economize in every way. It was, of course, all we could do to keep up Ashfield. My mother no longer gave luncheon or dinner parties. She had two servants instead of three. She tried to tell Jane that we were now badly off and that she would have to manage with two young, inexpensive maids, but she stressed that Jane, with her magnificent cooking, could command a large salary, and that she ought to have it. 
mother would look about and find Jane a place where she would get good wages and also have a kitchen made under her. You deserve it, said mother. Jane displayed no emotion, she was eating at the time, as usual. She nodded her head slowly, continued to chew, then said, Very well, ma'am. Just as you say. You know best. The next morning, however, she reappeared. I'd just like a word with you, ma'am. I've been thinking things over and I would prefer to stay here. I quite understand what you said, and I would be prepared to take less wages, but I have been here a very long time. In any case, my brother's been urging me to come and keep house for him and I have promised I will do so when he retires, that will probably be in four or five years time. Until then I would like to stay here. That is very, very good of you, said my mother, emotionally. Jane, who had a horror of emotion, said, it will be convenient, and moved majestically from the room. There was only one drawback to this arrangement. Having cooked in one way for so many years, Jane could not stop cooking in the same strain. If we had a joint it was always an enormous roast. Colossal beefsteak pies, huge tarts, and gargantuan steam puddings would be put on the table. Mother would say, only enough for two, remember, Jane, or, only enough for four, but Jane could never understand. Jane's own scale of hospitality was terribly expensive for the household, every day of the week, seven or eight of her friends were wont to arrive for tea, and eat pastries, buns, scones, rock cakes and jam tarts. In the end, in desperation, seeing the household books mounting up, my mother said gently that perhaps, as things were different now, Jane would have one day a week when she could have her friends. This would save a certain amount of waste, in case a lot was cooked and then people did not turn up. Thenceforward Jane held court on Wednesdays only. Our own meals was now very different from the normal three or four course feasts. Dinners were cut out altogether, and mother and I had a macaroni cheese or a rice pudding or something like that in the evening. I'm afraid this saddened Jane a great deal. Also, little by little, mother managed to take over the ordering, which formerly had been done by Jane. It had been one of my father's friend's great delights, when staying in the house, to hear Jane ordering on the telephone in her deep bass Devonshire voice, and I want six lobsters, hen lobsters, and prawns, not less than, it became a favorite phrase in our family. Not less than was not only used by Jane but also by a later cook of ours, Mrs. Potter. What splendid days for the tradesmen those were. But I've always ordered twelve fillets of sole, ma'am, Jane would say, looking distressed. The fact that there were not enough mouths to devour twelve fillets of sole, not even counting a couple in the kitchen, never appeared to enter her head. None of these changes were particularly noticeable to me. Luxury or economy mean little when you are young. If you buy boiled sweets instead of chocolates the difference is not noticeable. Mackerel I had always preferred to sole, and a whiting with its tail in its mouth I thought a most agreeable looking fish. My personal life was not much altered. I read enormous quantities of books worked through all the rest of Henty, and was introduced to Stanley Wayman. What glorious historical novels they were. I read The Castle and only the other day and thought how good it was. The Prisoner of Zenda was my opening to romance, as it was for many others. I read it again and again. I fell deeply in love, not with Rudolf Rassendel, as might have been expected, but with the real king imprisoned in his dungeon and sighing. I yearned to succour him, to rescue him, to assure him that I, Flavia, of course, loved him and not Rudolf Rassendel. I also read the whole of Jules Verne in French, Le Voyage au Centre de la Terre was my favourite for many months. I loved the contrast between the prudent nephew and the cocksure uncle. Any book I really liked I read over again at monthly intervals, then, after about a year, I would be fickle and choose another favourite. There were also L.T. Midas books for girls, which my mother disliked very much, she said the girls in them were vulgar and only thought of being rich and having smart clothes. Secretly, I rather liked them, but with a guilty feeling of being vulgar in my tastes. Some of the Henty's mother read aloud to me, though she was slightly exasperated by the length of the descriptions. She also read a book called The Last Days of Bruce, of which both she and I approved heartily. By way of lessons, I was put onto a book called Great Events of History, of which I had to read one chapter and answer the questions about it set in a note at the end. This was a very good book. It taught a lot of the main events that happened in Europe and elsewhere, which one could link on to the history of the kings of England, from Little Arthur onwards. How satisfactory to be firmly told so and so was a bad king, it has a kind of biblical finality.
I knew the dates of the kings of England and the names of all their wives, information that has never been much use to me. Every day I had to learn how to spell pages of words. I suppose the exercise did me some good, but I was still an extraordinarily bad speller and have remained so until the present day. My principal pleasures were the musical and other activities into which I entered with a family called Huxley. Dr. Huxley had a vague but clever wife. There were five girls, Mildred, Sybil, Muriel, Phyllis, and Enid. I came between Muriel and Phyllis, and Muriel became my special friend. She had a long face and dimples, which is unusual in a long face, pale golden hair, and she laughed a great deal. I joined them first in their weekly singing class. About ten girls took part in singing part songs and oratorios under the direction of a singing master, Mr. Crow. There was also, the orchestra, Muriel and I both played mandolins, Sybil, and a girl called Connie Stevens the violin, Mildred the cello. Looking back on the day of the orchestra, I think the Huxleys were an enterprising family. The stuffier of the old inhabitants of Torquay looked slightly askance at those Huxley girls, mainly because they were in the habit of walking up and down the Strand, which was the shopping center of the town, between twelve and one, first three girls, arm in arm, then two girls and the governess, they swung their arms, and walked up and down, and laughed and joked, and, cardinal sin against them, they did not wear gloves. These things were social offenses at that time. However, since Dr. Huxley was by far the most fashionable doctor in Torquay, and Mrs. Huxley was what is known as, well-connected, the girls were passed as socially acceptable. It was a curious social pattern, looking back. It was snobbish, I suppose, on the other hand, a certain type of snobbishness was much looked down upon. People who introduced the aristocracy into their conversation too frequently were disapproved of and laughed at. Three phases have succeeded each other during the span of my life. In the first the questions would be, but who is she, dear? Who are her people? Is she one of the Yorkshire Twiddledoss? Of course, they are badly off, very badly off, but she was a Wilmot. This was to be succeeded in due course by, oh yes, of course they are pretty dreadful, but then they are terribly rich. Have the people who have taken the larches got money? Oh well, then we'd better call. The third phase was different again, well, dear, but are they amusing? Yes, well of course they are not well off, and nobody knows where they came from, but they are very very amusing. After which digression into social values I had better return to the orchestra. Did we make an awful noise, I wonder? Probably. Anyway, it gave us a lot of fun and increased our musical knowledge. It led on to something more exciting, which was the getting up of a performance of Gilbert and Sullivan. The Huxleys and their friends had already given patience, that was before I joined their ranks. The next performance in view was the Yeoman of the Guard a somewhat ambitious undertaking. In fact I am surprised that their parents did not discourage them. But Mrs. Huxley was a wonderful pattern of aloofness, for which, I must say, I admire her, since parents were not particularly aloof then. She encouraged her children to get up anything they liked, helped them if they asked for help, and, if not, left them to it. The Yeoman of the Guard was duly cast. I had a fine strong soprano voice, about the only soprano they had, and I was naturally in the seventh heaven at being chosen to play Colonel Fairfax. We had a little difficulty with my mother, who was old-fashioned in her views about what girls could or could not wear on their legs if they were to appear in public. Legs were legs, definitely indelicate. For me to display myself in trunk hose, or anything of that kind, would, my mother thought, be most indecorous. I suppose I was thirteen or fourteen by then, and already five foot seven. There was, alas, no sign of the full rich bosom that I had hoped for when I was it. Cotterets. A yeoman of the guard's uniform was adjudged all right, though it had to be made with unusually baggy plus four trousers, but the Elizabethan gentleman presented more difficulties. It seems to me silly nowadays, but it was a serious problem then. Anyway, it was surmounted by my mother saying that it would be all right, but I must wear a disguising cloak thrown over one shoulder. So a cloak was managed out of a piece of turquoise blue velvet among Granny's pieces. Granny's pieces were kept in various trunks and drawers, and comprised all types of rich and beautiful fabrics, remnants which she had bought in various sales over the last 25 years and had now more or less forgotten about. It is not terribly easy to act with a cloak draped over one shoulder and flung over the other, in such a way that the indelicacies of one's legs were more or less hidden from the audience. As far as I remember I felt no stage fright. 
Strangely enough for a terribly shy person, who very often can hardly bring herself to enter a shop and who has to grit her teeth before arriving at a large party, there was one activity in which I never felt nervous at all, and that was singing. Later, when I studied both piano and singing in Paris, I lost my nerve completely whenever I had to play the piano in the school concert but if I had to sing I felt no nervousness at all. Perhaps that was due to my early conditioning in, is life a boon, and the rest of Colonel Fairfax's repertoire. There is no doubt that the Yeoman of the Guard was one of the highlights of my existence. But I can't help thinking that it's as well that we didn't do any more operas, an experience that you really enjoyed should never be repeated. One of the odd things in looking back is that, while you remember how things arrived or happened, you never know how or why they disappeared or came to a stop. I cannot remember many scenes in which I participated with the Huxleys after that time, yet I am sure there was no break in friendship. At one time we seemed to be meeting every day, and then I would find myself writing to Lully in Scotland. Perhaps Dr. Huxley left to practice elsewhere, or retired. I don't remember any definite leave-taking. I remember that Lully's terms of friendship were clearly defined. You can't be my best friend, she explained, because there are the Scottish girls, the McCrackens. They have always been our best friends. Brenda is my best friend, and Janet is Phyllis's best friend, but you can be my second best friend. So I was content with being Lully's second best friend, and the arrangement worked well, since the best friends, the McCrackens, were only seen by the Huxleys at intervals of, I should say, roughly two years. Second. It must, I think, have been some time in March that my mother remarked that Madge was going to have a baby. I stared at her. Madge, have a baby? I was dumbfounded. I cannot imagine why I shouldn't have thought of Madge having a baby, after all, it was happening all round one, but things are always surprising when they happen in one's own family. I accepted my brother-in-law, James, or Jimmy, as I usually called him, enthusiastically, and was devoted to him. Now here was something entirely different. As usual with me, it was some time before I could take it in. I probably sat with my mouth open for quite two minutes or more. Then I said, oh, that will be exciting. When is it coming? Next week. Not quite as soon as that, said my mother. She suggested a date in October. October. I was deeply chagrined. Fancy having to wait all that time. I can't. Remember very clearly what my attitude to sex was then, I must have been between 12 and 13, but I don't think I any longer accepted the theories of doctors with black bags or heavenly busy tants with wings. By then I had realized it was a physical process, but without feeling much curiosity or, indeed, interest. I had, however, done a little mild deduction. The baby was first inside you, and then in due course it was outside you, I reflected on the mechanism, and settled on the navel as a focal point. I couldn't see what that round hole in the middle of my stomach was for, it didn't seem to be for anything else, so clearly it must be something to do with the production of a baby. My sister told me years afterwards that she had had very definite ideas, that she had thought that her navel was a keyhole, that there was a key that fitted it, which was kept by your mother, who handed it over to your husband, who unlocked it on the wedding night. It all sounded so sensible that I don't wonder she stuck firmly to her theory. I took the idea out into the garden and thought about it a good deal. Madge was going to have a baby. It was a wonderful concept, and the more I thought about it the more I was in favor of it. I was going to be an aunt, it sounded very grown up and important. I would buy it toys, I would let it play with my doll's house, I would have to be careful that Christopher, my kitten, didn't scratch it by mistake. After about a week I stopped thinking about it, it was absorbed into various daily happenings. It was a long time to wait until October. Sometime in August a telegram took my mother away from home. She said she had to go and stay with my sister in Cheshire. Auntie Granny was staying. With us at the time. Mother's sudden departure did not surprise me much, and I didn't speculate about it, because whatever mother did she did suddenly, with no apparent forethought or preparation. I was, I remember, out in the garden on the tennis lawn, looking hopefully at the pear trees to see if I could find a pear which was ripe. It was here that Alice came out to fetch me. It's nearly lunchtime and you are to come in, Miss Agatha. There is a piece of news waiting for you. Is there? What news? You've got a little nephew, said Alice. A nephew? But I wasn't going to have a nephew till October. I objected. Ah, but things don't always go as you think they will, said Alice. Come on in now. 
I came into the house and found Granny in the kitchen with a telegram in her hand. I bombarded her with questions. What did the baby look like? Why had it come now instead of October? Granny returned answers to these questions with the parrying art well known to Victorians. She had, I think, been in the middle of an obstetric conversation with Jane when I came in, because they lowered their voices and murmured something like, the other doctor said, let the labor come on, but the specialist was quite firm. It all sounded mysterious and interesting. My mind was fixed entirely on my new nephew. When Granny was carving the leg of mutton, I said. But what does he look like? What color is his hair? He's probably bald. They don't get hair at once. Bald, I said, disappointed. Will his face be very red? Probably. How big is he? Granny considered, stopped carving, and measured off a distance on the carving knife. Like that, she said. She spoke with the absolute certainty of one who knew. It seemed to me rather small. All the same the announcement made such an impression on me that I am sure if I were being asked an associative question by a psychiatrist and he gave me the keyword baby I would immediately respond with carving knife. I wonder what kind of Freudian complex he would put that answer down to. I was delighted with my nephew. Madge brought him to stay at Ashfield about a month later, and when he was two months old he was christened in Old Tor Church. Since his godmother, Nora Hewitt, could not be there, I was allowed to hold him and be proxy for her. I stood near the font, full of importance, while my sister hovered nervously at my elbow in case I should drop him. Mr. Jacob, our vicar, with whom I was well acquainted, since he was preparing me for confirmation, had a splendid hand with infants at the font, tipping the water neatly back and off their forehead, and adopting a slightly swaying motion that usually stopped the baby from howling. He was christened James Watts, like his father and grandfather. He would be known as Jack in the family. I could not help being in rather a hurry for him to get to an age when I could play with him, since his principal occupation at this time seemed to be sleeping. It was lovely to have Madge home for a long visit. I relied on her for telling me stories and providing a lot of entertainment in my life. It was Madge who told me my first Sherlock Holmes story, The Blue Carbuncle, and after that I had always been pestering her for more. The Blue Carbuncle, The Red-Headed League and The Five Orange Pips were definitely my favorites, though I enjoyed all of them. Madge was a splendid storyteller. She had, before her marriage, begun writing stories herself. Many of her short stories were accepted for Vanity Fair. To have a vain tale in Vanity Fair was considered quite a literary achievement in those days, and father was extremely proud of her. She wrote a series of stories all connected with sport, The Sixth Ball of the Over, A Rub of the Green, Cassie Plays Croquet, and others. They were amusing and witty. I reread them about 20 years ago and I thought then how well she wrote. I wonder if she would have gone on writing if she had not married. I don't think she ever saw herself seriously as a writer, she would probably have preferred to be a painter. She was one of those people who can do almost anything they put their mind to. She did not, as far as I remember, write any more short stories after she married, but about 10 or 15 years later she began to write for the stage. The Claimant was produced by Basil Dean of the Royal Theatre with Leon Quartermain and Faye Compton in it. She wrote one or two other plays, but they did not have London productions. She was also quite a good amateur actress herself, and acted with the Manchester Amateur Dramatic. There is no doubt that Madge was the talented member of our family. I personally had no ambition. I knew that I was not very good at anything. Tennis and croquet I used to enjoy playing, but I never played them well. How much more interesting it would be if I could say that I always longed to be a writer, and was determined that someday I would succeed, but, Honestly, such an idea never came into my head. As it happened, I did appear in print at the age of 11. It came about in this way. The trams came to Ealing, and local opinion immediately erupted into fury. A terrible thing to happen to Ealing, such a fine residential neighborhood, such wide streets, such beautiful houses, to have trams clanging up and down. The word progress was uttered but howled down. Everyone wrote to the press, to their MP to anyone they could think of to write to. Trams were common, they were noisy, everyone's health would suffer. There was an excellent service of brilliant red buses, with Ealing on them in large letters, which ran from Ealing Broadway to Shepherd's Bush, and another extremely useful bus, though more humble in appearance, which ran from Hanwell to Acton. And there was the good old-fashioned Great Western Railway, to say nothing of the District Railway. Trams were simply not needed. But they came. 
Inexorably, they came, and there was weeping and gnashing of teeth, and Agatha had her first literary effort published, which was a poem I wrote on the first day of the running of the trams. There were four verses of it, and one of Granny's old gentleman, that gallant bodyguard of generals, light colonels, and admirals, was persuaded by Granny to visit the local newspaper office and suggest that it should be inserted. It was and I can still remember the first verse. When first the electric trams did run in all their scarlet glory. Twas well, but ere the day was done, it was another story. After which I went on to deride a shoe that pinched. There had been some electrical fault in a shoe, or whatever it was, which conveyed the electricity to the trams, so that after running for a few hours they broke down. I was elated at seeing myself in print, but I cannot say that it led me to contemplate a literary career. In fact I only contemplated one thing, a happy marriage. About that I had complete self-assurance, as all my friends did. We were conscious of all the happiness that awaited us, we looked forward to love, to being looked after, cherished and admired, and we intended to get our own way in the things which mattered to us while at the same time putting our husband's life, career, and success before all, as was our proud duty. We didn't need pep pills or sedatives, we had belief and joy in life. We had our own personal disappointments moments of unhappiness, but on the whole life was fun. Perhaps it is fun for girls nowadays, but they certainly don't look as if it is. However, a timely thought they may enjoy melancholy, some people do. They may enjoy the emotional crises that seem always to be overwhelming them. They may even enjoy anxiety. That is certainly what we have nowadays, anxiety. My contemporaries were frequently badly off and couldn't have a quarter of the things they wanted. Why then did we have so much enjoyment? Was it some kind of sap rising in us that has ceased to rise now? Have we strangled or cut it off with education, and? Worse, anxiety over education, anxiety as to what life holds for you. We were like obstreperous flowers, often weeds maybe, but nevertheless all of us growing exuberantly, pressing violently up through cracks in pavements and flagstones, and in the most inauspicious places, determined to have our fill of life and enjoy ourselves, bursting out into the sunlight, until someone came and trod on us. Even bruised for a time, we would soon lift ahead again. Nowadays, alas, life seems to apply weed killer, selective. We have no chance to raise a head again. There are said to be those who are unfit for living. No one would ever have told us we were unfit for living. If they had, we shouldn't have believed it. Only a murderer was unfit for living. Nowadays a murderer is the one person you mustn't say is unfit for living. The real excitement of being a girl, of being, that is, a woman in embryo, was that life was such a wonderful gamble. You didn't know what was going to happen to you. That was what made being a woman so exciting. No worry about what you should be or do, biology would decide. You were waiting for the man, and when the man came, he would change your entire life. You can say what you like, that is an exciting point of view to hold at the threshold of life. What will happen? Perhaps I shall marry someone in the diplomatic service, I think I should like that, to go abroad and see all sorts of places, or, I don't think I would like to marry a sailor, you would have to spend such a lot of time living in seaside lodgings. Or, perhaps I'll marry someone who builds bridges, or an explorer. The whole world was open to you, not open to your choice, but open to what fate brought you. You might marry anyone, you might, of course, marry a drunkard or be very unhappy, but that only heightened the general feeling of excitement. And one wasn't marrying the profession, either, it was the man. In the words of old nurses, nannies, cooks and housemaids, one day Mr. Wright will come along. I remember when I was very small seeing one of mother's prettier friends being helped to dress for a dance by old Hannah, Granny's cook. She was being laced into a tight corset. Now then, Miss Phyllis, said Hannah, brace your foot against the bed and lean back, I'm going to pull. Hold your breath. Oh Hannah, I can't bear it, I can't really. I can't breathe. Now don't you fret, my pet, you can breathe all right. You won't be able to eat much supper, and that's a good thing, because young ladies shouldn't be seen eating a lot, it's not delicate. You've got to behave like a proper young lady. You're all right. I'll just get the tape measure. There you are, nineteen and a half. I could have got you to nineteen. Nineteen and a half will do quite well gasped the sufferer. You'll be glad when you get there. Suppose this is the night that Mr. writes. Coming along. You wouldn't like to be there with a thick waist, would you, and let him see you like that. Mr. Wright. 
he was more elegantly referred to sometimes as your fate. I don't know that I really want to go to this dance. Oh yes, you do, dear. Think. You might meet your fate. And of course that is what actually happens in life. Girls go to something they wanted to go to, or they didn't want to go to, it doesn't matter which, and there is their fate. Of course, there were always girls who declared they were not going to marry, usually for some noble reason. Possibly they wished to become nuns or to nurse lepers, to do something grand and important, above all self-sacrificial. I think it was almost a necessary phase. An ardent wish to become a nun seems to be far more constant in Protestant than in Catholic girls. In Catholic girls it is, no doubt, more vocational, it is recognized as one of the ways of life, whereas for a Protestant it has some aroma of religious mystery that makes it very desirable. A hospital nurse was also considered a heroic way of life, with all the prestige of Miss Nightingale behind it. But marriage was the main theme, whom you were going to marry the big question in life. By the time I was 13 or 14 I felt myself enormously advanced in age and experience. I no longer thought of myself as protected by another person. I had my own protective feelings. I felt responsible for my mother. I also began to try to know myself, the sort of person I was, what I could attempt successfully, and the things I was no good at and that I must not waste time over. I knew that I was not quick-witted, I must give myself time to look at a problem carefully before deciding how I would deal with it. I began to appreciate time. There is nothing more wonderful to have in one's life, than time. I don't believe people get enough of it nowadays. I was excessively fortunate in my childhood and youth, just because I had so much time. You wake up in the morning, and even before you are properly awake you are saying to yourself, now, what shall I do with today? You have the choice, it is there, in front of you, and you can plan as you please. I don't mean that there were not a lot of things, duties, we called them, I had to do, of course there were. There were jobs to be done in the house, days when you clean silver photograph frames, days when you darned your stockings, days when you learned a chapter of great events in history, a day when you had to go down the town and pay all the tradesmen's bills. Letters and notes to write, scales and exercises, embroidery, but they were all things that lay in my choice, to arrange as I pleased. I could plan my day, I could say, I think I'll leave my stockings until this afternoon, I will go downtown in the morning and I will come back by the other road and see whether that tree had come into blossom yet. Always when I woke up, I had the feeling which I am sure must be natural to all of us, a joy in being alive. I don't say you feel it consciously, you don't, but there you are, you are alive, and you open your eyes, and here is another day, another step, as it were, on your journey to an unknown place. That very exciting journey which is your life. Not that it is necessarily going to be exciting as a life, but it will be exciting to you because it is your life. That is one of the great secrets of existence, enjoying the gift of life that has been given to you. Not every day is necessarily enjoyable. After the first delightful feeling of another day. How wonderful, you remember you have to go to the dentist at 10.30, and that is not nearly so good. But the first waking feeling has been there, and that acts as a useful booster. Naturally, a lot depends on temperament. You are a happy person, or you are of a melancholic disposition. I don't know that you can do anything about that. I think it is the way one is made, you are either happy until something arises to make you unhappy or else you are melancholy until something distracts you from it. Naturally happy people can be unhappy and melancholic people enjoy themselves. But if I were taking a gift to a child at a christening that is what I would choose, a naturally happy frame of mind. There seems to me to be an odd assumption that there is something meritorious about working. Why? In early times man went out to hunt animals in order to feed himself and keep alive. Later, he toiled over crops, and sowed and plowed for the same reason. Nowadays, he rises early, catches the 8.15, and sits in an office all day, still for the same reason. He does it to feed himself and have a roof over his head, and, if skilled and lucky, to go a bit further and have comfort and entertainment as well. It's economic and necessary. But why is it meritorious? The old nursery adage used to be, Satan finds some mischief still for idle hands to do. Presumably little Georgie Stevenson was enjoying idleness when he observed his mother's tea kettle lid rising and falling. Having nothing at the moment to do, he began to have ideas about it. I don't think necessity is the mother of invention, invention, in my opinion, arises directly from idleness, possibly also from laziness. To save oneself trouble. 
That is the big secret that has brought us down the ages hundreds of thousands of years, from chipping flints to switching on the washing up machine. The position of women, over the years, has definitely changed for the worse. We women have behaved like mugs. We have clamoured to be allowed to work. As men work. Men, not being fools, have taken kindly to the idea. Why support a wife? What's wrong with a wife supporting herself? She wants to do it. By golly, she can go on doing it. It seems said that having established ourselves so cleverly as the weaker sex, we should now be broadly on a par with the women of primitive tribes who toil in the fields all day, walk miles to gather camel thorn for fuel, and on trek carry all the pots, pans and household equipment on their heads, whilst the gorgeous, ornamental male sweeps on ahead, unburdened save for one lethal weapon with which to defend his women. You've got to hand it to Victorian women, they got their menfolk where they wanted them. They established their frailty, delicacy, sensibility, their constant need of being protected and cherished. Did they lead miserable, servile lives, downtrodden and oppressed? Such is not my recollection of them. All my grandmother's friends seem to me in retrospect singularly resilient and almost invariably successful in getting their own way. They were tough, self-willed, and remarkably well-read and well-informed. Mind you, they admired their men enormously. They genuinely thought men were splendid fellows, dashing, inclined to be wicked, easily led astray. In daily life a woman got her own way whilst paying due lip service to male superiority, so that her husband should not lose face. Your father knows best, dear, was the public formula. The real approach came privately. I'm sure you are quite right in what you said, John, but I wonder if you have considered. In one respect man was paramount. He was the head of the house. A woman, when she married, accepted as her destiny his place in the world and his way of life. That seems to me sound sense and the foundation of happiness. If you can't face your man's way of life, don't take that job, in other words, don't marry that man. Here, say, is a wholesale draper, he is a Roman Catholic, he prefers to live in a suburb, he plays golf and he likes to go for holidays to the seaside. That is what you are marrying. Make up your mind to it and like it. It won't be so difficult. It is astonishing how much you can enjoy almost everything. There are few things more desirable than to be an acceptor and an enjoyer. You can like and enjoy almost any kind of food or way of life. You can enjoy country life, dogs, muddy walks, towns, noise, people, clatter. In the one there is repose, ease for nerves, time for reading, knitting, embroidery, and the pleasure of growing things. In the other theatres, art galleries, good concerts, and seeing friends you would otherwise seldom see. I am happy to say that I can enjoy almost everything. Once when I was travelling by train to Syria, I was much entertained by a fellow traveller's dissertation on the stomach. My dear, she said, never give in to your stomach. If a certain thing doesn't agree with you, say to yourself, who's going to be master, me or my stomach? But what do you actually do about it? I asked with curiosity. Any stomach can be trained. Very small doses at first. It doesn't matter what it is. Eggs, now, used to make me sick, and toasted cheese gave me the most terrible pains. But just a spoonful or two of boiled egg two or three times a week, and then a little more scrambled egg and so on. And now I can eat any amount of eggs. It's been just the same with toasted cheese. Remember this, your stomach's a good servant, but a bad master. I was much impressed and promised to follow her advice, and I have done so though it has not presented much difficulty, my stomach being definitely a servile one. Third. When my mother had gone abroad with Madge to the south of France after my father's death, I remained at Ashfield under the tranquil eye of Jane for three weeks by myself. It was then that I discovered a new sport and new friends. Roller skating on the pier was a pastime much in vogue. The surface of the pier was extremely rough, and you fell down a good deal but it was great fun. There was a kind of concert room at the end of the pier, not used in winter of course, and this was opened as a kind of indoor rink. It was also possible to skate at what was grandly called the assembly rooms, or the bath saloons, where the big dances took place. This was much more high class, but most of us preferred the pier. You had your own skates and you paid tuppence for admission, and once on the pier you skated. The Huxleys could not join me in this sport because they were engaged with their governess during the morning, and the same held for Audrey. The people I used to meet there were the Lucis. Although grown up, they had been very kind to me, 
knowing that I was alone at Ashfield because the doctor had ordered my mother abroad for change and rest. Although I felt rather grand on my own, one could get weary of that feeling. I enjoyed ordering the meals, or thinking I was ordering the meals. Actually we always had for lunch exactly what Jane had made up her mind we were going to have beforehand, but she certainly put up a good show of considering my wildest suggestions. Could we have roast duck and meringues? I would ask and Jane would say yes, but she was not sure about the ordering of the duck, and that perhaps meringues, there were no whites of egg at the moment, perhaps we had better wait until some day when we had used the yolks for something else, so that in the end we had what was already sitting in the larder. But dear Jane was very tactful. She always called me Miss Agatha and allowed me to feel that I was in an important position. It was then that the Lucis suggested that I should come down and skate with them on the pier. They more or less taught me to stand up on my skates, and I loved it. They were, I think, one of the nicest families I have ever known. They came from Warwickshire, and the family's beautiful house, Charlcote, had belonged to Berkeley Lucy's uncle. He always thought that it ought to have come to him but instead of that it had gone to his uncle's daughter, her husband taking the name of Fairfax Lucy. I think the whole family felt very sad that Charlcote was not theirs, though they never said anything about it, except amongst themselves. The oldest daughter, Blanche, was an extraordinarily handsome girl, she was a little older than my sister and had been married before her. The eldest son, Reggie, was in the army but the second son was at home about my brother's age, and the next two daughters, Marguerite and Muriel, known to all as Margie and Nooney, were also grown up. They had rather slurred lazy voices that I found very attractive. Time as such meant nothing to them. After skating for some time, Nooney would look at her watch and say, well, did you ever, look at the time now. It's half past one already. Oh dear, I said. It will take me twenty minutes at least to walk home. Oh you'd better not go home, Aggie. You come home with us and have lunch. We can ring up Ashfield. So I would go home with them, and we would arrive about half past two to be greeted by Sam the dog, body like a barrel, breath like a drain pipe, as Nooney used to describe him, and somewhere there would be some kind of meal being kept hot and we would have it. Then they would say it was a pity to go home yet, Aggie, and we would go into their schoolroom and play the piano and have a sing-song. Sometimes we went on expeditions to the moor. We would agree to meet at Torre Station and take a certain train. The Lucis were always late, and we always missed the train. They missed trains, they missed trams, they missed everything, but nothing rattled them. Oh well, they would say, what does it matter? There'll be another one by and by. It's never any good worrying, is it? It was a delightful atmosphere. The high spots in my life were Madge's visits. She came down every August. Jimmy came with her for a few days, then he had to get back to business, but Madge stayed on to about the end of September, and Jack with her. Jack, of course, was a never-ending source of enjoyment to me. He was a rosy-cheeked golden-haired little boy, looking good enough to eat, and indeed we sometimes called him L.E. Petit Brioche. He had a most uninhibited nature, and did not know what silence was. There was no question of bringing Jack out and making him talk, the difficulty was to hush him down. He had a fiery temper and used to do what we called blow up he would first get very red in the face, then purple, then hold his breath, till you really thought he was going to burst, then the storm would happen. He had a succession of nannies, all with their own peculiarities. There was one particularly cross one, I remember. She was old, with a great deal of untidy grey hair. She had much experience, and was about the only person who could really daunt Jack when he was on the warpath. One day he had been very obstreperous, shouting out, you idiot, you idiot, you idiot, for no reason whatever, rushing to each person in turn. Nanny finally reproved him, telling him that if he said it any more he would be punished. I can tell you what I'm going to do, said Jack. When I die I shall go to heaven and I shall go straight up to God and I shall say you idiot, you idiot, you idiot. He paused, breathless, to see what this blasphemy would bring forth. Nanny put down her work, looked over her spectacles at him, and said without much interest, and do you suppose that the Almighty is going to take any notice of what a naughty little boy like you says? Jack was completely deflated. Nanny was succeeded by a young girl called Isabel. She for some reason was much addicted to throwing things out of the window. Oh drat these scissors, she would suddenly murmur, and fling them out onto the grass. Jack on occasions, attempted to help her. Shall I throw it out of the window, Isabel, he would ask, with great interest. 
Like all children, he adored my mother. He would come into her bed early in the morning and I would hear them through the wall of my room. Sometimes they were discussing life, and sometimes my mother would be telling him a story, a kind of serial went on, all about mother's thumbs. One of them was called Betsy Jane and the other Sari Ann. One of them was good, the other was naughty, and the things they did and said kept Jack in a gurgle of laughter the whole time. He always tried to join in conversation. One day when the vicar came to lunch there was a momentary pause. Jack suddenly piped up. I know a very funny story about a bishop, he said. He was hastily hushed by his relations, who never knew what Jack might come out with that he had overheard. Christmas we used to spend in Cheshire, going up to the Watts. Jimmy usually got his yearly holiday about then, and he and Madge used to go to St. Moritz for three weeks. He was a very good skater, and so it was the kind of holiday he liked most. Mother and I used to go up to Cheadle, and since their newly built house, called Manor Lodge, was not ready yet, we spent Christmas at Abney Hall, with the old Wattses and their four children and Jack. It was a wonderful house to have Christmas in if you were a child. Not only was it enormous Victorian Gothic, with quantities of rooms, passages, unexpected steps, back staircases, front staircases, alcoves, niches, everything in the world that a child could want, but it also had three different pianos that you could play, as well as an organ. All it lacked was the light of day, it was remarkably dark, except for the big drawing room with its green satin walls and its big windows. Nan Watts and I were fast friends by now. We were not only friends but drinking companions, we both liked the same drink, cream, ordinary plain, neat cream. Although I had consumed an enormous amount of Devonshire cream since I lived in Devonshire, raw cream was really more of a treat. When Nan stayed with me at Torquay, we used to visit one of the dairies in the town, where we would have a glass of half milk and half cream. When I stayed with her at Abney we used to go down to the home farm and drink cream by the half pint. We continued these drinking bouts all through our lives, and I still remember buying our cartons of cream in Sunningdale and coming up to the golf course and sitting outside the clubhouse waiting for our respective husbands to finish their rounds of golf, each drinking our pint of cream. Abney was a glutton's paradise. Mrs. Watts had what was called her storeroom off the hall. It was not like Granny's storeroom, a kind of securely locked treasure house from which things were taken out. There was free access to it, and all round the walls were shelves covered with every kind of dainty. One side was entirely chocolates, boxes of them, all different, chocolate creams in labeled boxes, there were biscuits, gingerbread, preserved fruits, jams and so on. Christmas was the supreme festival, something never to be forgotten. Christmas stockings in bed. Breakfast, when everyone had a separate chair heaped with presents. Then a rush to church and back to continue present opening. At two o'clock Christmas dinner, the blinds drawn down and glittering ornaments and lights. First, oyster soup, not relished by me, turbot, then boiled turkey, roast turkey, and a large roast sirloin of beef. This was followed by plum pudding, mince pies, and a trifle full of sixpences, pigs, rings, bachelor's buttons and all the rest of it. After that, again, innumerable kinds of dessert. In a story I once wrote, The Affair of the Christmas Pudding, I have described just such a feast. It is one of those things that I am sure will never be seen again in this generation, indeed I doubt nowadays if anyone's digestion would stand it. However, our digestions stood it quite well then. I usually had to be in eating prowess with Humphrey Watts, the Watts' son. Next to James in age. I suppose he must have been 21 or 22 to my 12 or 13. He was a very handsome young man, as well as being a good actor and a wonderful entertainer and teller of stories. Good as I always was at falling in love with people, I don't think I fell in love with him, though it is amazing to me that I should not have done so. I suppose I was still at the stage where my love affairs had to be romantically impossible, concerned with public characters, such as the Bishop of London and King Alfonso of Spain, and of course with various actors. I know I fell deeply in love with Henry Ainley when I saw him in The Bondman, and I must have been just getting ripe for the K.O.W.S. Keenan Wallers who were all to a girl in love with Louis Waller in Monsieur Beaucaire. Humphrey and I ate solidly through the Christmas dinner. He scored over me in oyster soup, but otherwise we were neck and neck. We both first had roast turkey, then boiled turkey, and finally four or five slashing slices of sirloin of beef. It is possible that our elders confined themselves to only one kind of turkey for this course, but as far as I remember old Mr. Watts certainly had beef as well as turkey. 
We then ate plum pudding and mince pies and trifle, I rather sparingly of trifle, because I didn't like the taste of wine. After that there were the crackers, the grapes, the oranges, the Elvis plums, the Carlsbad plums, and the preserved fruits. Finally, during the afternoon, various handfuls of chocolates were fetched from the storeroom to suit our taste. Do I remember being sick the next day? Having bilious attacks? No, never. The only bilious attacks I ever remember were those that seized me after eating unripe apples in September. I ate unripe apples practically every day, but occasionally I must have overdone it. What I do remember was when I was about 6 or 7 years old and had eaten mushrooms. I woke up with a pain about 11 o'clock in the evening, and came rushing down to the drawing room, where mother and father were entertaining a party of people, and announced dramatically, I am going to die. I am poisoned by mushrooms. Mother rapidly soothed me and administered a dose of Ipecacuan ha wine, always kept in the medicine cupboard in those days. And assured me that I was not due to die this time. At any rate I never remember being ill at Christmas. Nan Watts was just the same as I was, she had a splendid stomach. In fact, really, when I remember those days, everyone seemed to have a pretty good stomach. I suppose people had gastric and duodenal ulcers and had to be careful, but I cannot remember anybody living on a diet of fish and milk. A coarse and gluttonous age? Yes, but one of great zest and enjoyment. Considering the amount that I ate in my youth, for I was always hungry, I cannot imagine how I managed to remain so thin, a scrawny chicken indeed. After the pleasurable inertia of Christmas afternoon, pleasurable, that is, for the elders, the younger ones read books, looked at their presents, ate more chocolates, and so on, there was a terrific tea, with a great iced Christmas cake as well as everything else, and finally a supper of cold turkey and hot mince pies. About nine o'clock there was the Christmas tree, with more presents hanging on it. A splendid day, and one to be remembered till next year, when Christmas came again. I stayed at Abney with my mother at other times of year, and always loved it. There was a tunnel in the garden, underneath the drive, which I found useful in whatever historical romance or drama I was enacting at the moment. I would strut about, muttering to myself and gesticulating. I dare say the gardeners thought that I was mental, but I was only getting into the spirit of the part. It never occurred to me to write anything down, and I was quite indifferent to what any gardeners thought. I occasionally walk about nowadays muttering to myself, trying to get some chapter that won't go to come right. My creative abilities were also engaged by embroidery of sofa cushions. Cushions were most prevalent at that time, and embroidered cushion covers always welcome. I went in for an enormous bout of embroidery in the autumn months. To begin with I used to buy transfers, iron them off on the squares of satin, and start embroidering them in silks. Disliking the transfers in the end as being all the same, I then began to take flower pictures off China. We had some big Berlin and Dresden vases with beautiful bunches of flowers on them, and I used to trace over these, draw them out, and then try to copy the colors as closely as possible. Granny B was very pleased when she heard I was doing this, she had spent so much of her life in embroidery that she was glad to think a granddaughter took after her in that way. I did not reach her heights of fine embroidery, however, I never actually embroidered landscapes and figures, as she did. I have two of her fire screens now, one of a shepherdess, the other of a shepherd and shepherdess together under a tree, writing or drawing a heart on the bark of it, which is exquisitely done. How satisfying it must have been for the great ladies in the days of the Bayou Tapestry, in the long winter months. Mr. Watts, Jimmy's father, was a person who always made me feel unaccountably shy. He used to call me dream child, which made me wriggle in agonized embarrassment. What is our dream child thinking of, he used to say. I would go purple in the face. He used to make me play and sing sentimental songs to him, too. I could read music quite well, so he would often take me to the piano and I would sing his favorite songs. I didn't like them much, but at least it was preferable to his conversation. He was an artistic man, and painted landscapes of moors and sunsets. He was also a great collector of furniture, particularly old oak. In addition he and his friend Fletcher Moss took good photographs, and published several books of photographs of famous houses. I wish I had not been so stupidly shy, but I was of course at the age when one is particularly self-conscious. I much preferred Mrs. Watts, who was brisk, cheerful, and completely factual. Nan, who was two years older than I was, went in for being an enfant terrible, and took a special pleasure in shouting, being rude, and using swear words. 
It upset Mrs. Watts when her daughter fired off dams and blasts. She also disliked it when Nan used to turn on her and say, Oh don't be such a fool, mother. It was not the sort of thing that she had ever envisaged a daughter of hers saying to her, but the world was just entering into an age of plain speaking. Nan reveled in the role she was playing, though really, I believe, she was quite fond of her mother. Ah well, most mothers have to go through a period in which their daughters put them through the mill in one way or another. On Boxing Day we were always taken to the pantomime in Manchester, and very good pantomimes they were. We would come back in the train singing all the songs, the Watts rendering the comedian's songs in broad Lancashire. I remember us all bawling out, I was born on a Friday, I was born on a Friday, I was born on a Friday when, crescendo, my mother wasn't at home. Also, watching the trains come in, watching the trains go out, when we'd watched all the trains come in, we watched the trains go out. The supreme favorite was sung by Humphrey as a melancholy solo, the window, the window, I've pushed it through the window. I have no pain, dear mother now, I've pushed it through the window. The Manchester pantomime was not the earliest I was taken to. The first I ever saw was at Drury Lane, where I was taken by Granny. Dan Leno was Mother Goose. I can still remember that pantomime. I dreamt of Dan Leno for weeks afterwards, I thought he was the most wonderful person I had ever seen. And there was an exciting incident that night. The two little royal princes were up in the royal box. Prince Eddie, as one spoke of him colloquially, dropped his program and opera glasses over the edge of the box. They fell in the stalls quite near where we were sitting, and, oh delight, not the equerry but Prince Eddie himself came down to retrieve them, apologizing very politely, saying that he did hope they hadn't hurt anyone. I went to sleep that night indulging in the fantasy that one day I would marry Prince Eddie. Possibly I could save his life from drowning first, a grateful queen would give her royal consent. Or perhaps there would be an accident, he would be bleeding to death, I would give a blood transfusion. I would be created a countess, like the Countess Torby, and there would be a morganatic marriage. Even for six years old, however, such a fantasy was a little too fantastic to last. My nephew Jack once arranged a very good royal alliance of his own at about the age of four. Supposing, mummy, he said, you were to marry King Edward. I should become royalty. My sister said there was the queen to be thought of, and a little matter of Jack's own father. Jack rearranged matters. Supposing the queen died, and supposing that daddy, he paused to put it tactfully, supposing that daddy, er, wasn't there, and then supposing that King Edward was to, just to see you, here he stopped, leaving it to the imagination. Obviously King Edward was going to be struck all of a heap, and in next to no time Jack was going to be the king's stepson. I was looking in the prayer book during the sermon, Jack said to me, about a year later. I've been thinking of marrying you when I am grown up, Ange, but I've been looking in the prayer book and there is a table of things in the middle, and I see that the Lord won't let me. He sighed. I told him that I was flattered that he should have thought of such a thing. It is astonishing how you never really change in your predilections. My nephew Jack, from the days when he went out with a nursemaid, was always obsessed by things ecclesiastical. If he disappeared from sight you could usually find him in a church, gazing admiringly at the altar. If he was given colored plasticine the things he made were always triptychs, crucifixes, or some kind of ecclesiastical adornment. Roman Catholic churches in particular fascinated him. His tastes never changed, and he read more ecclesiastical history than anyone I have ever known. When he was about 30, he finally entered the Roman Catholic Church, a great blow to my brother-in-law, who was what I can only describe as the perfect example of a black Protestant. He would say, in his gentle voice, I'm not prejudiced, I really am not prejudiced. It's just that I can't help noticing that all Roman Catholics are the most terrible liars. It's not prejudice, it just is so. Granny was a good example of a black Protestant too, and got much enjoyment out of the wickedness of the papists. She would lower her voice and say, all those beautiful girls disappearing into convents, never seen again. I am sure she was convinced that all priests selected their mistresses from special convents of beautiful girls. The Watts were nonconformist, Methodist I think, which perhaps may have led to this tendency to regard Roman Catholics as representatives of the Scarlet Woman of Babylon. Where Jack got his passion for the Roman Catholic Church I cannot think. He doesn't seem to have inherited it from anyone in his family. But it was there, present always from his early years. Everybody took a great interest in religion in my young days. 
disputes about it were full and colorful, and sometimes heated. One of my nephew's friends said to him later in life, I really can't think, Jack, why you can't be a cheerful heretic like everyone else, it would be so much more peaceful. The last thing on earth that Jack could ever imagine being was peaceful. As his nursemaid said, on one occasion, when she had spent some time finding him, why Master Jack wants to go into churches, I can't imagine. It seems such a funny thing for a child to want to do. Personally, I think he must have been a reincarnation of a medieval churchman. He had, as he grew older, what I might call a churchman's face, not a monk's face, certainly not a visionary's, the kind of churchman versed in ecclesiastical practices and able to acquit himself well at the Council of Trent, and to be quite sound on the exact number of angels able to dance on the point of a needle. Fourth. Bathing was one of the joys of my life, and has remained so almost until my present age, in fact I would still enjoy it as much as ever but for the difficulties attendant on a rheumatic person getting herself into the water, and, even more difficult, out again. A great social change came when I was about 13. Bathing as I first remember it was strictly segregated. There was a special ladies bathing cove, a small stony beach, to the left of the bath saloons. The beach was a steeply sloping one, and on it there were eight bathing machines in the charge of an ancient man, of somewhat irascible temper, whose non-stop job was to let the machine up and down in the water. You entered your bathing machine, a gaily painted striped affair, saw that both doors were safely bolted, and began to undress with a certain amount of caution, because at any moment the elderly man might decide it was your turn to be let down into the water. At that moment there would be a frantic rocking, and the bathing machine would grind its way slowly over the loose stones, flinging you about from side to side. In fact the action was remarkably similar to that of a jeep or land rover nowadays, when traversing the more rocky parts of the desert. The bathing machine would stop as suddenly as it had started. You then proceeded with your undressing and got into your bathing dress. This was an unesthetic garment, usually made of dark blue or black alpaca, with numerous skirts, flounces and frills, reaching well down below the knees, and over the elbow. Once fully attired, you unbolted the door on the water side. If the old man had been kind to you, the top step was practically level with the water. You descended and there you were, decorously up to your waist. You then proceeded to swim. There was a raft not too far out, to which you could swim and pull yourself up and sit on it. At low tide it was quite near, at high tide it was quite a good swim, and you had it more or less to yourself. Having bathed as long as you liked, which for my part was a good deal longer than any grown-up accompanying me was inclined to sanction, you were signaled to come back to shore, but as they had difficulty in getting at me once I was safely on the raft, and I anyway proceeded to swim in the opposite direction, I usually managed to prolong it to my own pleasure. There was of course no such thing as sunbathing on the beach. Once you left the water you got into your bathing machine, you were drawn up with the same suddenness with which you had been let down, and finally emerged, blue in the face, shivering all over, with hands and cheeks dyed away to a state of numbness. This, I may say, never did me any harm, and I was as warm as toast again in about three quarters of an hour. I then sat on the beach and ate a bun while I listened to exhortations on my bad conduct in not having come out sooner. Granny who always had a fine series of cautionary tales, would explain to me how Mrs. Fox's little boy, such a lovely creature, had gone to his death of pneumonia, entirely from disobeying his elders and staying in the sea too long. Partaking of my current bun or whatever refreshment I was having, I would reply dutifully, No, Granny, I won't stay in as long next time. But actually, Granny, the water was really warm. Really warm, was it indeed? Then why are you shivering from head to foot? Why are your fingers so blue? The advantage of being accompanied by a grown-up person, especially Granny, was that we would go home in a cab from the Strand, instead of having to walk a mile and a half. The Torbay Yacht Club was stationed on Beacon Terrace, just above the ladies' bathing cove. Although the beach was properly invisible from the club windows, the sea around the raft was not, and, according to my father, a good many of the gentlemen spent their time with opera glasses enjoying the sight of female figures displayed in what they hopefully thought of as almost a state of nudity. I don't think we can have been sexually very appealing in those shapeless garments. The gentlemen's bathing cove was situated further along the coast. There the gentlemen, in their scanty triangles, could disport themselves as much as they pleased, with no female eye able to observe them from any point whatever. However, times were changing, Mixed bathing was being introduced all over England. 
The first thing mixed bathing entailed was wearing far more clothing than before. Even French ladies had always bathed in stockings, so that no sinful bare legs could be observed. I have no doubt that, with natural French chic, they managed to cover themselves from their necks to their wrists, and with lovely thin silk stockings outlining their beautiful legs, looked far more sinfully alluring than if they had worn a good old short-skirted British bathing dress of frilled alpaca. I really don't know why legs were considered so improper, throughout Dickens there are screams when any lady thinks that her ankles have been observed. The very word was considered daring. One of the first nursery axioms was always uttered if you mentioned those pieces of your anatomy, remember, the Queen of Spain has no legs. What does she have instead, nurshi? Limbs, dear, that is what we call them, arms and legs are limbs. All the same, I think it would sound odd to say, I've got a spot coming on one of my limbs, just below the knee. Which reminds me of a friend of my nephew's, who described an experience of her own as a little girl. She had been told that her godfather was coming to see her. Having not heard of such a personage before, she had been thrilled by the notion. That night, at about 1 a.m., after waking and considering the matter for some time, she spoke into the darkness. Nanny, I've got a godfather. Erb. Some indescribable sound answered her. Nanny, a little louder, I've got a godfather. Yes, dear, yes, very nice. But, Nanny, I've got a, fortissimo. Godfather. Yes, yes, turn over, dear, and go to sleep. But, Nanny, molto fortissimo, I have got a godfather. Well, rub. It, dearie, rub it. Bathing dresses continued to be very pure practically up to the time I was first married. Though mixed bathing was accepted by then, it was still regarded as dubious by the older ladies and more conservative families. But progress was too strong, even for my mother. We often took to the sea on such beaches as were given over to the mingling of the sexes. It was allowed first on Tor Abbey Sands and Corbin's Head Beach, which were more or less main town beaches. We did not bathe there, anyway, the beaches were supposed to be too crowded. Then mixed bathing was allowed on the more aristocratic Meadfoot Beach. This was another good 20 minutes away, and therefore made your walk to bathe rather a long one, practically two miles. However, Meadfoot Beach was much. More attractive than the ladies' bathing cove, bigger, wider, with an accessible rock a good way out to which you could swim if you were a strong swimmer. The ladies' bathing cove remained sacred to segregation, and the men were left in peace in their dashing triangles. As far as I remember, the men were not particularly anxious to avail themselves of the joys of mixed bathing, they stuck rigidly to their own private preserve. Such of them as arrived at Meadfoot were usually embarrassed by the sight of their sister's friends in what they still considered a state of near nudity. It was at first the rule that I should wear stockings when I bathed. I don't know how French girls kept their stockings on, I was quite unable to do so. Three or four vigorous kicks when swimming, and my stockings were dangling a long way beyond my toes, they were either sucked off altogether or else wrapped round my ankles like fetters by the time I emerged. I think that the French girls one saw bathing in fashion plates owed their smartness to the fact that they never actually swam, only walked gently into the sea and out again to parade the beach. A pathetic tale was told of the council meeting at which the question of mixed bathing came up for final approval. A very old councillor, a vehement opponent, finally defeated, quavered out his last plea. And all I say is, Mr. Mayor, if this, air mixed bathing is carried through, that there will be decent partitions in the bathing machines, however low. With Madge bringing down Jack every summer to Torquay, we bathed practically every day. Even if it rained or blew a gale, it seems to me that we still bathed. In fact, on a rough day I enjoyed the sea even more. Very soon there came the great innovation of trams. One could catch a tram at the bottom of Burton Road and be taken down to the harbour, and from there it was only about 20 minutes walk to Meadfoot. When Jack was about five, he started to complain. What about taking a cab from the tram to the beach? Certainly not, said my sister, horrified. We've come down all this way in a tram, haven't we? Now we walk to the beach. My nephew would sigh and say under his breath, Mum on the stingy side again. In retaliation, as we walked up the hill, which was, bordered on either side with Italian at villas, my nephew, who, at that age, never stopped talking for a moment, would proceed with a kind of Gregorian chant of his own, which consisted of repeating the names of all the houses we passed, Lunca, Pentreve, The Elms, Villa Margarita, Hartley St. George. As time went on, he added the names of such occupants as he knew, 
starting with Lunka, Dr. G. Refford, Pentreve, Dr. Quick, Villa Margarita, Madame Cavallon, the Laurels, don't know, and so on. Finally, infuriated, Madge or I would tell him to shut up. Why? Because we want to talk to each other, and we can't talk to each other if you are talking the whole time and interrupting us. Oh, very well. Jack lapsed into silence. His lips were moving, however, and one could just hear in faint breath, Lunka, Pentreve, the Priory, Torbay Hall, Madge and I would look at each other and try to think of something to say. Jack and I nearly drowned ourselves one summer. It was a rough day, we had not gone as far as Meadfoot, but instead to the ladies' bathing cove, where Jack was not yet old enough to cause a tremor in female breasts. He could not swim at that time, or only a few strokes, so I was in the habit of taking him out to the raft on my back. On this particular morning we started off as usual, but it was a curious kind of sea, a sort of mixed swell and chop, and, with the additional weight on my shoulders, I found it almost impossible to keep my mouth and nose above water. I was swimming, but I couldn't get any breath into myself. The tide was not far out, so that the raft was quite close, but I was making little progress, and was only able to get a breath about every third stroke. Suddenly I realized that I could not make it. At any moment now I was going to choke. Jack, I gasped, get off and swim to the raft. You're nearer that than the shore. Why, said Jack. I don't want to. Please, do, I bubbled. My head went under. Fortunately, though Jack clung to me at first, he got shaken off and was able therefore to proceed under his own steam. We were quite near the raft by then, and he reached it with no difficulty. By that time I was past noticing what anyone was doing. The only feeling in my mind was a great sense of indignation. I had always been told that when you were drowning the whole of your past life came before you, and I had also been told that you heard beautiful music when you were dying. There was no beautiful music, and I couldn't think about anything in my past life, in fact I could think of nothing at all but how I was going to get some breath into my lungs. Everything went black and, and and the next thing I knew was violent bruises and pains as I was flung roughly into a boat. The old seahorse, crotchety and useless as we had always thought him, had had enough sense to notice that somebody was drowning and had come out in the boat allowed him for the purpose. Having thrown me into the boat, he took a few more strokes to the raft and grabbed Jack, who resisted loudly saying, I don't want to go in yet. I've only just got here. I want to play on the raft. I won't come in. The assorted boatload reached the shore, and my sister came down the beach laughing heartily and saying, What were you doing? What's all? This fuss. Your sister nearly drowned herself, said the old man crossly, Go on, take this child of yours. We'll lay her out flat, and we'll see if she needs a bit of punching. I suppose they gave me a bit of punching, though I don't think I had quite lost consciousness. I can't see how you knew she was drowning. Why didn't she shout for help? I keeps an eye. Once you goes down you can't shout, water's coming in. We both thought highly of the old seahorse after that. The outside world impinged much less than it had in my father's time. I had my friends and my mother had one or two close friends whom she saw, but there was little social interchange. For one thing mother was very badly off, she had no money to spare for social entertainments, or indeed for paying cab fares to go to luncheons or dinners. She had never been a great walker, and now, with her heart attacks, she got out little, as it was impossible in Torquay to go anywhere without going up or downhill almost immediately. I had bathing in the summer, roller skating in the winter and masses of books to read. There, of course, I was constantly making new discoveries. Mother read me Dickens aloud at this point and we both enjoyed it. Reading aloud started with Sir Walter Scott. One of my favorites was The Talisman. I also read Marmion and The Lady of the Lake, but I think that both Mother and I were highly pleased when we passed from Sir Walter Scott to Dickens. Mother, impatient as always, did not hesitate to skip when it suited her fancy. All these descriptions, she would say at various points in Sir Walter Scott. Of course they are very good, and literary, but one can have too many of them. I think she also cheated by missing out a certain amount of sob stuff in Dickens, particularly the bits about Little Nell. Our first Dickens was Nicholas Nickleby, and my favorite character was the old gentleman who courted Mrs. Nickleby by throwing vegetable marrows over the wall. Can this be one of the reasons why I made Hercule Poirot retire to grow vegetable marrows? Who can say? My favorite Dickens of all was Bleak House, and still is. Occasionally we would try Thackeray for a change. 
We got through Vanity Fair all right, but we stuck on the Newcombs, we ought to like it, said my mother, everyone says it is his best. My sister's favorite had been Esmond, but that too we found diffuse and difficult, indeed I have never been able to appreciate Thackeray as I should. For my own reading, the works of Alexander Dumas in French now entranced me. The Three Musketeers, twenty years after, and best of all, The Count of Monte Cristo. My favorite was the first volume, Le Chateau d'If, but although the other five volumes occasionally had me slightly bewildered the whole colorful pageant of the story was entrancing. I also had a romantic attachment to Maurice Hewlett, The Forest Lovers, The Queen's Quair, and Richard Yanne. Very good historical novels they are, too. Occasionally my mother would have a sudden idea. I remember one day when I was picking up suitable windfalls from the apple tree, she arrived like a whirlwind from the house. Quickly, she said, we are going to Exeter. Going to Exeter, I said surprised. Why? Because Sir Henry Irving is playing there, in Beckett. He may not live much longer, and you must see him. A great actor. We've just time to catch the train. I have booked a room at the hotel. We duly went to Exeter, and it was indeed a wonderful performance of Beckett. Which I have never forgotten. The theater had never stopped being a regular part of my life. When staying at Ealing, Granny used to take me to the theater at least once a week, sometimes twice. We went to all the musical comedies, and she used to buy me the score afterwards. Those scores, how I enjoyed playing them. At Ealing, the piano was in the drawing room, and so fortunately I did not annoy anyone by playing several hours on end. The drawing room at Ealing was a wonderful period piece. There was practically no room in it to move about. It had a rather splendid thick turkey carpet on the floor, and every type of brocade chair, each one of them uncomfortable. It had two, if not three, marquetry china cabinets, a large central candelabra, standard oil lamps, quantities of small watt knots, occasional tables, and French Empire furniture. The light from the window was blocked by a conservatory, a prestige symbol that was a must, as in all self-respecting Victorian houses. It was a very cold room, the fire was only lit there if we had a party, and nobody as a rule went into it except myself. I would light the brackets on the piano, adjust the music stool, breathe heavily on my fingers, and start off with the country girl or our Miss Gibbs. Sometimes I allotted roles to the girls, sometimes I was myself singing them, a new and unknown star. Taking my scores to Ashfield, I used to play them in the evenings in the schoolroom, also an icy cold room in winter. I played and I sang. Mother often used to go to bed early, after a light supper, about eight o'clock. After she had had about two and a half hours of me thumping a piano overhead, and singing at the top of my voice, she could bear it no longer, and used to take a long pole, which served for pushing the windows up and down, and rap frantically on the ceiling with it. Regretfully I would abandon my piano. I also invented an operetta of my own called Marjorie. I did not compose it exactly, but I sang snatches of it experimentally in the garden. I had some vague idea that I might really be able to write and compose music one day. I got as far as the libretto, and there I stuck. I can't remember the whole story now, but it was all slightly tragic, I think. A handsome young man with a glorious tenor voice loved desperately a girl called Marjorie, who equally naturally did not love him in return. In the end he married another girl, but on the day after his wedding a letter arrived from Marjorie in a far country saying that she was dying and had at last realized that she loved him. He left his bride and rushed to her forthwith. She was not quite dead when he arrived, alive enough at any rate to raise herself on one elbow and sing a splendid dying love song. The bride's father arrived to wreak vengeance for his deserted daughter, but was so affected by the lover's grief that he joined his baritone to their voices, and one of the most famous trios ever written concluded the opera. I also had a feeling that I might like to write a novel called Agnes. I remember even less of that. It had four sisters in it, Queenie, the eldest, golden-haired and beautiful, and then some twins, dark and handsome, finally Agnes, who was plain, shy and, of course, in poor health, lying patiently on a sofa. There must have been more story than this, but it has all gone now. All I can remember is that Agnes's true worth was recognized at last by some splendid man with a black mustache whom she had loved secretly for many years. The next of my mother's sudden ideas was that perhaps, after all, I wasn't being educated enough, and that I had better have a little schooling. There was a girl's school in Torquay kept by someone called Miss Geyer, and my mother made an arrangement that I should go there two days a week and study certain subjects. 
I think one was arithmetic, and there was also grammar and composition. I enjoyed arithmetic, as always, and may even have begun algebra there. Grammar I could not understand in the least, I could not see why certain things were called prepositions or what verbs were supposed to do, and the whole thing was a foreign language to me. I used to plunge happily into composition, but not with real success. The criticism was always the same, my compositions were too fanciful. I was severely criticized for not keeping to the subject. I remember, Autumn, in particular. I started off well, with golden and brown leaves, but suddenly, somehow or other, a pig got into it, I think it was possibly rooting up acorns in the forest. Anyway, I got interested in the pig, forgot all about Autumn, and the composition ended with the riotous adventures of Curly Tail the pig in a terrific beechnut party he gave his friends. I can picture one teacher there, I can't recall her name. She was short and spare, and I remember her eager jutting chin. Quite unexpectedly one day, in the middle, I think, of an arithmetic lesson, she suddenly launched forth on a speech on life and religion. All of you, she said, every one of you, will pass through a time when you will face despair. If you never face despair, you will never have faced, or become, a Christian, or known a Christian life. To be a Christian you must face and accept the life that Christ faced and lived, you must enjoy things as he enjoyed things, be as happy as he was at the marriage at Cana, know the peace and happiness that it means to be in harmony with God and with God's will. But you must also know, as he did, what it means to be alone in the Garden of Gethsemane, to feel that all your friends have forsaken you, that those you love and trust have turned away from you, and that God himself has forsaken you. Hold on then to the belief that that is not the end. If you love, you will suffer, and if you do not love, you do not know the meaning of a Christian life. She then returned to the problems of compound interest with her usual vigor, but it is odd that those few words, more than any sermon I have ever heard, remained with me, and years later they were to come back to me and give me hope at a time when despair had me in its grip. She was a dynamic figure, and also, I think, a fine teacher, I wish I could have been taught by her longer. Sometimes I wonder what would have happened if I had continued with my education. I should, I suppose, have progressed, and I think I should have been entirely caught up in mathematics, a subject which has always fascinated me. If so, my life, would certainly have been very different. I should have been a third or fourth rate mathematician and gone through life quite happily. I should probably not have written any books. Mathematics and music would have been enough to satisfy me. They would have engaged my attention, and shut out the world of imagination. On reflection, though, I think that you are what you are going to be. You indulge in the fantasies of, if so and so had happened, I should have done so and so, or, if I had married so and so, I suppose I should have had a totally different life. Somehow or other, though, you would always find your way to your own pattern, because I am sure you are following a pattern, your pattern of your life. You can embellish your pattern, or you can scamp it, but it is your pattern and so long as you are following it you will know harmony, and a mind at ease with itself. I don't suppose I was at Miss Geyer's more than a year and a half, after that my mother had another idea. With her usual suddenness she explained that I was now going to Paris. She would let Ashfield for the winter, we would go to Paris, I might perhaps start at the same pension at which my sister had been, and see. How I liked it. Everything went according to plan, mother's arrangements always did. She carried them out with the utmost efficiency, and bent everyone to her will. An excellent let was obtained for the house, Mother and I packed all our trunks, I don't know that there were quite so many round-topped monsters as there had been when we went to the south of France, but there were still a goodly number, and in next to no time we were settled in the Hotel de Lina, in the Avenue de Ina in Paris. Mother was laden with letters of introduction and the addresses of various pension nats and schools, teachers, and advisors of all kinds. She had things sorted out before long. She heard that Madge's pension at had changed its character and gone downhill as the years passed. Mademoiselle T herself had either given up or was about to give up, so my mother merely said we could try it for a bit, and see. This attitude towards schooling would hardly be approved of nowadays, but to my mother trying a school was exactly like trying a new restaurant. If you looked inside you couldn't tell what it was like, you must try it, and if you didn't like it the sooner you moved from it the better. Of course then you had not to bother with GCE school certificate, O-levels, A-levels, and serious thoughts for the future. I started at Madame as LTS, and stayed there for about two months, until the end of the term. I was 15. 
My sister had distinguished herself on arriving, when she was dared by some other girl to jump out of a window. She had immediately done so, and arrived slap in the middle of a tea table round which Mademoiselle T and distinguished parents were sitting. What hoidens these English girls are, exclaimed Mademoiselle T in high displeasure. The girls who had egged her on were maliciously pleased, but they admired her for her feet. My entry was not at all sensational. I was merely a quiet mouse. By the third day I was in misery with homesickness. In the last four or five years I had been so closely attached to my mother, hardly ever leaving her, that it was not unnatural that the first time I really went away from home I should feel homesick. The curious thing was that I didn't know what was the matter with me. I just didn't want to eat. Every time I thought of my mother, tears came into my eyes and ran down my cheeks. I remember looking at a blouse which mother had made, extremely badly, with her own fingers, and the fact that it was made badly, that it did not fit, that the tucks were uneven, made me cry all the more. I managed to conceal these feelings from the outside world, and only wept at night into my pillow. When my mother came to fetch me the following Sunday I greeted her as usual, but when we got back to the hotel I burst into tears and flung my arms round her neck. I am glad to say that at least I did not ask her to take me away, I knew quite well that I had to stop there. Besides, having seen mother I felt that I wasn't going to be homesick anymore, I knew what was the matter with me. I had no recurrence of homesickness. Indeed, I now enjoyed my days at Mademoiselle T.S. very much. There were French girls, American girls, and a good many Spanish and Italian girls, not many English. I liked the company of the American girls especially. They had a breezy interesting way of talking and reminded me of my Cotterets friend, Marguerite Prestley. I can't remember much about the work side of things, I don't think it can have been very interesting. In history we seemed to be doing the period of the Fermond, which I knew pretty well from the reading of historical novels, and in geography I have been mystified for life by learning the provinces of France as they were in the time of the Fermond rather than as they are now. We also learned the names of the months as they were during the French Revolution. My faults in French dictation horrified the mistress in charge so much she could hardly believe it. Vraiment, say impossible, she said. Vous, qui parlez si bien le français, vous avez fait vingt-cinq faux en dicté, vingt-cinq. Nobody else had made more than five. I was quite an interesting phenomenon by reason of my failure. I suppose it was natural enough under the circumstances, since I had known French entirely by talking it. I spoke it colloquially but, of course, entirely by ear, and the words it and it ate sounded exactly the same to me, I spelt it one way or the other purely by chance, hoping I might have hit upon the right one. In some French subjects, literature, recitation, and so on, I was in the top class, as regards French grammar and spelling I was practically in the bottom class. It made it difficult for my poor teachers, and I suppose shaming for me, except that I can't feel that I really cared. I was taught the piano by an elderly lady called Madame Legrand. She had been there for a great many years. Her favorite method of teaching the piano was to play a cutter mains with her pupil. She was insistent on pupils being taught to read music. I was not bad at reading music, but playing it with Madame Legrand was something of an ordeal. We both sat on the bench like music seat and, as Madame Legrand was extremely well covered, she took up the greater part of it and elbowed me away from the middle of the piano. She played with great vigor, using her elbows, which stuck out slightly akimbo, the result being that the unfortunate person who was playing the other two hands had to play with one elbow stuck tightly to her side. With a certain natural craftiness I managed nearly always to play the bass side of the duet. Madame Legrand was led into this the more easily because she so enjoyed her own performance, and naturally the treble gave her a far better chance of pouring her soul into the music. Sometimes for quite a long time, owing to the vigor of her playing and her absorption in it, she failed to realize that I had lost my place in the bass. Sooner or later I hesitated over a bar, got one behind, tried to catch up, not sure where I was, and then tried to play such notes as would accord with what Madame Legrand was playing. Since, However, we were reading music I could not always anticipate this intelligently. Suddenly, as the hideous cacophony we were making dawned upon her, she would stop, raise her hands in the air and exclaim, Mais tu est ce que vous jouez la, petite? Que c'est horrible. I couldn't have agreed with her more, horrible it was. We would then start again at the beginning. Of course, if I was playing the treble my lack of coordination was noticed at once. However, as a whole, we got on well. 
Madame Legrand puffed and snorted a great deal the whole time she played. Her bosom rose and fell, groans sometimes came from her, it was alarming but fascinating. She also smelled rather high, which was not so fascinating. There was to be a concert at the end of the term, and I was scheduled to play two pieces, one the third movement from the Sonata Pathetic of Beethoven, and the other a piece called Serenade d'Aragona, or something like that. I took a scunner to the Serenade d'Aragona straight away. I found extraordinary difficulty in playing it, I don't know why, it was certainly much easier than the Beethoven. Though my playing of the Beethoven came on well, the Serenade d'Aragona continued to be a very poor performance. I practiced it ardently, but I seemed to make myself even more nervous. I woke up at night, thinking I was playing, and all sorts of things would happen. The notes of the piano would stick, or I would find I was playing an organ instead of the piano, or I was late in arriving, or the concert had taken place the night before, it all seems so silly when one remembers it. Two days before the concert I had such high fever that they sent for my mother. The doctor could find no cause for it. However, he gave it as his view that it would be much better if I did not play at the concert, and if I were removed from the school for two or three days until the concert was over. I cannot tell you of my thankfulness, though at the same time I had the feeling of somebody who has failed at something they had been determined to accomplish. I remember now that at an arithmetic exam at Miss Geyer's school I had come out bottom, though I had been top of the class all the week previously. Somehow, when I read the questions at the exam my mind shut up and I was unable to think. There are people who can pass exams, often high up, after being almost bottom in class, there are people who can perform in public much better than they perform in private, and there are people who are just the opposite. I was one of the latter. It is obvious that I chose the right career. The most blessed thing about being an author is that you do it in private and in your own time. It can worry you, bother you, give you a headache, you can go nearly mad trying to arrange your plot in the way it should go and you know it could go, but, you do not have to stand up and make a fool of yourself in public. I returned to the pensionat with great relief and in good spirits. Immediately I tried to see if I could now play the Serenade d'Aragona. I certainly played it better than I had ever done before, but the performance was still poor. I went on learning the rest of the Beethoven Sonata with Madame Legrand, who, though disappointed in me as a pupil who might have done her credit, was still kind and encouraging and said I had a proper sense of music. The two winters and one summer that I spent in Paris were some of the happiest days I have ever known. All sorts of delightful things happened all the time. Some American friends of my grandfather whose daughter sang in Grand Opera lived there. I went to hear her as Marguerite in Faust. At the pensionat, they did not take girls to hear Faust, the subject was not supposed to be convenable for Lejeune's fills. I think people tended to be rather optimistic over the easy corruption of Lejeune's fills, you would have to have far more knowledge than June's fills did in those days to know anything improper was going on at Marguerite's window. I never understood in Paris why Marguerite was suddenly in her prison. Had she, I wondered, stolen the jewelry? Certainly pregnancy and the death of the child never even occurred to me. We were taken mostly to the opera comique. Ties, Werther, Carmen, La Vie Bohème, Manon. Werther was my favorite. At the Grand Opera House I heard Tannhauser as well as Faust. Mother took me to dressmakers, and I began to appreciate clothes for the first time. I had a pale gray crepe de chine semi-evening dress made, which filled me with joy, I had never had anything so grown up looking before. It was said that my bosom was still uncooperative so that I had to have a lot of ruffles of crepe to chine hurriedly tucked into the bodice, but I was still hopeful that one day a couple of truly womanly bosoms, firm, round and large, would be mine. How lucky that vision into the future is spared to us. Otherwise I should have seen myself at 35, with a round womanly bosom well developed, but, alas, everybody else going about with chests as flat as boards, and if they were so unfortunate as to have bosoms, tightening them out of existence. Through the introductions mother had brought, we went into French society. American girls were welcomed always to the Faubourg Saint-Germain and it was acceptable for the sons of the French aristocracy to marry rich Americans. Though I was far from rich, my father was known to have been American, and all Americans were supposed to have some money. It was a curious, decorous, old world society. The Frenchmen I met were polite, very come I elfo, and nothing could have been duller from a girl's point of view. However, I learned French phraseology of the politest kind. I also learned dancing and deportment, with someone called, I think, though it seems improbable, Mr. Washington Lobb. 
Mr. Washington Lobb was the closest thing to Mr. Turveydrop that I can imagine. I learned the Washington Post, the Boston, and a few other things, and I also learned the various usages of cosmopolitan society. Suppose now, you were about to sit down by an elderly married lady. How would you sit? I looked at Mr. Washington Lobb with blank eyes. I should, er, sit, I said puzzled. Show me. He had some gilt chairs there, and I sat down in a gilt chair, trying to hide my legs as much as possible underneath the chair. No, no, that is impossible. That will never do, said Mr. Washington Lobb. You turn slightly sideways, that is enough, not more, and as you sit down you are leaning slightly to the right, so you bend your left knee slightly, so that it is almost like a little bow as you sit. I had to practice this a good deal. The only things I really hated were my drawing and painting lessons. Mother was adamant on that subject, she would not let me off, girls should be able to do watercolors. So very rebelliously, twice a week, I was called for by a suitable young woman, since girls did not go about alone in Paris, and taken by metro or bus to an atelier somewhere near the flower market. There I joined a class of young ladies, painting violets in a glass of water, lilies in a jar, daffodils in a black vase. There would be terrific size as the lady in charge came round. Mais vous any voyeurine, she said to me. First you must start with the shadows, do you not see? Here, and here, and here there are shadows. But I never saw the shadows, all I saw were some violets in a glass of water. Violets were mauve, I could match the shade of mauve on my palette, and I would then paint the violets a flat mauve. I quite agree that the result did not look like a bunch of violets in a glass of water, but I did not see, and I don't think have ever seen, what does make shadows look like a bunch of violets in water. On some days, to ease my depression, I would draw the table legs or an odd chair in perspective, which cheered me up but which did not go down at all well with my instructress. Though I met many charming Frenchmen, strangely enough I did not fall in love with any of them. Instead I conceived a passion for the reception clerk in the hotel, Monsieur Stree. He was tall and thin, rather like a tapeworm, with pale blonde hair and a tendency to spots. I really cannot understand what I saw in him. I never had the courage to speak to him, though he occasionally said, Bonjour, Mademoiselle, as I passed through the hall. It was difficult to have fantasies. About Monsieur Street. I imagined myself sometimes nursing him through the plague in French Indochina, but it took much effort to keep that vision going. As he finally gasped out his last breath he would murmur, Mademoiselle, I always adored you in the days at the hotel, which was all right as far as it went, but when I noticed Monsieur Street writing industriously behind the desk the following day it seemed to me extremely unlikely that he would ever say such a thing, even on his deathbed. We passed the Easter holidays going on expeditions to Versailles, Fontainebleau, and various other places, and then, with her usual suddenness, mother announced that I should not be returning to Mademoiselle T.S. I don't think much of that place, she said. No interesting teaching. It's not what it was in Madge's time. I am going back to England, and I have arranged that you shall go to Miss Hogg's school at Autuil, Les Maroniers. I can't remember feeling anything beyond mild surprise. I had enjoyed myself at Mademoiselle T.S., but I didn't particularly want to go back there. In fact it seemed more interesting to go to a new place. I don't know whether it was stupidity on my part or amiability, I like to think, of course, that it was the latter but I was always prepared to like the next thing that came along. So I went to Les Maroniers, which was a good school but extremely English. I enjoyed it, but found it dull. I had quite a good music teacher but not as much fun as Madame Legrand had been. As everyone talked English all the time, in spite of the fact that it was strictly forbidden, nobody learned much French. Outside activities were not encouraged, or indeed perhaps even allowed, at Les Maroniers, so at last I was to shake myself free of my detested painting and drawing lessons. The only thing I missed was passing through the flower market, which really had been heavenly. It was no surprise to me at the end of the summer holidays when my mother suddenly said to me at Ashfield that I was not going back to Les Maroniers. She had had a new idea for my education. V. Granny's doctor, Dr. Burwood, had a sister-in-law who kept a small establishment for finishing girls in Paris. She only took 12 to 15 girls, and they were all studying music or taking courses at the Conservatoire or the Sorbonne. How did I like that idea? My mother asked. As I have said, I welcomed new ideas, in fact my motto might have been established by then as, try anything once. So in the autumn I went to Miss Dryden's establishment. 
just off the Arc de Triomphe and the Avenue du Bois. Being at Miss Dryden's suited me down to the ground. For the first time I felt that what we were doing was really interesting. There were twelve of us. Miss Dryden herself was tall, rather fierce, with beautifully arranged white hair, an excellent figure, and a red nose, which she was in the habit of rubbing violently when she was angry. She had a dry, ironic form of conversation that was alarming but stimulating. Assisting her was a French code juteur, Madame Petit. Madame Petit was very French, temperamental, highly emotional, remarkably unfair, and we were all devoted to her, and not nearly so much in awe of her as we were of Miss Dryden. It was, of course, much more like living in a family, but a serious attitude was taken towards our studies. There was an emphasis on music, but we had plenty of interesting classes of all kinds. We had people from the Comédie Française, who gave us talks on Molière, Racine, and Corneille, and singers from the Conservatoire, who sang the airs of Lully and Gluck. We had a dramatic class where we all recited. Luckily we did not have so many dictees here, so my spelling faults were not quite so noticeable, and since my spoken French was better than the others I enjoyed myself thoroughly reciting the lines of Andromache, feeling myself indeed that tragic heroine as I stood and declaimed, Seigneur, touts ces grandeurs and emi touchant plus cura. I think we all rather enjoyed ourselves at the drama class. We were taken to the comedy firm and says and saw the classic dramas and several modern plays as well. I saw Sarah Bernhard in what must have been one of the last roles of her career, as the golden pheasant in Rustan's Chanticleer. She was old, lame, feeble, and her golden voice was cracked, but she was certainly a great actress she held you with her impassioned emotion. Even more exciting than Sarah Bernhard did I find Regine. I saw her in a modern play, La Corse Auxiliary Flambos. She had a wonderful power of making you feel, behind a hard repressed manner, the existence of a tide of feeling and emotion which she would never allow to come out into the open. I can still hear now, if I sit quiet a minute or two with my eyes closed, her voice, and see her face in the last words of the play, Poor Savra Mafia, J.A.I. Tuesday Mamir, and the deep thrill this sent through one as the curtain came down. It seems to me that teaching can only be satisfactory if it awakens some response in you. Mere information is no good, it gives you nothing more than you had before. To be talked to about plays by actresses, repeating words and speeches from them, to have real singers singing you Bois Apace or an aria from Gluck's Orphée was to bring to life in you a passionate love of the art you were hearing. It opened a new world to me, a world in which I have been able to live. Ever since. My own serious study was music, of course, both singing and piano. I studied the piano with an Austrian, Charles Furster. He occasionally came to London and gave recitals. He was a good but frightening teacher. His method was to wander round the room as you played. He had the air of not listening, looked out of the window, smelt a flower, but all of a sudden, as you played a false note or phrased something badly, he would swing round with the aliority of a pouncing tiger and cry out, Hein, tu est cek vu jaus ie, petite, hein? Say it rose. It was shattering to the nerves at first, but one got used to it. He was a passionate addict of Chopin, so that I learned mostly Chopin etudes and waltzes, the fantasy impromptu, and one of the ballades. I knew I was getting on well under his teaching, and it made me happy. I also learned the sonatas of Beethoven, as well as several light, what he called drawing room pieces, a romance of four, the Barcarolle of Tchaikovsky, and others. I practiced with real assiduity, usually about seven hours a day. I think a wild hope was springing up within me. I don't know that I ever let it quite come into my consciousness, but it was there in the background, that perhaps I could be a pianist, could play at concerts. It would be a long time and hard work, but I knew that I was improving rapidly. My singing lessons had begun before this period. My teacher was a Monsieur Bouet. He and Jean de Risca were supposed at that time to be the two leading singing teachers of Paris. Jean de Risca had been a famous tenor and Bouet an operatic baritone. He lived in an apartment five flights up with no lift. I used to arrive at the fifth story completely out of breath, as indeed was only natural. The apartments all looked so alike that you lost count of the stories you had climbed, but you always knew when you were getting to Monsieur Bouet's because of the wallpaper on the stairs. On the last turn, was an enormous grease mark which had a rough resemblance to the head of a cairn terrier. When I arrived I would be immediately greeted with reproaches. What did I mean by breathing fast like that? Why did I have to be out of breath? Someone my age should spring upstairs, without panting. Breathing was everything. Breathing is the whole of singing, you should know that by now. 
he would then reach for his tape measure, which was always at hand. This he would put round my diaphragm and then urge me to breathe in, hold it, and then breathe out as completely as possible. He would calculate the difference between the two measurements, nodding his head occasionally and saying, Say bien, say bien, it advances. You have a good chest, an excellent chest. You have splendid expansion, and what is more, I will tell you something, you will never have the consumption. That is a sad thing for some singers, they get the consumption, but... With you know. As long as you practice your breathing, all will be well with you. You like beefsteak? I said yes, I was extremely fond of beefsteak. That is good too, that is the best food for a singer. You cannot eat large meals, or eat often, but I say to my opera singers you will have at 3 o'clock in the afternoon a large steak and a glass of stout, after that nothing till you sing at 9 o'clock. We then proceeded to the singing lesson proper. The voyage de tête, he said, was very good, it was perfect, properly produced and natural, and my chest notes were not too bad, but the medium, the medium was extremely weak. So to begin with I was to sing mezzo-soprano songs to develop le medium. At intervals he would get exasperated with what he called my English face. English faces, he said, have no expression. They are not mobile. The skin round the mouth, it does not move, and the voice, the words, everything, they come from the back of the throat. That is very bad. The French language has got to come from the palate, from the roof of the mouth. The roof of the mouth, the bridge of the nose, that is where the voice of the medium comes from. You speak French very well, very fluently, though it is unfortunate you have not the English accent but the accent of the midi. Why do you have the accent of the midi? I thought for a minute, and then I said perhaps because I had learned French from a French maid who had come from Pau. Ah, that explains it, he said. Yes, that is it. It is the accent meridional that you have. As I say, you speak French fluently, but you speak it as though it were English because you speak it from the back of your throat. You must move your lips. Keep your teeth close together, but move your lips. Ah, I know what we shall do. He would then tell me to stick a pencil in the corner of my mouth and articulate as well as possible while I was singing, without letting the pencil drop out. It was extraordinarily difficult at first, but in the end I managed it. My teeth clamped the pencil and my lips then had to move a great deal to make the words come out at all. Bouet's fury was great one day when I brought in the air from Samson E.T. Delilah, Mon Caressuveratavoya, and asked him if I could possibly learn it, as I had enjoyed the opera so much. But what is this you have here? he said, looking at the piece of music. What is this? What key is it in? It is in a transposed key. I said I had bought the version for a soprano voice. He shouted with rage, but Delilah is not a soprano part. It is a mezzo part. Do you not know that if you sing an air from an opera, it must always be sung in the key it was written in? You cannot transpose for a soprano voice what has been written for a mezzo voice, it puts the whole emphasis wrong. Take it away. If. You bring it in the proper mezzo key, yes, you shall learn it. I never dared sing a transposed song again. I learned large quantities of French songs, and a lovely Ave Maria of Cherubinis. We debated for some time how I was to pronounce the Latin of that. The English pronounce Latin in the Italian way, the French have their own way of pronouncing Latin. I think, since you are English, you had better sing it in the Italian pronunciation. I also sang a good many of Schubert's songs in German. In spite of not knowing German this was not too difficult, and I sang songs in Italian, of course. On the whole I was not allowed to be too ambitious, but after about six months or so of study I was allowed to sing the famous aria from La Boheme, T.E. Gelida Manina, and also the aria from Tosca, Vice di Arte. It was indeed a happy time. Sometimes, after a visit to the Louvre, we were taken to have tea at Rumpelmayer's. There could be no delight in life for a greedy girl like tea at Rumpelmayer's. My favorites were those glorious cakes with cream and marron piping of a sickliness which was incomparable. We were taken of course, for walks in the Bois, a very fascinating place. One day, I remember, when we were going in a neat crocodile, two by two, along a deeply wooded path, a man came out from behind some trees, a classic case of indecent exposure. We must all have seen him, I think, but we all behaved in a decorous manner as if we had noticed nothing unusual. Possibly we may have been not quite sure of what it was we had seen. Miss Dryden, herself, who was in charge of us that day, sailed along with the ironclad belligerence of a battleship. We followed her. I suppose the man, 
whose upper half was very correct, with black hair and pointed beard and a very smart cravat and tie, must have spent his day wandering about the darker places of the bois so as to surprise decorous young ladies from pension gnats, walking in a crocodile, wishing perhaps to add to their knowledge of life in Paris. I may add that, as far as I know, not one of us mentioned this incident to any of the other girls, there was not so much as a giggle. We were all splendidly modest in those days. We had occasional parties at Miss Dryden's, and on one occasion a former pupil of hers, an American woman now married to a French vicomte, arrived with her son, Rudy. Rudy might have been a French baron, but in appearance he was a thoroughly American college boy. He must have blenched a little at the sight of twelve noble girls looking at him with interest, approbation, and possible romance in their eyes. I've got my work cut out shaking hands round here, he declared in a cheerful voice. We all met Rudy again the next day at the Palais de Glace, where some of us were skating and some learning to skate. Rudy was again determinately gallant, anxious not to let his mother down. He skated several circuits of the rink with those of us who were able to stand up. I, as so often in these matters, was unlucky. I had only just begun to learn, and on my first afternoon had succeeded in throwing the skating instructor. This, I may say, had made him extremely angry. He had been held up to the ridicule of his colleagues. He prided himself on being able to hold up anyone, even the stoutest American lady, and to be floored by a tall thin girl must have infuriated him. He took me out for my turn as seldom as possible after this. Anyway I didn't think I would risk being pioneered by Rudy round the rink, I should probably throw him too, and then he would have been annoyed. Something happened to me at the sight of Rudy. We only saw him on those few occasions, but they marked a point of transition. From that moment forward I stepped out of the territory of hero worship. All the romantic love I had felt for people real and unreal, people in books, people in the public eye, actual people who came to the house, finished at that moment. I no longer had the capacity for selfless love or the wish to sacrifice myself on their behalf. From that day I began to think of young men only as young men, exciting creatures whom I would enjoy meeting, and among whom, someday, I should find my husband, Mr. Wright in fact. I did not fall in love with Rudy, perhaps I might have, if I had met him often, but I did suddenly feel different. I had become one of the world of females on the prowl. From that moment, the image of the Bishop of London, who had been my last object of hero worship, faded from my mind. I wanted to meet real young men, lots of real young men, in fact there couldn't be too many of them. I am hazy now as to how long I remained at Miss Dryden's, a year, perhaps eighteen months, I do not think as long as two years. My volatile mother did not propose any further changes of educational plan, perhaps she did not hear of anything that excited her. But I think really that she had an intuitive knowledge that I had found what satisfied me. I was learning things that mattered, that built themselves into me as part of an interest in life. One dream of mine faded before I left Paris. Miss Dryden was expecting an old pupil of hers, the Countess of Limerick, who herself was a very fine pianist, a pupil of Charles Furster's. Usually the two or three girls who were studying the piano would give an informal concert on these occasions. I was one of them. The result was catastrophic. I was nervous beforehand, but not unusually so, no more than would be natural, but as soon as I sat down at the piano inefficiency overwhelmed me like a tide. I played wrong notes, my tempo went, my phrasing was amateur and ham-handed, I was just a mess. Nobody could have been kinder than Lady Limerick. She talked to me later. And said she had realized how nervous I had been, and that one did get these fits of what really qualified as stage fright. Perhaps I would get over them later when I became more experienced in playing before an audience. I was grateful for those kind words, but I knew myself that there was more to it than that. I continued to study, but before I finally went home I asked Charles Furster frankly whether he thought that by hard work and application I could one day be a professional pianist. He, too was kind, but he told me no lies. He said that he thought I had not the temperament to play in public, and I knew he was right. I was grateful to him for telling me the truth. I was miserable about it for a while, but I tried hard not to dwell on it more than I could help. If the thing you want beyond anything cannot be, it is much better to recognize it and go forward, instead of dwelling on one's regrets and hopes. Such a rebuff coming early helped me for the future. It taught me that I had not the kind of temperament for exhibition of any kind. I can describe what it seemed like by saying that I could not control my physical reaction. Part 4. Flirting, 
Courting, bands up, marriage. Popular Victorian game. First. Soon after I came home from Paris, my mother had a serious illness. In the usual manner of doctors, it was diagnosed as appendicitis, paratyphoid, gallstones, and a few more things. Several times she had been on the brink of being carted off to the operating table. Treatment did not improve her condition, she was constantly having relapses, and various different operations were moved. My mother was an amateur doctor herself. When her brother Ernest had been working as a medical student, she had helped him with mounting enthusiasm. She would have made a far better doctor than he would. In the end he had to give up the idea owing to the fact that he could not stand the sight of blood. By that time mother was practically as fully trained as he was, and would not have minded blood, wounds, or any other physical offenses to the eye. I noticed that, whenever we went to the dentist together, my mother ignored the queen or the tattler and immediately seized the lancet or the British medical journal if it was anywhere about on the table. Finally losing patience with her medical attendants, she said, I don't think they know, I don't know myself. I think the great thing is to get out of the doctor's hands. She succeeded in finding yet another doctor who was what you might call the biddable kind, and was soon able to announce that he had advised sunshine in a warm dry climate. We will go to Egypt for the winter, she informed me. Once more we set about letting the house. It was fortunate that the expenses of traveling must have been fairly low in those days, and that the cost of living abroad seemed easily covered by the high rent asked for Ashfield. Torquay was of course at that period still a winter resort. Nobody went there during the summer, and people who lived there always went away then to avoid, the terrible heat. I can't imagine what this terrible heat could be, nowadays I always find South Devon extremely cold in the summer. Usually they went up. To the moor and took houses there. Father and mother did that once, but they found it so hot on the moor that father hired a dog cart and drove back into Torquay to sit in his own garden practically every afternoon. Anyway. Torquay was then the Riviera of England, and people paid large rents for furnished villas there, during quite a gay winter season with concerts in the afternoons, lectures, occasional dances, and a great deal of other social activity. I was now ready to come out. My hair was up, which at that period meant done in the Grecian style, with large knots of curls high up on the back of the head and a kind of fillet round it. It was really a becoming style, particularly suited to evening dress. My hair was very long. I could sit on it easily. This for some reason was considered something to be proud of in a woman, though what it actually meant was that your hair was completely unmanageable and was always coming down. To counteract this, hairdressers created what was called a postiche, a large false knot of curls, with your own hair pinned away as tight to your head as possible, and the postiche pinned to that. Coming out was a thing of great importance in a girl's life. If you were well off, your mother gave a dance for you. You were supposed to go for a season in London. Of course the season was by no means the commercial and highly organized racket it has become in the last 20 or 30 years. The people you asked to your dance then, and the people to whose dances you went, were your personal friends. There was always a slight difficulty in scraping up enough men, but the dances were on the whole informal affairs, or else there were charity balls, to which you took a large party. Of course, there could be nothing like that in my life. Madge had had her coming out in New York and been to parties and dances there, but father had not been able to afford a London season for her, and there was certainly no question of my having one now. But my mother was anxious that I should have what was considered a young girl's birthright, that is to say that she should emerge like a butterfly from a chrysalis, from a schoolgirl to a young lady of the world, meeting other girls and plenty of young men, and, to put it plainly, be given her chance of finding a suitable mate. Everyone made a point of being kind to young girls. They asked them to house parties, and they arranged pleasant theater evenings for them. You could rely on all your friends to rally round. There was nothing approaching the French system of shielding daughters and permitting them to meet only a selected few parties, who would all make suitable husbands, who had committed their follies and sown their young men's wild oats, and who had sufficient money or property to keep a wife. This system was, I think, a good one, it resulted, certainly, in a high percentage of happy marriages. The English belief that young French girls were forced to marry rich old men was quite untrue. A French girl could make her choice, but it was definitely a limited choice. The rackety, wild living young man, the charming mauvais sujet whom she would doubtless have preferred, was never allowed to enter her orbit. In England that was not so. Girls went out to dances and met all kinds of young men. Their mothers were there, too, sitting wearily as chaperones, 
but mothers were fairly helpless. Of course, people were reasonably careful about the young men with whom they allowed their daughters to associate, but there was still a wide field of choice, and girls were notorious for preferring undesirable young men, and even going so far as to get engaged to them or having what was termed an understanding. Having an understanding was a really useful term, by it parents avoided the friction of bad feeling over refusing to accept their daughter's choice. You are very young still, dear, and I am sure Hugh is quite charming, but he also is young and has not established himself yet. I see no reason why you should not have an understanding and should meet occasionally, but no letters and no formal engagement. They then worked behind the scenes to try to produce a suitable young man so that he might distract the girl's mind from the first one. This often happened. Direct opposition would, of course, have made the girl cling frantically to her first choice, but having it authorized took away some of the glamour, and as most girls are capable of being sensible they quite often changed their minds. Owing to the fact that we were badly off, my mother saw that it was going to be difficult for me to enter society on the usual terms. Her choice of Cairo as a convalescent center for herself was, I think, made mainly on my behalf, and was a good one. I was a shy girl, not brilliant socially, if I could be familiarized with dancing, talking to young men, and all the rest of it, as an everyday thing, it would be the best way of giving me some worthwhile experience. Cairo, from the point of view of a girl, was a dream of delight. We spent three months there, and I went to five dances every week. They were given in each of the big hotels in turn. There were three or four regiments stationed in Cairo, there was polo every day, and at the cost of living in a moderately expensive hotel all this was at your disposal. A good many people went out there for the winter, and many of them were mothers and daughters. I was shy at first, and remained shy in many ways, but I was passionately fond of dancing and I danced well. Also I liked young men, and I soon found they liked me, so everything went well. I was just 17, Cairo as Cairo meant nothing to me, girls between 18 and 21 seldom thought of anything but young men, and very right and proper. Too. The art of flirtation is lost nowadays, but then it was in full swing, and was an approximation, I think, to what the old troubadours called Le Pays du Tendre. It is a good introduction to life, the half sentimental, half romantic attachment that grows up between what I think of now in my advanced age as girls and boys. It teaches them something of life and of each other without having to pay too violent or disillusioning a price. I certainly don't remember any illegitimate babies among my friends or their families. No, I am wrong. It was not a pretty story, a girl whom we knew went to spend her holidays with a school friend, and was seduced by the school friend's father, an elderly man with a nasty reputation. Sexual attachments would have been difficult to enter into because young men had a high opinion of young girls, and adverse public opinion would have affected them as well as the girls. Men had their sexual fun with married women, usually a good deal older than themselves, or else with little friends in London, about whom no one was supposed to know. I do remember one incident when I was staying in a house party in Ireland later. There were two or three other girls and young men, soldiers mostly, in the house, and one of the soldiers left abruptly one morning, saying he had had a telegram from England. This was patently untrue. Nobody knew the cause, but he had confided in a much older girl, whom he knew well and whom he considered able to appreciate his dilemma. Apparently he had been asked to accompany one of the girls to a dance some little distance away to which the others had not been invited. He duly drove her there, but on the way the girl suggested that they should stop at a hotel and engage a room. We shall arrive at the dance a bit late, she said, but nobody notices, I find, I've often done it. The young man was so horrified that, having refused the suggestion he felt it quite impossible to meet her again the next day. Hence his abrupt departure. I could hardly believe my ears, she seemed such a nicely brought up girl, quite young, nice parents, and everything. Just the sort of girl one would feel one would want to marry. Those were still great days for the purity of young girls. I do not think we felt in the least repressed because of it. Romantic friendships, tinged certainly with sex or the possibility of sex, satisfied us completely. Courtship is, after all, a recognized stage in all animals. The male struts and courts, the female pretends not to notice anything, but is secretly gratified. You know it is not yet the real thing, but it is a kind of apprenticeship. The troubadours were quite right when they made their songs about the pays du tendre. I can reread Aucassin and Nicolette always, for its charm, its naturalness, and its sincerity. Never again, after your youth, 
Do you have that particular feeling, the excitement of friendship with a man, that sense of being in affinity, of liking the same things, of the other one saying what you have just been thinking? A great deal of it is illusion, of course, but it is a wonderful illusion, and I think it ought to have its part in every woman's life. You can smile at yourself later, saying, I was really rather a young fool. However, in Cairo I didn't even get as far as falling slightly in love. I had too much to do. There was so much going on, and so many attractive, personable young men. The ones that did stir my heart were men of about 40, who kindly danced with the child now and again, and teased me as a pretty young thing, but that was all. Society decreed that you should not dance more than two dances on your program with the same man in an evening. It was possible, occasionally, to stretch this to three, but the sharp eyes of the chaperones were then upon you. One's first evening dresses, of course, were a great joy. I had one of pale green chiffon with little lace frills, and a white silk one, rather plainly made, and a rather gorgeous one of deep turquoise blue taffeta, the material for which Granny had unearthed from one of her secret remnant chests. It was a magnificent piece of stuff, but alas, having been in storage for so many years, it was unable to stand the Egyptian climate, and one evening in the course of a dance it split up the skirt, down the sleeves and round the neck, and I had to retire hurriedly to the ladies' cloakroom. Next day we went to one of the Levantine dressmakers of Cairo. They were very expensive, my own dresses, bought in England, had been cheap. Still, I did get a lovely dress, it was a shot pale pink satin, and had a bunch of pink rose buds on one shoulder. What I wanted, of course, was a black evening dress, all girls wanted a black evening dress to make them look mature. All their mothers refused to let them have them. A young Cornishman, called Trelawney, and a friend of his, both in the 60th Rifles, were my chief partners. One of the older men, a Captain Crake, who was engaged to a nice American girl, brought me back to my mother after a dance one night and said, here's your daughter. She has learned to dance. In fact she dances beautifully. You had better try to teach her to talk now. It was a justified reproach. I had still, alas, no conversation. I was good looking. My family, of course, laugh uproariously whenever I say that I was a lovely girl. My daughter and her friends, particularly, say, but, mother, you couldn't have been. Look at those awful old photographs. It is true that some of the photographs of those days are pretty terrible, but that, I think, is due to the clothes, which are not yet quite old enough to have become period. Certainly at that time we were wearing monstrous hats, practically a yard across, of straw, ribbon, flowers, and large veils. Studio portraits were often taken in hats like this, sometimes tied with a ribbon under the chin, or sometimes you were shown with a much frizzled head of hair, holding an enormous bunch of roses like a telephone receiver up to your ear. Looking at my early photographs, one, taken before I came out, with two long pigtails, sitting, for God knows what reason, at a spinning wheel, is quite attractive. As one young man said to me once, I like the Gretchen one, very much. I suppose I did look rather like Marguerite in Faust. There was one nice one of me in Cairo in one of my plainer hats, an enormous dark blue straw with one pink rose. It makes an attractive angle round the face, and is not so overladen with ribbons as most. Dresses were, on the whole, fussy, and frilly. I soon became mad about polo, and used to watch it every afternoon. Mother tried to broaden my mind by taking me occasionally to the museum, and also suggested we should go up the Nile and see the glories of Luxor. I protested passionately, with tears in my eyes, Oh no, mother, oh no, don't let's go away now. There's the fancy dress dance on Monday, and I promised to go on a picnic to Saqqara on Tuesday, and so on and so forth. The wonders of antiquity were the last thing I cared to see, and I am very glad she did not take me. Luxor, Karnak, the beauties of Egypt, were to come upon me with wonderful impact about twenty years later. How it would have spoiled them for me if I had seen them then with unappreciative eyes. There is no greater mistake in life than seeing things or hearing them at the wrong time. Shakespeare is ruined for most people by having been made to learn it at school, you should see Shakespeare as it was written to be seen, played on the stage. There you can appreciate it quite young, long before you take in the beauty of the words and of the poetry. I took my grandson, Matthew, to Macbeth, and the Merry Wives of Windsor at Stratford when he was, I think, eleven or twelve. He was very appreciative of both, though his comment was unexpected. He turned to me as we came out, and said in an awestruck voice, you know, 
If I hadn't know beforehand that that was Shakespeare, I should never have believed it. This was clearly meant to be a testimonial to Shakespeare, and I took it as such. Macbeth having been a success with Matthew, we proceeded to the Merry Wives of Windsor. In those days it was done, as I am sure it was meant to be, as good old English slapstick, no subtlety about it. The last representation of the Merry Wives I saw, in 1965, had so much arty production about it that you felt you had traveled very far from a bit of winter sun in Windsor Old Park. Even the laundry basket was no longer a laundry basket, full of dirty washing, it was a mere symbol made of raffia. One cannot really enjoy slapstick farce when it is symbolized. The good old pantomime custard trick will never fail to rouse a roar of laughter, so long as custard appears to be actually applied to a face. To take a small carton with bird's custard powder written on it and delicately tap a cheek, well, the symbolism may be there, but the farce is lacking. The Merry Wives of Windsor went down well indeed with Matthew, I am glad to say, particular delight being taken over the Welsh schoolmaster. I think there is nothing more delightful than introducing the young to things that we ourselves have long taken for granted, and have taken for granted in a particular way. Max and I went on a motor tour of the castles of the lawyer once with my daughter, Rosalind, and one of her friends. The friend measured all the castles we saw by one criterion only, she would look round with experienced eyes and say, they could really have made Whoopi here, couldn't they? I had never thought of the castles of the lawyer in terms of making Whoopi before, but again it was a shrewd observation. The old kings and noblemen of France did indeed use their castles for Whoopi. The moral, since I was brought up always to find morals, is that you are never too old to learn. There is always some new point of view being shown you unexpectedly. This seems to have led me a long way from Egypt. One thing does so lead to another, but why shouldn't it? That winter in Egypt, I now see, solved a great many problems in our life. My mother, faced with the difficulty of having to provide social life for a young daughter, with next to no money to do it on, discovered a solution, I overcame my awkwardness. In the language of my time, I knew how to behave. Our way of life now is so different that it seems almost impossible to explain. The trouble is that girls today know nothing of the art of flirtation. Flirtation, as I have said, was an art carefully cultivated by girls of my generation. We knew the rules back to front. It was true that in France no young girl was ever left alone with a young man, but in England that was certainly not so. You went for a walk with a man, you went out riding with a man, but you did not go to a dance alone with a young man, either your mother sat there, or some other bored dowager, or appearances were satisfied by a young married woman being in your party. But having kept the rules, and having danced with a young man, you then strolled out in the moonlight or wandered into the conservatory, and charming tets a tets could take place without decorum being abandoned in the eyes of the world. Managing your program was a difficult art, and one that I was not particularly good at. Say you start off at a party, A, B, C are three girls, D, E, F are three young men. You must at least dance with each of those young men twice, probably, you will go to supper with one of them, unless he or you particularly wish to avoid that. The rest of the program is open for you to arrange to your satisfaction. There are plenty of young men lined up there, and at once some of them, the ones you don't particularly want to see, approach you. Then the tricky bit begins. You try to prevent them seeing that your program is as yet not filled up at all, and say doubtfully that you could manage number 14. The difficulty is to strike the right balance. The young men you do want to dance with are here somewhere, but if they are late coming up your program may be already filled. On the other hand, if you tell enough lies to the first young men you will be left with gaps in your program, and they may not be filled by the right young men. Then you will have to sit out some dances and be a wallflower. Oh, the agony when the young man you have secretly been waiting for suddenly appears, having been looking wildly for you in all the wrong places. You have to tell him sadly, I have only got the second extra and number 10. Oh, surely you can do better than that, he pleads. You look at your program, and consider. Cutting dances is not a nice act. It is disapproved of, not only by hostesses and mothers, but also by young men themselves. They sometimes take revenge by cutting dances themselves in return. Perhaps in looking down your program you see the name of some young man who has behaved badly to you, who has come up late, who has talked more to another girl at supper than to you. If so, you sacrifice him properly. Just occasionally, in desperation, you sacrifice a young man because he dances so abominably that it is really agony for your feet. 
but that I hardly ever liked to do, because I was tender-hearted, and it seemed unkind to treat so badly a poor young man who was almost certain to be treated badly by everyone else. The whole thing was really as intricate as the steps of a dance. In some ways it was great fun, but in others rather nerve-wracking. At any rate one's manners did improve with practice. Going to Egypt was a great help to me. I don't think anything else would have removed my natural gauchiri so soon. It was certainly a wonderful three months for a girl. I got to know at least 20 or 30 young men reasonably well. I went to, I suppose, between 50 and 60 dances, but I was too young and enjoying myself far too much to fall in love with anybody, which was lucky. I did cast languishing eyes on a handful of bronzed middle-aged colonels, but most of these were already attached to attractive married women, the wives of other men, and had no interest in young and insipid girls. I was somewhat plagued by a young Austrian count of excessive solemnity, who paid me serious attention. Avoid him as much as I could, he always sought me out and engaged me for a waltz. The waltz, as I have said, is the one dance I dislike, and the count's waltzing was of the most superior kind, that is, it consisted very largely of reversing at top speed, which rendered me so giddy that I was always afraid I would fall down. Reversing had been considered by Miss Hickey's dancing class as not quite nice, so I had not had sufficient practice in it. The Count would then say that he would like the pleasure of a little conversation with my mother. This was, I suppose, his way of showing that his attentions were honorable. Of course, I had to take him to my mother, who was sitting against the wall, enduring the penance of the evening, for to her it certainly was a penance. The Count sat down beside her and entertained her very solemnly for, I should think, at least twenty minutes. Afterwards, when we got home, my mother said to me crossly, What on earth induced you to bring over that little Austrian to talk to me? I couldn't get rid of him. I assured her that I couldn't help it, that he had insisted. Oh well, you must try and do better, Agatha, said my mother. I can't have young men being brought up to talk to me. They only do it to be polite, and to make a good impression. I said he was a dreadful man. He is nice looking, well bred, and a good dancer, said my mother, but I must say that I found him a complete bore. Most of my friends were young subalterns, and our friendships were absorbing but non-serious. I watched them playing polo, goaded them if they had not done well or applauded if they had, and they showed off before me to the best of their ability. I found it rather more difficult to talk to the slightly older men. A great many names are forgotten by this time, but there was a Captain Hibbard who used to dance with me fairly often. It was quite a surprise to me when my mother said nonchalantly on the boat when we were sailing back from Cairo to Venice, you know Captain Hibbard wanted to marry you, I suppose. What? I said, startled. He never proposed to me or said anything. No, he said it to me, answered mother. To you. I said in astonishment. Yes. He said he was very much in love with you, and did I think you were too young? Perhaps he ought not to speak of it to you, he said. And what did you say? I demanded. I told him I was quite sure you were not in love with him, and that it was no good his going on with the idea, she said. Oh mother! I exclaimed indignantly. You didn't. Mother looked at me in great surprise. Do you mean to say you did like him, she demanded. Would you have considered marrying him? No, of course not, I said. I don't want to marry him at all, and I'm not in love with him, but I really do think, mother that you might let me have my own proposals. Mother looked rather startled, then she admitted handsomely that she had been wrong. It's quite a long time, you see, since I was a girl myself, she said. But I do see your point of view. Yes, one does like to have one's own proposals. I was annoyed about it for some time. I wanted to know what it felt like to be proposed to. Captain Hibbard was good looking, not boring, danced well, was well off it was a pity that I could not consider marrying him. I suppose, as is so often the case, that if you are not attracted to a young man, but he is attracted to you, he is at once put out of court by the fact that men, when they are in love, invariably manage to look like a somewhat sick sheep. If a girl is attracted to such a man she feels flattered by this appearance, and does not hold it against him, if she has no interest she dismisses him from her mind. This is one of the great injustices of life. Women, when they fall in love, look ten times as good looking as normally, their eyes sparkle, their cheeks are bright, their hair takes a special glow, their conversation becomes much wittier and more brilliant. Other men, who have never noticed them before, then start to take a second look. That was my first, 
highly unsatisfactory proposal of marriage. My second came from a young man six foot five high. I had liked him very much, and we had been good friends. He did not think of approaching me through my mother, I am glad to say. He had more sense than that. He managed to get home on the same boat as I did, sailing from Alexandria to Venice. I felt sorry that I was not fonder of him. We continued to write letters to one another for a short time, but then he was posted to India, I think. If I had met him when I was a little older I might perhaps have cared for him. While I am on the subject of proposals, I wonder if men were specially given to proposing in my young days. I cannot help feeling that some of the proposals I and my friends had were entirely unrealistic. I have a suspicion that if I had accepted the offers they would have been dismayed. I once tackled a young naval lieutenant on this point. We had been walking home from a party in Torquay when he suddenly blurted out his proposal of marriage. I thanked him and said no, and added, and I don't believe you really want to, either. Oh I do, I do. I don't believe it, I said. We have only known each other about ten days, and I don't see why you want to get married so young in any case. You know it would be very bad for your career. Yes, well, of course, that's true in a way. So it's really an awfully silly thing to go and propose to a girl like that. You must admit that yourself. What made you do it? It just came over me, said the young man. I looked at you and it just came over me. Well, I said, I don't think you had better do it again to anyone. You must be more careful. We parted on kindly prosaic terms. Second. In describing my life I am struck by the way it sounds as though I and everybody else were extremely rich. Nowadays you certainly would have to be rich to do the same things, but in point of fact nearly all my friends came from homes of moderate income. Most of their parents did not have a carriage or horses, they certainly had not yet acquired the new automobile or motor car. For that you did have to be rich. Girls had usually not more than three evening dresses, and they had to last you for some years. Your hats you painted with a shilling bottle of hat paint every season. We walked to parties, tennis parties, and garden parties, though for evening dances in the country we would of course hire a cab. In Torquay there were not many private dances except at Christmas or Easter. People tended to invite guests to stay and make up a party to go to the regatta ball in August, and usually some other local dance in one of the bigger houses. I went to a few dances in London during June and July, not many because we did not know many people in London. But one would go occasionally to subscription dances, as they were called, making up a party of six. None of this called for much expenditure. Then there were the country house parties. I went, nervously the first time, to some friends in Warwickshire. They were great hunting people. Constance Ralston Patrick, the wife, did not hunt herself, she drove a pony carriage to all the meets and I drove with her. My mother had forbidden me strictly to accept a mount or ride. You really don't know very much about riding, she pointed out. It would be fatal if you went and injured somebody's valuable horse. However, nobody offered me a mount, perhaps it was as well. My riding and hunting had been confined to Devonshire, which meant scrabbling over high banks rather like Irish hunting, in my case mounted on a horse from a livery stable which was used to fairly unskillful riders on its back. The horse certainly knew more than I did, and I was quite content to leave it to Crowdy, my usual mount, a rather dispirited strawberry roan, who managed to get himself successfully over the banks of Devon. Naturally, I rode side saddle hardly any woman rode astride at that time. You feel wonderfully safe on a side saddle, your legs clasped round pommels. The first time I ever tried to ride astride I felt more unsafe than I could have believed possible. The Ralston Patricks were very kind to me. They called me the Pinkling for some reason, I suppose because I so often had pink evening dresses. Robin used to tease the Pinkling a lot, and Constance used to give me matronly advice with a slight twinkle in her eye. They had a delightful small daughter, about three or four years old when I first went there, and I used to spend a good deal of time playing with her. Constance was a born matchmaker, and I realize now that she produced during the course of my visits several nice and eligible men. I sometimes got a little unofficial riding too. I remember one day I had had a gallop round the fields with a couple of Robin's friends. Since this had happened at a moment's notice, and I had not even got into a riding habit but was in an ordinary print frock, my hair was not up to the strain. I still wore, as all girls did, the postiche attachment. Riding back down the village street, my hair collapsed completely, and curls dropped off at intervals all the way. I had to go back on foot to pick them up. 
Unexpectedly this produced a rather pleasing reaction in my favor. Robin told me afterwards that one of the leading lights of the Warwickshire hunt had said to him approvingly, Nice girl you've got staying with you. I like the way she behaved when all that false hair fell off, didn't mind a bit. Went back and picked it all up and roared with laughter. Good sport, she was. The things that made a good impression on people are really very odd. Another of the delights of staying with the Ralston Patricks was that they had a motor car. I cannot tell you the excitement that this produced in 1909. It was Robin's pet delight and treasure, and the fact that it was temperamental and broke down constantly made his passion for it all the greater. I remember one day we made an excursion to Banbury. Starting out was rather like equipping an expedition to the North Pole. We took large furry rugs, extra scarves to wrap round the head, baskets of provisions, and so on. Constance's brother Bill, Robin, and I made the expedition. We said a tender farewell to Constance, she kissed us all, urged us to be careful, and said she would have plenty of hot soup and home comforts waiting for us if we returned. Banbury, I may say, was about 25 miles from where they lived, but it was treated as though it was land's end. We proceeded 7 miles quite happily, cautiously at about 25 miles an hour, but free from trouble. However, that was only the beginning. We did eventually get to Banbury, after changing a wheel and trying to find a garage somewhere, but garages were few and far between in those days. At last we got home, about 7 o'clock in the evening, exhausted, frozen to the marrow, and frantically hungry, having finished all the provisions long before. I still think of it as one of the most adventurous days of my life. I had spent a great deal of it sitting on a bank by the roadside, in an icy wind, urging on Robin and Bill as, with the manual of instruction open beside them, they struggled with tires, spare wheel, jacks, and various other pieces of mechanism of which they had had, up. Till then, no personal knowledge. One day my mother and I went down to Sussex and lunched with the Bartolots. Lady Bartolot's brother, Mr. Ancatel, was also lunching, and he had an enormous and powerful automobile of the kind which in my memory seems to be about 100 feet long and hung with enormous tubes all over the outside. He was a keen motorist, and offered to drive us back to London. No need to go by train, beastly things, trains. I'll drive you back. I was in the seventh heaven. Lady Bartolot lent me one of the new motoring caps, a sort of flat thing halfway between a yachting cap and that worn by a German officer of the Imperial staff, which was tied down with motoring veils. We got into the monster, extra rugs were piled round us, and off we went like the wind. All cars were open at that time. To enjoy them one had to be pretty hardy. But then, of course, one was hardy in those days, practicing the piano in rooms with no fires in the middle of winter inured you against icy winds. Mr. Ancatel did not contain himself to the 20 miles an hour that was the usual safe speed, I believe we went 40 or 50 mph through the roads of Sussex. At one moment he started up in the driving seat exclaiming, look back. Look back. Look back behind that hedge. Do you see that fellow hiding there? Ah, the wretch. The villain. It's a police trap. Yes, the villains, that's what they do, hide behind a hedge and then come out and measure the time. From 50 we dropped to a crawl of 10 miles an hour. Enormous chuckles from Mr. Ancatel. That dished him. I found Mr. Ancatel a somewhat alarming man, but I loved his automobile. It was bright red, a frightening, exciting monster. Later I went to stay with the Bartolots for Goodwood races. I think that was the only country house visit that I did not enjoy. It was entirely a racing crowd staying there, and racing language and terms were incomprehensible to me. To me racing meant standing about for hours wearing an unmanageable flowery hat, pulling on six hat pins with every gust of wind, wearing tight patent leather shoes with high heels, in which my feet and ankles swelled horribly in the heat of the day. At intervals I had to pretend enormous enthusiasm as everyone shouted they're off, and stood on tiptoe to look at quadrupeds already out of sight. One of the men asked me kindly if he should put something on for me. I looked terrified. Mr. Ankatel's sister, who was acting as hostess, at once ticked him off. Don't be silly, she said, the girl is not to bet. Then she said kindly to me, I tell you what. You shall have five shillings on whatever I back. Pay no attention to these others. When I discovered that they were betting twenty pounds or twenty-five pounds each time my hair practically stood on end. But hostesses were always kind to girls in money matters. They knew that few girls had any money to throw about. Even the rich ones, or the ones who came from rich homes, 
had only moderate dress allowances, pound 50 or 100 pounds a year. So hostesses looked after the girls carefully. They were sometimes encouraged to play bridge, but if so someone always carried them, and was responsible for their debts if they lost. This kept them from feeling out of it, and at the same time ensured that they didn't lose sums of money which they could not afford to lose. My first acquaintance with racing did not enthrall me. When I got home to mother I said that I hoped I would never hear the words thereof, again. When a year had passed, however, I had become quite a keen racing fan, and knew something about the runners. I stayed later with Constance Ralston Patrick's family in Scotland, where her father kept a small racing stable, and there I was initiated more fully into the sport and was taken to several small race meetings, which I soon found to be fun. Goodwood, of course, had been more like a garden party, a garden party going on for far too long. Moreover there was a lot of ragging going on, a kind of ragging I had not been used to. People broke up each other's rooms, threw things out of the windows, and shouted with laughter. There were no other girls there, they were mostly young married women in the racing set. One old colonel of about 60 came barging into my room and crying, now then, let's have a bit of fun with baby, took out one of my evening dresses from the cupboard, it was rather a babbyish one, pink with ribbons, and threw it out of the window saying, catch, catch, here is a trophy from the youngest member of the party. I was terribly upset. Evening dresses were great items in my life, carefully tended and preserved, cleaned, mended, and here it was being thrown about like a football. Mr. Ankadel's sister, and one of the other women, came to the rescue, and told him that he was not to tease the poor child. I was really thankful to leave this party. Still, it no doubt did me good. Amongst other house parties I remember an enormous one at a country house rented by Mr. and Mrs. Park Lyle, Mr. Park Lyle used to be referred to as, the Sugar King. We had met Mrs. Park Lyle out in Cairo. She was, I suppose, 50 or 60 at the time, but from a short distance she looked like a handsome young woman of 25. I had never seen much makeup in private life before. Mrs. Park Lyle certainly put up a good show with her dark, beautifully arranged hair, exquisitely enameled face, almost comparable with that of Queen Alexandra, and the pink and pale blue pastel shades which she wore, her whole appearance a triumph of art over nature. She was a woman of great kindliness, who enjoyed having lots of young people in her house. I was rather attracted to one of the young men there, later killed in the 1914-18 war. Though he took only moderate notice of me, I had hopes of becoming better acquainted. In this I was foiled, however, by another soldier, a gunner, who seemed continually to be at my elbow, insisting on being my partner at tennis and croquet, and all the rest of it. Day by day my mounting exasperation grew. I was sometimes extremely rude to him, he didn't seem to notice. He kept asking me if I had read this book or that, offering to send them to me. Would I be in London? Would I care to go and see some polo? My negative replies had no effect upon him. When the day came for my departure I had to catch a fairly early train because I had to go to London first and then take another train on to Devon. Mrs. Parklyle said to me after breakfast Mr. S. I can't remember his name now, is going to drive you to the station. Fortunately that was not very far. I would have much preferred to have gone in one of the Park Lyle cars, naturally the Park Lyles had a fleet of cars, but I presume Mr. S. had suggested driving me to our hostess, who had probably thought I would like it. How little she knew. However, we arrived at the station, the train came in, an express to London, and Mr. S. ensconced me in the corner seat of an empty second-class carriage. I said goodbye to him, in friendly tones, relieved to be seeing the last of him. Then just as the train started he suddenly caught at the handle, opened the door, and leapt in, closing it behind him. I'm coming to London, too, he said. I stared at him with my mouth open. You haven't got any luggage with you. I know, I know, it doesn't matter. He sat down opposite me, leaned forward, his hands on his knees, and gazed at me with a kind of ferocious glare. I meant to put it off till I met you again in London. I can't wait. I have to tell you now. I am madly in love with you. You must marry me. From the first moment I saw you, coming down to dinner, I knew that you were the one woman in the world for me. It was some time before I could interrupt the flow of words, and say with icy coldness, it is very kind of you, Mr. S., I am sure, and I deeply appreciate it, but I am afraid the answer is no. He protested for about five minutes, finally urging that we should at least leave it, so that we could be friends and meet again. 
I said that I thought it was much better that we shouldn't meet again, and that I would not change my mind. I said it with such finality that he was forced to accept it. He leaned back in his seat and gave himself up to gloom. Can you imagine a worse time to propose to a girl? There we were, shut up in an empty carriage, no corridors then, going to London, two hours at least, and having arrived at such an impasse in the conversation that there was nothing for us to say. Neither of us had anything to read. I still dislike Mr. S when I remember him, and have no proper feeling of. Gratitude such as one was always taught should be felt for a good man's love, Granny's maxim. I am sure he was a good man, perhaps that was what made him so dull. Another country house visit I paid was also a racing one, to stay with some old friends of my godmother's in Yorkshire, the Matthews. Mrs. Matthews was a non-stop talker, and rather alarming. The invitation was to a party for the St. Ledger. By the time I went there I had got more used to racing, and in fact was beginning to enjoy it. Moreover, a silly thing to remember, but the sort of thing one does, I had a new coat and skirt bought for this particular occasion. I was vastly pleased with myself in it. It was of a greenish-brown tweed of good quality. It came from a good tailoring house. It was the sort of thing my mother said was worth spending money on, because a good coat and skirt would do you for years. This one certainly did, I wore it for six years at least. The coat was long and had a velvet collar. With it I wore a smart little toque in greenish-brown shades of velvet in a bird's wing. I have no photographs of myself in this get-up, if I had I should no doubt think I looked highly ridiculous now, but my memories of myself are as looking smart, sporting, and well-dressed. The height of my joy was reached when at the station where I had to change, I must, I think, have been coming from Cheshire, where I had been with my sister. There was a cold wind blowing, and the station master approached me and asked if I would like to wait in his office. Perhaps, he said, your maid would like to bring along your jewel case or anything valuable. I had of course never traveled with a maid in my life, and never should, nor was I the owner of a jewel case, but I was gratified by this treatment, putting it down to the smartness of my velvet toque. I said my maid was not with me this time, I could not avoid saying this time in case I should go down in his eyes, but I gratefully accepted his offer, and sat in front of a good fire exchanging pleasant platitudes about the weather. Presently the next train came in and I was seen into it with much ceremony. I am convinced I owed this preferential treatment to my coat and skirt and hat. Since I was traveling second class and not first, I could hardly be suspected of great wealth or influence. The Matthews lived at a house called Thorpe Arch Hall. Mr. Matthews was much older than his wife, he must have been about 70, and he was a deer, with a thatch of white hair, a great love of racing, and, in his time, hunting. Though extremely fond of his wife he was inclined to be greatly flustered by her. Indeed, my principal memory of him was saying irritably, Damn, dear, don't hustle me. Damn, don't hustle me, don't hustle me, Addy. Mrs. Matthews was a born hustler and fusser. She talked and fussed from morning to night. She was kind, but at times I found her almost unbearable. She hustled poor old Tommy so much that he finally invited a friend of his to live permanently with them a Colonel Wallenstein, always said by the surrounding county to be Mrs. Matthews' second husband. I am quite convinced that this was no case of the other man or the wife's lover. Colonel Wallenstein was devoted to Addie Matthews, I think it had been a lifetime passion of his, but she had always kept him where she wanted him, as a convenient, platonic friend with a romantic devotion. Anyway, Addie Matthews lived a very happy life with her two devoted men. They indulged her, flattered her, and always arranged that she should have everything she wanted. It was while staying there that I met Evelyn Cochran, Charles Cochran's wife. She was a lovely little creature, just like a Dresden shepherdess, with big blue eyes, and fair hair. She had with her dainty but highly unsuitable shoes for the country, which Addie never let her forget, reproaching her for them every hour of the day, really, Evelyn dear, why you don't bring proper shoes with you? Look at those things pasteboard solace, only fit for London. Evelyn looked sadly at her with large blue eyes, her life was mostly spent in London, and was entirely wrapped up in the theatrical profession. She had, so I learned from her, climbed out of a window to run away with Charles Cochrane, who was heavily disapproved of by her family. She adored him with the kind of adoration that one seldom meets. She wrote to him every single day if she was away from home. I think, too, that, in spite of many other adventures, he always loved her. She suffered a good deal during her life with him, 
for with such a love as hers jealousy must have been hard to bear. But I think she found it worth it. To have such a passion for one person that lasts all your life is a privilege, no matter what it costs you in endurance. Colonel Wallenstein was her uncle. She disliked him very much. She also disliked Addie Matthews, but was rather fond of old Tom Matthews. I have never liked my uncle, she said, he is a most tiresome man. And as for Addie, she is the most aggravating and silly female I have ever met. She can't leave anyone alone, she is always scolding them or managing them, or doing something, she can't keep quiet. Third. After our stay at Thorpe Arch, Evelyn Cochran asked me to come to see them in London. I did, feeling shy, and was thrilled by hearing so much theatrical gossip. Also, for the first time, I began to appreciate that there might be something in. Pictures. Charles Cochran had a great love of painting. When I first saw his Degas picture of ballet girls it stirred something in me that I had not known existed. The habit of marching girls to picture galleries willy-nilly, at too young an age, is much to be deprecated. It does not produce the wanted result, unless they are naturally artistic. Moreover, to the untutored eye or the unartistic one, the resemblance of great masters to one another is most depressing. They have a sort of shiny mustard gloom. Art was forced on me first by being made to learn to draw and paint when I didn't enjoy it, and then by having a kind of moral obligation to appreciate art laid on me. An American friend of ours, herself a great devotee of pictures, music, and all kinds of culture, used to come over to London on periodical visits, she was a niece of my godmother, Mrs. Sullivan, and also of Pierpont Morgan. May was a dear person with a terrible affliction, she had a most unsightly goitre. In the days when she had been a young girl, she must have been a woman of about 40 when I first knew her, there was no remedy for goitre, surgery was supposed to be too dangerous. One day when May arrived in London, she told my mother that she was going to a clinic in Switzerland to be operated on. She had already made arrangements. A famous surgeon, who made this his speciality, had said to her, Mademoiselle, I would not advise this operation to any man, it must be done with a local anesthetic only because during the course of it the subject has to talk the whole time. Men's nerves are not strong yet to endure this, but women can achieve the fortitude necessary. It is an operation that will take some time, perhaps an hour or more, and during that time you will have to talk. Have you the fortitude? May says she looked at him, thought a minute or two, and then said firmly, yes, she had the fortitude. I think you are right to try, May, my mother said. It will be a great ordeal for you but if it succeeds it will make such a difference to your life that it will be worth anything you suffer. In due course word came from May in Switzerland, the operation had been successful. She had now left the clinic and was in Italy, in a pension at Fiesoli, near Florence. She was to remain there for about a month, and after go back to Switzerland to have a further examination. She asked whether my mother would allow me to go out and stay with her there, and see Florence and its art and architecture. Mother agreed, and arrangements were made for me to go. I was very excited, of course, I must have been about 16. A mother and daughter were found who were traveling out by the train that I was taking. I was delivered over to them, introduced by Cook's agent at Victoria, and started off. I was lucky in one thing, both mother and daughter felt ill in trains if they were not facing the engine. As I did not care, I had the whole of the other side of the carriage on which to lie down flat. None of us had appreciated the fact of the hour's difference in time, so when the moment came in the early hours of the morning for me to change at the frontier I was still asleep. I was bundled out by the conductor onto the platform, and mother and daughter shouted farewell. Assembling my belongings, I went to the other train, and immediately journeyed on through the mountains into Italy. Stingle, May's maid, met me in Florence, and we went up together in the tram to Fiesoli. It was inexpressibly beautiful on that day. All the early almond and peach blossom was out, delicate white and pink on the bare branches of the trees. May was in a villa there, and came out to meet me with a beaming face. I have never seen such a happy-looking woman. It was strange to see her without that terrible bag of flesh jutting out under her chin. She had had to have a great deal of courage, as the doctor had warned her. For an hour and twenty minutes, she told me, she had lain there in a chair, her feet held up in a wrench above her head, while the surgeons carved at her throat and she talked to them, answering questions, speaking, grimacing if told. Afterwards the doctor had congratulated her, he told her she was one of the bravest women he had ever known. But I must tell you, Monsieur L.E. Doctor, she said, just before the end I was feeling I had to scream, 
have hysterics, cry out and say I could not bear any more. Ah, said Dr. Ru, but you did not do so. You are a brave woman. I tell you. So May was unbelievably happy, and she did everything she could to make my stay in Italy agreeable. I went sightseeing into Florence every day. Sometimes Stengel went with me, but more often a young Italian woman engaged by May came up to Fiesoli and escorted me into the town. Young girls had to be even more carefully chaperoned in Italy than in France, and indeed I suffered all the discomforts of being pinched in trams by ardent young men most painful. It was then that I had been subjected to so large a dose of picture galleries and museums. Greedy as ever, what I looked forward to was the delicious meal in a patisserie before catching the tram back to Fiesoli. On several occasions in the later days May came in also, to accompany me on my artistic pilgrimage, and I remember well on the last day, when I was to return to England, she was adamant that I should see a wonderful St. Catherine of Siena, which had just been cleaned. I don't know if it was in the Uffizi or what gallery now, but May and I galloped through every room looking in vain for it. I couldn't have cared less about St. Catherine. I was fed up with St. Catherine's, revolted by those innumerable St. Sebastians struck all over with arrows, heartily. Tired of saints one and all, and their emblems and their unpleasant methods of death. I was fed up, too with self-satisfied Madonnas, particularly with those of Raphael. I really am ashamed, writing now, to think what a savage I was in this respect, but there it is, old masters are an acquired taste. As we raced about looking for St. Catherine, my anxiety was mounting. Would we have time to go to the patisserie and have a final delicious meal of chocolate and whipped cream, and sumptuous ghetto? I kept saying, I don't mind, May, really I don't mind. Don't bother any more. I've seen so many pictures of St. Catherine. Ah, but this one, Agatha dear, it's so wonderful, you'll realize when you see it how sad it would be if you'd missed it. I knew I shouldn't realize, but I was ashamed to tell May so. However, fate was on my side, it transpired that this particular picture of St. Catherine would be absent from the gallery for some weeks longer. There was just time to stuff me with chocolate and cakes before catching our train, May expatiating at length upon all the glorious pictures, and I agreeing with her fervently as I pushed in mouthfuls of cream and coffee icing. I ought to have looked like a pig by now, with bulging flesh and tiny eyes, instead of which I had a most ethereal appearance, fragile and thin, with large dreamy eyes. Seeing me, you would have prophesied an early death in a state of spiritual ecstasy, like children in Victorian storybooks. At any rate I did have the grace to feel ashamed at not appreciating May's artistic education. I had enjoyed Fiesoli, but mostly the almond blossom and I had got a lot of fun out of Dada, a tiny Pomeranian dog which accompanied May and Stengel everywhere. Dada was small and very clever. May often brought him to visit England. On those occasions he got inside a large muff of hers and always remained unsuspected by customs officers. May came to London on her way back to New York, and displayed her elegant new neck. Mother and Granny both wept and kissed her repeatedly, and May wept too because it was like an impossible dream come true. Only after she had left for New York did mother say to granny, how sad, though, how terribly sad, to think that she could have had this operation 15 years ago. She must have been very badly advised by consultants in New York. And now, I suppose, it's too late, said my grandmother thoughtfully. She will never marry now. But there, I am glad to say, granny was wrong. I think May had been terribly said that marriage was not to be for her, and I don't think for one moment she expected it so late in life. But some years later she came over to England bringing with her a clergyman who was the rector at one of the most important Episcopalian churches in New York, a man of great sincerity and personality. He had been told that he had only a year to live, but May, who had always been one of his most zealous parishioners, had insisted on getting together a subscription from the congregation and bringing him to London to consult doctors there. She said to Granny, you know, I am convinced that he will recover. He's needed, badly needed. He does wonderful work in New York. He's converted gamblers and gangsters, he's gone into the most terrible brothels and places, he's had no fear of public opinion or of being beaten up, and a lot of extraordinary characters have been converted by him. May brought him out to luncheon at Ealing. Afterwards, at her next visit, when she came to say goodbye, Granny said to her, May, that man's in love with you. Why, Auntie? exclaimed May, how can you say such a terrible thing? He never thinks of marriage. He is a convinced celibate. He may have been once, said Granny, but I don't think he is now. 
And what's all this about celibacy? He's not a Roman. He's got his eye on you, May. May looked highly shocked. However, a year later, she wrote and told us that Andrew was restored to health and that they were getting married. It was a very happy marriage. No one could have been kinder, gentler, and more understanding than Andrew was to May. She does so need to be happy, he said once to Granny. She has been shut off from happiness for most of her life, and she has become so afraid of it that it has turned her almost into a Puritan. Andrew was always to be something of an invalid, but it did not stop his work. Dear May, I am so glad that happiness came to her as it did. Fourth. In the year 1911 something that I considered fantastic happened. I went up in an aeroplane. Aeroplanes, of course, were one of the chief subjects of surmise, disbelief, argument, and all the rest of it. When I had been at school in Paris, we were taken one day to see Santos Dumont endeavor to get up off the ground in the Bois de Boulogne. As far as I remember, the aeroplane got up, flew a few yards, then crashed. All the same, we were impressed. Then there were the Wright brothers. We read about them eagerly. When taxis came into use in London, a system was introduced of whistling for cabs. You stood on your front doorstep, one whistle would produce a growler, four-wheeled cab, two whistles a hansom, that gondola of the streets, three whistles, if you were very lucky, produced that new vehicle a taxi. A picture in. Punch one week showed a small urchin saying to a butler standing on a stately doorstep, whistle in hand, try whistling four times, guv nor, you might get an aeroplane. Now suddenly it seemed that that picture was not so funny or impossible as it had been. It might soon be true. On the occasion I am talking about, mother and I had been staying somewhere in the country, and we went one day to see a flying exhibition, a commercial venture. We saw planes zoom up into the air, circle round, and vol plane down to earth again. Then a notice was put up, pound five a flight. I looked at mother. My eyes grew large and pleading. Could I? Oh, mother, couldn't I? It would be so wonderful. I think it was my mother who was wonderful. To stand and watch her beloved child going up in the air in a plane. At that time they were crashing every day. She said, if you really want to go, Agatha, you shall. Five pounds was a lot of money in our life, but it was well spent. We went to the barricade. The pilot looked at me, and said, is that head on tight? All right, get in. The flight only lasted five minutes. Up we went in the air circled round several times, oh, it was wonderful. Then that switch back down, and the vol plane to earth again. Five minutes of ecstasy, and half a crown extra for a photograph, a faded old photograph that I still have showing a dot in the sky that is me in an aeroplane on May 10, 1911. The friends of one's life are divided into two categories. First there are those that spring out of one's environment, with whom you have in common the things you do. They are like the old-fashioned ribbon dance. They wind and pass in and out of your life, and you pass in and out of theirs. Some you remember, some you forget. Then there are those whom I would describe as one's elected friends, not many in number, whom a real interest on either side brings together, and who usually remain, if circumstances permit, all through your life. I should say I have had about seven or eight such friends, mostly men. My women friends have usually been environmental only. I don't know exactly what brings about a friendship between man and woman, Men do not by nature ever want a woman as a friend. It comes about by accident, often because the man is already sensually attracted by some other woman and quite wants to talk about her. Women do often crave after friendship with men, and are willing to come to it by taking an interest in someone else's love affair. Then there comes about a very stable and enduring relationship, you become interested in each other as people. There is a flavor of sex, of course, the touch of salt as a condiment. According to an elderly doctor friend of mine, a man looks at every woman he meets and wonders what she would be like to sleep with, possibly proceeding to whether she'd be likely to sleep with him if he wanted it. Direct and coarse that's a man, he put it. They don't consider a woman as a possible wife. Women, I think, quite simply try on, as it were, every man they meet as a possible husband. I don't believe any woman has ever looked across a room and fallen in love at first sight with a man, lots of men have with a woman. We used to have a family game, invented by my sister and a friend of hers, it was called Agatha's Husbands. The idea was that they picked out two or at most three of the most repellent looking strangers in a room, and it was then put to me that I had to choose one of them as a husband, on pain of death or slow torture by the Chinese. Now then, Agatha, which will you have, 
the fat young one with pimples, and the scurfy head, or that black one like a gorilla with the bulging eyes. Oh, I can't, they're so awful. You must, it's got to be one of them. Or else red hot needles and water torture. Oh dear, then the gorilla. In the end we got into a habit of labeling any physically hideous individual as, an Agatha's husband, oh. Look. That's a really ugly man, a real Agatha's husband. My one important woman friend was Eileen Morris. She was a friend of our family. I had in a way known her all my life, but did not get to know her properly until I was about 19 and had caught up with her, since she was some years older than I was. She lived with five maiden aunts in a large house overlooking the sea, and her brother was a schoolmaster. She and he were very alike, and she had a mind with the clarity of a man's rather than a woman's. Her father was a nice, quiet, dull man, his wife had been, my mother told me, one of the gayest and most beautiful women she had ever seen. Eileen was rather plain, but she had a remarkable mind. It ranged over so many subjects. She was the first person I had come across with whom I could discuss ideas. She was one of the most impersonal people I have ever known, one never heard anything about her own feelings. I knew her for many years, yet I often wonder in what her private life consisted. We never confided anything personal in each other, but whenever we met we had something to discuss, and plenty to talk about. She was quite a good poet, and knowledgeable about music. I remember that I had a song which I liked, because I enjoyed the music of it so much, but unfortunately it had remarkably silly words. When I commented on this to Eileen, she said she would like to try to write some different words for it. This she did, improving the song. Enormously from my point of view. I, too, wrote poetry, perhaps everyone did at my age. Some of my earlier examples are unbelievably awful. I remember one poem I wrote when I was eleven. I knew a little cowslip and a pretty flower too. Who wished she was a bluebell and had a robe of blue? You can guess how it went on. She got a robe of blue, became a bluebell, and didn't like it. Could anything be more suggestive of a complete lack of literary talent? By the age of 17 or 18, however, I was doing better. I wrote a series of poems on the Harlequin legend, Harlequin's song, Columbines, Pierrot, Pierrette, etc. I sent one or two poems to the Poetry Review. I was very pleased when I got a guinea prize. After that, I won several prizes and also had poems printed there. I felt very proud of myself when I was successful. I wrote quite a lot of poems from time to time. A sudden excitement would come over me and I would rush off to write down what I felt gurgling round in my mind. I had no lofty ambitions. An occasional prize in the poetry review was all I asked. One poem of mine that I reread lately I think is not bad, at least it has in it something of what I wanted to express. I reproduce it here for that reason. Down in the wood. Bare brown branches against a blue sky, and silence within the wood. Leaves that listless, lie under your feet. Bold brown bowls that are biding their time, and silence within the wood. Spring has been fair in the fashion of youth, summer with languorous largess of love, autumn with passion that passes to pain. Leaf, flower, and flame, they have fallen and failed and beauty, bare beauty is left in the wood. Bare brown branches against a mad moon, and something that stirs in the wood. Leaves that rustle and rise from the dead. Branches that beckon and leer in the light, and something that walks in the wood. Skirling and whirling, the leaves are alive. Driven by death in a devilish dance. Shrieking and swaying of terrified trees. A wind that goes sobbing and shivering by. And fear, naked fear passes out of the wood. I occasionally tried to set one of my poems to music. My composition was not of a high order, a fairly simple ballad I could do not too badly. I also wrote a waltz with a trite tune, and a rather extraordinary title, I don't know where I got it from, one hour with the... It was not until several of my partners had remarked that an hour was a pretty hefty time for a waltz to last that I realized the title was somewhat ambiguous. I was proud because one of the principal bands, Joyce's band, which played at most of the dances, included it occasionally in its repertoire. However, that waltz, I can see now, is exceedingly bad music. Considering my own feelings about waltzes, I cannot imagine why I tried to write one. The tango was another matter. A deputy of Mrs. Wordsworth started a dancing evening for adults at Newton Abbott, and I and others used to go over for instruction. There I made what I called, my tango friend, a young man whose Christian name was Ronald and whose last name I cannot remember. We rarely spoke to each other or took the least interest in each other, our whole mind was engrossed with our feet. 
We had been partnered together fairly early, had found the same enthusiasm, and danced well together. We became the principal exponents of the art of the tango. At all dances where we met we reserved the tango for each other without question. Another excitement was Lily Elsie's famous dance in The Merry Widow or The Count of Luxembourg, I can't remember which, when she and her partner waltzed up a staircase and down again. This I practiced with the boy next door. Max Meller was at Eden at the time, about three years younger than I was. His father was a very ill man with tuberculosis, who had to lie out in the garden in an open-air hut where he slept at night. Max was their only son. He fell deeply in love with me as an older girl, and grown up, and used to parade himself for my benefit, or so his mother told me, wearing a shooting jacket and shooting boots, shooting sparrows with an air gun. He also began to wash, quite a novelty on his part, since his mother had had to worry him for several years about the state of his hands, neck, etc., bought several pale mauve and lavender ties, and in fact, showed every sign of growing up. We got together on the subject of dancing, and I would repair to the Mellor's house to practice with him on their stairs, which were more suitable than ours, being shallower and wider. I don't know that we were a great success. We had a lot of extremely painful falls, but persevered. He had a nice tutor, a young man called, I think, Mr. Shaw, about whom Marguerite Lucy commented, a nice little nature, it's a pity his legs are so common. I must say that ever since I have been unable to stop myself applying this criterion to any male stranger. Good looking, perhaps, but are his legs common? Fifth. One unpleasant winter's day, I was lying in bed recovering from influenza. I was bored. I had read lots of books, had attempted to do the demon thirteen times, brought out Miss Milligan successfully, and was now reduced to dealing myself bridge hands. My mother looked in. Why don't you write a story, she suggested. Write a story? I said, rather startled. Yes, said mother. Like Madge. Oh, I don't think I could. Why not, she asked. There didn't seem any reason why not, except that. You don't know that you can't, mother pointed out, because you've never tried. That was fair enough. She disappeared with her usual suddenness and reappeared five minutes later with an exercise book in her hand. There are only some laundry entries at one end, she said. The rest of it is quite all right. You can begin your story now. When my mother suggested doing anything one practically always did it. I sat up in bed and began thinking about writing a story. At any rate it was better than doing Miss Milligan again. I can't remember now how long it took me, not long, I think, in fact, I believe it was finished by the evening of the following day. I began hesitantly on various different themes, then abandoned them, and finally found myself thoroughly interested in going along at a great rate. It was exhausting, and did not assist my convalescence, but it was exciting too. I'll route out Madge's old typewriter, said mother, then you can type it. This first story of mine was called The House of Beauty. It is no masterpiece but I think on the whole that it is good, the first thing I ever wrote that showed any sign of promise. Amateurishly written, of course, and showing the influence of all that I had read the week before. This is something you can hardly avoid when you first begin to write. Just then I had obviously been reading D. H. Lawrence. I remember that the plumed serpent, sons, and lovers, the white peacock etc. were great favorites of mine about then. I had also read some books by someone called Mrs. Everard Coates, whose style I much admired. This first story was rather precious, and written so that it was difficult to know exactly what the author meant, but though the style was derivative the story itself shows at least imagination. After that I wrote other stories, The Call of Wings, Not Bad, The Lonely God, result of reading The City of Beautiful Nonsense, Regrettably Sentimental, a short dialogue between a deaf lady and a nervous man at a party, and a grisly story about a seance, which I rewrote many years later. I typed all these stories on Madge's machine, an Empire typewriter, I remember, and hopefully sent them off to various magazines, choosing different pseudonyms from time to time as the fancy took me. Madge had called herself Mostyn Miller, I called myself Mac Miller, then changed to Nathaniel Miller my grandfather's name. I had not much hope of success, and I did not get it. The stories all returned promptly with the usual slip, the editor regrets, then I would parcel them up again and send them off to some other magazine. I also decided that I would try my hand at a novel. I embarked lightheartedly. It was to be set in Cairo. I thought of two separate plots, and at first could not choose between them. In the end, I hesitatingly made a decision and started on one. 
It had been suggested to my mind by three people we used to look at in the dining room of the hotel in Cairo. There was an attractive girl, hardly a girl in my eyes, because she must have been close on 30, and every evening after the dance she would come and have supper there with two men. One was a heavy set, broad man, with dark hair, a captain in the 60th rifles, the other a tall, fair young man in the cold stream guards, possibly a year or two younger than she was. They sat one on either side of her, she kept them in play. We learned their names but we never discovered much more about them, though somebody did make the remark once, she will have to make up her mind between them, sometime. That was enough for my imagination, if I had known any more about them I don't think I should have wanted to write about them. As it was, I was able to make up an excellent story, probably far different from their characters, their actions, or anything else. Having gone a certain distance with it, I became dissatisfied, and turned to my other plot. This was more light-hearted, dealing with amusing characters. I made, however, the fatal mistake of encumbering myself with a deaf heroine, really I can't think why, anyone can deal in an interesting manner with a blind heroine, but a deaf heroine is not so easy, because, as I soon found out, once you have described what she is thinking, and what people are thinking and saying of her, she is left with no possibility of conversation, and the whole business comes to a stop. Poor Melancy became ever more insipid and boring. I went back to my first attempt, and I realized that it was not going to be nearly long enough for a novel. Finally, I decided to incorporate the two. Since the setting was the same, why not have two plots in one? Proceeding on these lines I finally brought my novel to the requisite length. Heavily encumbered by too much plot, I dashed madly from one set of characters to the other, occasionally forcing them to mix with each other in a way which they did not seem to wish to do. I called it, I can't think why, snow upon the desert. My mother then suggested, rather hesitantly, that I might ask Eden Philpotts if he could give me help or advice. Eden Philpotts was then at the height of his fame. His novels of Dartmoor were celebrated. As it happened, he was a neighbor of ours, and a personal friend of the family. I was shy about it, but in the end agreed. Eden Philpotts was an odd-looking man, with a face more like a fawn's than an ordinary human being's, an interesting face, with its long eyes turned up at the corners. He suffered terribly from gout, and often when we went to see him was sitting with his leg bound up with masses of bandages on a stool. He hated social functions and hardly ever went out, in fact he disliked seeing people. His wife, on the other hand, was extremely sociable, a handsome and charming woman, who had many friends. Eden Philpotts had been very fond of my father, and was also fond of my mother who seldom bothered him with social invitations but used to admire his garden and his many rare plants and shrubs. He said that of course he would read Agatha's literary attempt. I can hardly express the gratitude I feel to him. He could so easily have uttered a few careless words of well-justified criticism, and possibly discouraged me for life. As it was, he set out to help. He realized perfectly how shy I was and how difficult it was for me to speak of things. The letter he wrote contained very good advice. Some of these things that you have written, he said, are capital. You have a great feeling for dialogue. You should stick to gay natural dialogue. Try and cut all moralizations out of your novels, you are much too fond of them, and nothing is more boring to read. Try and leave your characters alone, so that they can speak for themselves, instead of always rushing into. Tell them what they ought to say, or to explain to the reader what they mean by what they are saying. That is for the reader to judge for himself. You have two plots here, rather than one, but that is a beginner's fault, you soon won't want to waste plots in such a spend-free way. I am sending you a letter to my own literary agent, Hughes Massey. He will criticize this for you and tell you what chances it has of being accepted. I am afraid it is not easy to get a first novel accepted, so you mustn't be disappointed. I should like to recommend you a course of reading which I think you will find helpful. Read De Quincey's Confessions of an Opium Eater. This will increase your vocabulary enormously, he used some very interesting words. Read the story of my life by Jefferies, for descriptions, and a feeling for nature. I forget now what the other books were, a collection of short stories, I remember, one of which was called The Paris Pride, and was written round a teapot. There was also a volume of Ruskin, to which I took a violent dislike, and one or two others. Whether they did me good or not, I don't know. I certainly enjoyed the Quincy and also the short stories. I then went and had an interview in London with Hughes Massey. The original Hughes Massey was alive at that time, and it was he whom I saw. He was a large, swarthy man, 
and he terrified me. Ah, he said, looking at the cover of the manuscript, Snow Upon the Desert. M.M., a very suggestive title, suggestive of banked fires. I looked even more nervous, feeling that was far from descriptive of what I had written. I don't know quite why I had chosen that title, beyond the fact that I had presumably been reading Omar Khayyam. I think I meant it to be that, like snow upon the desert's dusty face, all the events that happen in life are in themselves superficial and pass without leaving any memory. Actually I don't think the book was at all like that when finished, but that had been my idea of what it was going to be. Hughes Massey kept the manuscript to read, but returned it some months later, saying that he felt it unlikely that he could place it. The best thing for me to do, he said, was to stop thinking about it anymore, and to start to write another book. I have never been an ambitious person by nature, and I resigned myself to making no further struggle. I still wrote a few poems, and enjoyed them, and I think I wrote one or two more short stories. I sent them to magazines, but expected them to come back, and come back they usually did. I was no longer studying music seriously. I practiced the piano a few hours a day, and kept it up as well as I could to my former standard, but I took no more. Lessons. I still studied singing when we were in London for any length of time. Francis Corbe, the Hungarian composer, gave me singing lessons, and taught me some charming Hungarian songs of his own composition. He was a good teacher and an interesting man. I also studied English ballad singing with another teacher, a woman who lived near that part of the Regent Canal which they call Little Venice and which always fascinates me. I sang quite often at local concerts and, as was the fashion of the time, took my music when I was asked out to dinner. There was, of course, no tinned music in those days, no broadcasting, no tape recorders, no stereophonic gramophones. For music you relied on the private performer, who might be good, moderately good, bloody awful. I was quite a good accompanist, and could read by sight, so I often had to play accompaniments for other singers. I had one wonderful experience when there were performances of Wagner's Ring in London with Richter conducting. My sister Madge had suddenly become very interested in Wagnerian music. She arranged for a party of four to go to the ring, and paid for me. I shall always be grateful to her and remember that experience. Van Rui sang Wotan. Gertrude Kappel sang the principal Wagnerian soprano roles. She was a big, heavy woman with a turned-up nose no actress, but she had a powerful, golden voice. An American called Saltzman Stevens sang Siegland, Isolde, and Elizabeth. Saltzman Stevens I shall always find it hard to forget. She was a most beautiful actress in her motions and gestures, and had long graceful arms that came out of the shapeless white draperies Wagnerian heroines always wore. She made a glorious Isolde. I suppose her voice could not have been equal to that of Gertrude Kappel, but her acting was so superb that it carried one away. Her fury and despair in the first act of Tristan, the lyrical beauty of her voice in the second, and then, most unforgettable, to my mind, that great moment in the third act, that long music of Kurwinal, the anguish, and the waiting, with Tristan and Kurwinal together, the looking for the ship on the sea. Finally that great soprano cry that comes from offstage, Tristan. Saltzman Stevens was a sold. Rushing, yes, rushing one could feel, up the cliff and up onto the stage, running with those white arms outstretched to catch Tristan within their grasp. And then, a sad, almost bird-like stricken cry. She sang the Liebestad entirely as a woman, not a goddess, sang it kneeling by Tristan's body, looking down at his face, seeing him with the force of her will and imagination come alive, and finally, bending, bending lower and lower, the last three words of the opera, with a kiss, came as she bent to touch his lips with hers, and then to fall suddenly across his body. Being me, every night before I dropped off to sleep I used to turn over and over in my mind the dream that one day I might be singing a soul on a real stage. It did no harm, I told myself, at any rate to go through it in fantasy. Could I, would it ever be possible for me to sing in opera? The answer of course was no. An American friend of May Sturges who was over in London, and connected with the Metropolitan Opera House New York, very kindly came to hear me sing one day. I sang various arias for her, and she took me through a series of scales, arpeggios, and exercises. Then she said to me, the songs you sang told me nothing, but the exercises do. You will make a good concert singer, and should be able to do well and make your name at that. Your voice is not strong enough for opera, and never will be. So let us take it from there. My cherished secret fantasy to do something in music was ended. 
I had no ambition to be a concert singer, which was not an easy thing to do anyway. Musical careers for girls did not meet with encouragement. If there had been any chance of singing in opera I would have fought for it, but that was for the privileged few, who had the right vocal cords. I am sure there can be nothing more soul-destroying in life than to persist in trying to do a thing that you want desperately to do well, and to know you are at the best second rate. So I put wishful thinking aside. I pointed out to mother that she could now save the expense of music lessons. I could sing as much as I liked, but there was no point in going on studying singing. I had never really believed that my dream could come true, but it is a good thing to have had a dream and to have enjoyed it, so long as you do not clutch too hard. It must have been about this time that I began reading the novels of May Sinclair, by which I was much impressed, and, indeed, when I read them now I am still much impressed. I think she was one of our finest and most original novelists, and I cannot help feeling that there will be a revival of interest in her someday, and that her works will be republished. A Combined Maze, that classic story of a little clerk and his girl, I still think one of the best novels ever written. I also liked The Divine Fire, and Tasker Fevens I think a masterpiece. A short story of hers, The Flaw in the Crystal, impressed me so much, probably because I was addicted to writing psychic stories at the time that it inspired me to write a story of my own somewhat in the same vein. I called it Vision, it was published with some other stories of mine in a volume much later, and I still like it when I come across it again. I had formed a habit of writing stories by this time. It took the place, shall we say, of embroidering cushion covers or pictures taken from Dresden China flower painting. If anyone thinks this is putting creative writing too low in the scale, I cannot agree. The creative urge can come out in any form, in embroidery, in the cooking of interesting dishes, in painting, drawing and sculpture, in composing music, as well as in writing books and stories. The only difference is that you can be a great deal more grand about some of these things than others. I would agree that the embroidering of Victorian cushion covers is not equal to participating in the Bayou Tapestry, but the urge is the same in both cases. The ladies of the early Williams's court were producing a piece of original work requiring thought, inspiration and tireless application, some parts of it no doubt were dull to do, and some parts highly exciting. Though you may say that a square of brocade with two clematis and a butterfly on it is a ridiculous comparison, the artist's inner satisfaction was probably much the same. The waltz I composed was nothing to be proud of, one or two of my embroideries, however, were good of their kind, and I was pleased with them. I don't think I went as far as being pleased with my stories, but then there always has to be a lapse of time after the accomplishment of a piece of creative work before you can in any way evaluate it. You start into it, inflamed by an idea, full of hope, full indeed of confidence, about the only times in my life when I have been full of confidence. If you are properly modest, you will never write at all, so there had to be one delicious moment when you have thought of something, know just how you are going to write it, rush for a pencil, and start in an exercise book buoyed up with exaltation. You then get into difficulties, don't see your way out, and finally manage to accomplish more or less what you first meant to accomplish, though losing confidence all the time. Having finished it, you know that it is absolutely rotten. A couple of months later you wonder whether it may not be alright after all. Sixth. About then I had two near escapes from getting married. I call them near escapes because, looking back now, I realize with certainty that either of them would have been a disaster. The first one was what you might call, a young girl's high romance. I was staying with the Ralston Patricks. Constance and I drove to a cold and windy meet, and a man mounted on a nice chestnut rode up to speak to Constance and was introduced to me. Charles was, I suppose, about 35, a major in the 17th Lancers, and he came every year to Warwickshire to hunt. I met him again that evening when there was a fancy dress dance, to which I went dressed as Elaine. A pretty costume. I still have it, and wonder how I could ever have got into it, it is in the chest in the hall which is full of dressing up things. It is quite a favorite, white brocade and a pearl cap. I met Charles several times during my visit, and when I went back home we both expressed polite wishes that we should meet again sometime. He mentioned that he might be down in Devonshire later. Three or four days after getting home I received a parcel. In it was a small silver gilt box. Inside the lid was written, the asps, a date, and, to Elaine below it. The asps was where the meet had taken place, and the date was the date I had met him. I also got a letter from him saying that he hoped to come to see us the following week when he would be in Devon. That was the beginning of a lightning courtship. 
Boxes of flowers arrived, occasional books, enormous boxes of exotic chocolates. Nothing was said that could not have been properly said to a young girl, but I was thrilled. He paid us two more visits, and on the third asked me to marry him. He had, he said, fallen in love with me the first moment he saw me. If one was arranging proposals in order of merit, this one would easily go to the top of my list. I was fascinated and partly carried off my feet by his technique. He was a man with a good deal of experience of women, and able to produce most of the reactions he wanted. I was ready for the first time to consider that here was my fate, my Mr. Wright. And yet, yes, there it was, and yet. When Charles was there, telling me how wonderful I was, how he loved me, what a perfect Elaine, what an exquisite creature I was, how he would spend his whole life making me happy, and so on, his hands trembling and his voice shaking, oh yes, I was charmed like a bird off a tree. And yet, yet, when he was gone away, when I thought of him in absence, there was nothing there. I did not yearn to see him again. I just felt he was, very nice. The alteration between the two moods puzzled me. How can you tell if you are in love with a person? If in absence they mean nothing to you, and in presence they sweep you off your feet, what is your real reaction? My poor darling mother must have suffered a great deal at that time. She had, she told me later, prayed a great deal that shortly a husband would be provided for me, good, kind, and well provided with this world's goods. Charles had appeared much like an answer to prayer, but somehow she wasn't satisfied. She always knew what people were thinking and feeling, and she must have known quite well that I didn't know myself what I did feel. While she held her usual maternal view that no man in this world could be good enough for her Agatha, she had a feeling that, even allowing for that, this was not the right man. She wrote to the Ralston Patricks to find out as much as she could about him. She was handicapped by my father not being alive, and by my having no brother who could make what were in those days the usual inquiries as to a man's record with women, his exact financial position, his family, and so on and so on, very old-fashioned it seems nowadays, but I dare say it averted a good deal of misery. Charles came up to standard. He had had a good many affairs with women, but that my mother did not really mind, it was an accepted principle that men sowed their wild oats before marriage. He was about fifteen years older than I was, but her own husband had been ten years older than she was, and she believed in that kind of gap in years. She told Charles that Agatha was still very young and that she must not come to any rash decisions. She suggested that we should see each other occasionally during the next month or two, without my being pressed for a decision. This did not work well because Charles and I had absolutely nothing to talk about except the fact that he was in love with me. Since he was holding himself back on that subject, there was a great deal of embarrassed silence between us. Then he would go away, and I would sit and wonder. What did I want to do? Did I want to marry him? Then I would get a letter from him. He wrote, there was no doubt about it, the most glorious love letters, the kind of love letters that any woman would long to get. I pored over them, reread them, kept them, decided that this was love at last. Then Charles would come back, and I would be excited, carried off my feet, and yet at the same time had a cold feeling at the back of my mind that it was all wrong. In the end my mother suggested that we should not see each other for six months, and that then I should decide definitely. That was adhered to, and during that period there were no letters, which was probably just as well, because I should have fallen for those letters in the end. When the six months were up I received a telegram. Cannot stand this indecision any longer. Will you marry me, yes or no? I was in bed with a slight feverish attack at the time. My mother brought me the telegram. I looked at it and at the reply paid form. I took a pencil and wrote the word no. Immediately I felt an enormous relief, I had decided something. I should not have to go through any more of this uncomfortable up and down feeling. Are you sure, asked mother. Yes, I said. I turned over on my pillow and went immediately to sleep. So that was the end of that. Life was rather gloomy during the next four or five months. For the first time everything I did bored me and I began to feel that I had made a great mistake. Then Wilfred Peary came back into my life. I have mentioned Martin and Lillian Peary, my father's great friends, whom we met again abroad, in Dinard. We had continued to meet, though I had not again seen the boys. Harold had been at Eton and Wilfred had been a midshipman in the Navy. Now Wilfred was a fully-fledged sub-lieutenant RN. He was in a submarine, I think, at that time and often came in with that portion of the fleet which visited Torquay. He became an immense friend at once, 
one of the people in my life I have been fondest of. Within a couple of months we were unofficially engaged. Wilfred was such a relief after Charles. With him there was no excitement, no doubt, no misery. Here was just a dear friend, somebody I knew well. We read books, discussed them, we had always something to talk about. I was completely at home with him. The fact that I was treating him and considering him exactly like a brother, did not occur to me. My mother was delighted, and Mrs. Peary too. Martin Peary had died some years ago. It seemed a perfect marriage from everyone's point of view. Wilfred had a good career ahead of him in the Navy, our fathers had been the closest friends, and our mothers liked each other, mother liked Wilfred, Mrs. Peary liked me. I still feel I was a monster of ingratitude not to have married him. My life was now settled for me. In a year or two, when it was suitable, young subalterns and young sublieutenants were not encouraged to marry too soon, we would be married. I liked the idea of marrying a sailor. I should live in lodgings at South Sea, Plymouth, or somewhere like that, and when Wilfred was away on foreign stations I could come home to Ashfield and spend my time with mother. Really, nothing in the world could have been so right. I suppose there is a horrible kink in one's disposition that tends always to kick against anything that is too right or too perfect. I wouldn't admit it for a long time, but the prospect of marrying Wilfred induced in me a depressing feeling of boredom. I liked him, I would have been happy living in the same house with him, but somehow there wasn't any excitement about it, no excitement at all. One of the first things that happens when you are attracted to a man and he is to you is that extraordinary illusion that you think exactly alike about everything, that you each say the things the other had been thinking. How wonderful it is that you like the same books, and the same music. The fact that one of you hardly ever goes to a concert or listens to music doesn't at that moment matter. He always really liked music, but he didn't know he did. In the same way, the books he likes you have never actually wished to read, but now you feel that really you do want to read them. There it is, one of nature's great illusions. We both like dogs and hate cats. How wonderful. We both like cats and hate dogs, also wonderful. So life went placidly on. Every two or three weeks Wilfred came for the weekend. He had a car and used to drive me around. He had a dog, and we both loved the dog. He became interested in spiritualism, therefore I became interested in spiritualism. So far all was well. But now Wilfred began to produce. Books that he was eager for me to read and pronounce on. They were very large books, theosophical mostly. The illusion that you enjoyed whatever your man enjoyed didn't work, naturally it didn't work, I wasn't really in love with him. I found the books on Theosophy tedious, not only tedious, I thought they were completely false, worse still, I thought a great many of them were nonsense. I also got rather tired of Wilfred's descriptions of the mediums he knew. There were two girls in Portsmouth, and the things those girls saw you wouldn't believe. They could hardly ever go into a house without gasping, stretching, clutching their hearts and being upset because there was a terrible spirit standing behind one of the company. The other day, said Wilfred, Mary, she's the elder of the two, she went into a house and up to the bathroom to wash her hands, and do you know she couldn't walk over the threshold? No, she absolutely couldn't. There were two figures there, one was holding a razor to the throat of the other. Would you believe it? I nearly said, no, I wouldn't, but controlled myself in time. That's very interesting. I said. Had anyone ever held a razor to the throat of somebody there? They must have, said Wilfred. The house had been let to several people before, so an incident of that kind must have occurred. Don't you think so? Well, you can see it for yourself, can't you? But I didn't see it for myself. I was always of an agreeable nature however, and so I said cheerfully, of course, it certainly must have been so. Then one day Wilfred rang up from Portsmouth and said a wonderful chance had come his way. There was a party being assembled to look for treasure trove in South America. Some leave was due to him and he would be able to go off on this expedition. Would I think it terrible of him if he went? It was the sort of exciting chance that might never happen again. The mediums, I gathered, had expressed approval. They had said that undoubtedly he would come back having discovered a city that had not been known since the time of the Incas. Of course, one couldn't take that as proof or anything, but it was very extraordinary, wasn't it? Did I think it awful of him, when he could have spent a good part of his leave with me? I found myself having not the slightest hesitation. I behaved with splendid unselfishness. I said to him I thought it a wonderful opportunity, that of course he must go, 
and that I hoped with all my heart that he would find the Inca's treasures. Wilfred said I was wonderful, absolutely wonderful, not a girl in a thousand would behave like that. He rang off, sent me a loving letter, and departed. But I was not a girl in a thousand, I was just a girl who had found out the truth about herself and was rather ashamed about it. I woke up the day after he had actually sailed with the feeling that an enormous load had slipped off my mind. I was delighted for Wilfred to go treasure hunting, because I loved him like a brother and I wanted him to do what he wanted to do. I thought the treasure hunting idea was rather silly, and almost certain to be bogus. That again was because I was not in love with him. If I had been, I would have been able to see it through his eyes. Thirdly, oh joy, oh joy. I would not have to read any more Theosophy. What are you looking so cheerful about, mother asked suspiciously. Listen, mother, I said. I know it's awful, but I am really cheerful because Wilfred has gone away. The poor darling. Her face fell. I have never felt so mean, so ungrateful as I did then. She had been so happy about Wilfred and me coming together. For one misguided moment I almost felt that I must go through with it, just for the sake of making her happy. Fortunately, I was not quite so sunk in sentimentality as that. I didn't write and tell Wilfred what I had decided, because I thought it might have a bad effect on him in the middle of hunting for Inca treasure in steamy jungles. He might have a fever, or some unpleasant animal might leap on him while his mind was distracted, and anyway it would spoil his enjoyment. But I had a letter waiting for him when he came back. I told him how sorry I was, how fond of him I was, but I didn't think that there was really the proper kind of feeling between us to engage each other for life. He didn't agree with me, of course, but he took the decision seriously. He said he didn't think he could bear to see me often, but that we would always remain friendly towards each other. I wonder now if he was relieved as well. I don't think so, but on the other hand I do not think it cut him to the heart. I think he was lucky. He would have made me a good husband, and would always have been fond of me, and I think I should have made him quite happy in a quiet way, but he could do better for himself, and about three months later he did. He fell violently in love with another girl, and she fell as violently in love with him. They were married in due course, and had six children. Nothing could have been more satisfactory. As for Charles, about three years later he married a beautiful girl of 18. Really, what a benefactress I was to those two men. The next thing that happened was that Reggie Lucy came back on leave from Hong Kong. Though I had known the Lucis for so many years, I had never met their eldest brother, Reggie. He was a major in the Gunners, and had done his service mostly abroad. He was a shy and retiring person who seldom went out. He liked playing golf, but he had never cared for dances or parties. He was not fair-haired and blue-eyed like the others, he had dark hair and brown eyes. They were a closely knit family, and enjoyed each other's society. We went out to Dartmoor together in the usual Lucy-ish fashion, missing trams, looking up trains which didn't exist, missing them anyway, changing at Newton Abbott and missing the connection, deciding we'd go to a different part of the moor, and so on. Then Reggie offered to improve my golf. My golf at this stage might be said to have been practically non-existent. Various young men had done their best for me, but much to my own regret, I was not good at games. The irritating thing was that I was always a promising beginner. At archery, at billiards, at golf, at tennis, and at croquet I promised very well, but the promise was never fulfilled, another source of humiliation. The truth is, I suppose, that if you haven't got a good eye for balls you haven't. I played in croquet tournaments with Madge where I had the advantage of the utmost number of bisques that was allowed. With all your bisques, said Madge, who played well, we ought to win. Easily. My bisques helped, but we didn't win. I was good at the theory of the game, but I invariably missed ridiculously easy shots. At tennis I developed a good forehand drive which sometimes impressed my partners, but my backhand was hopeless. You cannot play tennis with a forehand drive alone. At golf I had wild drives, terrible iron shots, beautiful approach shots, and completely unreliable putts. Reggie, however, was extremely patient, and he was the kind of teacher who did not mind in the least whether you improved or not. We meandered gently round the links, we stopped whenever we felt like it. The serious golfers went by train to Chiston Golf Course. The Torquay course was also the race course three times a year, and was not much patronized or well kept up. Reggie and I would amble round it, then we would go back to tea with the Lucis and have a sing-song, having made fresh toast because the old toast was now cold. And so on. 
It was a happy lazy life. Nobody ever hurried, and time didn't matter. Never any worry, never any fuss. I may be entirely wrong, but I feel certain that none of the leucis ever had duodenal ulcers, coronary thrombosis, or high blood pressure. One day Reggie and I had played four holes of golf, and then, since the day was extremely hot, he suggested that really it would be much more agreeable to sit down under the hedge he got out his pipe, smoked companionably, and we talked in our usual way, which was never continuously, but a word or two on a subject or a person, then restful pauses. It is the way I most like holding a conversation. I never felt slow or stupid, or at a loss for things to say, when I was with Reggie. Presently, after various puffs at his pipe, he said thoughtfully, you've got a lot of scalps, Agatha, haven't you? Well, you can put mine with them any time you like. I looked at him rather doubtfully, not quite sure of his meaning. I don't know whether you know I want to marry you, he said, you probably do. But I may as well say it. Mind you, I'm not pushing myself forward in any way, I mean there's no hurry, the famous Lucy phrase came easily from Reggie's lips, you are very young still, and it would be all wrong on my part to tie you down now. I said sharply that I was not so very young. Oh yes you are, Aggie, compared with me. Though Reggie had been urged not to call me Aggie, he frequently forgot, because it was so natural for the Lucis to call each other names like Margie, Noonie, Eddie, and Aggie. Well, you think about it, went on Reggie. Just bear me in mind, and if nobody else turns up, there I am, you know. I said immediately that I didn't need to think about it, I would like to marry him. I don't think you can have thought properly, Aggie. Of course I've thought properly. I can think in a moment about a thing like that. Yes, but it's no good rushing into it, is it? You see, a girl like you, well, she could marry anybody. I don't think I want to marry anybody. I think I'd rather marry you. Yes but you've got to be practical, you know. You've got to be practical in this world. You want to marry a man with a good lot of money, a nice chap, one you like, who can give you a good time and look after you properly, give you all the things you ought to have. I only want to marry the person I want to marry, I don't mind about a lot of things. Yes, but they are important, old girl. They are important in this world. It is no good being young and romantic. He went on my leaves up in another 10 days. I thought I'd better speak before I went. Before that I thought I wouldn't. I thought that I'd wait. But I think you, well, I think I'd like you just to know that I'm here. When I come back in two years time, if there isn't anybody. There won't be anyone, I said. I was quite positive. And so Reggie and I became engaged. It was not called an engagement, it was on the understanding system. Our families knew we were engaged, but it would not be announced or put in the paper, and we would not tell our friends about it, though I think most of them knew. I can't think, I said to Reggie, why we can't be married. Why didn't you tell me sooner, then we would have had time to make preparations. Yes, of course, you've got to have bridesmaids and a slap-up wedding and all the rest of it. But anyway, I shouldn't dream of letting you get married to me now. You must have your chance. I used to get angry over this, and we would almost quarrel. I said I didn't think it was flattering for him to be so ready to turn down my offer to marry him at once. But Reggie had fixed ideas as to what was due to the person he loved, and he had got it into his long, narrow head that the right thing for me to do was to marry a man with a place, money, and all the rest of it. In spite of our disputes, though, we were very happy. The Lucis all seemed pleased, saying, we've thought Reggie had his eye on you, Aggie, for some time. He doesn't usually look at any of our girlfriends. Still, there's no hurry. Better give yourself plenty of time. There were one or two moments when what I had enjoyed so much with the Lucis, their insistence on there being plenty of time for anything, roused a certain antagonism in me. Romantically, I would have liked Reggie to say that he couldn't possibly wait two years, that we must get married now. Unfortunately, it was the last thing Reggie would have dreamed of saying. He was a very unselfish man, and diffident about himself and his prospects. My mother was, I think, happy about our engagement. She said, I have always been fond of him. I think he is one of the nicest people I have ever met. He will make you happy. He is gentle and kind, and he will never hurry you, or bother you. You won't be very well off, but you will have enough now that he has reached the rank of major, you'll manage all right. You're not the sort of person who cares very much about money, 
and who wants parties and a gay life. No, I think this will be a happy marriage. Then she said, after a slight pause, I wish he'd told you a little earlier, so that you could have married straight away. So she, too, felt as I did. Ten days later, Reggie left to go back to his regiment and I settled down to wait for him. Let me add here a kind of postscript to my account of my courtship days. I have described my suitors, but, rather unfairly, have not commented on the fact that I, too, lost my heart. First to a very tall young soldier, whom I met when staying in Yorkshire. If he had asked me to marry him, I should probably have said yes before the words were out of his mouth. Very wisely from his point of view, he didn't. He was a penniless subaltern, and about to go to India with his regiment. I think he was more or less in love with me, though. He had that sheep-like look. I had to make do with that. He went off to India, and I yearned after him for at least six months. Then, a year or so later, I lost my heart again, when acting in a musical play got up by friends in Torquay, a version of Bluebeard, with topical words, written by themselves. I was Sister Anne, and the object of my affections later became an air vice marshal. He was young then, at the beginning of his career. I had the revolting habit of singing to a teddy bear in a coy fashion the song of the moment. I wish I had a teddy bear to sit upon my knee. I'd take it with me everywhere to cuddle up to me. All I can offer in excuse is that all the girls did that sort of thing, and it went down very well. Several times in later life I came near meeting him again, since he was a cousin of friends, but I always managed to avoid it. I have my vanity. I have always believed that he has a memory of me as a lovely girl at a moonlight picnic on Anstey's Cove on the last day of his leave. We sat apart from the rest on a rock sticking out to sea. We didn't speak, just sat there holding hands. After he left he sent me a little gold teddy bear brooch. I cared enough to want him still to remember me like that, and not to sustain the shock of meeting thirteen stone of solid flesh and what could only be described as a kind face. Amias always asks after you, my friends would say. He would so like to meet you again. Meet me at a ripe sixty? No fear. I would like to be an illusion still to somebody. Seventh. Happy people have no history, isn't that the saying? Well, I was a happy person during this period. I did mostly the same things as usual, met my friends, went to stay away occasionally, but there was anxiety about my mother's eyesight. Which was getting progressively worse. She had great difficulty in reading now and trouble seeing things in a bright light. Spectacles did not help. My grandmother at Ealing was also rather blind, and had to peer about for things. She was also getting, as elderly people do, progressively more suspicious of everybody, of her servants, of men who came to mend the pipes, of the piano tuner, and so on. I always remember Granny leaning across the dining table and saying, either to me or to my sister, SSH. A deep hissing sound, speak low, where is your bag? In my room, Granny. You've left it there? You mustn't leave it there. I heard her, upstairs, just now. Well, but that's all right, isn't it? You never know, dear, you never know. Go up and fetch it. It must have been about this time that my mother's mother, Granny B, fell off a bus. She was addicted to riding on the top of buses, and I suppose by now must have been 80. Anyway, the bus went on suddenly as she was coming downstairs, and she fell off broke, I think, a rib, and possibly an arm as well. She sued the bus company with vigor, was awarded handsome compensation and sternly forbidden by her doctor ever to ride on the top of a bus again. Naturally, being Granny B, she disobeyed him constantly. Up to the last Granny. B was always the old soldier. She had an operation, too, somewhere about this time. I imagine it was cancer of the uterus, but the operation was entirely successful and she never had any recurrence. The only deep disappointment was her own. She had looked forward to having this tumor, or whatever it was, removed from her inside, because, she thought, she would be quite nice and slim after it. She was by this time an immense size, bigger than my other grandmother. The joke of the fat woman who was stuck in the bus door, with the bus conductor crying to her, try sideways, ma'am, try sideways, lor, young man, I ain't got no sideways, could have applied perfectly to her. Though strictly forbidden to get out of bed by the nurses after she had come out of the anesthetic, and they had left her to sleep, she rose from her bed and tiptoed to the pier glass. What a disillusion. She appeared to be as stout as ever. I shall never get over the disappointment, Clara, she said to my mother. 
Never. I counted on it. It carried me through that anesthetic and everything. And look at me, just the same. It must have been about then that my sister Madge and I had a discussion which was to bear fruit later. We had been reading some detective story or other, I think. I can only say I think because one's remembrances are not always accurate, one is apt to rearrange them in one's mind and get things in the wrong date and sometimes in the wrong place, I think it was the mystery of the yellow room, which had just come out, by a new author, Gaston L. E. Rue, with an attractive young reporter as detective, his name was Relatable. It was a particularly baffling mystery, well worked out and planned, of the type some call unfair and others have to admit is almost unfair, but not quite. One could just have seen a neat little clue cleverly slipped in. We talked about it a lot, told each other our views, and agreed it was one of the best. We were connoisseurs of the detective story, Madge had initiated me young to Sherlock Holmes, and I had followed Hotfoot on her trail, starting with the Lavenworth case, which had fascinated me when recounted to me by Madge at the age of eight. Then there was Arsene Lupin, but I never quite considered that a proper detective story, though the stories were exciting and great fun. There were also the Paul Beck stories, highly approved, the Chronicles of Mark Hewitt, and now the Mystery of the Yellow Room. Fired with all this, I said I should like to try my hand at a detective story. I don't think you could do it, said Madge. They are very difficult to do. I've thought about it. I should like to try. Well, I bet you couldn't, said Madge. There the matter rested. It was never a definite bet, we never set out the terms, but the words had been said. From that moment I was fired by the determination that I would write a detective story. It didn't go further than that. I didn't start to write it then, or plan it out, the seed had been sown. At the back of my mind, where the stories of the books I am going to write take their place long before the germination of the seed occurs, the idea had been planted, someday I would write a detective story. Eighth. Reggie and I wrote to each other regularly. I gave him the local news, and tried to write him the best letter I could, Letter writing has never been one of my strong points. My sister Madge, now, was what I can only describe as a model of the art. She could make the most splendid stories out of nothing at all. I do envy that gift. My dear Reggie's letters were exactly like Reggie talking, which was nice and reassuring. He urged me at great length, always, to go about a lot. Now don't stay at home moping, Aggie. Don't think that is what I want, because it isn't. You must go out and see people. You must go to dances and things and parties. I do want you to have every chance, before we get settled down. Looking back now, I wonder whether at the back of my mind I may not have slightly resented this point of view. I don't think I recognized it at the time, but does one really like to be urged to go about, to see other people, to do better for yourself, that extraordinary phrase? Is it not nearer to the truth that every female would prefer her love letters to exhibit a show of jealousy? Who is that fellow so and so you write about? You're not getting too fond of him, are you? Isn't that what we really want as a sex? Can we take too much unselfishness? Or does one read back into one's mind things that perhaps weren't there? The usual dances were given in the neighborhood. I didn't go to them because, as we had no car, it would not have been practicable to accept any invitations of more than a mile or two away. Hiring a cab or car would have been too expensive except for a very special occasion. But there were times when a hunt for girls was on, and then you would be asked to stay, or fetched, and returned. The Cliffords at Chudley were giving a dance to which they were asking members of the garrison from Exeter, and they asked some of their friends if they could bring a likely girl or two along. My old enemy commander Traverse, who was now retired and living with his wife in Chudley, suggested that they should bring me. Having been my pet abomination as a small child, he had graduated from that into old family friend. His wife rang up and asked if I would come and stay with them and go to the Clifford's dance. I was delighted to do so, of course. I also got a letter from a friend called Arthur Griffiths, whom I had met when staying with the Matthews at Thorpe Arch Hall in Yorkshire. He was the local vicar's son, and a soldier, a gunner. He and I had become great friends. Arthur wrote to say that he was now stationed at Exeter, but that unfortunately he was not one of the officers going to the dance, and that he was very sad about it because he would have liked to dance with me again. However, he said, there's a fellow from our mess going, Christy by name, so look out for him, won't you? He's a good dancer. Christy came my way quite soon in the dance. He was a tall, fair young man, with crisp curly hair, a rather interesting nose, turned up not down, 
and a great air of careless confidence about him. He was introduced to me, asked for a couple of dances, and said that his friend Griffiths had told him to look out for me. We got on together very well, he danced splendidly and I danced again several more times with him. I enjoyed the evening thoroughly. The next day, having thanked the Traverse, I was driven home by them as far as Newton Abbott, where I took the train back. It must have been, I suppose, a week or ten days later, I was having tea with the Mellers at their house opposite ours. Max Meller and I still practiced our ballroom dancing, though mercifully waltzing upstairs was out of fashion. We were, I think, tangoing, when I was summoned to the telephone. It was my mother. Come home at once, will you, Agatha, she said. There's one of your young men here, I don't know him, never seen him before. I've given him tea, but he seems to be staying on and on hoping to see you. My mother was always intensely irritated if she had to look after my young men unaided, she regarded such entertainment as strictly my business. I was cross at coming back, I was enjoying myself. Besides, I thought I knew who it was, a rather dreary young naval lieutenant, the one who used to ask me to read his poems. So I went unwillingly, with a sulky expression on my face. I came into the drawing room, and a young man stood up with a good deal of relief. He was rather pink in the face and clearly embarrassed, having had to explain himself. He was not even much cheered by seeing me, I think he was afraid I shouldn't remember him. But I did remember him, though I was intensely surprised. It had not occurred to me that I should ever see Griffith's friend, young Christy, again. He made some rather hesitating explanations, he had had to come over to Torquay on his motorbike, and thought he might as well look me up. He avoided mentioning the fact that he must have gone to a certain amount of trouble and embarrassment to find out my address from Arthur Griffiths. However, things went better after a minute or two. My mother was intensely relieved by my arrival. Archie Christie looked more cheerful, having got his explanations over, and I felt highly flattered. The evening wore on as we talked. In the sacred code sign, common between women, the question was raised between mother and me as to whether this unasked visitor was going to be invited to stay to supper, and if so what food there was likely to be in the house. It must have been soon after Christmas, because I know there was cold turkey in the larder. I signaled yes to mother, and she asked Archie if he would care to stay and have a scratch meal with us. He accepted promptly. So we had cold turkey and salad and something else, cheese I think, and spent a pleasant evening. Then Archie got on his motorbike and went off in a series of explosive bumps to Exeter. For the next ten days he made frequent and unexpected appearances. That first evening he had asked me if I would like to come to a concert at Exeter, I had mentioned at the dance that I was fond of music, and that he would take me to the Red Cliff Hotel to tea afterwards. I said I would like to come very much. Then there was a somewhat embarrassed moment when mother made it clear that her daughter did not accept invitations to come to Exeter for concerts by herself. That damped him a bit, but he hastily extended the invitation to her. Mother relented, decided she approved of him, and said that it would be quite all right for me to go to the concert, but that she was afraid that I could not go to tea with him at a hotel. I must say, looking at it nowadays, I think we had peculiar rules. One could go alone with a young man to play golf, to ride a horse, or to roller skate, but having tea with him in a hotel had a kind of risque appearance which good mothers did not fancy for their daughters. A compromise was made in the end, that he might give me tea in the refreshment room on Exeter Station. Not a very romantic spot. Later, I asked him if he would like to come to a Wagnerian concert that was to take place at Torquay in four or five days' time. He said he would like it very much. Archie told me all about himself, how he was waiting impatiently to get into the newly formed Royal Flying Corps. I was thrilled by this. Everyone was thrilled by flying. But Archie was entirely matter of fact. He said it was going to be the service of the future, if there was a war, planes would be the first thing needed. It wasn't that he was mad keen on flying, but it was a chance to get on in your career. There was no future in the army. As a gunner, promotion was too slow. He did his best to take the romance out of flying for me, but didn't quite succeed. All the same it was the first time that my romanticism came up against a practical, logical mind. In 1912 it was still a fairly sentimental world. People called themselves hard-boiled, but they had no real idea what the term meant. Girls had romantic ideas about young men, and young men had idealistic views about young girls. We had, however, come a long way since my grandmother's day. You know, I like Ambrose, she said, 
referring to one of my sister's suitors. The other day, after Madge had walked along the terrace, I saw Ambrose get up and follow her, and he bent down and picked up a handful of gravel, where her feet had trodden, and put it in his pocket. Very pretty I thought it was, very pretty. I could imagine that happening to me when I was young. Poor darling granny. We had to disillusion her. Ambrose, it turned out, was deeply interested in geology, and the gravel had been of a particular type which interested him. Archie and I were poles apart in our reactions to things. I think that from the start that fascinated us. It is the old excitement of the stranger. I asked him to the New Year ball. He was in a peculiar mood the night of the dance, he hardly spoke to me. We were a party of four or six, I think, and every time I danced with him and we sat out afterwards he was completely silent. When I spoke to him he answered almost at random, in a way that did not make sense. I was puzzled, looking at him once or twice, wondering what was the matter with him, what he was thinking of. He seemed no longer interested in me. I was rather stupid, really. I should have known by now that when a man looks like a sick sheep, completely bemused, stupid and unable to listen to what you say to him, he has, vulgarly, got it badly. What did I know? Did I know what was happening to me? I remember picking up one of Reggie's letters when it came, saying to myself, I'll read this later, and shoving it quickly into the hall drawer. I found it there some months afterwards. I suppose, deep down, I already knew. The Wagnerian concert was two days after the ball. We went to it, and came back to Ashfield afterwards. As we went up to the schoolroom to play the piano, as was our usual custom, Archie spoke to me almost desperately. He was leaving in two days' time, he said, he was going to Salisbury Plain, to start his flying corps training. Then he said fiercely, you've got to marry me, you've got to marry me. He said he had known it the first evening he danced with me. I had an awful time getting your address and finding you. Nothing could have been more difficult. There will never be anyone but you. You've got to marry me. I told him it was impossible, that I was already engaged to someone. He waved away engagements with a furious hand. What on earth does that matter, he said. You'll just have to break it off, that's all. But I can't. I couldn't possibly do that. Of course you could. I'm not engaged to anyone else, but if I was I'd break it off in a minute without even thinking about it. I couldn't do this to him. Nonsense. You have to do things to people. If you were so fond of each other, why didn't you get married before he went abroad? We thought, I hesitated, it better to wait. I wouldn't have waited. I'm not going to wait either. We couldn't be married for years, I said. You're only a subaltern. And it would be the same in the Flying Corps. I couldn't possibly wait years. I should like to be married next month or the month after. You're mad, I said. You don't know what you are talking about. I don't think he did. He had to come down to earth in the end. It was a terrible shock for my poor mother. I think she had been anxious, though no more than anxious, and she was deeply relieved to hear that Archie was going away to Salisbury Plain, but to be presented so suddenly with a fate accompli shook her. I had said to her, I'm sorry, mother. I've got to tell you. Archie Christie has asked me to marry him, and I want to, I want to dreadfully. But we had to face facts, Archie unwillingly, but mother was very firm with him. What do you have to get married on, she asked. Either of you. Our financial position could hardly have been worse. Archie was a young subaltern, only a year older than I was. He had no money, only his pay and a small allowance, which was all that his mother could afford. I had only the solitary hundred a year which I had inherited under my grandfather's will. It would be years at the best before Archie was in any position to marry. He said to me rather bitterly before he went, your mother's brought me down to earth. I thought nothing would matter. We would get married somehow or other, and things would be all right. She has made me see that we can't, not at present. We shall have to wait, but we won't wait a day longer than we can help. I shall do everything, everything I can think of. This flying business will help, only of course they don't like your being married either in the army or the flying corps while you are young. We looked at each other, we were young, desperate, and in love. We had an engagement that lasted a year and a half. It was a tempestuous time, full of ups and downs and deep unhappiness, because we had the feeling that we were reaching out for something we would never attain. I put off writing to Reggie for nearly a month, mainly, I suppose, out of guilt, 
and partly because I could not bring myself to believe that what had suddenly happened to me could possibly have been real, soon I would wake up from it and go back to where I was. But I had to write in the end, guilty, miserable, and without a single excuse. It made it worse, I think, the kindly and sympathetic way that Reggie took it. He told me not to distress myself, it wasn't my fault he was sure, I could not have helped it, these things happen. Of course, he said, it's been a bit of a blow for me, Agatha, that you are marrying a chap who is even less able to support you than I am. If you were marrying somebody well off, a good match and everything, I should have felt that it didn't matter so much, because it would be more what you ought to have, but now I can't help wishing that I'd taken you at your word and that we'd got married and that I'd brought you out here with me straight away. Did I wish also that he'd done that? I suppose not, not by that time, and yet perhaps there was always the feeling of wanting to go back, wanting to have once more a safe foot on shore. Not to swim out into deep water. I had been so happy, so peaceful with Reggie, we had understood each other so well, we'd enjoyed and wanted the same things. What had happened to me now was the opposite. I loved a stranger, mainly because he was a stranger, because I never knew how he would react to a word or a phrase and everything he said was fascinating and new. He felt the same. He said once to me, I feel I can't get at you. I don't know what you're like. Every now and then we were overwhelmed by waves of despair and one or other of us would write and break it off. We would both agree that it was the only thing to do. Then, about a week later, we would find ourselves unable to bear it, and we would be back on the old terms. Everything that could go wrong, did go wrong. We were badly enough off anyway, but now a fresh financial blow fell upon my family. The H.B. Shafflin Company in New York, the firm of which my grandfather had been a partner, went suddenly into liquidation. It was an unlimited company too and I gathered that the position was serious. In any case, it meant that the income which my mother had received from it, which was the only income she had, would now cease completely. My grandmother, by good fortune, was not quite in the same situation. Her money had also been left to her in H.B. Shafflin shares, but Mr. Bailey, who was the member of the firm who looked after her affairs, had been worried for some time. Charged with the care of Nathaniel Miller's widow, he felt responsible for her. When Granny wanted money she merely wrote to Mr. Bailey, and Mr. Bailey, I think, sent it her in cash, it was as old-fashioned as that. She was disturbed and upset when one day he suggested to her that she should allow him to reinvest her money for her. Do you mean take my money out of Shafflin's? He was evasive. He said that you had to watch investments, that it was awkward for her, being English by birth and living in England, as the widow of an American. He said several things which, of course, were not the real explanation at all, but Granny accepted them. Like all women of that time, you accepted completely any business advice that was given you by anyone you trusted. Mr. Bailey said leave it to him, he would reinvest her money in a way that would give her nearly as much income as she had now. Reluctantly Granny agreed, and therefore, when the crash came, her income was safe. Mr. Bailey was dead by that time, but he had done his duty for the partner's widow, without giving away his fears about the solvency of the company. Younger members of the firm had, I believe, launched out in a big way, and had seemed successful, but actually they had expanded too much, had opened too many branches all over the country, and spent too much money on salesmanship. Whatever its cause, the crash was a complete one. It was like a recurrence of my childhood's experience, when I had heard mother and father talking together about money difficulties, and had pranced down happily to announce to the household below stairs that we were ruined. Ruin had seemed to me then a fine and exciting thing. It did not seem nearly so exciting now, it spelled final disaster for Archie and myself. The 100 pounds a year I had belonging to me must of course go to support mother. No doubt Madge would help also. By selling Ashfield she might just be able to exist. Things turned out to be not quite so bad as we thought, because Mr. John Shafflin wrote from America to my mother and said how deeply grieved he was. She might count on an income of 300 pounds a year sent to her not from the firm, which was bankrupt, but from his own private fortune, and this would last until her death. That relieved us of the first anxiety. But when she died that money would cease. One hundred pounds a year in Ashfield was all I could count upon for the future. I wrote and told Archie that I could never marry him, that we should have to forget each other. Archie refused to listen to this. Somehow or other he was going to make money. We would get married, and he might even be able to help support my mother. He made me confident and hopeful. We got engaged again. 
My mother's eyesight became much worse, and she went to a specialist. He told her she had cataracts in both eyes, and that for various reasons it would be impossible to operate. They might not grow fast, but in time would certainly lead to blindness. Again I wrote to Archie, breaking off the engagement, saying that it was obviously not meant to be, and that I could never desert my mother if she were blind. Again he refused to concur. I was to wait and see how my mother's eyesight got on, there might be a cure for it, an operation might be possible, and anyway she wasn't blind now so we might as well remain engaged. We did remain engaged. Then I had a letter from Archie, saying, it's no good, I can never marry you. I am too poor. I have been trying one or two small investments with what I had, and it's no good whatsoever, I've lost it. You must give me up. I wrote and said I would never give him up. He wrote back and said I must. We then agreed we would give each other up. Four days later Archie managed to get leave and arrived suddenly on his motor bicycle from Salisbury Plain. It was no good, we had got to be engaged again, we had got to be hopeful and wait, something would happen, even if we had to wait four or five years. We went through emotional storms, and in the end, once more, our engagement was on, though every month the possibility of marriage receded further into the distance. It was hopeless, I felt in my heart, but I wouldn't recognize it. Archie thought it was hopeless too, but we still clung desperately to the belief that we could not live without each other, so we might as well remain engaged and pray for some sudden stroke of fortune. I had by now met Archie's family. His father had been a judge in the Indian civil service, and had had a severe fall from a horse. He became rapidly ill after that, the fall had affected his brain, and had finally died in hospital in England. After some years of widowhood, Archie's mother had remarried William Hemsley. No one could have been kinder to us or more fatherly than he always was. Archie's mother, Peg, came from southern Ireland, near Cork, and was one of twelve children. She had been staying with her eldest brother, who was in the Indian Medical, when she had met her first husband. She had two boys, Archie and Campbell. Archie had been head of the school at Clifton, and had passed forth into Woolwich, he had brains, resource, audacity. Both boys were in the army. Archie broke the news of his engagement to her, and sang my praises in the way that sons are apt to do in describing the girl of their choice. Peg looked at him with a doubtful eye, and said in a rich Irish voice, would she now be one of those girls that's wearing one of these newfangled Peter Pan collars? Rather uneasily Archie had to admit that I did wear Peter Pan collars. They were rather a feature of the moment. We girls had at last abandoned the high collars to our blouses, which were stiffened by little zigzag bones, one up each side and one at the back, so as to leave red, uncomfortable marks on the neck. A day came when people determined to be daring and achieve comfort. The Peter Pan collar was designed, presumably, from the turned-down collar worn by Peter Pan in Barry's play. It fitted round the bottom of the neck, was of soft material, had nothing like a bone about it, and was heaven to wear. It could hardly have been called daring. When I think of the reputation for possible fastness that we girls incurred, just by showing the four inches of neck from below the chin, it seems incredible. Looking round and seeing girls in bikinis on the beach now makes one realize how far one has gone in fifty years. Anyway, I was one of these go-ahead girls who, in 1912, wore a Peter Pan collar. And she looks lovely in it, said the loyal Archie. Ah, she would, no doubt, said Peg. Whatever doubts she may have had about me on account of this, however, she greeted me with extreme kindness, and indeed what I almost thought of as gush. She professed to be so fond of me, so delighted, I was just the girl she had wanted for her boy, and so on and so on that I didn't believe a word of it. The real truth was that she thought her son much too young to marry. She had no particular fault to find with me, I could no doubt have been much worse. I might have been a tobacconist's daughter, always accounted a symbol of disaster, or a young divorcee, there were some. About by then, or even a chorus girl. Anyway, she doubtless decided that with our prospects the engagement would come to nothing. So she was very sweet to me, and I was slightly embarrassed by her. Archie, true to temperament, was not particularly interested in what she thought of me or I of her. He had the happy attribute of going through life without the least interest in what anyone thought of him or his belongings, his mind was always entirely bent on what he wanted himself. So there we were, still engaged, but no nearer getting married, in fact, rather further off. Promotion did not seem likely to come more quickly in the flying corps than anywhere else. 
Archie had been dismayed to find that he suffered a good deal from sinus trouble when flying a plane. He had a good deal of pain, but carried on. His letters were full of technical accounts of Farman biplanes and Avros, his opinions on the planes that meant more or less certain death for the pilot, and the ones that were pretty steady and ought to develop well. The names of his squadron became familiar to me, Joubert de la Ferde, Brooke Popham, John Salmon. There was also a wild Irish cousin of Archie's who had by now crashed so many machines that he was more or less permanently grounded. It seems odd that I don't remember being at all worried about Archie's safety. Flying was dangerous, but then so was hunting, and I was used to people breaking their necks in the hunting field. It was just one of the hazards of life. There was no great insistence on safety then, the slogan safety first would have been considered rather ridiculous. To be concerned with this new form of locomotion, flying, was glamorous. Archie was one of the first pilots to fly, his pilot's number was, I think, just over the hundred, one hundred and five or one hundred and six. I was enormously proud of him. I think nothing has disappointed me more in my life than the establishment of the aeroplane as a regular method of travel. One had dreamed about it as resembling the flying of a bird, the exhilaration of swooping through the air. But now, when I think of the boredom of getting in an aeroplane and flying from London to Persia, from London to Bermuda, from London to Japan, could anything be more prosaic? A cramped box with its narrow seats, the view from the window mostly wings and fuselage, and below you cotton wool clouds. When you see the earth, it has the flatness of a map. Oh yes, a great disillusionment. Ships can still be romantic. As for trains, what can beat a train? Especially before the diesels and their smell arrived. A great puffing monster carrying you through gorges and valleys, by waterfalls, past snow mountains, alongside country roads with strange peasants in carts. Trains are wonderful, I still adore them. To travel by train is to see nature and human beings, towns and churches and rivers, in fact, to see life. I don't mean that I am not fascinated by the conquering of air by man, by his adventures into space, possessed of that one gift that other forms of life do not have, the sense of adventure, the unconquerable spirit, and with it courage, not merely the courage of self-defense, which all animals have, but the courage to take your life into your hands and go out into the unknown. I am proud and excited to feel that all this has happened in my lifetime, and I would like to be able to look into the future to see the next steps, one feels they will follow quickly on one another now, with a snowballing effect. What will it all end in? Further triumphs? Or possibly the destruction of man by his own ambition? I think not. Man will survive, though possibly only in pockets here and there. There may be some great catastrophe, but not all mankind will perish. Some primitive community, rooted in simplicity, knowing of past doings only by hearsay, will slowly build up a civilization once more. Ninth. I don't remember in 1913 having any anticipation of war. Naval officers occasionally shook their heads and murmured der Tag, but we had been hearing that for years, and paid no attention. It served as a suitable basis for spy stories, it wasn't real. No nation could be so crazy as to fight another except on the NW frontier or some faraway spot. All the same, First aid and home nursing classes were popular during 1913, and at the beginning of 1914. We all went to these, bandaged each other's legs and arms, and even attempted to do neat head bandaging, much more difficult. We passed our exams, and got a small printed card to prove our success. So great was female enthusiasm at this time that if any man had an accident he was in mortal terror of ministering women closing in on him. Don't let those first aiders come near me, the cry would rise. Don't touch me, girls. Don't touch me. There was one extremely snuffy old man amongst the examiners. With a diabolical smile he laid traps for us. Here is your patient, he would say, pointing to a boy scout prostrate on the ground. Broken arm, fractured ankle, get busy on him. An eager pair, I and another, swooped upon him and trotted out our bandages. We were good at bandaging, beautiful, neat bandages we had practiced carefully reversing as we went up a leg, so that the whole thing looked deliciously taut and tidy, with a few figure of eights thrown in for good measure. In this case, however, we were taken aback, there was to be no neatness or beauty here, stuff was already bulkily wound round the limb. Field dressings, said the old man. Put your bandages on top of them, you've nothing else to replace them by, remember. We bandaged. It was much more difficult to bandage this way, making neat turns and twists. Get on with it, 
said the old man. Use the figure of eight, you'll have to come to it in the end. No good trying to go by the textbooks and reverse from top to bottom. You've got to keep the dressing on, girl, that's the point of it. Now then, the bed is through the hospital doors there. We picked up our patient, having duly fixed, we hoped, the splints where splints should be fixed, and carried him to the bed. Then we paused, slightly taken aback, neither of us had thought of opening up the bedclothes before arriving with the patient. The old man cackled with glee. Ha ha. Haven't thought of everything, have you, young ladies? Ha ha, always see your bed is ready for your patient before you start carrying him there. I must say that, humiliated as he made us feel, that old man taught us a great deal more than we had learned in six lectures. Besides our textbooks, there was some practical work arranged for us. Two mornings a week we were allowed to attend the local hospital in the outpatient's ward. That was intimidating, because the regular nurses, who were in a hurry and had a lot to do, despised us thoroughly. My first job was to remove the dressing from a finger, prepare warm boracic and water for it, and soak the finger for the requisite time. That was easy. The next job was an ear that needed siringing, and that I was quickly forbidden to touch. Siringing an ear was a highly technical thing, said the sister. Nobody unskilled should attempt it. Remember that. Don't think you're being useful by doing what you haven't learned to do. You might do a lot of harm. The next thing I had to do was to remove the dressings from the leg of a small child who had pulled over a boiling kettle on itself. That was the moment when I nearly gave up nursing for good. The bandages had, as I knew, to be soaked off gently in lukewarm water, and whatever way you did this, or touched them, the pain was agonizing to the child. Poor little thing. She was only about three years old. She screamed and screamed, it was horrible. I felt so upset that I thought I was going to be sick then and there. The only thing that saved me was the sardonic gleam in the eye of a staff nurse nearby. These stuck-up young fools, the eyes said, think they can come in here and know all about everything, and they can't manage the first thing they are asked to do. Immediately I determined that I would stick it. After all, it had got to be soaked off, not only the child had to bear her pain, but I had to bear her pain also. I went on with it, still feeling sick, setting my teeth, but managing it, and being as gentle as I could. I was quite taken aback when the staff nurse said suddenly to me, not a bad job you've done there. Turned you up a bit at first, didn't it? It did me once. Another part of our education was a day with the district nurse. Here again, two of us were taken on one day of the week. We went round a number of small cottages, all of them with windows tightly closed, some of them smelling of soap, others of something quite different, the yearning to throw open a window was sometimes almost irresistible. The ailments seemed rather monotonous. Practically everyone had what was tersely referred to as bad legs. I was slightly hazy as to what bad legs were. The district nurse said, blood poisoning is very common, some the result of venereal disease, of course, some ulcers, bad blood all of it. Anyway that was the generic name for it among the people themselves, and I understood much better in years to come when my daily help would always say, my mother's ill again. Oh, what's the matter with her? Oh, bad legs, she's always had bad legs. One day on our rounds we found one of the patients had died. The district nurse and I laid out the body. Another experience. Not so heart-rending as scalded children, but unexpected if you had never done it before. When, in far-off Serbia, an archduke was assassinated, it seemed such a faraway incident, nothing that concerned us. After all, in the Balkans people were always being assassinated. That it should touch us here in England seemed quite incredible, and I speak here not only for myself but for almost everybody else. Swiftly, after that assassination, what seemed like incredible storm clouds appeared on the horizon. Extraordinary rumors got about, rumors of that fantastic thing, war. But of course that was only the newspapers, no civilized nations went to war. There hadn't been any wars for years, there probably never would be again. No, the ordinary people, everyone in fact, apart from, I suppose, a few senior ministers and inner circles of the foreign office, had no conception that anything like war might happen. It was all rumors, people working themselves up and saying it really looked quite serious, speeches by politicians. And then suddenly one morning it had happened. England was at war. Part 5. War. First. England was at war. It had come. I can hardly express the difference between our feelings then and now. 
Now we might be horrified, perhaps surprised, but not really astonished that war should come, because we are all conscious that war does come, that it has come in the past and that, at any moment, it might come again. But in 1914 there had been no war for, how long? 50 years, more? True, there had been the Great Boer War, and skirmishes on the northwest frontier, but those had not been wars involving one's own country, they had been large army exercises, as it were, the maintenance of power in far places. This was different, we were at war with Germany. I received a wire from Archie, come Salisbury if you can hope to see you. The Flying Corps would be among the first to be mobilized. We must go, I said to mother. We must. Without more ado we set off to the railway station. We had little money in hand, the banks were shut, there was a moratorium, and no means of getting money in the town. We got into the train, I remember, but whenever ticket collectors came, though we had three or four five pounds notes that mother always kept by her, they refused them, nobody would take five pounds notes. All over southern England, our names and addresses were taken by infinite numbers of ticket collectors. The trains were delayed and we had to change at various stations, but in the end we reached Salisbury that evening. We went to the county hotel there. Half an hour after our arrival Archie came. We had little time together, he could not even stay and dine. We had half an hour, no more. Then he said goodbye and left. He was sure, as indeed all the flying corps was, that he would be killed, and that he would never see me again. He was calm and cheerful, as always, but all those early flying corps boys were of the opinion that a war would be the end, and quickly, of at least the first wave of them. The German air force was known to be powerful. I knew less, but to me also it came with the same certainty that I was saying goodbye to him, I should never see him again, though I, too, tried to match his cheerfulness and apparent confidence. I remember going to bed that night and crying and crying until I thought I would never stop, and then, quite suddenly, without warning, falling exhausted into such a deep sleep that I did not wake till late the following morning. We traveled back home, giving more names and addresses to ticket collectors. Three days later, the first war postcard arrived from France. It had printed sentences on it which anyone sending a card was only allowed to cross off or leave in, such things as am well, am in hospital, and so on. I felt, when I got it, for all its meager information, that it was a good omen. I hurried to my detachment in the VAD.S to see that was going on. We made a lot of bandages and rolled them, prepared baskets full of swabs for hospitals. Some of the things we did were useful, far more of them were no use at all, but they passed the time, and soon, grimly soon, the first casualties began to arrive. A move was made to serve refreshments to the men as they arrived at the station. This, I must say, was one of the silliest ideas that any commandant could possibly have had. The men had been heavily fed all the way along the line from Southampton, and when they finally arrived at Torquay Station the main thing was to get them out of the train onto the stretchers and ambulances, and then to the hospital. The competition to get into the hospital, converted from the town hall, and do some nursing had been great. For strictly nursing duties those chosen first had been mostly the middle-aged, and those considered to have had some experience of looking after men in illness. Young girls had not been felt suitable. Then there was a further consignment known as ward maids, who did the housework and cleaning of the town hall, brasses, floors, and such things, and finally there was the kitchen staff. Several people who did not want to nurse had applied for kitchen work, the ward maids, on the other hand, were really a reserve force, waiting eagerly to step up into nursing as soon as a vacancy should occur. There was a staff of about eight trained hospital nurses, all the rest were VADS. Mrs. Acton, a forceful lady, acted as matron, since she was senior officer of the VADS. She was a good disciplinarian, she organized the whole thing remarkably well. The hospital was capable of taking over 200 patients, and everyone was lined up to receive the first contingent of wounded men. The moment was not without its humor. Mrs. Spraggy, General Spraggy's wife, the mayoress, who had a fine presence, stepped forward to receive them, fell symbolically on her knees before the first entrant, a walking case, motioned him to sit down on his bed, and ceremonially removed his boots for him. The man, I must say, looked extremely surprised, especially as we soon found out that he was an epileptic, and not suffering from war wounds of any kind. Why the haughty lady should suddenly remove his boots in the middle of the afternoon was more than he could understand. I got into the hospital, but only as a ward maid, and set to zealously on the brass. However, 
After five days I was moved up to the ward. Many of the middle-aged ladies had done little real nursing at all, and though full of compassion and good works, had not appreciated the fact that nursing consists largely of things like bedpans, urinals, scrubbing of macintoshes, the clearing up of vomit, and the odor of suppurating wounds. Their idea of nursing had, I think, been a good deal of pillow smoothing, and gently murmuring soothing words over our brave men. So the idealists gave up their tasks with alacrity, they had never thought they would have to do anything like this, they said. And hardy young girls were brought to the bedside in their places. It was bewildering at first. The poor hospital nurses were driven nearly frantic by the number of willing but completely untrained volunteers under their orders. They had not got even a few fairly well-trained probationer nurses to help them. With another girl, I had two rows of twelve beds, we had an energetic sister-sister bond, who, although a first-class nurse, was far from having patience with her unfortunate staff. We were not really unintelligent, but we were ignorant. We had been taught hardly anything of what was necessary for hospital service, in fact all we knew was how to bandage, and the general theories of nursing. The only things that did help us were the few instructions we had picked up from the district nurse. It was the mysteries of sterilization that foxed us most, especially as Sister Bond was too harassed even to explain. Drums of dressings came up, ready to be used in treatment on the wounds, and were given into our charge. We did not even know at this stage that kidney dishes were supposed to receive dirty dressings, and the round bowls pure articles. Also, as all the dressings looked extremely dirty, although actually surgically clean, they had been baked in the sterile sir downstairs, it made it very puzzling. Things sorted themselves out, more or less, after a week. We discovered what was wanted of us, and were able to produce it. But Sister Bond by then had given up and left. She said her nerves wouldn't stand it. A new sister, Sister Anderson, came to replace her. Sister Bond had been a good nurse, quite first class, I believe, as a surgical nurse. Sister Anderson was a first class surgical nurse too, but she was also a woman of common sense and with a reasonable amount of patience. In her eyes we were not so much unintelligent as badly trained. She had four nurses under her on the two surgical rows, and she proceeded to get them into shape. It was Sister Anderson's habit to size up her nurses after a day or two, and to divide those whom she would take trouble to train and those who were, as she put, only fit to go and see if the crock is boiling. The point of this latter remark was that at the end of the ward were about four enormous boiling urns. From these was taken boiling water for making fomentations. Practically all wounds were treated at that time with wrung out fomentations, so seeing whether the crock was boiling was the first essential in the test. If the wretched girl who had been sent to see if the crock was boiling reported that it was, and it was not, with enormous scorn Sister Anderson would demand, don't you even know when water is boiling, nurse? It's got some steam puffing out of it, said the nurse. That's not steam, said Sister Anderson. Can't you hear the sound of it? The singing sound comes first, then it quietens down and doesn't puff, and then the real steam comes out. She demonstrated, murmuring to herself as she moved away, if they send me any more fools like that I don't know what I shall do. I was lucky to be under Sister Anderson. She was severe but just. On the next two rows there was Sister Stubbs, a small sister, gay and pleasant to the girls, who often called them dear and, having lured them into false security, lost her temper with them vehemently if anything went wrong. It was like having a bad-tempered kitten in charge of you, it may play with you, or it may scratch you. From the beginning I enjoyed nursing. I took to it easily, and found it, and have always found it, one of the most rewarding professions that anyone can follow. I think, if I had not married, that after the war I should have trained as a real hospital nurse. Maybe there is something in heredity. My grandfather's first wife, my American grandmother, was a hospital nurse. On entering the nursing world we had to revise our opinions of our status in life, and our present position in the hierarchy of the hospital world. Doctors had always been taken for granted. You sent for them when you were ill, and more, or less did what they told you, except my mother, she always knew a great deal more than the doctor did, or so we used to tell her. The doctor was usually a friend of the family. Nothing had prepared me for the need to fall down and worship. Nurse, towels for the doctor's hands. I soon learned to spring to attention, to stand, a human towel rail, waiting meekly while the doctor bathed his hands, wiped them with the towel, and, not bothering to return it to me, flung it scornfully on the floor. Even those doctors who were, 
By secret nursing opinion, despised as below standard, in the ward now came into their own and were accorded a veneration more appropriate to higher beings. Actually to speak to a doctor, to show him that you recognized him in any way, was horribly presumptuous. Even though he might be a close friend of yours, you were not supposed to show it. This strict etiquette was mastered in due course, but once or twice I fell from grace, on one occasion a doctor, irritable as doctors always are in hospital life, not, I think because they feel irritable but because it is expected of them by the sisters, exclaimed impatiently, no, no, sister, I don't want that kind of forceps. Give me, I've forgotten the name of it now, but, as it happened, I had one in my tray and I proffered it. I did not hear the last of that for 24 hours. Really, nurse, pushing yourself forward in that way. Actually handing the forceps to doctor yourself. I'm so sorry, sister, I murmured submissively. What ought ITO have done? Really, nurse, I think you should know that by now. If doctor requires anything which you happen to be able to provide, you naturally hand it to me, and I hand it to doctor. I assured her that I would not transgress again. The flight of the more elderly would-be nurses was accelerated by the fact that our early cases came in straight from the trenches with field dressings on, and their heads full of lice. Most of the ladies of Torquay had never seen a louse, I had never seen one myself, and the shock of finding these dreadful vermin was far too much for the older dears. The young and tough, however, took it in their stride. It was usual for one of us to say to the other in a gleeful tone when the next one came on duty, I've done all my heads, waving one's little tooth comb triumphantly. We had a case of tetanus in our first batch of patients. That was our first death. It was a shock to us all. But in about three weeks time I felt as though I had been nursing soldiers all my life, and in a month or so I was quite adept at looking out for their various tricks. Johnson, what have you been writing on your board? Their boards, with the temperature charts pinned on them, hung on the bottom of the bed. Writing on my board, nurse, he said, with an air of injured innocence. Why nothing? What should I? Somebody seems to have written down a very peculiar diet. I don't think it was sister or doctor. Most unlikely they would order you port wine. Then I would find a groaning man saying, I think I'm very ill, nurse. I'm sure I am, I feel feverish. I looked at his healthy though rubicund face and then at his thermometer, which he held out to me, and which read between 104 and 105. Those radiators are very useful, aren't they? I said. But be careful, if you put it on too hot a radiator the mercury will go completely. Ah, nurse, he grinned, you don't fall for that, do you? You young ones are much more hard-hearted than the old ones were. They used to get in no end of a patty when we had temperatures of 104, they used to rush off to sister at once. You should be ashamed of yourself. Ah, nurse, it's all a bit of fun. Occasionally they had to go to the x-ray department, at the other end of the town, or for physiotherapy there. Then one used to have a convoy of six to look after, and one had to watch out for a sudden request to cross the road, because I've got to buy a pair of boot laces, nurse. You would look across the road and see that the boot shop was conveniently placed next to the Georgian dragon. However, I always managed to bring back my six, without one of them giving me the slip and turning up later in a state of exhilaration. They were terribly nice, all of them. There was one Scotsman whose letters I used to have to write. It seemed astonishing that he should not be able to read or write, since he was practically the most intelligent man in the ward. However, there it was, and I duly wrote letters to his father. To begin with, he sat back and waited for me to begin. We'll write to my father now, nurse, he commanded. Yes. Dear father, I began. What do I say next? Och, just say anything you think he'd like to hear. Well, I think you had better tell me exactly. I'm sure you know. But I insisted that some indication should be given me. Various facts were then revealed, about the hospital he was in, the food he had, and so on. He paused. I think that's all. With love from your affectionate son. I suggested. He looked deeply shocked. No, indeed, nurse. You know better than that, I hope. What have I done wrong? You should say from your respectful son. We won't mention love or affection or words like that, not to my father. I stood corrected. The first time I had to accompany an operation case into the theater I disgraced myself. Suddenly the theater walls reeled about me, and only another nurse's firm arm closing round my shoulders and ejecting me rapidly saved me from disaster. 
It had never occurred to me that the sight of blood or wounds would make me faint. I hardly dared face Sister Anderson when she came out later. She was, however, unexpectedly kind. You mustn't mind, nurse, she said. It happened to many of us the first time or so. For one thing you are not prepared for the heat and the ether together, it makes you feel a bit squeamish and that was a bad abdominal operation, and they are the most unpleasant to look at. Oh sister, do you think I shall be alright next time? You'll have to try and be alright next time. And if not you'll have to go on until you are. Is that right? Yes, I said, that's right. The next one she sent me into was quite a short one, and I survived. After that I never had any trouble, though I used sometimes to turn my eyes away from the original incision with the knife. That was the thing that upset me, once it was over I could look on quite calmly and be interested. The truth of it is one gets used to anything. Second. I think it's so wrong, dear Agatha, said one of my mother's elderly friends, that you should go and work in hospital on a Sunday. Sunday is the day of rest. You should have your Sundays off. How do you suppose the men would have their wounds dressed, get themselves washed, be given bed pans, have their beds made and get their teas if nobody worked on a Sunday? I asked. After all, they couldn't do without all those things for 24 hours, could they? Oh dear, I never thought of that. But there ought to be some arrangement. Three days before Christmas Archie suddenly got leave. I went up with my mother to London to meet him. It was in my mind, I think that we might get married. A good many people were doing so now. I don't see, I said, how we can go on being careful and thinking of the future with everyone getting killed like this. My mother agreed. No, she said. I should feel just as you do. One can't think of risks and things like that. We did not say so, but the probabilities of Archie's being killed were, airly high. Already the casualties had startled and surprised people. A lot of my own friends had been soldiers, and had been called up at once. Every day, it seemed, one read in the paper that somebody one knew had been killed. It was only three months since Archie and I had seen each other, yet those three months had been, I suppose, acted out in what might have been called a different dimension of time. In that short period I had lived through an entirely new kind of experience, the death of my friends, uncertainty, the background of life being altered. Archie had had an equal amount of new experience, though in a different field. He had been in the middle of death, defeat, retreat, fear. Both of us had lived a large tract on our own. The result of it was that we met almost as strangers. It was like learning to know each other all over again. The difference between us showed up at once. His own determined casualness and flippancy, almost gaiety, upset me. I was too young then to appreciate that that was for him the best way of facing his new life. I, on the other hand, had become far more earnest, emotional, and had put aside my own light flippancy of happy girlhood. It was as though we were trying to reach each other, and finding, almost with dismay, that we had forgotten how to do so. Archie was determined on one thing, he made that clear from the first, there was no question of marriage. Entirely the wrong thing to do, he said. All my friends think so. Just rushing into things, and then what happens? You stop one you've had it, and you've left behind a young widow, perhaps a child coming it's selfish and wrong. I didn't agree with him. I argued passionately on the other side. But one of Archie's characteristics was certainty. He was always sure of what he ought to do and what he was going to do. I don't mean that he never changed his mind, he could, and did, suddenly, and very quickly sometimes. In fact he could change right over, seeing black as white and white as black. But when he had done so he was just as sure about it. I accepted his decision and we set about enjoying those precious few days we would have together. The plan was that after a couple of days in London I should go down with him to Clifton, and spend the actual days of Christmas with him at his stepfather's and mother's house. That seemed a very right and proper arrangement. Before leaving for Clifton, however, we had what was to all intents and purposes a quarrel. A ridiculous quarrel, but quite a heated one. Archie arrived at the hotel on the morning of our departure for Clifton, with a present for me. It was a magnificent dressing case, completely fitted inside, and a thing that any millionaires might have confidently taken to the Ritz. If he had brought a ring, or a bracelet, however expensive, I should not have demurred, I should have accepted it with eager pride and pleasure, but for some reason I revolted violently against the dressing case. I felt it was an absurd extravagance, and not a thing I should ever use. 
What was the good of my going back home to continue nursing in a hospital with an exciting dressing case suitable for a holiday in peacetime abroad? I said I didn't want it, and he would have to take it. Back. He was angry, I was angry. I made him take it away. An hour later he returned and we made it up. We wondered what on earth had come over us. How could we be so foolish? He admitted that it was a silly kind of present. I admitted that I had been ungracious to say so. As a result of the quarrel and the subsequent reconciliation we somehow felt closer than before. My mother went back to Devon and Archie and I traveled to Clifton. My future mother-in-law continued to be charming in a rather excessive Irish style. Her other son, Campbell, said to me once, Mother is a very dangerous woman. I didn't understand at the time, but I think I know now what he meant. Hers was the kind of gushing affection which could change just as rapidly into its opposite. At one moment she wished to love her future daughter-in-law, and did so, at another moment nothing would be too bad for her. We had a tiring journey to Bristol, the trains were in a state of chaos still, and usually hours late. Eventually, though, we arrived, and had a most affectionate welcome. I went to bed, exhausted by the emotions of the day and traveling, and also by contending with my natural shyness, so that I could say and do the right thing with my future in-laws. It must have been half an hour later, perhaps an hour. I had gone to bed, but was not yet asleep, when there was a tap at the door. I went and opened it. It was Archie. He came inside, shut the door behind, and said abruptly, I've changed my mind. We've got to get married. At once. We will marry tomorrow. But you said. Oh, never mind what I said. You were right and I was wrong. Of course it is the only sensible thing to do. We'll have two days together before I go back. I sat down on the bed, my legs feeling rather weak. But, but you were so. Certain. What does that matter? I've changed my mind. Yes, but, there was so much that I could not bring out. I had always suffered from being tongue-tied when I most wanted to say things clearly. It's going to be all so difficult, I said weakly. I could always see what Archie could not, the hundred and one disadvantages in a prospective action. Archie only saw the essential itself. At first it had seemed to him absolute folly to get married in the middle of wartime, now, a day later, he was equally determined that it was the only right thing for us to do. Difficulties in the actual accomplishment, the upset feelings of all our nearest relations, made no impact on him at all. We argued. We argued much as we had done 24 hours before, this time the opposite way round. Needless to say, again he won. But I don't believe we can get married so suddenly, I said doubtfully. It's so difficult. Oh yes we can, said Archie cheerfully. We can get a special license or something, the Archbishop of Canterbury. Isn't that very expensive? Yes, I believe it is, rather. But I expect we'll manage. Anyway, we've got to. No time for anything else. Tomorrow is Christmas Eve. So that's all right. I said weakly that it was. He left me, and I stayed awake most of the night worrying. What would mother say? What would Madge say? What would Archie's mother say? Why couldn't Archie have agreed to our marriage in London, where everything would have been easy and simple? Oh well, there it was. I finally fell asleep exhausted. A great many of the things that I had foreseen came true the next morning. First of all our plans had to be broken to Peg. She immediately burst into hysterical tears, and retired to bed. That my own son should do this to me, she gasped, as she went up the stairs. Archie, I said, we'd better not. It's upset your mother terribly. What do I care if it's upset her or not, said Archie. We've been engaged for two years. She must be used to the idea. She seems to feel it terribly now. Rushing it on me in this way, Peg sobbed, as she lay in a darkened room with a handkerchief soaked in eau de cologne on her forehead. Archie and I looked at each other, rather like two guilty dogs. Archie's stepfather came to the rescue. He brought us down from Peg's room and said to us, I think you two are doing quite the right thing. Now don't worry about Peg. She always gets upset if she's startled. She is very fond of you, Agatha, and she will be pleased as anything about this afterwards. But don't expect her to be pleased today. Now you two go out and get on with your plans. I dare say you haven't got too much time. Remember, I am sure, quite sure, that you are doing the right thing. Though I had started the day faintly tearful and apprehensive myself, within another two hours I was full of fighting spirit. 
The difficulties in the way of our marriage were intense, and the more it seemed impossible that we could be married that day the more I, as well as Archie, became determined that we would be. Archie first consulted a former ecclesiastical headmaster of his. A special license was said to be obtainable from Doctors' Commons and cost £25. Neither Archie nor I had pound 2,5, but that we brushed aside, as we could no doubt borrow it. What was more difficult was that it had to be obtained personally. One could not get such a thing on Christmas Day, so in the end a marriage that day appeared quite impossible. Special license was out. We next went to a registry office. There again we were rebuffed. Notice had to be given for a period of 14 days before the ceremony could be performed. Time slipped away. Finally a kindly registrar, whom we had not seen before, back from his elevenses, came up with the answer. My dear chap, he said to Archie, you live here, don't you? I mean, your mother and stepfather reside here. Yes, said Archie. Well then, you keep a bag here, you keep clothes here, you keep some of your effects here, don't you? Yes. Then you don't need a fortnight's notice. You can buy an ordinary license and get married at your parish church this afternoon. The license cost eight pounds. We could manage eight pounds. After that it was a wild rush. We hunted down the vicar at the church at the end of the road. He was not in. We found him in a friend's house. Startled, he agreed to perform the ceremony. We rushed home to Peg, and to snatch a little sustenance. Don't speak to me, she cried. Don't speak to me, and locked her door. There was no time to be lost. We hurried along to the church, Emmanuel, I think it was called. Then we found we had to have a second witness. Just about to rush out and catch a complete stranger, by utter chance I came across a girl whom I knew. I had stayed with her in Clifton a couple of years before. Yvonne Bush, though startled, was ready enough to be an impromptu bridesmaid and our witness. We rushed back. The organist was doing some practicing, and offered to play the wedding march. Just as the ceremony was about to start, I thought for one said moment that no bride could have taken less trouble about her appearance. No white dress, no veil, not even a smart frock. I was wearing an ordinary coat and skirt with a small purple velvet hat, and I had not even had time to wash my hands or face. It made us both laugh. The ceremony was duly performed, and we tackled the next hurdle. Since Peg was still prostrate we decided we would go down to Torquay, stay at the Grand Hotel there, and spend Christmas Day with my mother. But I had first, of course, to ring her up and announce what had happened. It was extremely difficult to get through on the telephone, and the result was not particularly happy. My sister was staying there and greeted my announcement with a great deal of annoyance. Springing it like this on mother. You know how weak her heart is. You are absolutely unfeeling. We caught the train, it was very crowded, and we arrived at last at Torquay at midnight, having managed to book ourselves a room by telephone. I still had a slightly guilty feeling, we had caused such a lot of trouble and inconvenience. Everybody we were most fond of was annoyed with us. I felt this but I don't think Archie did. I don't think it occurred to him for one moment, and if it did, I don't think he minded. A pity that everyone got upset in all that, he would have said, but why should they? Anyway, we had done the right thing, he was sure of that. But there was one thing that made him nervous. The moment had come. We climbed on the train, and he suddenly produced, rather like a conjurer, an extra suitcase. I hope, he said nervously to his new young bride, I hope that you are not going to be cross about this. Archie. It's the dressing case. Yes. I didn't take it back. You don't mind, do you? Of course I don't mind. It's lovely to have it. There we were, going on a journey with it, and our wedding journey too. So that was got over safely, and Archie was enormously relieved, I think he thought that I was going to be angry about it. If our wedding day had been one long struggle against odds, and a series of crises, Christmas Day was benign and peaceful. Everyone had had time to get over their shock. Madge was affectionate, had forgotten all censure, my mother had recovered from her heart condition and was thoroughly happy in our happiness. Peg, I hoped, had recovered. Archie assured me that she would have. And so we enjoyed Christmas Day very much. The next day I traveled with Archie to London, and said goodbye to him as he went off to France again. I was not to see him for another six months of war. I resumed work at the hospital, where news of my present status had preceded me. Nurse. This was Scotty, 
rolling his Azars a great deal and tapping on the foot of his bed with his little cane. Nurse, come here at once. I came. What's this I hear? You've been getting yourself married. Yes, I said, I have. Do you hear that? Scotty appealed to the whole row of beds. Nurse Miller's got married. What's your name now, nurse? Christy. Ah, a good Scottish name, Christy. Nurse Christy, do you hear that, sister? This is Nurse Christie now. I heard, said Sister Anderson. And I wish you every happiness, she added formally. It's made plenty of talk in the ward. You've done well for yourself, nurse, said another patient. You've married an officer, I hear. I admitted that I had risen to that giddy height. Aye, you've done very well for yourself. Not that I'm surprised, you're a nice looking girl. The months went on. The war settled down to a grisly stalemate. Half our patients seemed to be trench feet cases. It was intensely cold that winter, and I had terrible chilblains on both hands and feet. The eternal scrubbing of Macintoshes is not helpful to chilblains on the hands. I was given more responsibility as time went on, and I liked my work. One settled into a routine of doctors and nurses. One knew the surgeons one respected, one knew the doctors who were secretly despised by the sisters. There were no more heads to delouse and no more field dressings, base hospitals were now established in France. But still we were nearly always crowded. Our little Scotsman who had been there with a fractured leg left at last, convalescent. Actually he had a fall on the station platform during the journey, but so anxious was he to get to his native town in Scotland that he never mentioned it and concealed the fact that his leg had been refractured. He suffered agonies of pain, but finally managed to arrive at his destination, and his leg had to be reset all over again. It is all somewhat of a haze now yet one recalls odd instances standing out in one's memory. I remember a young probationer who had been assisting in the theater and had been left behind to clear up, and I had helped her take an amputated leg down to throw into the furnace. It was almost too much for the child. Then we cleared up all the mess and the blood together. She was, I think, too young and too new to it to have been given that task to do alone so soon. I remember a serious-faced sergeant whose love letters I had to write for him. He could not read or write. He told me roughly what he wanted me to say. That will do very nicely, nurse, he would nod, when I read it over to him. Write it in triplicate, will you? In triplicate? I said. I, he said. One for Nelly, and one for Jesse and one for Margaret. Wouldn't it be better to vary them a little? I asked. He considered. I don't. Think so, he said. I've told them all the essentials. So each letter began the same. Hope this finds you as it leaves me, but more in the pink, and ended, yours till hell freezes. Won't they find out about each other? I asked with some curiosity. Och, I don't think so, he said. They're in different towns, you see, and they don't know each other. I asked if he was thinking of marrying any of them. I might, he said, and I might not. Nellie, she is a fine one to look at, a lovely girl. But Jessie, she's more serious, and she worships me. She thinks the world of me, Jessie does. And Margaret. Margaret? Well, Margaret, he said, she makes you laugh, Margaret does. She's a gay girl. However, we'll see. I have often wondered whether he did marry any of those three, or whether he found a fourth who combined good looks, being a good listener and being gay as well. At home things went on much the same. Lucy had come as a replacement to Jane, and always spoke of her in awe as Mrs. Rowe, I do hope I shall be able to fill Mrs. Rowe's place, it's such a big responsibility taking on after her. She was dedicated to the future of coming to be cooked to me and Archie after the war. One day she came to my mother, looking very nervous, and said, I hope you won't mind, ma'am, but I really feel I must go and join the WAFs. I hope you won't think it wrong of me. Well, Lucy, said my mother, I think you are quite right. You are a young, strong girl, just what they want. So Lucy departed, in tears at the last, hoping we would get on all right without her and saying she didn't know what Mrs. Rowe would think. With her, also, went the house bar lower maid, the beautiful Emma. She went to get married. They were replaced by two elderly maid servants to whom the hardships of wartime were unbelievable and deeply resented. I'm sorry, madam, said the elderly Mary, trembling with rage, after a couple of days, but it's not right, the food we're given. We've had fish two days this week, and we've had insides of animals. 
I've always had a good meat meal at least once a day. My mother tried to explain that food was now rationed and that one had to eat fish and what was prettily called, edible offal, on at least two or three days of the week. Mary merely shook her head, and said, it isn't right, it isn't treating one right. She also said that she had never been asked to eat margarine before. My mother then tried the trick which many people tried during the war, of wrapping the margarine in the butter paper and the butter in the margarine paper. Now if you taste these two, she said, I don't believe you'll be able to tell margarine from butter. The two old pussies looked scornful, then tried and tested. They had no doubts, it's absolutely plain which is which, ma'am, no doubt about it. You really think there is so much difference? Yes, I do. I can't bear the taste of margarine, neither of us can. It makes us feel quite sick. They handed it back to my mother with disgust. You do like the other? Yes, ma'am, very good butter. No fault to find with that. Well, I might as well tell you, said my mother, that that is the margarine, this is the butter. At first they wouldn't believe it. Then when they were convinced they were not pleased. My grandmother was now living with us. She used to fret a great deal at my returning alone to the hospital at night. So dangerous, dear, walking home by yourself. Anything might happen. You must make some other arrangement. I don't see what other arrangement I could make, Granny. And anyway, nothing has happened to me. I've been doing it for several months. It's not right. Somebody might speak to you. I reassured her as best I could. My hours of duty were 2 o'clock till 10, and it was usually about half past 10 before I left the hospital after the night shift had come on. It took about three quarters of an hour to walk home, along, it must be admitted, fairly lonely roads. However, I never had any trouble. I once met a very drunken sergeant but he was only too anxious to be gallant. Fine work you're doing, he said, staggering slightly as he walked. Fine work you're doing at the hospital. I'll see you home, nurse. I'll see you home because I wouldn't like anything to happen to you. I told him that there was no need but that it was kind of him. Still home with me he duly tramped, saying goodbye in a most respectful manner at our gate. I forget exactly when it was that my grandmother came to live with us. Shortly after the outbreak of the war, I imagine. She had become very blind indeed with cataract, and she was, of course, too old to be operated on. She was a sensible woman, so though it was a terrible wrench for her to give up her house in Ealing and her friends and all the rest of it, she saw plainly that she would be helpless living there alone and that servants were unlikely to stay. So the great move had been made. My sister came down to help my mother, I came up from Devon, and we all became busy. I don't think I realized in the least at the time what poor granny suffered but now I have a clear picture of her sitting helpless and half-blind in the middle of her possessions and everything that she prized, while all round her were three vandals, rummaging in things, turning things out, deciding what to do away with. Little said cries rose from her, Oh, you're not going to throw away that dress, Madame Ponsiros, my beautiful velvet. Difficult to explain to her that the velvet was moth-eaten, and that the silk had disintegrated. There were trunkfuls and drawers full of things eaten by moth, their usefulness ended. Because of her worry, many things were kept which ought to have been destroyed. Trunk after trunk, filled with papers, needle books, lengths of print for servants' dresses, lengths of silk and velvet bought it. Sales, remnants, so many many things that at one time could have been useful if they had been used, but which had simply piled up. Poor Granny sat in her large chair and wept. Then, after the clothes, her storeroom was attacked. Jams that had gone moldy, plums that had fermented, even packets of butter and sugar which had slipped down behind things and been nibbled by mice, all the things of her thrifty and provident life, all the things that had been bought and stored and saved for the future, and now, here they were, vast monuments of waste. I think that is what hurt her so much, the waste. Here were her homemade liqueurs they at least, owing to the saving quality of alcohol, were in good condition. 36 demijohns of cherry brandy, cherry gin, damson gin, damson brandy, and the rest of it, went off in the furniture van. On arrival there were only 31. And to think, said Granny, those men said they were all teetotalers. Perhaps the removers were taking their revenge, they had got little sympathy from my grandmother in moving things. When they wished to take the drawers out of the vast mahogany tallboy chests of drawers, Granny was scornful. Take the drawers out? Why? The weight. You're three strong men, aren't you? Men carried them up these stairs full of things. Nothing was taken out then. 
The idea. Men aren't worth anything at all nowadays. The men pleaded they couldn't manage it. Weaklings, said Granny, giving in at last. Absolute weaklings. Not a man worth his salt nowadays. The cases included comestibles purchased to save Granny from starvation. The only thing that cheered her when we arrived at Ashfield was devising good hiding places for them. Two dozen tins of sardines were laid flat on top of a Chippendale escritoire. There they remained, some of them to be entirely forgotten, so much so that when my mother, after the war, was selling a piece of furniture, the man who came to fetch it away said with an apologetic cough, I think there is a large amount of sardines on the top of this. Oh really, said my mother. Yes, I suppose there might be. She did not explain. The man did not ask. The sardines were removed. I suppose, said mother, we'd better have a look on top of some of the other pieces of furniture. Things like sardines and bags of flour seemed to turn up in the most unexpected places for many years to come. A disused clothes basket in the spare room was full of flour, slightly weevily. The hams, at any rate, had been eaten in good condition. Jars of honey, bottles of French plums, and some, but not many, tinned goods were liable to be found, though Granny disapproved of tinned goods, and suspected them of being a source of tomain poisoning. Only her own preserving in bottles and jars was felt by her to be a properly safe conserve. Indeed, tinned food was regarded with disapproval by all in the days of my girlhood. All girls were warned when they went to dances, be very careful you don't eat lobster for supper. You never know, it may be tinned. The word tinned being spoken with horror. Tinned crab was such a terrible commodity as not even to need warning against. If anyone then could have envisaged a time where one's main nourishment was frozen food and tinned vegetables, with what apprehension and gloom it would have been regarded. In spite of affection and willing service, how little I sympathized with my poor grandmother's sufferings. Even when technically unselfish, one is still so self-centered. It must have been, I see now, a terrible thing for my poor grandmother, by then, I suppose, well over eighty, to uproot herself from a house where she had lived for thirty or forty years, having gone there only a short time after her widowhood. Not so much perhaps leaving the house itself, that must have been bad enough, although her personal furniture came with her, the large four-poster bed, the two big chairs that she liked to sit in. But worse than anything was the loss of all her friends. Many had died, but there were still a good many left, neighbors who came in often, people with whom to gossip over old days, or to discuss the news in the daily papers, all the horrors of infanticide, rape, secret vice, and all the things that cheer the lives of the old. It is true that we read the papers to Granny every day but we were not really interested in the horrible fate of a nursemaid, a baby abandoned in her perambulator, a young girl assaulted in a train. World affairs, politics, moral welfare, education, the topics of the day none of these really interested my grandmother in the least, not because she was a stupid woman, nor because she reveled in disaster, it was rather that she needed something that contradicted the even tenor of everyday life, some drama, some terrible happenings, which, although she herself was shielded from them, were occurring perhaps not too far away. My poor grandmother had nothing exciting now in her life except the disasters which she had read to her from the daily papers. She could no longer have a friend drop in with said news of the awful behavior of Colonel So and So to his wife, or the interesting disease from which a cousin suffered and for which no doctor had yet been able to find a cure. I see now how sad it was for her, how lonely, and how dull. I wish I had been more understanding. She got up slowly in the morning after breakfast in bed. She came down about eleven and looked hopefully for someone who might have time to read the papers to her. Since she did not come down at a fixed time this was not always possible. She was patient, she sat in her chair. For a year or two she was still able to knit because for knitting she did not have to see well, but as her eyesight grew worse she had to knit coarser and coarser types of garments, and even there, she would drop a stitch and not know it. Sometimes one would find her weeping quietly in her armchair because she had dropped a stitch several rows back and it had all to be pulled out. I used to do it for her, pick it up and knit it up for her so that she could go on from where she had left off, but that did not really heal the sorrowful hurt that she was no longer able to be useful. She could seldom be persuaded to go out for a little walk on the terrace, or anything like that. Outside air she considered definitely harmful. She sat in the dining room all day because she had always sat in the dining room in her own house. She would come and join us for afternoon tea, but then she would go back again. Yet sometimes, especially if we had a party of young people in for supper, when we went up to the schoolroom afterwards, 
suddenly Granny would appear, creeping slowly and with difficulty up the stairs. On these occasions she did not want, as usual, to go to an early bed, she wanted to be in it, to hear what was going on, to share our gaiety and laughter. I suppose I wished she wouldn't come. Although she wasn't actually deaf, a good many things had to be repeated to her, and it placed a slight constraint over the company. But I am glad at least that we never discouraged her from coming up. It was said for poor Granny, and yet it was inevitable. The trouble with her, as with so many old people, was the loss of her independence. I think it is the sense of being a DISP-aced person that makes so many elderly people indulge in the illusion that they are being poisoned or their belongings stolen. I don't think really it is a weakening of the mental faculties, it is an excitement that they need, a kind of stimulant, life would be more interesting if someone were trying to poison you. Little by little Granny began to indulge in these fancies. She assured my mother that the servants were, putting things in my food. They want to get rid of me. But Auntie dear, why should they want to get rid of you? They like you very much. Ah, that's what you think, Clara. But, come a little nearer. They are always listening at doors, that I know. My egg yesterday, scrambled egg it was. It tasted very peculiar, metallic. I know, she nodded her head. Old Mrs. Wyatt, you know, she was poisoned by the butler and his wife. Yes dear, but that was because she had left them a lot of money. You haven't left any of the servants any money. No fear, said Granny. Anyway, Clara, in future I want a boiled egg only for my breakfast. If I have a boiled egg they can't tamper with that. So a boiled egg granny had. The next thing was the said disappearance of her jewelry. This was heralded by her sending for me. Agatha? Is that you? Come in, and shut the door, dear. I came up to the bed. Yes, granny, what is the matter? She was sitting on. Her bed crying, her handkerchief to her eyes. It's gone, she said. It's all gone. My emeralds, my two rings my beautiful earrings, all gone. Oh dear. Now look, Granny, I'm sure that they haven't really gone. Let's see, where were they? They were in that drawer, the top drawer on the left, wrapped up in a pair of mittens. That's where I always keep them. Well, let's see, shall we? I went across to the dressing table, and looked through the drawer in question. There were two pairs of mittens rolled up in balls, but nothing inside them. I transferred my attention to the drawer below. There was a pair of mittens in there, with a hard satisfactory feeling to them. I brought them over to the foot of the bed, and assured Granny that here they were, the earrings, the emerald brooch, and her two rings. It was in the third drawer down instead of the second. I explained. They must have put them back. I don't think they could have managed that, I said. Well, you be careful, Agatha dear. Very careful. Don't leave your bag lying about. Now tiptoe over to the door, will you? and see if they are listening. I obeyed and assured Granny that nobody was listening. How terrible it is, I thought, to be old. It was a thing, of course, that would happen to me, but it did not seem real. Strong in one's mind is always the conviction, I shall not be old. I shall not die. You know you will, but at the same time you are sure you won't. Well, now I am old. I have not yet begun to suspect that my jewelry is stolen, or that anyone is poisoning me but I must brace myself and know that that too will probably come in time. Perhaps by being forewarned I shall know that I am making a fool of myself before it does begin to happen. One day Granny thought that she heard a cat, somewhere near the back stairs. Even if it had been a cat, it would have been more sensible either to leave it there or to mention it to one of the maids, or to me, or to mother. But Granny had to go and investigate herself, with the result that she fell down the back stairs and fractured her arm. The doctor was doubtful when he said it. He hoped, he said, it would knit again all right, but at her age, over eighty, however, Granny rose triumphantly to the occasion. She could use her arm quite well in due course, though she was not able to lift it high above her head. No doubt about it, she was a tough old lady. The stories she always told me of her extreme delicacy in youth, and the fact that the doctors despaired of her life on several occasions between the ages of fifteen and thirty-five were, I feel sure, quite untrue. They were a Victorian assertion of interesting illness. What with ministering to Granny, and late hours on duty in the hospital, life was fairly full. In the summer Archie got three days leave, and I met him in London. It was not a very happy leave. He was on edge, nervy, and full of knowledge of the conditions of the war which must have been causing everyone anxiety. 
The big casualties were beginning to come in, though it had not yet dawned upon us in England that, far from being over by Christmas, the war would in all probability last for four years. Indeed, when the demand came out for conscription, Lord Derby's three years or for the duration, it seemed ridiculous to contemplate as much as three years. Archie never mentioned the war or his part in it, his one idea in those days was to forget such things. We had as pleasant meals as we could procure, the rationing system was much fairer in the first war than in the second. Then, whether you dined in a restaurant or at home, you had to produce your meat coupons etc. if you wanted a meat meal. In the second war the position was much more unethical, if you cared, and had the money, you could eat a meat meal every day of the week by going to a restaurant, where no coupons were required at all. Our three days passed in an uneasy flash. We both longed to make plans for the future, but both felt it was better not. The one bright spot for me was that shortly after that leave Archie was no longer flying. His sinus condition not permitting such work, he was instead put in charge of a depot. He was always an excellent organizer and administrator. He had been mentioned several times in dispatches, and was finally awarded the CMG, as well as the DSO. But the one award he was always most proud of was the first issued, being mentioned in dispatches by General French, right at the beginning. That, he said, was really worth something. He was also awarded a Russian decoration, the Order of Saint Stanislaus, which was so beautiful that I would have liked to have worn it myself as a decoration at parties. Later that year I had flu badly, and after it congestion of the lungs which rendered me unable to go back to the hospital for three weeks or a month. When I did go back a new department had been opened, the dispensary, and it was suggested that I might work there. It was to be my home from home for the next two years. The new department was in the charge of Mrs. Ellis, wife of Dr. Ellis, who had dispensed for her husband for many years, and my friend Eileen Morris. I was to assist them, and study for my apothecary's hall examination, which would enable me to dispense for a medical officer or a chemist. It sounded interesting. And the hours were much better, the dispensary closed down at 6 o'clock and I would be on duty alternate mornings and afternoons, so it would combine better with my home duties as well. I can't say I enjoyed dispensing as much as nursing. I think I had a real vocation for nursing, and would have been happy as a hospital nurse. Dispensing was interesting for a time, but became monotonous, I should never have cared to do it as a permanent job. On the other hand, it was fun being with my friends. I had great affection and an enormous respect for Mrs. Ellis. She was one of the quietest and calmest women I had ever known, with a gentle, rather sleepy voice and a most unexpected sense of humor which popped out at different moments. She was also a very good teacher, since she understood one's difficulties, and the fact that she herself, as she confessed, usually did her sums by long division made one feel on comfortable terms with her. Eileen was my instructress in chemistry, and was frankly a great deal too clever for me to begin with. She started not from the practical side but from the theory to be introduced suddenly to the periodic table, atomic weight, and the ramifications of coal tar derivatives was apt to result in bewilderment. However, I found my feet, mastered the simpler facts, and after we had blown up our Kona coffee machine in the process of practicing Marsh's test for arsenic our progress was well on the way. We were amateurish, but perhaps being so made us more careful and conscientious. The work was uneven in quality, of course. Every time we had a fresh convoy of patients in, we worked furiously hard. Medicines, ointments, jars and jars of lotions to be filled, replenished, and turned out every day. After working in a hospital with several doctors, one realizes how medicine, like everything else in this world, is very much a matter of fashion, that, and the personal idiosyncrasy of every medical practitioner. What is there to do this morning? Oh, five of Dr. Huitik's, and four of Dr. James's, and two of Dr. Viner's specials. The ignorant layman, or laywoman, as I suppose I ought to call myself, believes that the doctor studies your case individually, considers what drugs would be best for it, and writes a prescription to that effect. I soon found that the tonic prescribed by Dr. Wittick, and the tonic prescribed by Dr. James and the tonic prescribed by Dr. Viner were all quite different, and particular, not to the patient, but to the doctor. When one comes to think of it, it is quite reasonable, though it does not perhaps make a patient feel quite as important as he did before. The chemists and dispensers take rather a lofty view where doctors are concerned, they have their opinions also. One might think that Dr. James's is a good prescription and Dr. Huitik's below contempt, but, they have to make them up just the same. 
Only when it comes to ointments do doctors really become experimental. That is mainly because skin afflictions are enigmas to the medical profession and to everyone else. A colamine type of application cures Mrs. D in a sensational manner, Mrs. C, however, coming along with the same complaint, does not respond to colamine at all, it only produces additional irritation, but a coal tar preparation, which only aggravated the trouble with MRS. D has unexpected success with Mrs. C, so the doctor has to keep on trying until he finds the appropriate preparation. In London, skin patients also have their favorite hospitals. Tried the Middlesex? I did, and the stuff they gave me did no good at all. Now here, at UCH, I'm nearly cured already. A friend then chimes in, well, I'm beginning to think there is something in the Middlesex. My sister was treated here and it did her no good, so she went to the Middlesex and she was as right as rain after two days. I still have a grudge against one particular skin specialist, a persistent and optimistic experimenter, belonging to the school of, try anything once, who conceived the idea of a concoction of cod liver oil to be smeared all over a baby just a few months old. The mother and the other members of the household must have found poor baby's proximity very hard to bear. It did no good whatsoever and was discontinued after the first 10 days. The making of it also rendered me a pariah in the home, for you cannot deal with large quantities of cod liver oil without returning home smelling to high heaven of noisome fish. I was a pariah on several occasions in 1916, more than once as the result of the fashion for Bips paste, which was applied to all wounds treated. It consisted of bismuth and iodoform worked into a paste with liquid paraffin. The smell of the iodoform was with me in the dispensary, on the tram, in the home, at the dinner table, and in my bed. It has a pervasive character which used up from your fingertips, wrists, arms, and over your elbows, and of course was quite impossible to wash off as far as the smell went. To save my family's feelings I used to have a meal tray in the pantry. Towards the end of the war, Bip's paste went out of favor, it was replaced by other more innocuous preparations, and finally was succeeded by enormous demijohns of hypochlorous lotion. This, arising from ordinary chloride of lime with soda and other ingredients, caused a penetrating smell of chlorine to pervade all your clothes. Many of the disinfectants of sinks, etc., nowadays have this kind of basis. The mere sniff of them is enough to sicken me. I furiously attacked a very obstinate manservant we had at one time. What have you been putting down the sink in the pantry? It smells horrible. He produced a bottle proudly. First class disinfectant, madam, he said. This isn't a hospital, I cried. You'll be hanging up a carbolic sheet next. Just rinse the sink out with good hot water, and a little soda occasionally if you must. Throw that filthy chloride of lime preparation away. I gave him a lecture on the nature of disinfectants and the fact that anything which is harmful to a germ is usually equally harmful to human tissue, so that spotless cleanliness and not disinfection was the thing to aim at. Germs are tough, I pointed out to him. Weak disinfectants won't discourage any good sturdy germ. Germs will flourish in a solution of 1 in 60 carbolic. He was not convinced, and continued to use his nauseous mixture whenever he was sure I was safely out of the house. As part of my preparation for my examination at Apothecary's Hall, it was arranged that I should have a little outside instruction from a proper commercial chemist. One of the principal pharmacists in Torquay was gracious enough to say that I could come in on certain Sundays and that he would give me instruction. I arrived meek and frightened, anxious to learn. A chemist's shop, the first time that you go behind the scenes, is a revelation. Being amateurs in our hospital work, we measured every bottle of medicine with the utmost accuracy. When the doctor prescribed 20 grains of bismuth carbonate to a dose, exactly 20 grains the patient got. Since we were amateurs, I think this was a good thing, but I imagine that any chemist who has done his five years, and got his minor pharmaceutical degree, knows his stuff in the same way as a good cook knows hers. He tosses in portions from the various stock bottles with the utmost confidence, without bothering to measure or weigh at all. He measures his poisons or dangerous drugs carefully, of course, but the harmless stuff goes in in the approximate dollops. Coloring and flavoring are added in much the same way. This sometimes results in the patients coming back and complaining that their medicine is a different color from last time. It is a deep pink I have as a rule, not this pale pink, or, this doesn't taste right, it is the peppermint mixture I have, a nice peppermint mixture, not nasty, sweet, sickly stuff. Then chloroform water has clearly been added instead of peppermint water. 
The majority of patients in the outpatient department at University College Hospital, where I worked in 1948, were particular as to the exact color and taste of their preparations. I remember an old Irish woman who leaned into the dispensary window, pressed half a crown into my palm, and murmured, Make it double strong, dearie, will you? Plenty of peppermint, double strong. I returned her the half a crown, saying priggishly that we didn't accept that sort of thing, and added that she had to have the medicine exactly as the doctor had ordered it. I did, however, give her an extra dollop of peppermint water, since it could not possibly do her any harm and she enjoyed it so much. Naturally, when one is a novice at this kind of job, one has a nervous horror of making mistakes. The addition of poison to a medicine is always checked by one of the other dispensers, but there can still be frightening moments. I remember one of mine. I had been making up ointments that afternoon, and for one of them I had placed a little pure carbolic in a convenient ointment pot lid, then carefully, with a dropper, added it to the ointment that I was mixing on the slab. Once it was duly bottled, labeled, and put out on a slab, I went on with my other work. It was about three in the morning, I think, that I woke up in bed and said to myself, what did I do with that ointment pot lid, the one I put the carbolic in? The more I thought the less I was able to remember having taken it and washed it. Had I perhaps clapped it on some other ointment I had made, not noticing that it had anything in it? Again, the more I thought, the more I was sure that that was what I had done. I had put it out on the ward shelf with the others to be collected on the following morning by the ward boy in his basket, and one ointment for one patient would have a layering of strong carbolic in the top. Worried to death, I could bear it no longer. I got out of bed, dressed, walked down to the hospital, went in, fortunately I did not have to go through the ward, since the staircase to the dispensary was outside it, went up, surveyed the ointments I had prepared, opened the lids, and sniffed cautiously. To this day I don't know whether I imagined it or not, but in one of them I seemed to detect a faint odor of carbolic which there should not have been. I took out the top layer of the ointment, and so made sure that all was well. Then I crept out again and walked home and back to bed. On the whole it is not usually the novices who make mistakes in chemists' shops. They are nervous, and always asking advice. The worst cases of poisoning through mistakes arise with the reliable chemists who have worked for many years. They are so familiar with what they are doing, so able to do it without really thinking any more, that the time does come when one day, preoccupied perhaps with some trouble of their own, they make a slip. This happened in the cases of the grandchild of a friend of mine. The child was ill and the doctor came and wrote a prescription which was taken to the chemist to be made up. In due course the dose was administered. That afternoon the grandmother did not like the look of the child, she said to the nanny, I wonder whether there is anything wrong with that medicine. After a second dose, she was still more worried. I think there is something wrong, she said. She sent for the doctor, he took a look at the child, examined the medicine, and took immediate action. Children tolerate opium and its preparations very badly. The chemist had blundered, had put in quite a serious overdose. He was terribly upset, poor man, he had worked for this particular firm for 14 years and was one of their most careful and trusted dispensers. It shows what can happen to anybody. During the course of my pharmaceutical instruction on Sunday afternoons, I was faced with a problem. It was incumbent upon the entrance to the examination to deal with both the ordinary system and the metric system of measurements. My pharmacist gave me practice in making up preparations to the metric formula. Neither doctors nor chemists like the metrical system in operation. One of our doctors at the hospital never learned what, containing 0.1, really meant, and would say, now let me see, is this solution one in a hundred or one in a thousand? The great danger of the metric system is that if you go wrong you go ten times wrong. On this particular afternoon I was having instruction in the making of suppositories, things which were not much used in the hospital, but which I was supposed to know how to make for the exam. They are tricky things, mainly owing to the melting point of the cocoa butter, which is their base. If you get it too hot it won't set, if you don't get it hot enough it comes out of the molds the wrong shape. In this case Mr. P the pharmacist was giving me a personal demonstration, and showed me the exact procedure with the cocoa butter, then added one metrically calculated drug. He showed me how to turn the suppositories out at the right moment, then told me how to put them into a box and label them professionally as so and so one in a hundred. He went away then to attend to other duties, but I was worried, because I was convinced that what had gone into those suppositories was 10% and made a dose of one in ten in each, not one in a hundred. 
I went over his calculations and they were wrong. In using the metric system he had got his dot in the wrong place. But what was the young student to do? I was the merest novice, he was the best known pharmacist in the town. I couldn't say to him, Mr. P, you have made a mistake. Mr. P the pharmacist was the sort of person who does not make a mistake, especially in front of a student. At this moment, repassing me, he said, you can put those into stock, we do need them sometimes. Worse and worse. I couldn't let those suppositories go into stock. It was quite a dangerous drug that was being used. You can stand far more of a dangerous drug if it is being given through the rectum, but all the same, I didn't like it, and what was I to do about it? Even if I suggested the dose was wrong, would he believe me? I was quite sure of the answer to that, he would say, it's quite all right. Do you think I don't know what I'm doing in matters of this kind? There was only one thing for it. Before the suppositories cooled, I tripped, lost my footing, upset the board on which they were reposing, and trod on them. Firmly. Mr. P, I said, I'm terribly sorry, I've knocked over those suppositories and stepped on them. Dear, 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 he said vexedly. This one seems all right. He picked up one which had escaped the weight of my beetle crushers. It's dirty, I said firmly, and without more ado tipped them all into the waste bin. I'm very sorry, I repeated. That's all right, little girl, he said. Don't worry too much, and patted me tenderly on the shoulders. He was too much given to that kind of thing, pats on the shoulders, nudges, occasionally a faint attempt to stroke my cheek. I had to put up with it because I was being instructed, but I was as standoffish as possible, and usually managed to engage the other dispenser in conversation so that I could not be alone with him. He was a strange man, Mr. P. One day, Seeking perhaps to impress me, he took from his pocket a dark colored lump and showed it to me, saying, Know what this is? No, I said. It's Kurari, he said. Know about Kurari? I said I had read about it. Interesting stuff, he said. Very interesting. Taken by the mouth, it does you no harm at all. Enter the bloodstream, it paralyzes and kills you. It's what they use for arrow poison. Do you know why I carry it in my pocket? No. I said, I haven't the slightest idea. It seemed to me an extremely foolish thing to do, but I didn't add that. Well, you know, he said thoughtfully, it makes me feel powerful. I looked at him then. He was a rather funny looking little man, very roundabout, and robin red breast looking, with a nice pink face. There was a general air of childish satisfaction about him. Shortly afterwards I finished my instructional course, but I often wondered about Mr. P afterwards. He struck me, in spite of his cherubic appearance, as possible rather a dangerous man. His memory remained with me so long that it was still there waiting when I first conceived the idea of writing my book The Pale Horse, and that must have been, I suppose, nearly fifty years later. Third. It was while I was working in the dispensary that I first conceived the idea of writing a detective story. The idea had remained in my mind since Madge's earlier challenge, and my present work seemed to offer a favorable opportunity. Unlike nursing, where there always was something to do, dispensing consisted of slack or busy periods. Sometimes I would be on duty alone in the afternoon with hardly anything to do but sit about. Having seen that the stock bottles were full and attended to, one was at liberty to do anything one pleased except leave the dispensary. I began considering what kind of a detective story I could write. Since I was surrounded by poisons, perhaps it was natural that death by poisoning should be the method I selected. I settled on one fact which seemed to me to have possibilities. I toyed with the idea, liked it, and finally accepted it. Then I went on to the dramatis personae. Who should be poisoned? Who would poison him or her? When? Where? How? Why? And all the rest of it. It would have to be very much of an intimate murder, owing to the particular way it was done it would have to be all in the family, so to speak. There would naturally have to be a detective. At that date I was well steeped in the Sherlock Holmes tradition. So I considered detectives. Not like Sherlock Holmes, of course, I must invent one of my own, and he would also have a friend as a kind of butt or stooge, that would not be too difficult. I returned to thoughts of my other characters. Who was to be murdered? A husband could murder his wife, that seemed to be the most usual kind of murder. I could, of course, have a very unusual kind of murder for a very unusual motive, but that did not appeal to me artistically. 
The whole point of a good detective story was that it must be somebody obvious but at the same time, for some reason, you would then find that it was not obvious, that he could not possibly have done it. Though really, of course, he had done it. At that point I got confused, and went away and made up a couple of bottles of extra hypochlorous lotion so that I should be fairly free of work the next day. I went on playing with my idea for some time. Bits of it began to grow. I saw the murderer now. He would have to be rather sinister looking. He would have a black beard, that appeared to me at that time very sinister. There were some acquaintances who had recently come to live near us, the husband had a black beard, and he had a wife who was older than himself and who was very rich. Yes, I thought, that might do as a basis. I considered it at some length. It might do, but it was not entirely satisfactory. The man in question would, I was sure, never murder anybody. I took my mind away from them and decided once and for all that it is no good thinking about real people, you must create your characters for yourself. Someone you see in a tram or a train or a restaurant is a possible starting point, because you can make up something for yourself about them. Sure enough, next day, when I was sitting in a tram, I saw just what I wanted, a man with a black beard, sitting next to an elderly lady who was chattering like a magpie. I didn't think I'd have her, but I thought he would do admirably. Sitting a little way beyond them was a large, hearty woman, talking loudly about spring bulbs. I liked the look of her too. Perhaps I could incorporate her? I took them all three off the tram with me to work upon, and walked up Barton Road muttering to myself just as in the days of the kittens. Very soon I had a sketchy picture of some of my people. There was the hardy woman, I even knew her name, Evelyn. She could be a poor relation or a lady gardener or a companion, perhaps a lady housekeeper? Anyway, I was going to have her. Then there was the man with the black beard whom I still felt I didn't know much about, except for his beard which wasn't really enough, or was it enough? Yes, perhaps it was, because you would be seeing this man from the outside, so you could only see what he liked to show, not as he really was, that ought to be a clue in itself. The elderly wife would be murdered more for her money than her character, so she didn't matter very much. I now began adding more characters rapidly. A son? A daughter? Possibly a nephew? You had to have a good many suspects. The family was coming along nicely. I left it to develop, and turned my attention to the detective. Who could I have as a detective? I reviewed such detectives as I had met and admired in books. There was Sherlock Holmes, the one and only, I should never be able to emulate him. There was Arsene Lupin, was he a criminal or a detective? Anyway, not my kind. There was the young journalist relatable in the mystery of the Yellow Room, that was the sort of person whom I would like to invent, someone who hadn't been used before. Who could I have? A schoolboy? Rather difficult. A scientist? What did I know of scientists? Then I remembered our Belgian refugees. We had quite a colony of Belgian refugees living in the parish of Tor. Everyone had been bursting with loving kindness and sympathy when they arrived. People had stocked houses with furniture for them to live in, had done everything they could to make them comfortable. There had been the usual reaction later, when the refugees had not seemed to be sufficiently grateful for what had been done for them and complained of this and that. The fact that the poor things were bewildered and in a strange country was not sufficiently appreciated. A good many of them were suspicious peasants, and the last thing they wanted was to be asked out to tea or have people drop in upon them, they wanted to be left alone, to be able to keep to themselves, they wanted to save money, to dig their garden and to manure it in their own particular and intimate way. Why not make my detective a Belgian? I thought. There were all types of refugees. How about a refugee police officer? A retired police officer. Not too young a one. What a mistake I made there. The result is that my fictional detective must really be well over a hundred by now. Anyway, I settled on a Belgian detective. I allowed him slowly to grow into his part. He should have been an inspector, so that he would have a certain knowledge of crime. He would be meticulous, very tidy, I thought to myself, as I cleared away a good many untidy odds and ends in my own bedroom. A tidy little man. I could see him as a tidy little man, always arranging things, liking things in pairs, liking things square instead of round. And he should be very brainy, he should have little gray cells of the mind, that was a good phrase, I must remember that, yes, he would have little gray cells. He would have rather a grand name, one of those names that Sherlock Holmes and his family had. Who was it his brother had been? 
Mycroft Holmes. How about calling my little man Hercules? He would be a small man Hercules, a good name. His last name was more difficult. I don't know why I settled on the name Poirot, whether it just came into my head or whether I saw it in some newspaper or written on something, anyway it came. It went well not with Hercules but Hercule, Hercule Poirot. That was all right, settled, thank goodness. Now I must get names for the others, but that was less important. Alfred Inglethorpe, that might do, it would go well with the black beard. I added some more characters. A husband and wife, attractive, estranged from each other. Now for all the ramifications, the false clues. Like all young writers, I was trying to put far too much plot into one book. I had too many false clues, so many things to unravel that it might make the whole thing not only more difficult to solve, but more difficult to read. In leisure moments, bits of my detective story rattled about in my head. I had the beginning all settled, and the end arranged, but there were difficult gaps in between. I had Hercule Poirot involved in a natural and plausible way. But there had to be more reasons why other people were involved. It was still all in a tangle. It made me absent-minded at home. My mother was continually asking why I didn't answer questions or didn't answer them properly. I knitted Granny's pattern wrong more than once, I forgot to do a lot of the things that I was supposed to do, and I sent several letters to the wrong addresses. However, the time came when I felt I could at last begin to write. I told mother what I was going to do. Mother had the usual complete faith that her daughters could do anything. Oh, she said. A detective story? That will be a nice change for you, won't it? You'd better start. It wasn't easy to snatch much time, but I managed. I had the old typewriter still, the one that had belonged to Madge, and I battered away on that, after I had written a first draft in longhand. I typed out each chapter as I finished it. My handwriting was better in those days and my longhand was readable. I was excited by my new effort. Up to a point I enjoyed it. But I got very tired, and I also got cross. Writing has that effect, I find. Also, as I began to be enmeshed in the middle part of the book, the complications got the better of me instead of my being the master of them. It was then that my mother made a good suggestion. How far have you got, she asked. Oh, I think about halfway through. Well, I think if you really want to finish it you'll have to do so when you take your holidays. Well, I did mean to go on with it then. Yes, but I think you should go away from home for your holiday, and write with nothing to disturb you. I thought about it. A fortnight quite undisturbed. It would be rather wonderful. Where would you like to go, asked my mother. Dartmoor. Yes, I said. Entranced. Dartmoor, that is exactly it. So to Dartmoor I went. I booked myself a room in the Moorland Hotel at Haytor. It was a large, dreary hotel with plenty of rooms. There were few people staying there. I don't think I spoke to any of them, it would have taken my mind away from what I was doing. I used to write laboriously all morning till my hand ached. Then I would have lunch, reading a book. Afterwards I would go out for a good walk on the moor, perhaps for a couple of hours. I think I learned to love the moor in those days. I loved the tours and the heather and all the wild part of it away from the roads. Everybody who went there, and of course there were not many in wartime, would be clustering round Haytor itself, but I left Haytor severely alone and struck out on my own across country. As I walked I muttered to myself, enacting the chapter that I was next going to write, speaking as John to Mary, and as Mary to John, as Evelyn to her employer, and so on. I became quite excited by this. I would come home, have dinner, fall into bed and sleep for about 12 hours. Then I would get up and write passionately again all morning. I finished the last half of the book, or as near as not, during my fortnight's holiday. Of course that was not the end. I then had to rewrite a great part of it mostly the overcomplicated middle. But in the end it was finished and I was reasonably satisfied with it. That is to say it was roughly as I had intended it to be. It could be much better, I saw that, but I didn't see just how I could make it. Better so I had to leave it as it was. I rewrote some very stilted chapters between Mary and her husband John who were estranged for some foolish reason, but whom I was determined to force together again at the end so as to make a kind of love interest. I myself always found the love interest a terrible bore in detective stories. Love, I felt, belonged to romantic stories. To force a love motif into what should be a scientific process went much against the grain. However, 
and that period detective stories always had to have a love interest, so there it was. I did my best with John and Mary, but they were poor creatures. Then I got it properly typed by somebody, and having finally decided I could do no more to it, I sent it off to a publisher, Hodder and Stoughton, who returned it. It was a plain refusal, with no frills on it. I was not surprised, I hadn't expected success, but I bundled it off to another publisher. Fourth. Archie came home for his second leave. It must have been nearly two years, since I had seen him last. This time we had a happy leave together. We had a whole week, and we went to the new forest. It was autumn, with lovely colorings in the leaves. Archie was less nervy this time, and we were both less fearful for the future. We walked together through the woods and had a kind of companionship that we had not known before. He confided to me that there was one place he had always wanted to go, to follow a signpost that said, to no man's land. So we took the path to no man's land, and we walked along it, then came to an orchard, with lots of apples. There was a woman there and we asked her if we could buy some apples from her. You don't need to buy from me, my dears, she said. You're welcome to the apples. Your man is in the Air Force, I see, so was a son of mine who was killed. Yes, you go and help yourselves to all the apples you can eat and all you can take away with you. So we wandered happily through the orchard eating apples, and then went back through the forest again and sat down on a fallen tree. It was raining gently, but we were very happy. I didn't talk about the hospital or my work, and Archie didn't talk much about France, but he hinted that, perhaps, before long, we might be together again. I told him about my book and he read it. He enjoyed it and said he thought it good. He had a friend in the Air Force, he said, who was a director of Methuen's, and he suggested that if the book came back again he should send me a letter from this friend which I could enclose with the MS and send to Methuen's. So that was the next port of call for the mysterious affair at Stiles. Methuen's, no doubt in deference to their director, wrote much more kindly. They kept it longer, I should think about six months, but, though saying that it was very interesting and had several good points, concluded it was not quite suitable for their particular line of production. I expect really they thought it pretty awful. I forget where I sent it next, but once again it came back. I had rather lost hope by now. The Bodley Head, John Lane, had published one or two detective stories recently, rather a new departure for them, so I thought I might as well give them a try. I packed it off to them, and forgot all about it. The next thing that happened was sudden and unexpected. Archie arrived home, posted to the Air Ministry in London. The war had gone on so long nearly four years, and I had got so used to working in hospital and living at home that it was almost a shock to think I might have a different life to live. I went up to London. We got a room at a hotel, and I started round, looking for some kind of a furnished flat to live in. In our ignorance we started with rather grand ideas, but were soon taken down a peg or two. This was wartime. We found two possibles in the end. One was in West Hampstead, it belonged to a Miss Tunks, the name stuck in my mind. She was exceedingly doubtful of us, wondering whether we would be careful enough, young people were so careless, she was very particular about her things. It was a nice little flat, three and a half guineas a week. The other one that we looked at was in St. John's Wood, Northwick Terrace, just off Maida Vale, now pulled down. That was just two rooms, as against three, on the second floor, and rather shabbily furnished, though pleasant, with faded chintz and a garden outside. It was in one of those biggish old-fashioned houses, and the rooms were spacious. Moreover it was only two and a half guineas as against three and a half a week. We settled for that. I went home and packed up my things. Granny wept, mother wanted to weep but controlled it. She said, you are going to your husband now, dear, and beginning your married life. I hope everything will go well. And if the beds are of wood, be sure there are no bed bugs, said Granny. So I went back to London and Archie, and we moved into 5 Northwick Terrace. It had a microscopic kitchenette and bathroom, and I planned to do a certain amount of cooking. To start with, however, we would have Archie's soldier servant and Batman, Bartlett, who was a kind of Jeeves, a perfection. He had been valet to dukes in his time. Only the war had brought him into Archie's service, but he was devoted to the colonel and told me long tales of his bravery, his importance, his brains, and the mark he had made. Bartlett's service was certainly perfect. The drawbacks of the flat were many, the worst of which was the beds, which were full of large, iron lumps, 
I don't know how any beds could have got into such a state. But we were happy there, and I planned to take a course of shorthand and bookkeeping which would occupy my days. So it was goodbye to Ashfield and the start of my new life, my married life. One of the great joys of five, Northwick Terrace was Mrs. Woods. In fact I think it was partly Mrs. Woods which decided us in favor of Northwick Terrace rather than the West Hampstead flat. She reigned in the basement, a fat, jolly, cozy sort of woman. She had a smart daughter who worked in one of the smart shops, and an invisible husband. She was the general caretaker and, if she felt like it, would do for the members of the flats. She agreed to do for us, and she was a tower of strength. From Mrs. Woods I learned details of shopping which had so far never crossed my horizon. Fishmonger done you down again, love, she would say to me. That fish isn't fresh. You didn't poke it the way I told you to. You've got to poke it and look at its eye, and poke its eye. I looked at the fish doubtfully, I felt that to poke it in its eye was taking somewhat of a liberty. Stand it up on its end too, stand it up on its tail. See if it flops or if it's stiff. And those oranges now. I know you fancy an orange sometimes as a bit of a treat, in spite of the expense, but that kind there has just been soaked in boiling water to make them look fresh. You won't find any juice in that orange. I didn't. The big excitement of my and Mrs. Wood's life was when Archie drew his first rations. An enormous piece of beef appeared, the biggest piece I had seen since the beginning of the war. It was of no recognizable cut or shape, did not seem to be topside or ribs or sirloin, it was apparently chopped up according to weight by some Air Force butcher. Anyway, it was the handsomest thing we'd seen for ages. It reposed on the table and Mrs. Woods and I walked round it admiringly. There was no question of if going in my tiny oven. Mrs. Woods agreed kindly to cook it for me. And there's such a lot, I said, you can have it as well as us. Well, that's very nice of you, I'm sure, we'll enjoy a good go of beef. Groceries, mind you, that's easy. I've got a cousin, Bob, in the grocery, as much sugar and butter as we want we get, and Marge. Things like that, family gets served first. It was one of my introductions to the time-honored rule which holds good through the whole of life, what matters is who you know. From the open nepotism of the East to the slightly more concealed nepotism and old boys club of the Western democracies, everything in the end hinges on that. It is not, mind you, a recipe for complete success. Freddy so and so gets a well paid job because his uncle knows one of the directors in the firm. So Freddy moves in. But if Freddy is no good, the claims of friendship or relationship having been satisfied, Freddy will be gently eased out, possibly passed on to some other cousin or friend, but in the end finding his own level. In the case of meat, and the general luxuries of wartime, there were some advantages for the rich, but on the whole, I think, there were infinitely more advantages for the working class because nearly everyone had a cousin or a friend, or a daughter's husband, or someone useful who was either in a dairy, a grocery, or something of that kind. It didn't apply to butchers, as far as I could see, but grocers were certainly a great family asset. Nobody that I came across at that time ever seemed to keep to the rations. They drew their rations, but they then drew an extra pound of butter and an extra pot of jam, and so on, without any feeling of behaving dishonestly. It was a family perk. Naturally Bob would look after his family and his family's family first. So Mrs. Woods was always offering us extra tidbits of this and that. The serving of the first joint of meat was a great occasion. I cannot think it was particularly good meat or tender, but I was young, my teeth were strong, and it was the most delicious thing I had had for a long time. Archie, of course, was surprised at my greed. Not a very interesting joint, he said. Interesting. I said. It's the most interesting thing I have seen for three years. What I may call serious cooking was done for us by Mrs. Woods. Lighter meals, supper dishes, were prepared by me. I had attended cookery classes, like most girls, but they are not particularly useful to you, when you come down to it. Everyday practice is what counts. I had made batches of jam pies, or toad in the hole, or etc. of various kinds, but these were not what were really needed now. There were national kitchens in most quarters of London, and these were useful. You called there and got things ready cooked in a container. They were quite well cooked, not very interesting ingredients, but they filled up the gaps. There were also national soup squares with which we started our meals. These were described by Archie as sand and gravel soup, recalling the skit by Stephen Leacock on a Russian short story, Yog took sand and stones and beat it to make a cake. 
Soup squares were rather like that. Occasionally I made one of my specialties, such as a very elaborate souffle. I didn't realize at first that Archie suffered badly with nervous dyspepsia. There were many evenings when he came home and was unable to eat anything at all, which rather discouraged me if I had prepared a cheese souffle, or something at which I fancied myself. Everyone has their own ideas of what they like to eat when they feel ill, and Archie's, to my mind, were extraordinary. After lying groaning on his bed for some time, he would suddenly say, I think I'd like some treacle or golden syrup. Could you make me something with that? I obliged as best I could. I started a course of bookkeeping and shorthand to occupy my days. As everyone knows by now, thanks to those interminable articles in Sunday papers, newly married wives are usually lonely. What surprises me is that newly married wives should ever expect not to be. Husbands work, they are out all day, and a woman, when she marries, usually transfers herself to an entirely different environment. She has to start life again, to make new contacts and new friends, find new occupations. I had had friends in London before the war, but by now all were scattered. Nan Watts, now Pollock, was living in London, but I felt rather diffident about approaching her. This sounds silly, and indeed it was silly, but one cannot pretend that differences in income do not separate people. It is not a question of snobbishness or social position, it is whether you can afford to follow the pursuits that your friends are following. If they have a large income and you have a small one, things become embarrassing. I was slightly lonely. I missed the hospital and my friends there and the daily goings on, and I missed my home surroundings, but I realized that this was unavoidable. Companionship is not a thing that one needs every day, it is a thing that grows upon one, and sometimes becomes as destroying as ivy growing round you. I enjoyed learning shorthand and bookkeeping. I was humiliated by the ease with which little girls of 14 and 15 progressed in shorthand, at bookkeeping, however, I could hold my own, and it was fun. One day at the business school where I took my courses the teacher stopped the lesson, went out of the room and returned, saying everything ended for today. The war is over. It seemed unbelievable. There had been no real sign of this being likely to happen, nothing to lead you to believe that it would be over for another six months or a year. The position in France never seemed to change. One won a few yards of territory or lost it. I went out in the streets quite dazed. There I came upon one of the most curious sights I had ever seen, indeed I still remember it, almost, I think with a sense of fear. Everywhere there were women dancing in the street. English women are not given to dancing in public, it is a reaction more suitable to Paris and the French. But there they were, laughing, shouting, shuffling, leaping even, in a sort of wild orgy of pleasure, an almost brutal enjoyment. It was frightening. One felt that if there had been any Germans around the women would have advanced upon them and torn them to pieces. Some of them I suppose were drunk, but all of them looked it. They reeled, lurched, and shouted. I got home too. Find Archie was already home from his air ministry. Well, that's that, he said, in his usual calm and unemotional fashion. Did you think it would happen so soon? I asked. Oh well, rumors have been going around, we were told not to say anything. And now, he said, we'll have to decide what to do next. What do you mean, do next? I think the best thing to do will be to leave the Air Force. You really mean to leave the Air Force? I was dumbfounded. No future in it. You must see that. There can't be any future in it. No promotion for years. What will you do? I'd like to go into the city. I've always wanted to go into the city. There are one or two opportunities going. I always had an enormous admiration for Archie's practical outlook. He accepted everything without surprise, and calmly put his brain, which was a good one, to work on the next problem. At the moment, armistice, or no armistice, life went on as before. Archie went every day to the air ministry. The wonderful Bartlett, alas, got himself demobbed very quickly. I suppose the dukes and earls were pulling strings to regain his services. Instead, we had a rather terrible creature called Varel. I think he did his best, but he was inefficient, quite untrained, and the amount of dirt, grease and smears on the silver, plates, knives, and forks, was beyond anything I had seen before. I was really thankful when he, too, got his demobilization papers. Archie got some leave and we went to Torquay. It was while I was there that I went down with what I thought at first was a terrific attack of tummy sickness and general misery. However, it was something quite different. It was the first sign that I was going to have a baby. I was thrilled. 
My ideas of having a baby had been that they were things that were practically automatic. After each of Archie's leaves I had been deeply disappointed to find that no signs of a baby appeared. This time I had not even expected it. I went to consult a doctor, our old Dr. Powell had retired, so I had to choose a new one. I didn't think I would choose any of the doctors whom I had worked with in the hospital, I felt I knew rather too much about them and their methods. Instead I went to a cheery doctor who rejoiced in the somewhat sinister name of Stab. He had a very pretty wife, with whom my brother Monty had been deeply in love since the age of nine. I have called my rabbit, he said then, after Gertrude Huntley, because I think she is the most beautiful lady I have ever seen. Gertrude. Huntley, afterwards Stab, was nice enough to show herself deeply impressed, and to thank him for this honor accorded her. Dr. Stab told me that I seemed a healthy girl, and nothing should go wrong, and that was that. No further fuss was made. I cannot help being rather pleased that in my day there were none of those antenatal clinics in which you are pulled about every month or two. Personally, I think we were much better off without them. All Dr. Stab suggested was that I should go to him or to a doctor in London about a couple of months before the baby was due, just to see that everything was the right way up. He said I might go on being sick in the morning, but after three months that it would disappear. There, I regret to say, he was wrong. My morning sickness never disappeared. It was not only a morning ailment. I was sick four or five times every day, and it made life in London quite embarrassing. To have to skip off a bus when you had perhaps only just got on it, and be violently sick in the gutter, is humiliating for a young woman. Still, it had to be put up with. Fortunately nobody thought in those days of giving you things like thalidomide. They just accepted the fact that some people were sicker than others having a baby. Mrs. Woods, as usual omniscient on all subjects to do with birth and death, said, Ah well, dearie, I'd say myself that you are going to have a girl. Sickness means girls. Boys you go dizzy and faint. It's better to be sick. Of course I did not think it was better to be sick. I thought to swoon away would be more interesting. Archie, who had never liked illness, and was apt to shear off if people were ill, saying, I think you'll do better without me bothering you, was on this occasion most unexpectedly kind. He thought of all sorts of things to cheer me up. I remember he bought a lobster, at that time an excessively expensive luxury, and placed it in my bed to surprise me. I can still remember coming in and seeing the lobster with its head and whiskers lying on my pillow. I laughed like anything. We had a splendid meal with it. I lost it soon afterwards, but at any rate I had had the pleasure of eating it. He was also noble enough to make me Benger's food, which had been recommended by Mrs. Woods as more likely to keep down than other things. I remember Archie's hurt face when he had made me some Benger's, and allowed it to go cold because I could not drink it hot. I had had it, and had said it was very nice, no lumps in it tonight, and you've made it beautifully, then half an hour later there was the usual tragedy. Well, look here, said Archie, in an injured manner. What's the good of my making you these things? I mean, you might just as well not take them at all. It seemed to me, in my ignorance, that so much vomiting would have a bad effect on our coming child, that it would be starved. This, however, was far from the case. Although I continued to be sick up to the day of the birth, I had a strapping eight and a half pound daughter, and I myself, though never seeming to retain any nourishment at all, had put on rather than lost weight. The whole thing was like a nine-month ocean voyage to which you never got acclimatist. When Rosalind was born, and I found a doctor and a nurse leaning over me, the doctor saying, well, you've got a daughter all right, and the nurse, more gushing, oh, what a lovely little daughter. I responded with the important announcement, I don't feel sick anymore. How wonderful. Archie and I had had great arguments the preceding month about names, and about which sex we wanted. Archie was very definite that he must have a daughter. I'm not going to have a boy, he said, because I can see I should be jealous of it. I'd be jealous of your paying attention to it. But I should pay just as much attention to a girl. No, it wouldn't be the same thing. We argued about a name. Archie wanted Enid. I wanted Martha. He shifted to Elaine, I tried Harriet. Not till after she was born did we compromise on Rosalind. I know all mothers rave about their babies, but I must say that, though I personally consider newborn babies definitely hideous, Rosalind actually was a nice-looking baby. She had a lot of dark hair, and she looked rather like a red Indian, she had not that pink, bald look that is so depressing in babies, and she seemed, from an early age, both gay and determined. 
I had an extremely nice nurse, who took grave exception to the ways of our household. Rosalind was born, of course, at Ashfield. Mothers did not go to nursing homes in those days, the whole birth, with attendance, cost fifteen pounds, which seems to me, looking back, extremely reasonable. I kept the nurse, on my mother's advice, for an extra two weeks, so that I could get full instructions in looking after Rosalind, and also go to London and find somewhere else to live. The night when we knew Rosalind would be born we had a curious time. Mother and Nurse Pemberton were like two females caught up in the rites of nativity, happy, busy, important, running about with sheets, setting things to order. Archie and I wandered about, a little timid, rather nervous, like two children who were not sure they were wanted. We were both frightened and upset. Archie, as he told me afterwards, was convinced that if I died it would be all his fault. I thought I possibly might die, and if so I would be extremely sorry because I was enjoying myself so much. But it was really just the unknown that was frightening. It was also exciting. The first time you do a thing is always exciting. Now we had to make plans for the future. I left Rosalind at Ashfield with Nurse Pemberton still in charge, and went to London to find A, a place to live in. B, a nurse for Rosalind, and C, a maid to look after whatever house or flat we should find. The last was really no problem at all, for a month before Rosalind's birth who should burst in but my dear Devonshire Lucy, just out of the wafts, breathless, warm-hearted, full of exuberance, the same as ever, and a tower of strength. I've heard the news, she said. I've heard you are going to have a baby, and I'm ready. The moment you want me, I'll move in. After consultation with my mother, I decided that Lucy must be offered a wage such as never before, in my mother's or my experience, had been paid to a cook or a general maid. It was £36 a year, an enormous sum in those days, but Lucy was well worth it and I was delighted to have her. By this time, nearly a year after the armistice, finding anywhere to live was about the most difficult thing in the world. Hundreds of young couples were scouring London to find anything that would suit them at a reasonable price. Premiums, too, were being asked. The whole thing was very difficult. We decided to take a furnished flat first while we looked around for something that would really suit us. Archie's plans were working out. As soon as he got his demobilization he was going in with a city firm. I have forgotten the name of his boss by this time, I will call him for convenience Mr. Goldstein. He was a large, yellow man. When I had asked Archie about him that was the first thing he had said, well, he's very yellow. Fat too, but very yellow. At that time the city firms were being forward in offering postings to young demobilist officers. Archie's salary was to be £500 a year. I had £100 a year which I still received under my grandfather's will, and Archie had his gratuity and sufficient savings to bring him in a further £100 a year. It was not riches, even in those days, in fact it was far from riches, because rents had risen so enormously, and also the price of food. Eggs were eight pence each, which was no joke for a young couple. However, we had never expected to be rich, and had no qualms. Looking back, it seems to me extraordinary that we should have contemplated having both a nurse and a servant, but they were considered essentials of life in those days, and were the last things we would have thought of dispensing with. To have committed the extravagance of a car, for instance, would never have entered our minds. Only the rich had cars. Sometimes, in the last days of my pregnancy, when I was waiting in queues for buses, elbowed aside because of my cumbrous movements, men were not particularly gallant at that period, I used to think as cars swept past me, how wonderful it would be if I could have. One one day. I remember a friend of Archie's saying bitterly, nobody ought to be allowed to have a car unless they are on very essential business. I never felt like that. It is always exciting, I think, to see someone having luck, someone who is rich, someone who has jewels. Don't the children in the street all press their faces against the windows to spy on parties, to see people with diamond tiaras? Somebody has got to win the Irish sweepstake. If the prizes for it were only £30 there would be no excitement. The Calcutta sweep, the Irish sweep, nowadays the football pools, all those things are romance. That, too, is why there are large crowds on the pavements watching film stars as they arrive at the premieres of film shows. To the watchers they are heroines in wonderful evening dresses, made up to the back teeth, figures of glamour. Who wants a drab world where nobody is rich, or important, or beautiful, or talented? 
Once one stood for hours to look at kings and queens, nowadays one is more inclined to gasp at pop stars, but the principle is the same. As I said, we were prepared to have a nurse and a servant as a necessary extravagance, but would never have dreamed of having a car. If we went to theaters it would be to the pit. I would have perhaps one evening dress, and that would be a black one so as not to show the dirt, and when we went out on muddy evenings, I would always of course, have, black shoes for the same reason. We would never take a taxi anywhere. There is a fashion in the way you spend your money, just as there is a fashion in everything. I'm not prepared to say now whether ours was a worse or a better way. It made for less luxury, plainer food, clothes, and all those things. On the other hand, in those days you had more leisure, there was leisure to think, to read, and to indulge in hobbies and pursuits. I think I am glad that I was young in those times. There was a great deal of freedom in life, and much less hurry and worry. We found a flat, rather luckily, quite soon. It was on the ground floor of Addison Mansions, which were two big blocks of buildings situated behind Olympia. It was a big flat, four bedrooms, and two sitting rooms. We took it furnished for five guineas a week. The woman who let it to us was a terrifically peroxided blonde of 45, with an immense swelling bust. She was very friendly and insisted on telling me a lot about her daughter's internal ailments. The flat was filled with particularly hideous furniture, and had some of the most sentimental pictures I have ever seen. I made a mental note that the first thing Archie and I would do would be to take them down and stack them tidily to await the owner's return. There was plenty of china and glass and all that kind of thing, including one eggshell tea set which frightened me because I thought it so fragile that it was sure to get broken. With Lucy's aid, we stored it away in one of the cupboards as soon as we arrived. I then visited Mrs. Butcher's bureau, which was the recognized rendezvous indeed I believe it still is, for those who want nannies. Mrs. Boucher managed to bring me down to earth rather quickly. She sniffed at the wages I was willing to pay, inquired about conditions and what staff I kept, and then sent me to a small room where prospective employees were interviewed. A large, competent woman was the first to come in. The mere sight of her filled me with alarm. The sight of me, however, did not fill her with any alarm whatever. Yes, madam? How many children would it be? I explained that it would be one baby. And from the month, I hope. I never consent to taking any baby unless it is from the month. I get my babies into good ways as soon as possible. I said it would be from the month. And what staff do you keep, madam? I said apologetically that as staff I kept one maid. She sniffed again. I'm afraid, madam, that would hardly suit me. You see, I have been accustomed to having my nurseries waited on and looked after, and a fully equipped and pleasant establishment. I agreed that my post was not what she was looking for, and got rid of her with some relief. I saw three more, but they all despised me. However, I returned for further interviews the next day. This time I was lucky. I came across Jesse Swan Nell, 35, sharp of tongue, kind of heart, who had lived most of her time as nurse with a family in Nigeria. I broke to her, one by one, the shameful conditions of my employment. Only one maid, one nursery, not a day and night nursery, the great attended to, but otherwise she would have to do her own nursery and, final and last straw, the wages. Ah well, she said, it doesn't sound too bad. I'm used to hard work, and that doesn't bother me. A little girl, is it? I like girls. So Jessie Swannell and I fixed it up. She was with me two years, and I liked her very much, though she had her disadvantages. She was one of those who by nature dislike the parents of the child they are looking after. To Rosalind she was goodness itself, and would have died for her, I think. Me she regarded as an interloper, though she grudgingly did as I wanted her to do, even if she did not always agree with me. On the other hand, if any disaster occurred, she was splendid, kind, ready to help, and cheerful. Yes, I respect Jessie Swan Nell, and I hope she has had a good life and done the kind of thing she wanted to do. So all was settled, and Rosalind, myself, Jessie Swan Nell, and Lucy all arrived at Addison Mansions and started family life. Not that my search was ended. I had now to look for an unfurnished flat to be our permanent home. That of course was not so easy, in fact it was hellishly difficult. As soon as one heard of anything one rushed off, rang up, wrote letters, yet there really seemed to be nothing possible. Sometimes they were dirty, shabby, so broken down that you could hardly imagine living in them. Time after time someone got in just ahead of you. We circled London, 
Hampstead, Chiswick, Pimlico, Kensington, St. John's Wood, my day seemed one long bus tour. We visited all the estate agents, and before long we began to get anxious. Our furnished let was only two months. When the peroxided Mrs. Ann and her married daughter and children returned they would not be likely to let it to us for any longer. We must find something. At last it seemed we were lucky. We secured, or more or less secured, a flat near Battersea Park. Its rent was reasonable, the owner, Miss Llewellyn, was moving out in about a month's time, but would actually be content to go a little sooner. She was moving to a flat in a different part of London. All seemed settled, but we had counted our chickens too soon. A terrible blow befell us. Only about a fortnight before the date of moving we heard from Miss Llewellyn that she was unable to get into her new flat, because the people in it were in their turn unable to get into theirs. It was a chain reaction. It was a severe blow. Every two or three days we telephoned to Miss Llewellyn for news. The news was worse each time. Always, it seemed, the other people were having more difficulty getting into their flat, so she was equally full of doubt about leaving her own. It finally seemed as though it might be three or four months before we would be able to get possession, and even that date was uncertain. Feverishly, we began once again studying the advertisements, ringing up house agents, and all the rest of it. Time went on, and by now we were desperate. Then a house agent rang up and offered us not a flat but a house. A small house in Scarsdale Villas. It was for sale though, not to let. Archie and I went and saw it. It was a charming little house. It would mean selling out practically all the small capital we had, a terrible risk. However, we felt we had to risk something, so we duly agreed to buy it, signed on a dotted line and went home to decide what securities we should sell. It was two mornings later when, at breakfast, I was glancing through the paper, turning first to the flat column, which by now was such a habit with me that I was unable to stop it, and saw an advertisement, flat to let unfurnished, 96 Addison Mansions, 90 pounds per annum. I uttered a hoarse cry, dashed down my coffee cup, read the advertisement to Archie, and said, there's no time to lose. I rushed from the breakfast table, crossed the grass courtyard between the two blocks at a run, and went up the stairs of the opposite block, four flights of them, like a maniac. The time was a quarter past eight in the morning. I rang the bell of number 96. It was opened by a startled looking young woman in a dressing gown. I've come about the flat, I said with as much coherence as I could manage in my breathlessness. About this flat? Already? I only put the advertisement in yesterday. I didn't expect anyone so soon. Can I see it? Well, well, it's a little early. I think it will do for us, I said. I think I'll take it. Oh, well, I suppose you can look round. It's not very tidy. She drew back. I charged in regardless of her hesitations, took one rapid look round the flat, I was not going to run any risk of losing it. Pound 90 per annum. I asked. Yes, that's the rent. But I must warn you it's only a quarterly lease. I considered that for a moment, but it did not deter me. I wanted somewhere to live, and soon. And when is possession? Oh well, any time really, in a week or two. My husband's got to go abroad suddenly. And we want a premium for the linoleum and fittings. I did not much take to the linoleum surrounds, but what did that matter? Four bedrooms, two sitting rooms, a nice outlook on green, four flights of stairs to come up and down, true, but plenty of light and air. It wanted doing up, but we could do that ourselves. Oh, it was wonderful, a godsend. I'll take it, I said. That's definite. Oh, you're sure? You haven't told me your name. I told her, explained that I was living in a furnished flat opposite and all was settled. I rang up the agents there and then from her flat. I had been beaten to the punch too often before. As I descended the stairs again I met three couples coming up, each of them, I could see at a glance, going to number 96. This time we had one. I went back and told Archie in triumph. Splendid, he said. At that moment the telephone rang. It was Miss Llewellyn. I think, she said, that you will be able to have the flat quite certainly in a month now. Oh, I said. Oh yes, I see. I put back the receiver. Good lord, said Archie. Do you know what we've got? We've now taken two flats and bought a house. It seemed something of a problem. I was about to ring up Miss Llewellyn and tell her we didn't want the flat, but then a better idea occurred to me. 
We'll try to get out of the Scarsdale Villa house, I said, but we'll take the Battersea flat, and we'll ask a premium for it from someone else. That we'll pay the premium on. This one. Archie approved highly of this idea, and I think myself it was a moment of high financial genius on my part, because we could ill afford the £100 premium. Then we went to see the agents about the house we had bought in Scarsdale Villas. They were really very amiable. They said it would be quite easy to sell it to someone else, in fact there were several people who had been bitterly disappointed about it. So we got out of that with no more than a small fee to the agents. We had a flat, and in two weeks time we moved into it. Jessie Swannell was a brick. She made no trouble at all about having to go up and down four flights of stairs, which was more than I would have believed possible of any other nurse from Mrs. Butcher's. Ah well, she said, I'm used to lugging things about. Mind you, I could do with a nigger or two. That's the best of Nigeria, plenty of niggers. We loved our flat, and threw ourselves heartily into the business of decoration. We spent a good portion of Archie's gratuity on furniture, good modern furniture for Rosalind's nursery from Heels, good beds from Heels for us, and quite a lot of things came up from Ashfield, which was far too crowded with tables and chairs and cabinets, plate and linen. We also went to sales and bought odd chests of drawers and old-fashioned wardrobes for a song. When we got into our new flat we chose papers and decided on paint, some of the work we did ourselves, part we got in a small painter and decorator to help us with. The two sitting rooms, a quite large drawing room and a rather smaller dining room, faced over the court, but they faced north. I preferred the rooms at the end of a long passage at the back. They were not quite so big, but they were sunny and cheerful, so we decided to have our sitting room and Rosalind's nursery in the two back rooms. The bathroom was opposite them, and there was a small maid's room. Of the two large rooms we made the larger our bedroom and the smaller a dining room and possible emergency spare room. Archie chose the bathroom decoration, a brilliant scarlet and white tiled paper. Our decorator and paper hanger was extremely kind to me. He showed me how to cut and fold wallpaper in the proper way ready for pasting, and, as he put it, not to be afraid of it, when we papered the walls. Slap it on, see? You can't do any harm. If it tears, you paste it over. Cut it all out first, and have it all measured, and write the number on the back. That's right. Slap it on. A hairbrush is a very good thing to use to take the bubbles out. I became quite efficient in the end. The ceilings we left to him to deal with, I didn't feel ready to do a ceiling. Rosalind's room had pale yellow water paint on the walls, and there again I learned a little about decoration. One thing our mentor did not warn me about was that if you did not get spots of water paint off the floor quickly it hardened up and you could only remove it with a chisel. However, one learns by experience. We did Rosalind's nursery with an expensive frieze of paper from heels with animals round the top of the walls. In the sitting room I decided to have very pale pink shiny walls and to paper the ceiling with a black glossy paper with hawthorn all over it. It would make me feel, I thought, that I was in the country. It would also make the room look lower, and I liked low rooms. In a small room they looked more cottagey. The ceiling paper was to be put on by the professional of course, but he proved unexpectedly averse to doing it. Now. Look here, missus, you've got it wrong, you know. What you want is the ceiling done pale pink and the black paper on the walls. No, I don't, I said, I want the black paper on the ceiling and the pink distemper on the walls. But that's not the way you do rooms. See? You're going light up to dark. That's the wrong way. You should do dark up to light. You don't have to dark up to light if you prefer light up to dark, I argued. Well, I can only tell you, ma'am that it's the wrong way and that nobody ever does it. I said that I was going to do it. It will bring the ceiling right down, you see if it doesn't. It will make the ceiling come down towards the floor. It will make the room look quite low. I want it to look low. He gave me up then, and shrugged his shoulders. When it was finished I asked him if he didn't like it. Well, he said, it's odd. No, I can't say I like it, but, well, it's odd like but it is quite pretty if you sit in a chair and look up. That's the idea, I said. But if I was you, and you wanted to do that sort of thing, I'd have had one of them bright blue papers with stars. I don't want to think I'm out of doors at night, I said. I like to think I'm in a cherry blossom orchard or under a hawthorn tree. He shook his head sadly. Most of the curtains we had made for us. The loose covers I had decided to make myself. My sister Madge, now renamed Punky, 
Her son's name for her assured me in her usual positive fashion that this was quite easy to do. Just pin and cut them wrong side out, she said, then stitch them, and turn them outside in. It's quite simple, anyone could do it. I had a try. They did not look very professional, and I did not dare to attempt any piping, but they looked bright and nice. All our friends admired our flat, and we never had such a happy time as when settling in there. Lucy thought it was marvelous, and enjoyed every minute of it. Jesse Swannell grumbled the whole time, but was surprisingly helpful. I was quite content for her to hate us, or rather me, I don't think she disapproved of Archie quite so much. After all, as I explained to her one day, a baby has got to have parents or you wouldn't have one to look after. Ah well, I suppose you've got something there, said Jesse, and she gave a grudging smile. Archie had started his job in the city. He said he liked it and seemed quite excited about it. He was delighted to be out of the Air Force, which, he continued to repeat, was absolutely no good for the future. He was determined to make a lot of money. The fact that we were at the moment hard up did not worry us. Occasionally Archie and I went to the Palais de Danse at Hammersmith, but on the whole we did without amusements, since we really couldn't afford them. We were a very ordinary young couple, but we were happy. Life seemed well set ahead of us. We had no piano, which was a pity, but I made up for it by playing the piano madly whenever I was at Ashfield. I had married the man I loved, we had a child, we had somewhere to live, and as far as I could see there was no reason why we shouldn't live happily ever after. One day I got a letter. I opened it quite casually and read it without at first taking it in. It was from John Lane, the Bodley Head, and it asked if I would call at their office in connection with the manuscript I had submitted entitled The Mysterious Affair at Styles. To tell the truth, I had forgotten all about the mysterious affair at Styles. By this time it must have been with the Bodley Head for nearly two years, but in the excitement of the war's ending, Archie's return in our life together such things as writing and manuscripts had gone far away from my thoughts. I went off to keep the appointment, full of hope. After all they must like it a bit or they wouldn't have asked me to come. I was shown into John Lane's office, and he rose to greet me, a small man with a white beard, looking somehow rather Elizabethan. All round him there appeared to be pictures, on chairs, leaning against tables, all with the appearance of old masters, heavily varnished and yellow with age. I thought afterwards that he himself would look quite well in one of those frames with a ruff around his neck. He had a benign, kindly manner, but shrewd blue eyes, which ought to have warned me, perhaps, that he was the kind of man who would drive a hard bargain. He greeted me, told me gently to take a chair. I looked round, it was quite impossible. Every chair was covered with a picture. He suddenly saw this and laughed. Dear me, he said, there isn't much to sit on, is there? He removed a rather grimy portrait, and I sat down. Then he began to talk to me about the MS. Some of his readers, he said, had thought it showed promise, something might be made of it. But there would have to be considerable changes. The last chapter, for instance, I had written it as a court scene, but it was quite impossible written like that. It was in no way like a court scene, it would be merely ridiculous. Did I think I could do something to bring about the denouement in another way? Either someone could help me with the law aspect, though that would be difficult, or I might be able to change it in some other way. I said immediately that I thought I could manage something. I would think about it, perhaps have a different setting. Anyway, I would try. He made various other points, none of them really serious apart from the final chapter. Then he went on to the business aspect, pointing out what a risk a publisher took if he published a novel by a new and unknown writer, and how little money he was likely to make out of it. Finally he produced from his desk drawer an agreement which he suggested I should sign. I was in no frame of mind to study agreements or even think about them. He would publish my book. Having given up hope for some years now of having anything published, except the occasional short story or poem, the idea of having a book come out in print went straight to my head. I would have signed anything. This particular contract entailed my not receiving any royalties until after the first 2,000 copies had been sold, after that a small royalty would be paid. Half any serial or dramatic rights would go to the publisher. None of it meant much to me, the whole point was, the book would be published. I didn't even notice that there was a clause binding me to offer him my next five novels, at an only slightly increased rate of royalty. To me it was success, and all a wild surprise. I signed with enthusiasm. Then I took the MS away to deal with the anomalies of the last chapter. I managed that quite easily. 
And so it was that I started on my long career, not that I suspected at the time that it was going to be a long career. In spite of the clause about the next five novels, this was to me a single and isolated experiment. I had been dared to write a detective story, I had written a detective story, it had been accepted, and was going to appear in print. There, as far as I was concerned, the matter ended. Certainly at that moment I did not envisage writing any more books, I think if I had been asked I would have said that I would probably write stories from time to time. I was the complete amateur, nothing of the professional about me. For me, writing was fun. I went home, jubilant, and told Archie, and we went to the Palais de Danse at Hammersmith that night to celebrate. There was a third party with us, though I did not know it. Hercule Poirot, my Belgian invention, was hanging round my neck, firmly attached there like the old man of the sea. Fifth. After I had dealt satisfactorily with the last chapter of the mysterious affair at Stiles, I returned it to John Lane, then, once I had answered a few more queries and agreed to a few more alterations, the excitement receded into the background, and life went on as it would with any other young married couple who are happy, in love with each other, rather badly off, but not too much hampered by the fact. Our times off at weekends were usually spent in going to the country by train and walking somewhere. Sometimes we made a round trip of it. The only serious blow that befell us was that I lost my dear Lucy. She had been looking worried and unhappy, and finally she came to me rather sadly one day and said, I'm terribly sorry to let you down, Miss Agatha, I mean, ma'am, and I don't know what Mrs. Rowe would think of me, but, well, there it is, I'm going to get married. Married, Lucy? Who to? Someone I knew before the war. I always fancied him. I got more enlightenment from my mother. As soon as I told her, she exclaimed, it's not that Jack again, is it? It appeared that my mother had not much approved of that Jack. He'd been an unsatisfactory suitor of Lucy's, and it had been decided by her family that it was a good thing when the couple quarreled and parted company. However, they had come together again now. Lucy had been faithful to the unsatisfactory Jack and there it was, she was going to get married and we should have to look for another maid. By this time such a thing was even more impossible. No maids were to be found anywhere. However, at last, whether through an agency or a friend, I can't remember, I came across someone called Rose. Rose was highly desirable. She had excellent references, a round pink face, a nice smile, and looked as though she was quite prepared to like us. The only trouble was she was highly averse to going anywhere where there was a child and a nurse. I felt that she had to be prevailed upon. She had been with people in the Flying Corps, and when she heard that my husband had been in the Flying Corps too she obviously softened towards me. She said that she expected my husband knew her own employer, Squadron Leader G. I rushed home and said to Archie, did you ever know a Squadron Leader G? Not that I can remember, said Archie. Well, you must remember, I said. You must say that you came across him, or that you were buddies, or something like that, we've got to have Rose. She's wonderful, she really is. If you knew the awful creatures I have seen. So in due course Rose came to look upon us with favor. She was introduced to Archie, who said some complimentary things about Squadron Leader G, and was finally prevailed upon to accept the position. But I don't like nurses, she said warningly. Don't really mind children, but nurses, they always make trouble. Oh I'm sure, I said, that nurse Swannell won't make trouble. I was not so sure, but on the whole I thought that all would be well. The only person Jesse Swannell would make trouble for would be me, and that I could stand by now. As it happened, Rose and Jesse got along well together. Jesse told her all about her life in Nigeria, and the joy it had been to have endless niggers under her control, and Rose told her all that she had suffered in her various situations. Starved, I was, sometimes, said Rose to me one day. Starved. Do you know what they gave me for breakfast? I said that I didn't know. Kippers, said Rose gloomily. Nothing but tea and a kipper, and toast, and butter and jam. Well, I mean, I got so thin I was wasting away. There was no sign of Rose wasting away now, she was pleasantly plump. However, I made sure that when we had kippers for breakfast two kippers were always pressed upon Rose, or even three, and that eggs and bacon were served to her in lavish quantities. She was, I think, happy with us and fond of Rosalind. My grandmother died soon after Rosalind's birth. She had been much herself up to the end, but then got a bad attack of bronchitis, and her heart was not strong enough to recover from it. 
She was 92, still able to enjoy life, not too deaf, though very blind by this time. Her income, like my mother's, had been reduced by the Shafflin failure in New York, but Mr. Bailey's advice had saved her from losing all of it. This now came to my mother. It was not much by this time, because some of the shares had depreciated through the war, but it gave her three to four hundred pounds a year, which, with her allowance from Mr. Shafflin, made things possible for her. Of course everything got far more expensive in the years after the war. Still, she was able to keep on Ashfield. It made me rather unhappy not to be able to contribute my small income towards the upkeep of Ashfield, as my sister did. But it was really impossible in our case, we needed every penny we had to live on. One day, when I was speaking in a worried voice about the difficulties of keeping up Ashfield, Archie said, very sensibly, you know, really it would be much better for your mother to sell it and live elsewhere. Sell Ashfield. I spoke in a voice of horror. I can't see what good it is to you. You can't go there very often. I couldn't bear to sell Ashfield, I love it. It's, it's, it means everything. Then why don't you try and do something about it, said Archie. What do? You mean, do something about it? Well, you could write another book. I looked at him in some surprise. I suppose I might write another book one of these days, but it wouldn't do much good to Ashfield, would it? It might make a lot of money, said Archie. I didn't think that was likely. The mysterious affair at Stiles had sold clothes on 2,000 copies, which was not bad at that time for a detective story by an unknown author. It had brought me in the meager sum of pound 25, and this not for the royalties on the book, but from a half share of the serial rights, which had been sold, rather unexpectedly, to the Weekly Times for 50 pounds. Very good for my prestige, said John Lane. It was a good thing for a young author to have a serial accepted by the Weekly Times. That might be but £25 as the total income from writing a book did not encourage me to feel that I was likely to earn much money in a literary career. If a book has been good enough to take, and the publisher has made some money by it, which I presume he has, he will want another. You ought to get a bit more every time. I listened to this and agreed. I was full of admiration for Archie's financial know-how. I considered writing another book. Supposing I did, what should it be about? The question was solved for me one day when I was having tea in an ABC. Two people were talking at a table nearby, discussing somebody called Jane Fish. It struck me as a most entertaining name. I went away with the name in my mind. Jane Fish? That, I thought, would make a good beginning to a story, a name overheard at a tea shop, an unusual name, so that whoever heard it remembered it. A name like Jane Fish, or perhaps Jane Finn would be even better. I settled for Jane Finn and started writing straight away. I called it the Joyful Venture first, then the Young Adventurers, and finally it became the Secret Adversary. Archie had been quite right to settle in a job before he resigned from the Flying Corps. Young people were desperate. They had come out of the services and had no jobs to go to. Young men were always ringing our doorbell, trying to sell stockings or offering some household gadget. It was a pathetic sight. One felt so sorry for them that one often bought a pair of rather nasty stockings, just to cheer them up. They had been lieutenants, naval and military, and now they were reduced to this. Sometimes they even wrote poems and tried to sell them. I conceived the idea of having a pair of this kind, a girl who had been in the ATS or the VAD and a young man who had been in the army. They would both be rather desperate, looking for a job, and then they would meet each other perhaps they would already have met in the past. And then, then, I thought, they would be involved in, yes, espionage, this would be a spy book, a thriller, not a detective story. I liked the idea, it was a change after the detective work involved in the mysterious affair at Stiles. So I started writing, in a sketchy kind of way. It was fun, on the whole, and much easier to write than a detective story, as thrillers always are. When I had finished it, which was not for some time, I took it to John Lane, who didn't like it much. It was not the same type as my first book, it would not sell nearly so well. In fact they were undecided whether to publish it or not. However, in the end they decided to do so. I did not have to make so many changes in this one. As far as I remember it sold quite well. I made a little in royalties, which was something, and again I sold the serial rights to the Weekly Times, and this time got £50 doled out to me by John Lane. It was encouraging though not encouraging enough to make me think that I had as yet adopted anything so grand as a profession. 
My third book was Murder on the Links. This, I think, must have been written not long after a cause celebre which occurred in France. I can't remember the name of any of the participants by now. It was some tale of masked men who had broken into a house, killed the owner, tied up and gagged the wife, the mother-in-law had also died, but only apparently because she had choked on her false teeth. Anyway, the wife's story was disproved, and there was a suggestion that it was the wife who had killed her husband, and that she had never been tied up at all, or only by an accomplice. It struck me as a good plot on which to weave my own story, starting with the wife's life after she had been acquitted of the murder. A mysterious woman would appear somewhere, having been the heroine of a murder case years ago. I said it in France, this time. Hercule Poirot had been quite a success in the mysterious affair at Styles, so it was suggested that I should continue to employ him. One of the people who liked Poirot was Bruce Ingram, editor at the time of the sketch. He got in touch with me, and suggested that I should write a series of Poirot stories for the sketch. This excited me very much indeed. At last I was becoming a success. To be in the sketch, wonderful. He also had a fancy drawing made of Hercule Poirot which was not unlike my idea of him, though he was depicted as a little smarter and more aristocratic than I had envisaged him. Bruce Ingram wanted a series of 12 stories. I produced eight before long, and at first it was thought that that would be enough, but in the end it was decided to increase them to 12, and I had to write another four rather more hastily than I wanted. It had escaped my notice that not only was I now tied to the detective story, I was also tied to two people, Hercule Poirot and his Watson, Captain Hastings. I quite enjoyed Captain Hastings. He was a stereotyped creation, but he and Poirot represented my idea of a detective team. I was still writing in the Sherlock Holmes tradition, eccentric detective, stooge assistant, with a Lestrade type Scotland Yard detective, Inspector Jep, and I now added a human foxhound, Inspector Giroux, of the French police. Giroux despises Poirot as being old and passé. Now I saw what a terrible mistake I had made in starting with Hercule Poirot so old, I ought to have abandoned him after the first three or four books, and begun again with someone much younger. Murder on the Links was slightly less in the Sherlock Holmes tradition, and was influenced, I think, by the mystery of the Yellow Room. It had rather that high-flown, fanciful type of writing. When one starts writing, one is much influenced by the last person one has read or enjoyed. I think Murder on the Links was a moderately good example of its kind though rather melodramatic. This time I provided a love affair for Hastings. If I had to have a love interest in the book, I thought I might as well marry off Hastings. Truth to tell, I think I was getting a little tired of him. I might be stuck with Poirot, but no need to be stuck with Hastings too. The Bodley Head were pleased with Murder on the Links, but I had a slight row with them over the jacket they had designed for it. Apart from being in ugly colors, it was badly drawn, and represented, as far as I could make out, a man in pajamas on a golf links, dying of an epileptic fit. Since the man who had been murdered had been fully dressed and stabbed with a dagger, I objected. A book jacket may have nothing to do with the plot, but if it does it must at least not represent a false plot. There was a good deal of bad feeling over this, but I was really furious and it was agreed that in future I should see the jacket first and approve of it. I had already had one slight difference with the bodily head, and that was in the mysterious affair at Styles, over the spelling of the word Coco. For some strange reason, the house spelling of Coco, meaning by that a cup of cocoa, was Coco, which, as Euclid would have said, is absurd. I was sternly opposed by Miss House, the dragon presiding over all spelling in the bodily head books. Coco, she said, in their publications, was always spelled Coco, it was the proper spelling and was a rule of the firm. I produced tins of cocoa and even dictionaries, they had no impression on her. Cocoa was the proper spelling, she said. It was not until many years later, when I was talking to Alan Lane, John Lane's nephew, and begetter of Penguin Books, that I said, you know I had terrible fights with Miss House over the spelling of cocoa. He grinned. I know, we had great trouble with her as she got older. She got very opinionated about certain things. She argued with authors and would never give way. Innumerable people wrote to me and said, I can't understand, Agatha, why you spelled Coco, Coco in your book. Of course you were never a good speller. Most unfair. I was not a good speller, I am still not a good speller, but at any rate I could spell Coco the proper way. What I was, though, was a weak character. It was my first book, and I thought they must know better than I did. 
I had had some nice reviews for the mysterious affair at Styles, but the one which pleased me best appeared in the pharmaceutical journal. It praised this detective story for dealing with poisons in a knowledgeable way, and not with the nonsense about untraceable substances that so often happens. Miss Agatha Christie, they said, knows her job. I had wanted to write my books under a fancy name, Martin West or Mostyn Gray, but John Lane had been insistent on keeping my own name, Agatha Christie, particularly the Christian name, he said, Agatha is an unusual name which remains in people's memories. So I had to abandon Martin West and label myself henceforth as Agatha Christie. I had the idea that a woman's name would prejudice people against my work, especially in detective stories, that Martin West would be more manly and forthright. However, as I have said, when you are publishing a first book you give way to whatever is suggested to you, and in this case I think John Lane was right. I had now written three books, was happily married, and my heart's desire was to live in the country. Addison Mansions was a long way from the park pushing the pram there and back was no joke, either for Jesse Swannell or for me. Also there was one permanent snag, the flats were scheduled to come down. They belonged to Lyons, who intended to build new premises on the site. That is why the lease was only a quarterly one. At any moment notice might be given that the block was to be pulled down. Actually, 30 years later, our particular block of Addison Mansions was still standing, though now it has disappeared. Cadby Hall reigns in its stead. Among our other activities at the weekend, Archie and I sometimes went by train to East Croydon and played golf there. I had never been much of a golfer, and Archie had played little, but he became keenly appreciative of the game. After a while, we seemed to go every weekend to East Croydon. I did not really mind, but I missed the variety of exploring places and going long walks. In the end that choice of recreation was to make a big difference to our lives. Both Archie and Patrick Spence, a friend of ours who also worked at Goldstein's, were getting rather pessimistic about their jobs, the prospects as promised or hinted at did not seem to materialize. They were given certain directorships, but the directorships were always of hazardous companies sometimes on the brink of bankruptcy. Spence once said, I think these people are a lot of ruddy crooks. All quite legal, you know. Still, I don't like it, do you? Archie said that he thought that some of it was not very reputable. I rather wish, he said thoughtfully, I could make a change. He liked city life and had an aptitude for it, but as time went on he was less and less keen on his employers. And then something completely unforeseen came up. Archie had a friend who had been a master at Clifton, a Major Belcher. Major Belcher was a character. He was a man with terrific powers of bluff. He had, according to his own story, bluffed himself into the position of controller of potatoes during the war. How much of Belcher's stories was invented and how much true, we never knew, but anyway he made a good story of this one. He had been a man of 40 or 50 odd when the war broke out, and though he was offered a stay-at-home job in the war office he did not care for it much. Anyway, when dining with a VIP one night, the conversation fell on potatoes, which were really a great problem in the 1914-18 war. As far as I can remember, they vanished quite soon. At the hospital, I know, we never had them. Whether the shortage was entirely due to Belcher's control of them I don't know, but I should not be surprised to hear it. This pompous old fool who was talking to me, said Belcher, said the potato position was going to be serious, very serious indeed. I told him that something had to be done about it, too many people messing about. Somebody had got to take the whole thing over, one man to take control. Well, he agreed with me. But mind you, I said, he'd have to be paid pretty highly. No good giving a mingy salary to a man and expecting to get one who's any good, you've got to have someone who's the tops. You ought to give him at least, and here he mentioned a sum of several thousands of pounds. That's very high, said the VIP, you've got to get a good man, said Belcher. Mind you, if you offered it to me, I wouldn't take it on myself, at that price. That was the operative sentence. A few days later Belcher was begged, on his own valuation, to accept such a sum, and control potatoes. What did you know about potatoes? I asked him. I didn't know a thing, said Belcher. But I wasn't going to let on. I mean. You can do anything, you've only got to get a man as second in command who knows a bit about it, and read it up a bit, and there you are. He was a man with a wonderful capacity for impressing people. He had a great belief in his own powers of organization, and it was sometimes a long time before anyone found out the havoc he was causing. 
the truth is that there never was a man less able to organize. His idea, like that of many politicians, was first to disrupt the entire industry, or whatever it might be, and having thrown it into chaos, to reassemble it, as Omar Khayyam might have said, nearer to the heart's desire. The trouble was that, when it came to reorganizing, Belcher was no good. But people seldom discovered that until too late. At some period of his career he went to New Zealand, where he so impressed the governors of a school with his plans for reorganization that they rushed to engage him as headmaster. About a year later he was offered an enormous sum of money to give up the job, not because of any disgraceful conduct, but solely because of the muddle he had introduced, the hatred which he aroused in others, and his own pleasure in what he called, a forward-looking, up-to-date, progressive administration. As I say, he was a character. Sometimes you hated him, sometimes you were quite fond of him. Belcher came to dinner with us one night, being out of the potato job, and explained what he was about to do next. You know this empire exhibition we're having in 18 months time? Well, the thing has got to be properly organized. The dominions have got to be alerted, to stand on their toes and to cooperate in the whole thing. I'm going on a mission, the British Empire mission, going round the world, starting in January. He went on to detail his schemes. What I want, he said, is someone to come with me as financial advisor. What about you, Archie? You've always had a good head on your shoulders. You were head of the school at Clifton, you've had all this experience in the city. You're just the man I want. I couldn't leave my job, said Archie. Why not? Put it to your boss properly, point out it will widen your experience and all that. He'll keep the job open for you, I expect. Archie said he doubted if Mr. Goldstein would do anything of the kind. Well, think it over, my boy. I'd like to have you. Agatha could come too, of course. She likes traveling, doesn't she? Yes, I said, a monosyllable of understatement. I'll tell you what the itinerary is. We go first to South Africa. You and me, and a secretary, of course. With us would be going the Hyams. I don't know if you know Hyam, he's a potato king from East Anglia. A very sound fellow. He's a great friend of mine. He'd bring his wife and daughter. They'd only go as far as South Africa. Hyam can't afford to come further because he has got too many business deals on here. After that we push on to Australia, and after Australia New Zealand. I'm going to take a bit of time off in New Zealand, I've got a lot of friends out there, I like the country. We'd have, perhaps, a month's holiday. You could go on to Hawaii, if you liked, Honolulu. Honolulu, I breathed. It sounded like the kind of fantasy you had in dreams. Then on to Canada, and so home. It would take about nine to ten months. What about it? We realized at last that he really meant it. We went into the thing fairly carefully. Archie's expenses would, of course, all be paid, and outside that he would be offered a fee of £1,000. If I accompanied the party practically all my traveling costs would be paid, since I would accompany Archie as his wife, and free transport was being given on ships and on the national railways of the various countries. We worked furiously over finances. It seemed, on the whole, that it could be done. Archie's £1,000 ought to cover my expenses in hotels, and a month's holiday for both of us in Honolulu. It would be a near thing, but we thought it was just possible. Archie and I had twice gone abroad for a short holiday, once to the south of France, to the Pyrenees, and once to Switzerland. We both loved traveling, I had certainly been given a taste for it by that early experience when I was seven years old. Anyway, I longed to see the world, and it seemed to me highly probable that I never should. We were now committed to the business life, and a businessman, as far as I could see, never got more than a fortnight's holiday a year. A fortnight would not take you far. I longed to see China and Japan and India and Hawaii, and a great many other places, but my dream remained, and probably always would remain, wishful thinking. The question is, said Archie, whether old yellow face will look kindly on the scheme. I said hopefully that Archie must be very valuable to him. Archie thought he could probably be replaced with somebody just as good, heaps of people were milling about wanting jobs still. Anyway, old yellow face, did not play. He said that he might re-employ Archie on his return, it would depend, but he certainly could not guarantee to keep the job open. That would be too much for Archie to ask. He would have to take the risk of finding his place filled. So we debated it. It's a risk, I said. A terrible risk. Yes, 
it's a risk. I realize we shall probably land up back in England without a penny, with a little over a hundred a year between us, and nothing else, that jobs. Will be hard to get, probably even harder than now. On the other hand, well, if you don't take a risk you never get anywhere, do you? It's rather up to you, Archie said. What shall we do about Teddy? Teddy was our name for Rosalind at that time, I think because we had once called her in fun the tadpole. Punky, the name we all used for Madge now, would take Teddy. Or mother, they would be delighted. And she's got nurse. Yes, yes, that part of it is all right. It's the only chance we shall ever have, I said wistfully. We thought about it, and thought about it. Of course you could go, I said, bracing myself to be unselfish, and I stay behind. I looked at him. He looked at me. I'm not going to leave you behind, he said. I wouldn't enjoy it if I did that. No, either you risk it and come too, or not, but it's up to you, because you risk more than I do, really. So again we sat and thought, and I adopted Archie's point of view. I think you're right, I said. It's our chance. If we don't do it we shall always be mad with ourselves. No, as you say, if you can't take the risk of doing something you want, when the chance comes, life isn't worth living. We had never been people who played safe. We had persisted in marrying against all opposition, and now we were determined to see the world and risk what would happen on our return. Our home arrangements were not difficult. The Addison Mansion's flat could be let advantageously, and that would pay Jesse's wages. My mother and my sister were delighted to have Rosalind and Nurse. The only opposition of any kind came at the last moment, when we learned that my brother Monty was coming home on leave from Africa, my sister was outraged that I was not going to stay in England for his visit. Your only brother, coming back after being wounded in the war, and having been away for years, and you choose to go off round the world at that moment. I think it's disgraceful. You ought to put your brother first. Well, I don't think so, I said. I ought to put my husband first. He is going on this trip and I'm going with him. Wives should go with their husbands. Monty's your only brother, and it's your only chance of seeing him, perhaps for years more. She quite upset me in the end, but my mother was strongly on my side. A wife's duty is to go with her husband, she said. A husband must come first, even before your children, and a brother is further away still. Remember, if you're not with your husband, if you leave him too much, you'll lose him. That's especially true of a man like Archie. I'm sure that's not so, I said indignantly. Archie is the most faithful person in the world. You never know with any man, said my mother, speaking in a true Victorian spirit. A wife ought to be with her husband, and if she isn't, then he feels he has a right to forget her.